Good Thursday morning, everybody. John and Lance along with Dell here with you for the next three hours on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. And what, okay, okay, I don't know what the lead is today. Because what happens more, which is rarer, an Astros home win or the Texans picking up a big-name player? Texans picking up a big-name no, player. No, it's not rare. Not lately. It's actually really rare. Free agency is one thing. Daniel, it doesn't matter. They picked up big name players. This Joe is bigger Mixon, than Daniel Hunter. Daniel Hunter. Uh, 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 they they picked up. Who, a bunch name of all the big, big name. name. The Astros only have two wins. Name all the big name the players. Astros they only have up. two wins. The lead is Stephon yeah. Diggs of the Texans, without question. Yeah. The I Texans don't, I don't are know. now. The Astros winning at home. Is well, rare, we'll get their time. Feet. We got 157 more games to go, uh, hmm. or 154, yeah. whatever. But the Texans, we were off the air. We were literally leaving the air when this broke. 155. We were literally off the air when this broke. Right. Uh, going off the air. We were going and off so the air. So we haven't had a chance. But now Del I talked about it, on, it a lot. We broke it. We actually broke the news. Yeah, we broke the story right. here. Thanks to Dell. But um, what a huge move for the Houston Texans. Houston Texans end up getting Stephon Diggs. He is uh, he's somebody who gets easily disenchanted. All right, we know that. Happened in Minnesota. Happened in Buffalo. At some point, it'll probably happen in Houston. But I think you just want to get two years minimum out of digs and hope for three. And if that can happen, that is inside the window of the rookie contract for CJ Stroud. But what this is, is this is actually where Bill, when Bill O'Brien was trading away two first round picks to go for it now with a left tackle, and you can't protect the quarterback with just one offensive lineman. It's a five man job, sometimes six man job. I always thought that was the dumbest thing that they – that's going – that's not a go-for-it-now move, and they didn't have a go-for-it-now team. This is a go-for-it-now move. This is a second-round pick, and it's not even a second all the way. They do give up a second-rounder, but they get a fifth and a sixth in return for Stephon Diggs, and this is a go-for-it-now move because the Texans could not – but it doesn't cripple them at all. They no. give up next year's second-round pick that they got from the Vikings when they traded out of 23. So if you're doing the math – the Houston Texans traded this year's 23 and got Stephon Diggs, got a second-round pick this year, 46 or whatever it is this year, and a fifth and a sixth. That's what the Texans got out of that first round. Their 23rd pick yep. got them three draft picks in Stephon Diggs. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's 46 and then 59, right? So they got the 46 this year, and they got Stephon Diggs and a fifth and a sixth. And we were wondering why why is he doing that? And because Minnesota wanted to move, Minnesota wanted to move up, but he wanted to do this as well and not loot not and still have a second round pick next year. Nick Casario is doing an, a, a hell of a job, hell of a job. Now they probably work rework uh, digs. He's got they've got him through two thousand twenty. It's not a, it's a if you we rework yeah. him, it's because he's mad about his contract. Yeah, or it's not want, because your your salary case number is actually in the low twenties, which is pretty good for a wide but receiver. But you can still build up. You can get yourself there. But they got about eleven left right now, and he probably wants a little bit more. They give him some upfront money here; it'll lower that number, make and, him happy, yeah, and make him happy as well. So it, the question is, is 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 how long before he blows it up? So, you know, Sebastian, as a Colts fan, my son is really unhappy with the Texans offseason. Right. Extraordinarily unhappy with the Texans offseason. Um, you know, and he goes, yeah. I said, so, Sebastian, are the Colts better than the Texans? He goes, no. And Mason kept pre pressing because Mason's a Texan fan. And he said, he goes, yeah, so who's going to win the division? He goes, I don't know. He said, I will say the Texans are going to be good for at least eight weeks before Stefan loses it. <laughs> He said, so I'll, I'll tell you that. He goes, eight, anywhere from five to eight weeks, you should be really good. No, and then I, after that, it falls apart. I think he'll be good for the first year for sure, yeah. maybe the second year. By year three, I don't know if Stephon Diggs can help himself. But I also think that you've got a you've got an, a unique scenario in young quarterback that he may vibe with more in, in, in you know, Kirk Cousins wasn't his type. Josh Allen's not his type. Maybe C.J. Stroud will be his type. Yeah. Uh, from a head coaching standpoint, I don't know if it's head coaching issues, offense coordinator. He just he's a diva wide. This is our first real diva wide receiver. Brian, I don't Cooks was not a diva, <clears throat> but but he's in that he but he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Brandon Cooks is obviously a pain in the ass. Everybody trades him. I don't know if he's a diva. This is our first real life 
journey into diva wide receiver. But what you get with diva wide receiver is usually a really good player. And so, John, you look at it now, and without question, you and I have been covering this team since their inception. Nico Collins, Stephon Diggs, Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz, nothing from the Texans even comes close to this. I mean, you had Andre Johnson, of course, which, you know, he's great. Andre Johnson, Kevin Walter, Owen Daniels. Yeah, uh, you didn't really have a slot. Back then, you didn't use a slot as much. No, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. That was good. You had Kevin Walter. Who's the Kevin Walter on this team? There's no Kevin Walter on this team. Well, you don't have Kevin Walter. You got Nico and you got Tank. That's what I'm saying. It's much better than Kevin Walter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, But how long do you have Nico? That's a question, too. And if you do get rid of Nico in that offseason, what's Stefan Diggs going to say about your champ? Because your chances are not going to be as good. Um, and anytime in, in the postseason, he does, he doesn't, he doesn't play More a big catches role for him. He'll He's be going to be, mm, I don't know. <laughs> if Nico's gone, who gets more catches him? Trust he- me. He'll yeah. be fine with more catches. He'll be fine with more catches, but he also wants to win. And, and, and one of the things is in big games, he wants to, well, he be, wants to he win. He wants to be a focal point. Yeah, he wants to win as long as he's a focal is point. Is he going to be – if Tank is a focal point, let's say it's, a, it's, it's week four, week five. Let's say it's against Kansas City or it's against Buffalo, one of the teams that the, – the, the first place teams that the Texans have to face. And it's Tank who's starring or Nico who's starring. Is he going to have – is he going to have issues? That's a, I it's think, something that's a that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah, it's a legitimate question because for the Texans, what makes the Texans special now is they have three different players who could go off in any given game. It could be Diggs. It could be Tank Dell. It could be uh, – and I'm not even counting Schultz who can have big games, but it's Tank, it's Diggs, and it's Nico Collins. Any one of those guys could go for 120 and two touchdowns in any given game. That's what makes the Texans potentially so dangerous this year – and maybe, you know, a real strong favorite to challenge the Chiefs in the AFC is because they can beat you in a variety of ways. That, but that's what makes it good. You can't, you can't get away from that. It's got to be the best matchup on that particular game. It's got to be C.J. Stroud, full field reads, understanding that he goes to everyone. Like part of the success of this team will be based upon whether or not they can generate balanced offense with their offensive threats because that's what's going to make them tough. And if you start locking in on, you know, if you start locking in on one guy or if a wide receiver starts complaining to a quarterback about getting the ball, it's not going to be great. Now, I also think everything I've been told about C.J. Stroud is he doesn't put up with it. Like, C.J. holds his ground against everybody. It's one of the reasons he got into it, Bobby Slowick, during the meeting that they had pre-draft is because when he's challenged, you know, he's going to stand his ground and – I don't think he's going to get, you know, he's not just going to smile off the stuff like Josh Allen did. I think CJ will have some things to say to Diggs if it becomes an issue. How but, much How much happier is Diggs going to be in Houston and in Buffalo? See, I think that's a big part. That's a huge Where part. he lives, it's, yeah. it's going to be Playing warmer. Playing in warm weather. Uh-huh. You know, most of the time, half your games at least are going to be in a dome with that doesn't open, so you don't ever have to Played worry. in Minnesota like about that. About it being a cold. But he still had to live in Minnesota. In no, no, winter. no. I mean, I, I, I mean, think I that, think he's going to like it a lot. I do, too. Yeah. I think he's going to be, hopefully, he'll be. His brother was extremely happy. Trayvon was. Well, I want to keep Trayvon happy. Yeah. Well, because he, you know, Trayvon Diggs will get on social media and let us know when he's not happy right. with Stephon Diggs. So, this is the first, Texans' first foray into big boy expectations and big boy issue like we could potentially be gossip fodder now on ESPN we like right now yeah. ESPN to start their show it's it's Stefan Diggs of the Texans is the number one lead story on on, on there which is nice in their stories which is nice but I think it I think really you know we focused on some things that could go wrong with Stefan Diggs let's talk about the reality Stefan Diggs can eat up first and second level routes. Nico Collins can do route, you know, level two and level three, and Tank can pretty much do all three levels, short, medium, and deep. Bobby Slowick has the enviable task of creating an offense that allows him to, I don't know if he changes any route structures. I don't know if he goes into the lab and draws up new plays, but I still think Diggs is going to be a high target player. I think he gets the most targets of any Texan um, he's also Buffalo started using him a lot with catch and run stuff underneath, which tank can also do. So kind of an extension of the running game, just boop, quick hitters and go take off and get your yardage. This is really a, a fun, 
a fun exercise for Bobby Slowick and how to maximize what you have. Kyle Shanahan's done it with Dayuk, with Debo, with the wide receivers and running backs he's had. Now Bobby Slowick gets a chance to do it. And listen, Bobby Slowick, unless this gets royally screwed up this year, he is going to be the guy next year. I mean, he, he may be the number one guy based on how the Texans offense could perform. Yeah. He could be the number one guy when it comes to well head coaching job. When you have success, you're going to. And when you have the weapons that he has. Now, he's he better utilize them because if he's not, if in fact the Texans uh, do stall and don't have an explosive top five offense, yeah. then Bobby Slowick is going to hear it. The pressure is on now. Let me ask you this question. I don't know. Uh, San Francisco maybe still has... No, the number one weapons between Ayuk and Debo and, and McCaffrey and and Kittle, that's pretty good. It's pretty close. That's though. pretty close. I think Houston might be ahead of them. Well, I, that's a good. I mean, I, I mean, Kittle's getting older. Um, you know, we've got, we've got. Uh, do you add Mixon? So is Schultz. I mean, Schultz's been around Mixon? a little bit. But but wide receiving yeah, core. Yeah, Mixon absolutely is added. Our wide receiving core here in Houston is better than San Francisco's. Yeah, I like how you can't debo though. I mean, that's not yeah, I do too. Do you like? Disrespectful. Do you like? I'm not being disrespectful. Yeah. I like, t- I like Tank Stephon Diggs and Nico Cole and Nico Collins better than their three. Yeah, yeah, yes, I like. I mean, Debo Samuel. Better. Let's remember, Debo Samuel doesn't run routes really down the field a whole lot. And and Kittle, surprisingly, his stats aren't nearly as big as you would think. No, no, um, he's not been as. But big neither as, was neither last Schultz, year. He was neither are Schultz. Uh, but so, well, but, Schultz is going to be the fourth option. Schultz is, or maybe the fifth. Mixon, Mixon's going to get a lot of catches out of the, out uh-huh. the backfield. No, I, I think from a skill position standpoint, now throwing quarterback, the Texans have San Francisco beat. There's about, nobody There's nobody well, that else? matches. The Lions? I've gone through this yesterday. Nobody matches the Texans. Keep going. Yeah. Amon Burrow, the closest you Porter, get is Burrow, Burrow, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase. That's really, really strong. But then you run out of a little bit, a bit of gas at tight end. And running back. And running back. Yeah. Because you took this. And third wide receiver. Yeah. Because uh, Tyler Boyd is gone. Yeah. So they've got that little Nate Irvin, the little Irwin, the little white guy, who actually had a pretty good oh, game against the Texas. Oh, little white guy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not afraid of a no, little I'm white guy. Little, I'm it's not Trent Irwin, by the way. The only little white guy I'm afraid of Be is Be respectful. Like, it's Trent Irwin, not Nate. Um, whatever. whatever. No, That's what I'm respectful. saying. No one even no knows. No one even knows his first I'll name. Take, the Irwin, take, the white guy. I'll take. With the blonde hair. I'll take the... I'll take okay. the uh, the master over the protege. I'll take Kyle Shanahan over Bobby Slowick. So I think that well, helps as San a coach, calls. yes, yeah. Why? Just because he gets the Super Bowls? Now yeah, your weapons yeah, just because just now because I think, of that. I think. <laughs> oh, well, oh, really? <laughs> yes, just oh, because that's of why? that. Yes. Now I think Miami is in the mix. Obviously, with yep. you got two burning fast guys. You got Achan. Um, well, Who's the other H-N running back? Mostert started? scored over 20 touchdowns last year. Yeah, uh, Mostert, Mostert H-N, is that's fast, pretty strong. too. Now, who's your uh, third wide receiver? Uh, that might be something they approach Ooh, in the draft. Ooh, Dookie Staines. What about what? tight end? Dookie, well, they, they got John U. Smith. Dookie Staines. <laughs> Dookie Staines. Dookie Staines. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He's not Dalton Schultz, the great Dalton Schultz. Who who, 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 who you got You had, uh, left? Who who left last this offseason? Kasicki, don't care. He's been gone for a couple years now. Thank Has you. it been two years? Yes. So, Johnny, who was your tight end last year? Uh, it, well, they they kept Durham Smythe. It's, it's Johnny Smith they added. Ooh. Well, I didn't. I'm just. No one cares you, about your raggedy ass team you asked, outside. Of your two short. You brought it. Tiny fast guys. You have tiny fast guys. We've got Tank Dell, who's bigger than them. No, he's and not. probably faster. If we're being honest. Yeah, no. probably. No, no, he's not. Stephon Diggs might be faster. Actually, that's not the case. Um, no, you don't know. No, nah, we all know. Yeah, we do. We do kind of know. Uh, I, yeah, I guess. I, you know what? I don't know that anybody has. They're a better... up there. They're right yeah. in the. You can't. You can't compare them to others and go no. Immediately, the Texans are right there. When we t- in terms of weapons. So now we see whether or not they're going to be right there in terms of. I mean, we got a lot of quotes from a lot of people that we will hear from today about, including let's uh, play. Well, let's talk Astros in the next segment. But one, but after that. Let's hear from somebody who said the Texans got fleeced. Got fleeced. Wait, in the, the Texans deal. did? The Texans got fleeced. So fleeced was was trending yesterday, yeah. and I clicked it, and everything's Buffalo. Everything was about yeah. the Bills getting fleeced. No, 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 but no. But somebody no. else has got the Texans other now. Way. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
Uh, he's trying to make a name for him. He's really trying really, really hard. Okay. But here's Doc Linville, who, who who tries really hard for you, too. Tries to make your hair better. And it's it, you know what? This is just a side job for Doc, too. And yet, it's like, you guys have really responded. And you turned him into one of the biggest hair replacement guys in the city. I mean, I, he said, I, I think I'm second or something like that. And he, this was just something that he's decided to, but it's because of you, the 97.5 listener. For whatever reason, we are more follically challenged. And you know what? We, if you are follically challenged, Doc Linville is here for you. It's so easy. The neo grafting is easy. It's painless, basically. It's a you got a, a three days that uh, an anesthetic that you are going to feel and not feel at all. It's going to be. I did it on Friday. I'm back to work on Monday. Fred did it on Friday. Was back to work on Friday. That's how that's how easy it was for him. You're looking for the best way, and not only that, but you also got uh, the PRP, which stimulates the growth. Doc will decide which one is best for you. You decide that you have to do something about your hairline or your bald spot. Now, do it. Go to 975hair.com, 975hair.com. Drop our name. I'm serious. When you pull up, when you drop call a pin, pull up Aqueduct. Seriously, you tell them that you're a 97.5 listener. John and Lance, they're personal friends. Okay, and we're gonna have a lot of personal friends because if you have a, a, an issue with your plumbing, uh, Billy is gonna be here for you. I'm serious. Mary is gonna be like make, send a, 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 we, a Mike, my my guy Mike. He had an issue, and he they call he called, and they said, and Mary said, "Yep, we'll be right out." They were right out within the hour, fix whatever issue he had, and you know what? This is gonna be you as well. Two eight one four eight eight sixty two thirty eight. Put that number in your phone. Two eight one four eight eight sixty two thirty eight. Yeah, and, and whether the, the job is big or small, we talked about the fact they can handle that, but they handle emergencies for you. They handle um, plumbing when it comes to uh, you're, you're doing your remodeling or you're building a new house. They can handle all the plumbing. They can move gas lines for you. Anything you can think of, but most importantly, go get a hydrostatic test to make sure there's no leaks in your uh, plumbing underneath your home. That's extremely important. It's aqueductplumbingcompany.com. That's aqueductplumbingcompany.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. The Astros starting pitching. Now, it wasn't great last night, but it's still scoreless. 
I, I saw a stat, what was it, 23 and a third consecutive scoreless innings out of the starters right now, or some stupid number, 22, whatever it was, whatever the number was, but it's over 20 innings, consecutive innings of no runs by the Astros starters. Now, Javier was not, this is not what you want to see. I mean, he only gave up one hit, but five walks and three strikeouts. Yeah, that's, that's really scary. That's scary. That's too many base runners, first of all. What, has he given up two hits so far this year? Uh, yeah. He's given up two, two hits. hits. That's it. But, 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 but we all know the You scary... can't get him past the fifth inning. He's I know. got 90 pitches. The scary thing is, I mean, the Astros in their two wins, they've had a no-hitter and a one-hitter. Yeah. And, well, and then he had... And, but but the scary and then thing they had is a one hitter in their loss. Yeah, but but five. You're right. Five walks, three strikeouts is is. I I know you guys. Some of you are going to say sky is falling type talk from us, but that's the kind of stuff that we saw last year when he really struggled is allowing men on base unnecessarily and not getting a strikeout per nine. That's part of who he is. When he's on, when he's dealing, he is a strikeout per nine guy. And three strikeouts in five innings and ninety seven. He threw 97 pitches and had 51 strikes. That's that's, you know, we're, we're at 46 walks to 51 strikes. It's not where you want to be if you're Javier. The result is good. The process wasn't great. The trip there wasn't great. But the results in the box score, you think, oh, it looks good. But the five walks, he just he did have a hard time locating. Um, but I mean, they didn't put bat on ball on him. They, he he allowed yep. one hit. Yep. I think he's gone 10 innings with two hits so far. But the the walks and strikeouts, the first game, he did not have that issue with the walks. Um, but yesterday, wasn't it nice to see, front, to see Jordan kind of get, uh, get off the launching pad? What about, I mean, the Blue Jays got to be leaving here going, what the hell? We got no hit. We got one hit. And then the only game that we won, we couldn't do anything until the, a two-run homer with two outs in the ninth inning. They got to be leaving here going, we can't, we can't hit this team. And yet they still won one of the games. Just ridiculous. But uh, neither here nor there, Jordan broke out last night and just destroyed those baseballs. Just destroyed it. He, Chris Bassett, did you see him when he was walking off the field and Jordan's, what, what, you know, after Jordan made the third out of one of its at bats? Oh, yeah. But, but and Bassett he's like, you're killing like, me. You're, ki- you're effing killing me. Yeah. <laughs> If you see his stats, he's, yeah. Jordan yeah. kills him. Yeah, five homers, I think eight for 18, five homers off of him. Uh, just stupid. He can really see the ball off of him. It was nice to see Kyle Tucker with a couple more hits. Who leads the league in in hits this year? Can you tell me? Mm-mm. Do you know who leads the league? Who? In hits? Not Yiner. Yiner. Is he Yiner? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, Yiner's freaking <laughs> Despite out. Soto. And everybody else. He may be Pudge Rodriguez. He may be Pudge. I mean, he is. Because Pudge could hit with power. Pudge hit with average. Pudge could throw it. There's no question. He is special. And John Singleton picked up a hit. So we got a hit out of first base, everybody. We got a hit out of. It has got to be the weakest position. The weakest first base offense. First base is supposed to be a big offensive position. Mm. It's got to be the weakest in all of baseball for the last two years now. I, mean, I hope, two, I hope Abreu years. turns it around because Singleton has never had a major league season hitting over 200. Never. And we know his journey. It's, it's, it's a great story, but it's not the story of a full-time starter. It just simply doesn't happen in real life very often. And what Singleton is is a good story. He's got a chance to, you know, theoretically hit a home run for you off the bench. He's not a – he's not a – he's not even a – gonna be a, a platoon first baseman that's not that's not he's not good enough no. he's not a good enough hitter to do that and so if a brave starts to starts to tank as an older player this year like he did for much of last year before he had that you know he came back after an injury and was pretty good uh but if that's not if that's the outlier eh, um, it's how- not great i don't know if the astros will I don't know what they'll do about it. I think they'll just have to have a hole in their lineup see i think i think that i think that there's a, a good possibility you know that that a spot is not going to put up with it like uh, like Dusty. He's not going to have that kind of patience. I mean, you already see uh, Singleton going in there. He's started a couple of games now. I don't know that it can be Singleton, and I don't know that he'll have patience with Singleton either. Maybe it's Gray Kessinger. Maybe it's Dubon on an everyday basis at first, or or Would most he be the of, smallest most first the baseman in history. No, he's played first though. He's, yeah, but he's I got know a good he's glove. played it. He's got a good enough glove. To he's play got anyway. no. He's got a good glove. I'm just yeah. saying he's a small target. Just yeah. He's one of the sm- he'd be one of the smallest corner fielders. Yeah, I mean Alex Bregman's not a big guy, but he's well put together. I don't remember a first baseman ever being that 
Uh, Smallest stature. Yeah, probably. Like ever. It's You know, you want a bigger target. There's no question about that. But I could certainly see where Espada won't have the kind of pay. And Dusty left him in in the cleanup hole for most of the season. That's how the kind of patience that Dusty had last year with because of his name, because he was a veteran, as opposed to the youngsters like Yiner and Chaz, who I got to protect for everybody. I don't know that Espada. I hope he's not going to have that kind of patience with him. If if Abreu has to sit next to him because Abreu is not uh, contributing, then that's what's going to have to happen, and we'll see. Now, Jeremy Pena looks like a different guy right mm-hmm. now. He looks like a different guy. Jeremy Pena looks great right now. He looks like the rookie Pena. Yeah. I don't know what happened last year. I know he said a swing got all out of kilter and he couldn't fix it during the year. But man, does he look different this year? And it's huge. It's huge. We talk a lot about can Bregman get off to the good start? Can Javier and Hunter Brown? You know, it's the same guys over and over that you you say it's, it's very, very important. It's very crucial. But frankly, if Pena's hitting well, it dampens the issue with your first baseman not hitting well. Like, you've got to have a balance. Yeah. Something has to to be a plus if that first base is going to be a minus. Because there's a, there's a chance. There's actually a decent chance first base – is a hole. Hey, it was a hole for most of the when they won a national when they won a World Series. It was an issue with with pretty much for the entire year with Yuli. Um, it just it really was just for whatever reason Yuli just fell apart. And of course we know he came yeah. to life in the postseason. But that was just an issue you had to deal with. But Pena was good. Yeah. But Pena was good. Yeah. No. Well, the back end. Hopefully. Do we'll you know s- this is. It'll be it'll be interesting to see how much Dubon, how where where Jake Myers lands now. It, now that we're getting on an everyday basis, they got the day off today as they travel to the Rangers for four games where they own and that's their home. That's the home of the Houston Astros. They own that stadium. This is the first series win for the Astros at home since September. They had a series against the, the uh, Padres, September eighth, ninth, tenth, where they lost the first one eleven two, then they won seven five, then they won twelve two. That was the last series they had won at home. They lost a series to the Oakland A's, yeah. two out of three. They lost two out of three to the Royals. They lost, I'm sorry, no. Two out of three to the A's, two, two out of three to the Orioles. They were swept by the Royals. Yep. And that's and then this is the first one. And I'm not even getting into not being able to win in a postseason at home. So you got to go back. This is the first series win since uh, early September, basically September whatever it is, 8th eight, uh, eight through the 10th. It's nice to get a series win. It's nice to have a one-hitter and a no-hitter under your belt, too. Uh, absolutely. 728 ESPN. 97. A little bit of Crush City, too, by the way. Yeah. Some, right. You oh, know, a little, a little more power this year the so Astros far. The Astros are uh, – they've outscored – they've out-homered their opponents 12-6. to six. They've outscored their opponents, what, whatever it is. They've out-hit their opponents. Their starting pitching is the best in the league, it, the best ERA in the league. And they're two and five, mm-hmm. and they're two and five. That's it's so ridiculous, so ridiculous. But hopefully now, as they go home to Arlington, uh, it's going to be much better. Uh, give me the vin dot com is much better. I don't know what your options are, but give me the vin dot com is the best option for you to sell your car. Sell me, sell us your car. Give me the vin dot com. It's so easy. You can do it in your underwear. I beg you, please. Don't do it in your underwear just in case your camera is on. I don't know if you heard, but the government is watching you through your, your, your camera. So don't do it in your underwear. Put clothes on and then sell your car to John Clay Wolf. He is a guy who's going to buy it for more. He's a guy who has built up a huge, a, over a billion dollar business. Okay. It's crazy how big this thing has gotten because John Clay Wolf is really, really, really good at buying cars and then selling them at auction. He does pay. I mean, when you got a big, huge box store, what happens? You you pay less because you buy in bulk and you sell it for less. So that's the attraction to everybody to go to the big box stores. Well, that's the same attraction to go to give me the vin.com because he buys in bulk. He pays more and sells for less and, and makes less money at auction. But because he does such volume, he's got himself a huge, huge business. So if you're going to sell your vehicle, one place to go. Give me the VIN.com. That's give me the VIN.com.
for those of you who have been injured in an accident, you know, it's really, it's overwhelming. You start dealing with your car insurance stuff. You, and I'm talking about injured in an accident. You start, well, on the roadway, you deal with your car insurance. If you're at work, you have to worry about, oh my gosh, what are we going to do to pay bills? Uh, especially if you're hospitalized, those bills start to pay, to, to really uh, pile up on you. And you'll have an insurance company come in and say, don't worry about it. We'll take care of your hospital bills. That's part of this coverage because someone else's negligence caused, you know, your injury. But what they don't tell you is that the physical therapy, the surgeries, if you don't have it diagnosed right away, you're screwed. And that's a big problem for you because down the road, you're going to need physical therapy. What was your pain and suffering worth to the insurance company? I can promise you it's not worth as much to them as it is to you the person who's going through it. So if you've been hurt on the job, if you've been hurt uh, out on the roadway, really wherever, you can turn to John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm because they're going to fight for your rights. You are the one that they care about, and they're going to work for you and fight hard for you. 713-CALL-NOW is the phone number. Make sure you call. They they are bilingual. They can speak Spanish. If you have somebody that you know that needs a, a bilingual speaker, they can do that for you as well. But they are going to look out for you, and they passionately pr- pursue justice for the injured. They even do an amazing job for people who have suffered loss of life in their family due to this accident. They will get you compensated for that as well, uh, as much as they can, because that's something that you can't put a price tag on that. So 713, call now, or go to DaspitLaw.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right, welcome back. Before we get to this this fleecing that the uh, Bills did of the Texans, um, did you see the Rangers and Devils fight? It was like slap shot. Oh, it's old school? It was a slap shot. They dropped the puck, and five fights broke out all at once. They didn't even. They, they, they didn't even. The, the puck was just non-existent. As as a, five, a full on five on five, five line ball. Yeah, yeah. How how would you like to be out there? Like, oh, God, I, gotta, oh, I gotta do this. Are you well, you kidding? have to. Oh no, 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 no. And the other eight, eight of them got. So if in in the NHL, whoever declares the fight first, they don't get ejected. If you declare the fight. And wait, 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 wait. The other what? eight guys, they got ejected because they were second. They were second oh, fights in. Oh, the two guys who start. The two fight. Rempe and, yeah, it was uh, Rempe against uh, McDermott. And those those two went, you want to go? Yeah, you want to go? Yeah, we'll go. You want to go? Yeah, we'll go. Uh, and they went at it, and they didn't get ejected. The whole thing was because in the previous time that the Rangers and Devils played, uh, Rempe, who's just a goon. Just, he was fights, this to start? This the guy game? fights every single game. Was this to start the game? It's to start, yeah, the puck was dropped to start the game, and they all just started fighting. I mean, I'm watching now. Well, I've got to pause because I want to catch all the, the issues. But one guy from the Devils jumped the Ranger before the puck even dropped. Yeah, but before it, it I mean, was like, it, it yeah. was on. So everyone on the bench knew. Every, and so that's one of those things. Yeah. So we talked to a hockey. I remember being on the, your show, your TV show, talking to Moose Morissette, yeah. who was one of the fighters. Yeah, cool. And I said, how do you know you're going to fight? He goes, well, you ask the guy. You say, hey, you know, you want to go? We got to go. We got to go here. You know that. And then, you know, they they go. And I said, is it like, are you pissed off? And well, you, just no, said, no, go. no. He's like, that's my job. You know, my job is to, Racist. and that's their job. He said, so we will. You know, we we go, we fight, yeah. but he said, but you know that's uh that's just part of the job. You just tell them, and that's he said. You just say, hey, we got to go right now. And he goes, yeah, we'll go right now. So and it's like a conversation, and I'm watching everyone, and everyone on both sides knew. Just, like they knew. No, 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 no. They decided before because Rempe in the previous game threw an elbow at uh, single thalet and knocked him out, and it was a four game suspension for Rempe. He got that it was so bad that the the elbow that he threw to the jaw that he got suspended for it. So they knew going into this game, we're going. I mean, first thing, Rempe, we're going after you, and and they did, and they went after. Well, hold it. on, okay. So I'm watching the two who faced off didn't fight each other. No, no. He went and skated over. Is that Rempe? Like, he went after. That was just like slap shot too. You'll remember the one guy that skated around. I don't know if you ever saw Slapshot. It was an all time great movie. Uh, Paul Newman, 
And the guy who picked up the trophy and took off all this, did a strip tease at the end, but took off all his clothes. Oh. He hated all the fighting. He used to watch the Hanson brothers. Yeah. Remember? Who the goons? You, yeah. the, Han the, the Hanson brothers who were awesome. This was just like Slapshot. It was just like Slapshot. Just awesome. I only see two going out of the By the way, right I'm now. going uh, next Tuesday. Come Coming up, yeah, Tuesday night, I'm going to uh, uh, the Stars and the Sabres nice. in, our, in uh, Dallas. Yeah. That's your cousin, right? That's my cousin. He coaches the the, the Sabres, yeah. So we're going to go up there and watch him play. Um, Tony? No, Donnie, his brother. Don what about Tony's Rocco? Tony's fighting cancer. Tony. Uh, oh, is he really? Yeah, Tony was the head coach of Wisconsin. Then he was a uh, – he quit. He he stopped doing that, and he was a uh, Hawks, a Blackhawks announcer, and he had to quit this year because he's fighting cancer. So uh, best, of, best of luck to him. Your boy Rempy did not make out as well. Well, they don't, they they just stopped. It was that was so long through so many punches. Nobody went to the ice. The uh, referees were waiting, and finally they just wore themselves out so bad that they just broke up the fight. Mm -hmm. Usually it doesn't break up until you hit the ice, but they just kept throwing, kept firing uh, haymakers. <laughs> they tired themselves out. All right, so the Texans traded for Stefan Diggs, gave up Minnesota's second-round pick next year, and the Texans get a fifth and sixth back. They got Stefan Diggs. <laughs> they, they still have their pick and Minnesota's second-round pick this year. I mean, everybody is lauding Nick Casario for picking up. For, with the 23rd pick, you got Stefan Diggs, a second-rounder this year, and a fifth and a sixth. Everyone lauding the Houston Texans, and Nick Casario for doing this. Everyone, universally. Except, oh. except one Emmanuel Acho. Shady, I, I don't like the move, but I do think it was a smart one. I think it was real smart. It was smart to move on from Stefan Diggs because you always have to sell high. Buy low, sell high. Okay. The Bills, they bought incredibly high with Stefan Diggs. Y'all know they're paying him a premium, but then they traded him for a second-round pick? That's great math. Remember, Randy Moss at age 30 got a fourth-round pick. Stephon Diggs got a second. The Buffalo Bills know better than mm. anybody if Stephon Diggs is over the hill, if he is talent is deteriorating. The Bills know that. So if you are able to fleece the Texans for a second-round pick in the most wide receiver-heavy draft we have seen in a mighty long time, this is the time to do it. It's about six or seven first-round grade talents at the wide receiver position in this draft. So if you can move on from a $28 million a year caliber receiver in Stephon Diggs and get yourself a $2 million a year receiver or maybe a $2 million in totality of his contract receiver in a second round, that's what you have to do. Thanks. Incredibly right. good timing by the Bills. If you were going to move on, sell high because you already bought high, Joy. All right. Does he know what Randy Moss did in his 30-year-old season? Uh, yeah, well, he was on the... Well, now... Because I'll let you know. Randy Moss, after he's referencing Randy Moss going from Oakland to New England. By of the way, course, Randy he was that. a massive pain in the ass, well, which Stephon means Dix, you have no... Yeah, massive pain in you, the ass. You have no leverage when yeah, it right. happens. Fourth round pick, Randy Moss, traded to New England. 1,493 yards, 23 touchdowns. <laughs> So, I mean, I get what he's doing, but that's the wrong guy to pick when we're talking. Oh, he went for a fourth. Well, do you think the Raiders got value for that guy? So, if we're talking about people getting fleeced, the Raiders got fleeced. They traded a fourth-round pick for a guy who went for 23 touchdowns. Well, he was comparing you only no, got I, a fourth. No, I know what, I'm, yeah. what he's yeah. saying. So, you're saying you're, they know he's deteriorating. Well, the Raiders may have thought the same. Well, And look what happened to him. Is he deteriorating? That's a question. Well, he may not be the same. Well, he okay. So, so his look four at, years in Buffalo. Listen, before Buffalo, he wasn't an All Pro. With Buffalo, Josh Allen and he, beneath Josh Allen wasn't an All Pro before he got. The, it, it, it the combination was tremendous. He had fifteen hundred yards, twelve hundred yards, fourteen hundred yards, eleven hundred eighty three yards last year. He had eight touchdowns, ten touchdowns, eleven touchdowns, eight touchdowns mm -hmm. last year. Um, well, part of the reason that he is is disgruntled in Buffalo. Maybe was because he wasn't he wasn't getting the use that he had. He did have 160 targets, which was pretty close to. I mean, he had 166, 164, 154, 160 targets. His, his I mean, targets you, you are the same. Targets. targets are the same. His targets are the same. 127 catches, 103, 108, 107 catches. I mean, four he, straight years over 100 catches. Now this he guy's, had fewer yards this year. Okay, fewer, but fewer they, he also was thrown. That's what I was talking about. A lot more catch and run stuff, which. The one thing I will say is that NFL teams follow the next-gen data, and they'll go look at your speed, and it's one of the ways they determine looking at your acceleration, deceleration, looking at your top-end speed. 
they'll determine if you're losing something speed wise. I would imagine the Texans have done that and know. I mean, this this data is available to everyone. They'll know. They'll know if he's lost a step. But even if he's lost a step, Buffalo was still able to get him the ball shorter, and he still did. And you've got Nico Collins to go deep. So he was uh, the guy last year. So is there a possibility though that Acho is right in saying that he is? deteriorating and he may not be the same guy as he has yeah there's been. always that possibility what where he screwed up is using the word fleeced which is what he tried to do oh. for clout right. what he could have said everything else was okay you know they hey get rid of him now there's a deep wide receiver draft you get a second round pick all that stuff's great now what he probably doesn't realize is it's next year second so uh you didn't get the second from the texans uh this which, year but maybe, you got it next year well you Maybe should have given up your own. Again, Buffalo, a, that's the question. Minnesota might be picking pretty high. Buff, well, the the pick they got was Buffalo's. I mean, he's got to be talking about Buffalo addressing the wide receiver with their pick. I got to see if they have a second round pick, but they don't get one from the Texans in 2025. No. They're getting, they have their own. Yeah, it's a deep wide receiver draft, but Buffalo drafts late in a second, unless they had a trade yeah. they're drafting earlier. But the other thing was to say, fleeced, look, you gave up a second, but you also got a fifth and a sixth back. What that amounts to is a third-round pick. So the Texans, from a trade value standpoint, gave up what amounts to a third, like an early third-round pick is what it amounts to after you kick in the trade chart value. It was a good it was a good deal for the Texans, and, and it was one that Buffalo had to make. He became too big a pain in the ass. If, if you have all the leverage, okay, Justin Fields went for a sixth that could move to a fourth. Justin wasn't a pain in the ass. But the Bears told everybody, we're going to do right by Justin. Okay, where do you want to go, Justin? Pittsburgh. Well, you don't have any leverage now. Pittsburgh knows it's us or nobody. Yeah, is, is this trade comparable in any way to D-Hop? To the trade the Texans yes. made? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. Is. Now, yeah, because D-Hop, D-Hop was still a very, very good wide receiver, but he was on he was starting a trend towards the back end a little bit. Well, and he had good years there. I think still. it's very similar. And so the number so Bill O'Brien was this is but you know what? We clown Bill O'Brien, rightfully so. They took on a bad contract with that made it worse, David Johnson's contract. But that was the problem. But the difference was Houston didn't have to like that was not a, a leverage no, issue. The, Houston and, had and, leverage. And I think yeah, that's the problem. Is the Bills just wanted to get that pain in the ass out of there? Yeah, that's a, that's and you remember a, the the one that we compared the D Hop trade to was Stephon Diggs because yeah. Diggs brought back the yeah. first round. That yeah. was the comparison. Is you screwed this up? You didn't get a first, and Stephon Diggs did. Do you even know about new money? Do you even know about new money? New money, Bill. You should have got. You, you mean first. like Laramie Tunsil? And you I mean said, like Laramie Tunsil that then you gave I up said, four, two first rounders and, and, for? Exactly. And the, exactly. Exactly. He didn't like that, by the way, either. And then I said, yeah, but why take on that running back contract? Oh, Whoa. why are you so mad? <laughs> All right. 703 780 3776, the number to hang with us here. Come on. What do you think of the trade? What do you think? Your Astros won. The Texans won yesterday. We had, we're a winning city again. I mean, it turned in a hurry yesterday. We got a big game tonight, too. Oh, my God. We got a huge game tonight. We can talk about that too on the other side. Let's go to give me the vin and uh, let's go to uh Artisan Grange right now. Let's talk about your dipping habit. It's gross. You are and I, you're sitting in the car right now. You're sitting in the car right now and you know who you are. You just texted me a little while ago. You play golf and you sit in that car, okay? And you know I'm talking to you right now. You dip and it's gross. So stop it, okay? Stop it. Stop with the dip. Stop with the grossness. Your teeth are are, are awful. You're, 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 you got spittle all over yourself. It's not cool, okay? Stop trying to be cool or something. It's not cool to dip. So what you do, you get yourself off of it. You clean. Do it in a clean way. You know how you do it cleanly? With uh, Artisan Grange. You do it with the Canstead and the Dublin. Hemp in a pouch made of hemp, but you still get the flavor that you're looking for. You still have the sensation between your cheek and gum, right? So here's the deal. You're looking to wean yourself off that nicotine and tobacco, which is killing you. Do it with CBD oil that's helping you, okay? CBD American Shaman has them in their stores because what? Because it's good, and they love it. You're looking to, for a great way to get off that dip, 975dip.com, 975dip.com.
Hey, Zadig Jewelers, they're the gold standard of jewelry here in Houston, the state of Texas. No pun intended, but you can take the pun if you'd like. 28,000 square foot, two-level store, and they have the largest selection of designer fine jewelry and luxury watches in Houston. People come from all over the state to shop there. For engagement rings, for example, you know, they have a carefully curated selection of necklaces, earrings, rings, bracelet from all the top brands. But they also have a bridal center upstairs where you and your and your uh, fiance or your girlfriend can take a look at some of these some of these rings and make a decision on what is going to look great. It's an incredible opportunity for you to experience luxury and to experience the best rings that you are going to find here in the Houston area. Maybe you have an older one that is from uh, a keepsake from uh, your mother or, or her mother or her grandmother, they can take that, they can refurbish and turn it into a brand new ring. There's nothing they can't do there at Zadig Jewelers. It's 1801 Post Oak Boulevard. Visit Zadig Jewelers today. You can shop online at Zadig.com. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. All right, 750 ESPN, 97.5 and 92.5, someone, 3780, 3776 is the number. Let's get – come on. I need you guys. I mean, you are so – they've been so lazy the last uh, honestly, couple days. Honestly, yeah. honestly, a no-hitter, you've got a no-hitter that is thrown, a one-hitter, then you got – the Texans trading for um, trading for Stephon Diggs. I want to hear from Texans fans right now about your excitement level. This is you don't have to let us just do all the talking. 713-780-3776. Legitimately, and I said this before they even made free agent moves because I knew they had a lot of money to spend and they had draft picks. I really felt like the Texans were going to be a serious contender and threat for the for the Chiefs this year. Now, after free agency, I feel actually stronger about that. Last year, at this exact time, the odds of the Texans winning a world, uh, winning a Super Bowl, were two thousand to one. They were plus twenty thousand dollars to win a Super Bowl, the longest shot on the board. There were two teams that were like that. This year, right now, they are ten to one. Ten to one. Ten to one. Ten to one. It's incredible. In one year, Pat McAfee was put put it. I said, listen, a year and a half ago, it was the worst organization in football. <laughs> It was garbage. Mm-hmm. They had there was, there was no hope. the 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 wide receiver room was considered them them and the Titans and the Titans were considered the worst yeah. wide receiver rooms in the NFL. We went through that. Yes, we went through that because there was no tank. It Dell. was garbage. The organization was garbage. You didn't have the first pick, which everyone. A lot of people are, are acting like you know what what was the big deal? Why were all you people liking B- Bryce Young instead of C.J. Stroud? The whole city almost caught fire when Bryce Young was not going to be the right. pick and and the Texans won their last game. That's a rewriting of history that people are well, acting like. Not only that, that Davis Mills play that won that Colts game. Can you thank him? Changed. I mean, while everybody was, Ugh! the next day I was like, it's one pick, everybody. What the what do you and now little and then I was like, Ugh, I wish we had Bryce Young. I wish we had Bryce Young. Well, no, I all admit of us, it. I admit it. All I was, of us did. I thought, yeah. All of it, it, all that. of us in Houston. Yeah, I know. There's a couple stragglers out yeah, there, but oh no, CJ, realistically, CJ, yeah, bro, that completion is the butterfly effect. Yeah. Where can you imagine that one completion in the play for Davis Mills to extend? He should get an extension just for extending that play. And he changed and the, the touch, organization. It changed the, the whole trajectory of, of the organization. Oh. Now they would have drafted Will. They probably would have drafted Will Anderson, and then I don't know what they would have done at quarterback. Maybe waited until this year. But oh, Will no, Anderson. They would have drafted Bryce Young. Uh, you oh mean? no! If they got the first pick, yeah, yeah. yeah. they would have drafted Bryce Young. Yeah, yeah. And drafted. I got that. I got that confirmed. Yes. From somebody yes. who knows the owner, it, yes. Bryce Young would have been the guy. Yes. Bryce Young would have been the guy. And he would have actually been pretty good. No, he would have been okay. I mean, but it wouldn't be what it is today. Everybody wants to play with CJ. I mean, everybody wants to sit in a hot tub with CJ, right? And maybe they drafted Tank. Remember CJ Stroud? The little guy, the comedian, he did it. Right? <laughs> I don't know if everybody well, does, it was, but, it was Kevin Hart. Hart. It was actually Kevin Hart tub. did. Kevin Hart? Kevin Hart. Yes. Yeah, and it's cold But tub. CJ is the one who pushed hard for Tank Dell, right? Yes. On well, they were their boys. Allegedly, CJ said, will you dra- would draft him. Well, maybe that had an impact. Maybe. 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 Uncle Ted wants to get in here and talk about the Texans. Hey, Uncle Ted. 
Hey, what's up, fellas? How y'all doing? Good, man. We're good. So I got I have to say that as much credit as we're giving Nick Casario, we have to throw Zabico in there. Zabico and Bobby are changing the culture there. Never have I ever, and I'm a Cowboys fan, never have I ever seen the Texans in national news for anything good. <laughs> for off season moves is what I'm saying. Like no. when have you ever seen them never this many decisions good? Never, right? Never. Like, this is the first never time. You can't oh, yeah, think of one. The Texans are the envy of other organizations now, which is insane to think of. People are buying Cal McNair shirts. Cal McNair <laughs> is a celebrity <laughs> around town. The, the the turnaround for this organization, and it's specifically Cal, is one of the most amazing turnarounds. They couldn't post social media posts. In, in No, because everybody said sell the team, dumpster fire, all of this stuff. They could not jack Easterby. All of, the turnaround has been the most remarkable turnaround in, I can remember. Honestly, do we know of an organization that has gone from the 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 doldrums, as the crap that the Texans were just a year and a half ago, to what they are today? It's amazing. It's amazing what they've done. Um, who who's gone? Diggs. It's, okay, so here's the wide receiver room: Diggs, Nico, Tank, Woods, Brown, Mechie, Hutchinson. Who's gone? Woods? Uh, I think Mechie is going to be one because Diggs can play in the slot too. So I think Mechie's going to have a hard time making a team. Sucks because he was a second, but whatever. I think Mechie and well, potentially but, Woods, yeah. Brown's here. He just had a $5 million. Something, I mean, you got a lot four of it is guaranteed. You got is, four, four of the clear wide Woods? receivers. Should it be? It should be Woods. Yeah. I don't, but... I. I think maybe both years are guaranteed. That's all right. I mean, and you're he's gonna a take, veteran. You're going to take an L here. He's a veteran. I don't maybe know. Maybe it's Hutchinson. It could be Hutchinson. He's not a. Put him on the. He's gonna, a big guy. No, I mean, Hutchinson's cheap. Would somebody grab him off the practice squad? Hutchinson? Yeah. Um. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. Mechie? Well, let him fight for it. I think Mechie's got a hard job because he doesn't. He's not an outside receiver. He's a slot Tank and Stephon Diggs can both play the slot. Mechie's not a big separator. Like, I don't know what Mechie... Mechie's just kind of a guy, unfortunately. Um, wanted him to be more, but I kind of thought they overdrafted him. I thought he was, you know, more like a, a late third-round pick. He's solid. He can make it on another team, but he's just... I don't know if the Texans want to keep a guy who's just... He's not a special teams player either. Xavier Hutchinson, I think, plays special teams, so... That's going to be critical, too. Which one of these guys, these wide receivers at the back end? Because Noah Brown's making it. So, if you're a fifth receiver, do you play special teams? Because if the answer is you don't play special teams, you're, 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 yeah. you may have a hard time making it. Yep, you may be out. 757, we got a full board filling up right now. 713-780-3776. So, we will get you all in. And let's go. 713, you got to be excited about this. Everybody yesterday, I saw everybody, digs, 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 digs. This is this is huge. This is awesome. The Texans have as many and better, maybe the best weapons in the NFL. Maybe the best weapons in the NFL now. Let's go. 713-780-3776. First, I'm talking about my peeps over at Chastain Ford. Chastain Ford is where you get your, your – I, I love Chastain Ford. You will love Chastain Ford too because Chastain Ford is going to give you the best deal without – they are not going to add on. They're not going to mark up. There's so much more though, right? You can also uh, get $20 off the works oil change when you come in on Saturdays, okay? The works package is $79.95, recommended every 5,000 miles. Oil change entire rotation includes six quarts of motorcraft, uh, tire, gas, taxes, disposal, some non-Ford taxes, a synthetic motor blend. Um, you got the tire rotation, gas engines only, taxes and disposal not, not included. Some non-Ford vehicles uh, are going to be higher. Taxes and disposal of extra. Uh, you are getting a great, great deal. And twenty dollars off the seventy nine ninety five works package. So you're looking for a great way to keep maintain your car. The service department at Chastain Ford is second to none. You are going to love it. 
it, 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 they also have uh, where they'll come to you. If you've got a fleet of vehicles, they can come and f- fix your vehicles on site where you are. You don't have to bring them in. You don't have to tow them in. They'll go to you, okay? But here's the deal. You're not going to get better service than anybody than Chastain Ford. Love them. You'll love them, too. Join the Chastain family on 610 at Homestead, not Hempstead, five minutes from downtown Chastain Ford. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. <laughs> All right, let's go. I told you, get in. We want you and to you to talk about this. What do you think? It's 713-780-3776. Pena, what you think? Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, so, man, that, that auto guy is tripping. I don't know what he's on. He's tripping. He, he's definitely trying to get the clicks. He's he, he's he's picking out of his out of his rear end. Uh, I think I think Stephon Diggs got the good three to four years, and I'm still to put up some really good solid numbers. And that's what I have about that. But hey, I got one more thing to say, Dale. You really earned my respect yesterday at the end of the show, man. You, you are a true man of the people. You you like to get hugs from from, from listeners at at at, at, at events. You help old ladies out, and, and you and you broke the good news. You, you weren't selfish. Keep it to, to yourself, uh, man. Respect, dog. Have a good day. Hold on. What is you? How did? Thank how did you. He get what did you do? Because I I didn't wait for the next show, which would be mine, to go. Oh, by the way, we got breaking news. That's how you're keeping people there through the break. You're like, hey, also guys, uh, Stefan Diggs, and that's your way of saying so. Keep it here. I just want to point out when I made the announcement on this show, instead of saving it, you know what? An awful person like Lance did. Coming up, the next show is going to talk about college basketball. That's because he's a bad person. And you know why I'm a good person? I'll, you know who else is coming today? Big Chicken at 1030. So if you want food, Lance, instead of heading joking. out. Oh, all of a sudden, I'm all of a sudden not so I'm not so bad, right? Cause no, I'm, I never thought you I were bad. Let you walk, I was just wondering why you're a hero. I could have let you walk out of here yeah, without getting food. I was just wondering food. why you're a hero. That's no. What's the deal? What's big, happening? Big at Chicken's 10, coming. At, ter- at 1030, Big that's Chicken's place. Big dropping chicken. food off. 
for, well, would be for my show, but I'm letting him know so he doesn't head out of here and he's got lunch, free lunch if he wants to hang yeah, around. Chicken. Well, I want big chicken. Well, I'm telling okay, you too. Are you sticking around a half hour for your show? It's not for my show. It's for the food, weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> Go work on some I, offensive I linemen. Do. You you hang around a lot. Yeah, because I got a write-up player. So well, I he might, I'm on like my last 50. If you were planning to leave, maybe hang on. I'm not leaving now. There you go. So stop calling me a terrible person. Pollo grande. Oh. Pollo grande. Oh. Let's, right, let's get uh, Alan in here. Alan, what you think, bro? Yo, yo, what's up? Good morning, ESPN Houston, baby, man. Look, man, I've been a season ticket holder since 2017. I'm an excited Texas fan. I've been through the ups and the downs. When we drafted Deshaun Watson, I thought we were going to never have a great quarterback like Deshaun. TJ going to be five to ten times better. You know, Bill O'Brien, I thought ruined the Texans forever with the stupid trades, trading D-Hop, you know, picking up Larry Song for bad contract, the Whitney Merciless contract, all the bad. Shout out to Nick Casario. I believe in Nick, and Nick we trust. In two and a half, three years, he done rebuilt, revamped, got some real good deals. Look what he's doing in free agency. Look what he's doing, you know, in the future as well. Hopefully down the line we extend Nico. And one more one more last thing, I hope, with the little bit of money we have left in cap, we need to go get a safety in like Justin Simmons. I'll let Woods go. Draft another receiver and probably get clear as Campbell. Go Texas, baby. We going to the Super Bowl, baby. We going to the Super Bowl, baby. Let him cook. I love it. You that's now that's what I wanted to hear. That's how Houston should be feeling. It looks like you're contemplating something, John. What are you thinking? No, I I, I like I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I I think that I, I am excited about this. But I'm you're I'm, not as excited as he was. No, I've got a little I've got a little regret that I spent all that money all those years on my season tickets and my and my um, what I PSL PSL <laughs> and I don't have it anymore. <laughs> My boy, Uncle Freddie, but, but was- and your guy, Uncle Freddie, somebody gave him a PSL. He sold the season tickets. He was out after being in for all those years. Yeah. And somebody goes, hey, my company just wants to get rid of them. They'll give yeah. you the PSL for club seats. He's like, okay. And he said, I just lucked into it. I, yeah, I now I wish. Now, I don't know if I'd go to all the games anyway. I like going there yeah, and everything. Yeah, you sell them and pay but, for your season but tickets. It, yeah, you absolutely could. It's finally, finally, after 20 two years it would finally pay off to be a texan season ticket holder even during their best years 12 and 13 whatever 11 and 12 it was meh, it was okay this is the most exciting i was worried and i'm not worried anymore that there might be a sophomore slump for cj with these weapons how it, well, with, yeah. it, because we no, 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 catch yes. up. But now, how? How? Now, how? now. Now, I don't see how. How now, Somebody, Tank is going to be happen. open, or Schultz is going to be open, or Mixon's going to be open, or Nico's going to be open, or Diggs is going to be I'm open. I'm going to say something that won't be popular, probably. Go Draft ahead. an offensive lineman. Within your, with, the, with your first three picks somewhere... Draft an offensive line. The only thing that could hurt you is if your O line goes to crap. Yeah. So you have Charlie Heck back as a swing tackle. I'm I might be drafting another tackle. I might be drafting another tackle. I might be drafting another interior player. Because if Kenyon Green can't get it done, you got Ju Scruggs at center. Who's the other guard? You know, I, I may draft I may draft a guy to compete for a starting guard spot. I really might. Because I don't think Patterson, I don't think the Texans want it to be Patterson and then Scruggs. They want Juice at center, and they'd love for Kenyon to, you know, play and play well. But if that doesn't happen, you have be nice. Kendrick Green, um, no, two Scruggs. Kendrick got- Green, who is it? No, who is it from? Uh, from the Steelers. Oh, well, it's Kendrick Green. Yeah, it is Kendrick Green. Yeah, yeah. center guard, but he's a little undersized. Uh, but they like them. They like what they back. saw. You got. Yeah, you've got guys, but those guys didn't play I think I might. Well I think I year. might go get a. I might go get a dude. I might go get a dude in the third round at guard that I think can. Is Titus Howard going to be good at right tackle? See, yes, yes. I guess. Well, listen, I think. Got, I guess. I think. Listen. Why do you say that? What have you seen that you say, man? He's be, good because I think the because here's the deal: is teams are going to have to be a lot more hesitant about going after CJ right now. They're going to have to keep more guys back. Listen, 
if the Texans were playing the Texans offense right now, the Texans defense were playing, they would get dominated because they don't have any on, on the other side. They don't have anybody that can cover two guys. They got Stingley on one side and basically nothing. There's going to be a lot of teams that cannot keep up with the Texans defensively with their cornerbacks. Yeah. And CJ is going to hit them quick in stride. And you're not going to be able to tee off. I think Titus Howard. They're all. This whole offense is going to be benefiting from the Stephon Diggs trade because there's going to be a lot of quick hitting stuff that you they're, they're, you're just not going to be able to get to the quarterback because one guy is going to be able to get open in a hurry. Teams don't have three de- really really good defensive backs that can keep up with these guys. They just don't. I know the Texans don't. And unless you are an elite defense, you ain't going to have it either. So I think I think they just help themselves well, on the offensive who are they line gonna as be, well. Who are they going to be facing on the way to a potential Super Bowl? Elite defenses. And the mm-hmm. Texans gave up 47 sacks last year. Hopefully that that improves. wasn't wasn't great. And you kept saying this guy's going to be open. This guy's going to open. Well, as you pointed out, I feel like you could be saying that about teams facing the Texans. Yeah. Because I'm not sure, sure who they're going to yeah. cover. No. Who's going to be able yeah, to cover corners, anyone? Corners got to be corners a, a, a priority. priority. That's why they got to get a corner and a safety in this draft as well. Uh-huh. They do. Uh, well, wide receivers off the – I mean, you can go get one at some point, but that is no longer – No longer a need. That is no, no longer an you issue. You got no room for them. You got defensive, you got defensive tackle, corner, safety, and to me, interior offensive hey, line. Hey, listen, Noah Brown's going to make a bit of a contribution this year too. I, you, you got a well. You got. God, it's let me draft today this year for you, Nick. Just let me draft for you. I know the guys you need. Michael wants to talk about Dick. I'm going to hey, see Michael. if he'll let me. <laughs> hey, hey, what's up, fellas? Uh, neck tats. Texans neck tats just went up in the city, baby. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, Lance, you kind of answered my question about the wide receiver. Like, if any one of those stud receivers drops to the second round, grab that dude. But. Uh, I follow me with this, guys. I think C.J. Stroud is like good enough, and people like him enough because he's he's from California too. I think he's finally we're finally going to get Texans fans that don't live in Houston. You know, like the Cowboys fans. Like there's Cowboys fans in Maryland. You know, which is insane. But you know, once we start winning, uh, I think you know you know what I mean. I, I finally think our our fan base is going to actually grow because we'll be like a bandwagon team, which I'm which I'm fine with. What do you yeah. guys think? So, so yeah, it happened with the Astros. So for whatever reason. This this trade somehow affected the Dallas Cowboys. Robert Griffin III went after the the, the Cowboys after this trade. Because they didn't do anything. He said they're like this is exactly what the Cowboys should he be doing. He probably grew, and you know, the he's Texans from, are doing it. He's from Waco. He probably grew up a Cowboys. Probably fan, a Warren Sharp put this out for whatever reason out of nowhere. He just put out time to face reality. Teams in Texas, Cowboys versus Texans since 2010, winning seasons. Texans 8, Cowboys 7. Trips to playoffs, Texans 7, Cowboys 6. Playoff wins, Texans 5, Cowboys 3. Just out of nowhere. The Texans are dominating the co- the Cowboys in this state. Honestly, the Texans have a chance. They have a chance to be a really, really, to gain a lot of popularity in this state. They really do. They're making headlines. You think there's a... That they, as opposed to the headlines they had been making... It, with with the, the the garbage that this organization was, now they're making they're making tremendous headlines. You think there are football NFL fans up for grabs in this state? Well, no, no, but the the uh, bandwagon, like younger the fans, the star power of this team is going to no. CJ Stroud yeah. is going to absolutely pull in. CJ Stroud, Tank Dell, yes. There's the young fans. They don't just cheer for teams; they cheer for players. It's different than when we grew up, and so I think. We saw a lot of people wearing Astros hats after 17, a lot. Now, it slowed way down after the trash can stuff came out. But the Astros became kind of a hot team for a lot of people to follow and wear Astros hats. Oh, no, the Texans have cool now. They've got they've got a chance to win at a high level. They've got, you know, what's the dance that he does that um, the C.J. Stroud does with Tank? What's it called? I don't know. Oh, you were doing it. You were trying to do it. I was just do doing it. it. Oh, it's I don't a squabble. Know what it's the squabble. Oh, the squabble. Squabble. So he's got a little dance. He, you got a quarterback who does a little dance. Joe Burrow doesn't do dances. No, Joe Josh Burrow. Josh Allen doesn't do dances. I don't even think Lamar does dances. No, Lamar just beats you to the tune yeah, of like he did. 59 or whatever You know the what they didn't do was. against the Ravens last year? Do a lot of dancing. Dancing. You know well, why I'm they go- didn't score any touchdowns? No tank. Yeah. He was there well, for he the, was first, there the game. first game. Not CJ. For, 
first of all, Baltimore does not even. Um, the Ravens do not want to see the Texans. As a matter of fact, if you see the Texans, just take the week off. Take the week off, boys. I don't. It ain't gonna be a good week for you. They will see them this year. They good. will. I know good. the Texans have improved good. In, uh, quite a bit. Texans are the favorite in the AFC. But now. the way the Ravens beat no, you, I don't really. the way the Ravens beat you and beat everyone, I'm not sure the Texans. You mean have, the team that was losing to the Texans at halftime in playoff uh, game? And what happened then? At home with no tank when how, it was six degrees. How did it go after after half? Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. That's, it it kind of does. So the Texans have improved, and I'm with you. They got a shot to be the second favorite. But the way the Ravens beat teams, I don't think the Texans have improved there. The physicality that the Texans, I mean, that the Ravens bring to the table, that they try to bully you, I'm not sure that the Texans have made upgrades there. That's what I'm concerned with, the interior of the offensive line yeah. and, and at defensive tackle. I would, I would, I'm telling you, offensive line probably should be one of the first three picks because the only thing that could really short-circuit you now, well, the one thing that could really short-circuit you is coverage. So, yes, a, a cornerback, more competition for Jeff Okuda and who was the other corner that they added? Mike Ford, but he's special teams. Who's the other corner they added for like $4 million? Oh, oh, C.J. C.J. Hender- C. Henderson. Henderson. More competition is needed for Henderson and Akuda. Another corner is absolutely needed. Miles I believe Bryant. a safety is needed because DeAndre Houston Carson, that Carson Houston, or is it Houston Carson? That was, I'm Whatever. glad he stepped in and did an admirable job. It ain't good enough. Yep. Because right. Jimmy Ward, we don't know if he can stay healthy. No, we need a safety. Someone three, I mean, listen. What they've done this offseason, what they've addressed, no team has gotten a 10-plus sack guy, a 1,000-yard rusher, and a 1,000-yard receiver. No team's ever done what the Texans have done, ever. So they've gotten all three of those, and no team has ever put together an offseason where they've picked up those those types of players. So big ups to what they're doing right now, and it's got us excited. Chris, Justin and Chris, we'll get you guys on the other side. Right now I'm talking about Houston safe and locked. You have today and tomorrow to go to Houston Safe and Lock or King Safe and Lock, which is at uh, uh, I-10 and Wirt, or Houston Safe and Lock, which is at uh, Westheimer and the Beltway. Buy a new safe. Buy a new safe from Derek. Tell him you heard it right here. Buy a new safe. Pick the winner of Monday night's game, okay? That's the national championship ba- basketball. Pick the winner of that game and, and before before. They start the final four starts on a Saturday, and you get half off on that safe. So if you're in the market for a safe, you need a safe, you need a gun safe, you need a, a safe for your business, you need this is the time to buy. I know who I would pick. I don't know who you're going to pick. Probably, hopefully, be a pretty good game. But there's one team that's blowing everybody else out. So there's a good chance. I mean, the odds are with you if you pick a certain team that you're going to get fifty percent off on your safe. Okay, and then you root for that team. Otherwise, it's a business expense, and you need it to save anyway. But if you want 50% off, pick the winner of that game and buy a new safe from Houston Safe and Lock. Go to 975safe.com, 975safe.com.
You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. The Athletic is who actually won. Here's the headline. Who actually won the Stefan Diggs trade? And the point being is the Texans are getting a superstar in Stefan Diggs with CJ, with all of the other weapons that they have, but yet the drama that Diggs brings. It sure would be. I, I, is there a chance that he is actually going to be satisfied that he is actually going to be? Look, he's got the quarterback. He's got the weapons. I mean, hopefully they win at a high level because that's what he wants to do as well. He's I, on the cool team, John. I, I don't t- – look, living in, you mentioned this before, and I agree with this. Living in Houston over Buffalo is a big deal for a guy who – You know, for a receiver type who likes to shine a little bit. It's a lot better lifestyle. Number two, he's on the cool team. The Texans, believe it or not, are the cool team in the league. Number three, this is now his third team, and he's been considered uh, a malcontent at his other two stops. At some point, I think you become aware of what people think of you and who you are, and I think that could play into it. Now, is it going to let? It didn't last forever with Randy. Randy Moss eventually – Randy Moss eventually – got himself out of three different teams. That's just that's just a fact. It happened with the Vikings. It happened with the Raiders. It ended up happening with the uh, Patriots. You probably get to a breaking point at some time with with Diggs, but I don't think it's I don't think it's for the first two years. The Athletic gave the Bills a B minus, and they gave the Texans an A minus, and the and the Bills a B minus for the trade. Diggs' production deteriorated along the way. He didn't tally a 100-yard game after week six and topped six catches just three times in that final stretch of 13 games, including the playoffs. He totaled 24 receptions, 214 yards, and no touchdowns as the Bills closed the regular season with a five-game winning streak, which coincided with uh, Josh Allen rocketing himself into the MVP race. He, he maybe, maybe, maybe the Bills think that he it, his deteriorate. And you know what? They got rid of a pain in the ass. Maybe he's going to be a great citizen here. Maybe he's going to be. Well, they had to do it. The Bills had to do that. Yeah, The Bills I, they almost did because there was yet another post yesterday or the day before where Stefan Diggs, somebody was asking whether or not. RG3 said. He needed, whether or not Josh Allen needed an elite receiver. And 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 Stefan Diggs said, you sure? A no, rant- R- RG3 said, he Josh Allen, some guys need Josh Allen doesn't. Have yeah. to have that, and he goes, "You sure about Not, that?" Someone quote tweeted that particular yeah. video or statement and said he was essential but not needed. And, and Stefan Diggs, "You sure you about sure? that?" Pretty much. You sure? Um, yeah. Well, no. Every wide receiver. Look, the big comment for Lamar Jackson was he didn't have enough weapons. Not enough weapons. Josh Allen's in trouble now because if you look at who they have, they lost Gabe Davis, which they don't really care about. That they picked up um, Curtis Samuel. Curtis Samuel. That's okay. But they're they're not in good shape wide receiver wise. They've that twenty fifth pick now almost has to be yeah. a wide receiver, and yeah. it's not a great spot because Brian <laughs> Thomas is going to be gone. You're going to be looking at Xavier Worthy, is, Ad Mitchell. Is he going to get Aaron Rodgers? Where Maybe, Aaron Rodgers for years couldn't get them to take a wide receiver high. Uh, Josh, no, because that was a fundamental. To this day, they do not believe fundamentally in drafting wide receivers in the first round. Yeah. So they, 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 don't, they don't do it as an organization. Green Bay doesn't do it. Uh, they traded a first for Stephon Diggs. I think they – Brandon Bean knows we got to have a really good target for him. Yep. Let's get uh, Chris in here. He's been waiting. Hey, Chris. Hey, what's up, guys? Love the show. Uh, Lance, I actually really agree with you on the lineman, the lineman pick for the Texans. And here's why, John, maybe a question for you. So if you're a defensive coordinator – do you want to sit back and try to guard everybody and let TJ just have his time? Cause that was what you said a minute ago, or do you want to put pressure on TJ? And my opinion would be to put pressure on TJ and concede to the under route and hope a mistake happens and you get a two or three yard gain. If you sit back and try to let TJ just have time, he's going to pick us apart. So I think we go offensive lineman to give TJ time because of tank speed, Nico, I think that's a smart move. So I, I disagree a little bit, John, in the whole, sit-back approach, and I, and I go with Lance and give us some upfront protection. If TJ's got all the time in the world, 
I like our chances to go all the way. Still Texans take that. Well, let's not forget. I mean, the Texans have put quite a bit. I mean, they made Tunsil. They did the contract with Tunsil. They just did a huge contract with Titus. They do, uh, used the first one, rounder on Kenyon Green. Juice Scruggs, a uh, second rounder. Um, they they also drafted Patterson. They traded for um, the right guard. Um, Shaq Mason. Shaq Mason. Well, I mean, they, they put quite trade? a bit into the – now, here's a deal. How about that this happens? How about Kenyon Green is actually good? How about if that happened? So we had that happen with Derek Stingley. Um, now, Derek Stingley was less a case of looked bad on the field. It was more like just can't stay on the field. Kenyon looked bad on the field. Kenyon looked it's, really This bad. is a little bit more of a long shot that he comes back and looks good. But if it happens, oh, my God, it's like you just had another hit in free agency. Yeah. That's what it will feel it like. It basically would be because he wasn't there all last year. I'm Here's- not hopeful, but I'm hopeful. Yeah. If that makes sense. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm hoping it happens. And, oh, by the way, the threat of a run game now, as opposed to what you've had the last few years with the addition of Joe Mixon, I, it, it that, 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 that will also deter a pass rush. Because now i got to stay in my lane. And i got Joe Mixon coming at me as opposed to, you know, going all out for C.J., not only do I have to cover three or four or even five guys with Mixon coming out of the backfield, not only do I have to do that, but I've got to worry about Mixon picking up big chunks of yardage on me running the football now. I, it, this Texans offense, you're right, Bobby, Bobby Sloak is here. I, I didn't think he was going to be here this year. It's a big plus that Bobby Sloak is back this year. Bobby Sloak is going to be the guy, especially after what um, – Detroit, he pulled what what he pulled when he they were coming to see him on a plane, and he just said on their way, he said, "I ain't in interviewing with you." Hmm. Uh, ben Johnson, yeah, Ben Johnson, Ben with Johnson, Cleveland. yeah. With Ben's going to be a hot name, uh, but Ben and you know, and, and obviously Bobby is going to be huge, yeah. especially if they play like he's supposed to play. But um, Bobby Bobby Slowick won't be here to, in, at this time no, next no, year. No, 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 no. They there's just too no. much. There's just too great a chance that they're going to win it. They're going to be level. good. They're going to be great. And and the the hottest coordinator and you, and the offensive coordinator that that's in. Such it'll be a demand. team that needs a quarterback. You know, because a team that needs a quarterback is going to say, okay, we're getting quarterback head coach at the same time. And look, I think it's going to be Ben and Bobby are the two guys. And that look what the Texans look at. did with that. We got the head coach and the and the coordinator. And the quarterback, and the defensive end, and the everything that the Texans have done. Holy crap! This is this is so much fun now, as opposed to the crap that it's been over these last few years. Time to talk about and talk about good. Talk about great. Free rain coffee, R E I N. It's free. R E I N. Free rain coffee. Free rain coffee is the best coffee that I've ever had. I, I, and listen. I'm, I haven't been. I can't say that I've always been. Oh, I love my coffee every morning. I don't. I haven't. I do now. I love my coffee every morning, and it's because of Free Rain. It's because of Cole Hauser. It's because Rip from Yellowstone. Okay, born in San Angelo, Texas, the roastery has been fueling folks to get up and get after it for over 25 years. This is not. This is not some new out of the nowhere. They, they've been doing this, okay? Now, you might have heard, be hearing about it for the first time because it's the first time that they're advertising here in the city of Houston. But it's it, it, uh, they, they're, they love people who serve as well. Proud to serve the country, the community, military veterans, first responders, nurses, teachers. Check out uh, 975coffee.com and get yourself a discount of 20% by putting in pr- promo code ESPN20. It's fantastic coffee. If you're somebody who drinks coffee every morning, try it. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. 975coffee.com. Use promo code ESPN20.
You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. Look at the ball. <laughs> That's in Taiwan. The, the oh. earthquake. Holy crap. That's the dash crazy. cam. Yeah. Boulders are flying down. That was And this this guy's scary. backing up like that's a video game it yeah. looks like. Yeah. Uh 713-780-3776. Get in here and let's talk about these Texans or whatever else you want to talk or about. Or Astros. Or Astros. Or Rockets tonight. Uh just 3 games separate the Rockets from the play in. Well, four games, really, because the t- they lose the tiebreaker. This is pretty much the, I mean, every game's the most important, but this one's extre- this has extremely been, important. Okay, the na- the last time they've had a game that's been this important, no. three years ago. Uh, I would say. James Harden left. I would say recently they had one because you're still playing towards not that goal. Not this important, though. This is the team you're, you're chasing. Well, yeah, but this is also, even if you win it, it may not matter. Yeah. That's why no, I, right, right, I, right. I kind of, not sure I'm in on that because if, if uh, yeah, it'd be an issue. Look at Austin. Well, I'll let you see Austin Reeves in a second. He's doing a live shot from home, a TV shot, and he's got some window shade open, and the light is blasting him in the in the hair. You'll see oh, it in I a see second. It, yeah. yeah, it's not. He did not. It his, looks like he's pro- got something gold or something. Well, his... it looks like he's got the yeah. It looks like he's got the Dennis Schroeder. Yeah, but he does. Up? That's kind of a weird thing for a producer <laughs> not to say. Hey, can hey, you can, cover yeah. that up? Right. Uh, let's get Greg in here. Let's talk about his Texans. Anybody else? Someone three seven eight oh three seven seven six. Hey, what's up, John? LZ, how's it going, guys? What's going, going on? What are we doing? Hey, listen, I just wanted to chime in real quick. Been listening to you guys for a long time, but <laughs> you guys said something a few times last year, and I get it about Kenyon Green. You know, didn't have the greatest year. But I just want to let you guys know, man. I've been around that kid for quite some time. I've had the privilege. My kid played with them for from. Little league on through high school. The kid's got a good surround system, uh, you know, support system. He's got a good head on his shoulders. Any work that kid needs to be doing, trust me, man, he's doing it. So don't forget, guys, remember that that uh, post Jalen made where he was like, yeah, I don't forget, stay on that side. That's going to be Kenyon Green next guy, next year, guys. I hope, he has, yeah, I hope he has that kind of year. I mean, I hope he has a stay on that side, but – the fact is, people are waiting for him to play. He's the first round. They're waiting for him to play well. I don't think that's – this has been two years now. I don't want him. He didn't play one of – look, we're all cheering for him to do well. No one's cheering against Kenyon Green. Right now, there's not a lot to bank on. There is not a lot of I, – I, 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 we should be – hopefully, I'll be optimistic about it. But there really wasn't that much to be gleaned from that 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 he w- is going to be good. He was bad. He was bad. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, he's going to be much better. But you know what? Guys get coached up. Guys get better. His second year, a rookie, he made a lot of rookie. But some of it was physically he wasn't good enough. Mm-mm. Right? He got technique, overpowered. Yeah, technique wasn't good. I think he needs to be in better shape. But the guy said he's working on stuff. You know, he knows King yeah. Green and said he's really working on stuff. I hope so, so I hope that's the case. I mean, he won't be in the league long if he doesn't really work on it. He's got to get his body where it needs to be. He's got to be in his best physical conditioning. And he's got to really work out technique issues. There's a lot of work for Kenyon Green to do. But I'm cheering for him. I thought he was a really good run blocking prospect coming out of A&M. Really good. And that's something I want to see. But... You know, I put my name on that. I I thought he was going to be a really good pick for the Texans, and he hasn't been so far. But if he is this year, it's a really big deal. You know, it's a really big deal for them if they can solidify both center and left guard with Juice Scruggs at center and Kenyon Green at left guard. You got you got some big boys up front, and it'd be a great thing. I just right now he's going to have to show me something because I in two years I haven't seen it so far. So it's a big show me year for him. This is a year where if he doesn't get it done this year, he'll be gone. They won't keep him beyond three years. They won't even get to a fourth year of the contract. So uh, it's, a, it's a big one for him, and I hope he is putting in the work that he needs to right now because it's critical. Yep. This team, did, this head coaching staff, this coaching staff did not draft Kenyon Green. No, this coaching staff didn't, but Nick did. But Nick did. Nick yeah. did. Nick wants to see him. I'm sure Nick wants to. And, oh, by the way, he wants to see the kid succeed. By the way, yeah, yeah and a local kid, you hope, oh, man, I'm rooting for him. I hope he does, but there was very little that we saw of him two years ago that would t- would tell you 
no, he's a lock for this job or he's going to be. There was very little. So hopefully he is much better. Someone 3780-3776. James wants to talk NFL draft. What do you say, James? Hey, guys. How are we doing? What's going on? Um, you know, I'm looking at this thing. I think we've all kind of agreed over the last couple of months that the, the Texas' biggest needs have been defensive tackle, wide receiver, cornerback. Seems like they pretty clearly addressed the wide receiver issue. Um, I wonder if there's a spot in this draft, and Lance, you, you pour over this every single day and look at the positions, what teams are out there. Where, you know, we think there's probably going to be four or five quarterbacks that go pretty early. We think there's going to be three, four, five wide receivers that go pretty early. Probably going to be a pretty good run on offensive tackles. Does that leave a, a spot in the mid 20s where maybe somebody wants to do business for your first rounder next year if you're top guy? Let's say Byron Murphy, you know, is sitting there at 22. Or but you mean trade into the? Five. You mean trade into the first? Yeah, and you use next year's number one. So you give up your second. You give up next year's number one and one of your seconds this year. Mm. Well, I mean, maybe it's next year's number one and your third or something. You know, but but you know, it's, there's probably a guy there. I mean, to me, it's Byron Murphy. But well, everyone's going to you know, think your John first rounder Major, if your number one cornerback is out there. Yeah. So okay, that's an interesting thought. Now let's let's go let's work through this. The value, if if you're trading to to Byron Murphy, won't be there probably beyond sixteen. So if you wanted Byron Murphy, you'd have to jump up to, you know, the Colts aren't trading with you at 15. Seattle isn't going to trade with you at 16 if Byron Murphy's there. So you might have to go, like, number 14. I don't even know who 14 is. Wherever the Raiders are, could you get them to bite? Maybe, but it doesn't really. Wait a minute. So wait a minute. You got out of 23 for a couple second rounders. You're going to go back to give up your first rounder? That doesn't well, you'd make have any to, sense. You would have to give up next. Well, you get a first rounder this year for next year's. But the but difference you know, I, in. I, I'm not interested. Listen, that that's too that's too look at what the Saints paid for Davenport. That was too much. It was it was Well what too you're much. doing is you're getting a first rounder and you're giving a first rounder. But for the team getting a first rounder, they're you're probably also gonna give up you your second rounder. Yeah. Yeah, well you have to. Right. Because the team is gonna get you're probably gonna finish let's say you you get the twenty sixth pick of the draft. Well you're gonna be getting an earlier pick than that, more than likely, if you want to get one of those players. Now if you want to trade into the back half of the first Maybe the Ravens would consider that uh, for you. Maybe the Tampa Bay Bucks would consider it. You're still going to have to give up. If you trade a future first, you're still going to have to give them a spot this year. Maybe it'd be a third, but um, you'd have to really, really love somebody to want to do that this year. But, I mean, cornerback is a big deal. And well, Quinion Mitchell will be gone. Terry and Arnold probably goes by 17 to Jacksonville. I don't know the Kool-Aid McKinstries. I think he's a back half of the first guy. Cooper DeJean is going to be a safety, I'm probably. not interested in that. I'm not interested. Oh, in no, that's a long shot scenario. No. If I, you did it, you would trade your second rounder. I'm not giving up my first rounder. You would give year. up your 42nd and a third to dra to jump into your 42nd pick and your third round. Your first third round pick is what you would probably give up to jump into the late stages of the first round. Maybe you give up two second, two of your second round picks to jump into like pick number 26 or something. You might do something like that, but it's possible. Oh, well, I think it's possible the Texans could do something like that. I considered it. I'm not I'm not Nick. interested in giving up in a one yet next year for a one this year. I'm not. No, it'd probably be your second round picks is what you'd give up. Yep. But, Hopefully. but don't you think because they need D tackle, cornerback, safety, maybe offensive line, I think those picks are too valuable to just concentrate on getting one. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, I know you're going for it now, though. I mean, that's for sure. Um, but I'm not. I, 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 there's still there's still holes to fill, and and oh by the way, other teams may not be as interested in your first rounder next year because the thought is you're going to be pretty good. Where are you drafting next year if you're a, a playoff team? Where, where is that first round pick? Does it have as much value as it obviously doesn't have nearly as much value as it <laughs> your first round pick last year or what people thought would be your first round pick to coming up this year, right? Uh, the Texans were thought to be one of the doldrum in the, the doldrums and they ended up with first place and in the playoffs this year. Next year, for sure, people are going to think that you're drafting late, mid twenties or even later. So I don't I don't know that your 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 first round pick next year has that kind of value. I'm still not interested in giving it up though. I'm still not. Uh, 713-780-3776 is the number to get in with us. You guys are responding. We like it. But we do have to play 
with the Rockets taking on Golden State, um, we had Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce having a discussion about the Rocket situation with Alper and Shingun and Jalen Green. And we'll play some of that on the other side, talk about that. Uh, that is going to happen next right here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. But right now, since we're talking hoops, let's talk hoops. Let's talk pro dunk. Let's talk about that goal that you've got or don't have. The kids want a goal, Dad. The kids want to play. The kids, especially if you have young kids, but even older kids. JT, even when he could dunk, he was still lower in the basket, and they were out there having fun. Not all his buddies could dunk, so you know what? They all had a good time out there on the lot. And it's still happening because that goal we moved, and one of our uh, former neighbors has that goal, and they still love it. JT went and visited him, and the, and the kid, he plays on it this whole time, these last 10, 12 years, whatever it's been, he's been playing on that. He's a pretty good little player now. But you know why he's a pretty good little player? is because he had that goal in the front yard. He and his sisters are, are all pretty good players, and you know why? It's because they had the pro dunk goal. And the pro dunk goal is the goal that the kids want to play on. They can raise and lower it so that they can dunk. They can have fun. They can actually reach the goal when they're younger and, and actually get a, some shooting touch. And then you put then, then you raise it, and now all of a sudden you, you've got a kid that's playing some high school ball because they had that goal. You, my friends, are going to benefit. You, Dad, are going to benefit from that goal. The kids will be outside. Mom will love it too. Produnk.com, you want the best goal in the market? Produnk.com. When it comes to air conditioning companies, you got to have somebody you can trust, but you got to have somebody who does the job the right way. And Vanderford Air is somebody that I, I recommend strongly. They just came and worked on my system. I had them add a whole home dehumidifier to pull humidity <coughs> out of the home and, and improve the conditions in the home. But, you know, if you need an air conditioner fixed, did you know that they don't charge you for overtime or emergency charges? They don't have that. They have a five-value guarantee in writing for customers. The best value at the lowest cost, your comfort, even when it comes to temperature, quality workmanship, systems that work uh, that they work on will operate at factory standards. That's a really big deal. There's no shortcuts at Vanderford Air. And then 100% guarantee satisfaction or your money back. It's this simple. If you're looking to have your AC repaired, they'll give you the repair price. And if you want a new system cost, they'll give you the new system cost as well so you can compare the two. They redo all the lines. They go from ground floor up with a new system with a strong enough unit but an efficient unit. 
it's not going to be too big and it's not going to be too small. It'll be just right. Keeping your AC, uh, making your AC an efficient AC, but also keeping you cool because that's what you're paying for. It's Vanderford Air, V-A-N-D-E-R-F-O-R-D, VanderfordAir.com, or call 281-557-COOL. You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back. 713-780-3776 to get in here with us on ESPN 97.5. You're more than welcome. 713-780-3776. PJ is here. We're taking calls, baby. Shortest wait times in the history of radio. It had, always has been. This has been the shortest wait times. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. What up, PJ? Hey, what's going on, guys? How you Not doing? Not much. Man? Not much. How you doing? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I see the Texans making moves, and I'm from Houston. I'm probably I'm a Pittsburgh fan, but also I was telling my uh, friend of mine, he's a Texan fan. I said, "Y'all not gonna sneak up on nobody next year." And with this trade down, you're letting the whole NFL know. So I just want to get you guys' opinion on the expectation of winning because it's different when you're not winning, you're not expected to win. Now you're expected to win, and all odds are going to be on you. You're probably going to get some primetime games, too, and we know how that went the last time we had primetime games. So I just want to get you guys feeling. Do you feel differently, or what's, what's your expectation of this? I hang up and listen. Man, it feels way different. My expectations are high. This is the highest my expectations have been since 2012. I've been tempering this whole offseason because you're playing a first-play schedule. But they have gotten so much talent. They have gotten so much talent that they can compete now at the highest level in the NFL. They really can. So I have been like, everybody, slow down. Slow down. You're playing a, you ain't playing the schedule you played last year, a fourth-play schedule. You're playing a first-play schedule. But... They're going to be good. They got a lot of talent now. Holy crap. And I, I was a little worried about CJ, you know, having a, a, a second year blues, sophomore slump. I don't know how he can. I don't know how anymore. I, I just, they, he's just going to have so many guys that are so good around him that they're going to make everybody better. I, it just is, I'm, 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 I'm ecstatic. I'm ecstatic. I just I'm, yeah. So there's you know I want to see the running game develop. I want to see what what Joe Mixon does. I want to see what the offensive line does to open up holes for him. I still need to see that. I don't have any doubt the the passing game is going to click. Um, you can't fix everything when you're a bad team. You can't fix everything in one year. So or really even two drafts necessarily. So there's still probably going to be a hole in the secondary that you have to look at. Um, but I mean. You know, if you did your if 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 D'Amico does well with his evaluations and his staff, Matt Burke and then the scouting staff and Nick Casario, if they do well with their evaluations and find the right guys who can help, I just I question if you can get a rookie to come in and help you the way that you're going to need help. But that's why you have school. You know what? There's been lots of teams who don't have great defenses. Guess what they do? They just put up a ton of points. You just say, okay, well. We'll just outscore you. The Texans are in position now to get in a shootout and win. The Texans are in position to shoot it out with somebody and potentially beat them 35 to 31. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's part of it. If you can't, if your defense isn't sh- as strong as you want it to be, and they've got a defensive front now, nothing makes your cornerbacks better than when you got a pass rush. Yep. All of a sudden, cornerbacks get, get much better when they're when the quarterback is Lonnie being Lonnie Johnson is going to be so good now. Okay, Lonnie Johnson is going to be. What did he call himself? He Lance can't hear anything. He's covering his ears. I'm not going to listen to anything that says Lonnie Johnson. Lonnie Johnson, Jeff Okuda, C.J. Henderson, Miles Bryant, bodies, 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 bodies. Load up. Lonnie was oh first rounder, first first rounder, rounder, second rounder, second rounders. Johnny Flynn, Hashim the Beat. No, this isn't Daryl Morey's Rockets. Speaking of Daryl Morey's Rockets, how about tonight? Rockets take on the Warriors. There's nothing Daryl did for this team. And Dar- <laughs> yeah, listen, this isn't Daryl's team. This isn't Daryl's Rockets. No, it's not. It's a different. Name it's, one guy that Daryl's responsible for on the roster. Uh, well, can you think of any? I don't think any. Right? No. I mean, he did. He 
Well, he did. did Nobody. Eric Gordon was the last one. Didn't he make a trade that they've gotten any of these guys with? No. No? No one. Okay. Um, Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett sat down. They're talking about the same thing that we've been talking about. How in the world do you what what's going to happen with Shangun and 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 Jalen Green? Here is a bit of their discussion. Tell me what you guys think. Are shocking. The Rockets have turned the corner. Shangun is out. You thought that, that he was the anchor of that whole joint. You feel me? Man, them guys stepping up right now, Pete. He might have been holding them back. Man, he was holding them up. What you mean? He was one of their top, if not their best player, bro. You can't say that. You can't say that. I get it. The numbers say that. So let me say this. When one thing, when when you lose a weapon, you got to, you really have no choice but to switch it up and go to something else because you don't have that no more, right? When you can make this adjustment and then still thrive, that's what I'm saying. He he wasn't holding it up. He was was the anchor. He out now. Now he's playing a whole nother way now. Because you heard of. Addition by subtraction. What I'm saying is, like he's playing. a great young player. Yeah, bro. right. Numbers. I mean, he the way he did win Benyama, he's an asset. Bro, he been so now, well if they make year, the playoffs, bro. they on an eight nine game winning streak. You might could trade him and get a veteran piece to really even help them. Because oh. Jalen Green, he looking like a franchise player, right? He looking like a baby McGrady. But mm. you can't get a Shingun just out of the out of the clay, bro. You can't just go but to they the... they're going to have to make decisions on Shingun, bro. Jabari Parker. You keep all that together. Why can't you? You, you can't got a young all that together. But why can't you? I mean, Jabari Smith, Jalen Green. Man, Minnesota doing it. Oh, 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 okay, see, doing it. No, they don't Orlando, got three, they don't got three young it. dudes like that. Eventually, Ooh. Orlando going to have to make a decision, too. Man, you got a core. This summer, you got to sign Jalen Green for Man, 100 Okay, summer. cool. You got it. Let's get it. So, he, he's so there. now, next summer, you got to make a decision on Jabari or Sangoon. They're in-house. You can sign, re-sign all those guys is what no, I'm no, saying. No, you can't re-sign. You only got to, to, uh, room for two of them. Bro, you can re-sign all those guys yeah, is what I'm saying. All right, bro. all right. So, First Paul all, Pierce was anti Shingoon, Kevin Garnett pro Shingoon. Big guy, but wing guy. I mean, I get, I, you know what? I don't know. You know what? With What's the forty-three million called? dollars a year that you're giving Fred Van Vliet next year, it's called the Ticket and the Truth. That's the name of the podcast. The Ticket, Ticket and the Truth for their nicknames. Okay. Uh, agree or disagree that you can keep both of those guys? No, agreed. You can. You can. You absolutely can. Uh, you're locked in. Well, see, I think that you could still make a trade once you're locked in with the. You're not gonna. It won't keep you from trading one of them. So you can and let it play out and then trade later if, agree, if you don't like it. Agree with Paul Pierce that you trade Shingun and not Jalen. No, because it's harder because because KG just told you what it was. You can't bring up a Shagun. They had a lot of different pronunciations of Shingun in that. And that well, and one Jabari particular Parker, clip, as opposed, but yeah, you know, he, he corrected uh, himself. But I think that uh, no, it's hard to find a Shingun. Those guys, there's not a lot of those guys in the NBA. There's a lot of explosive wing scores. You could probably name ten right mm. off the top of your head, and you have no problem naming great wing scores. Naming guys who can get you points, rebounds, and assists, and who can single handedly beat you in the low block, who have the low post game. There's there's like one. There's one guy who does what now. Embiid does other things, but, okay, you can say, we'll just say Embiid. Embiid, Jokic, and I think that's it. And then you go Shingun, and that's it. For guys who are can do the things that they do, and really he's more like Baby J. It's, now, Jokic and Embiid are different, I think, because they, they, they contribute more defensively than than uh, than Shingun does, right? Yeah, I, guess. I mean, Shingun can be a, a defensive liability, especially you bring him out on top and he has to switch. I don't switch. care. Jalen's not a good defensive player, so we can't make that argument about, like, if you're going to compare the two of them, Jalen's not a good defender. I know he's gotten better. Jalen's gotten a lot better. He's gotten better, but he's not a plus defender no. necessarily. Um, Shingun, is, Shingun is rare offensively. He's a rare, rare commodity. This winning without Shingun has opened up I mean, I think some different thoughts as opposed to what we thought earlier in the year. And oh, by the way, Jalen Green, despite an unbelievable month of March, it's still a guy who's averaging less than 20 points a game. He has not been, he can, he's yet to put together a season. 
he has shown after the All-Star, whatever reason, that All-Star break has been tr- uh, remarkable for Jalen Green. And he has shown signs that maybe he's turned a corner. And maybe it's because it took him a little while. Maybe it's because he hadn't had any coaching before. And now it's finally coming. Maybe it's because it's, uh, uh, losing Shangun has opened up the middle for him. And he's, you know, able to do a lot more than he was before. Maybe all of those things. I think the two can coexist, though. What do you think off the top of your head the numbers would be for each to get a max contract? Because you heard the guys discuss giving guys money. What do you th- off the top? What do you think each would be, what their max number is? Well, their max number is isn't something that it's debatable. It's their max number. That's what I'm saying. Or what do you, you what do you pay? Because we're talking. Well, not that, but we're talking about numbers. What do you in your head? What do you think a max deal for either one? Thirty five. If Shingun got a max deal, it'd be five years, two hundred twenty five million. How much? Five years. How much? Five years, two hundred twenty five million. Two twenty five. Wow. Wow. Two twenty five. That's forty five million. Wow. And Jay- I wouldn't give him that. And Jalen would be five. What? And Jalen would be five. You wouldn't give Shagun Max? No. I'm not Okay, well, let him be- walk. Because of the cap jumping up, Jalen's would be five, 260. He he has a higher draft. He was drafted higher, so his deal is corresponding to where he was drafted. How about you guys take 35 each? <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Sure. Okay. Well, they I like ain't get the- a max deal elsewhere. They can only get the max deal here. Well, I like the, the way you're thinking. Or the here, Rockets, John. or the Rockets lose them. That's and the other thing. And this is now their but home. But, but, this but is they also lose their... them for what? Thirty-five? No, they Th- just lose them. Okay, do you want to win? Them, them how much can they make on the do open Do you want to win? Do you want to win? They can't get max. That's fine. Do you, you piss them off when they leave? Okay. If you want to win, if you want to win, you'll stay in Houston where the hot teams are: Astros, Texans. This is where the hot boys play. Do you want to be a hot boy or not? That's your choice. You want to be a hot boy, uh, um, Shingun? You want to be a hot boy, Jalen? Jalen's already got that flair. So Jalen's staying. A hot boy? Yeah. Why are you making references to early 2000s rap? That's hot right. boys? Is that what you're doing? That's right. They're hot boys here. <laughs> That's what it is. I don't That's think what they're hot is. boys. This is where the hot boys play. I can play some hot boys for you if you want. I'm just telling you, this is boys. where the hot boys play. And you can either you can either ride with it. Or we'll trade you to Sacramento. You have an interesting way of, of contract negotiations. It's like, hey, don't you want to be here? Take what we offer. Yeah. Do you want to win or not? Or do you want to lose? This is what I'd say. Do you want to win or lose? And as soon as Shingun says, win, okay, $36 so, so million a year. Is Shingun Lil Wayne or Juvenile when you call him Hot Boys? Which uh, one is he? Shingun is going to be uh, or is he BG? Juvenile. He's Juvenile. Is Jalen BG or, or Lil Wayne or Jalen is Lil Wayne. Okay. I mean, got kind of Lil Wayne vibes a little bit, but much better looking. You, This is a thing for you. This is hot boys. How often do you bring up the attractiveness of Jalen Green when you talk about He's it? just a cute dude. Like, I think well, the lady even said it. Well, your wife, I yeah. understand. Yeah. I'm no, not Jay, sure what like his... Jeremy Pena, Jalen Green. Well, yes. Those are those, are those. And then football-wise, I don't know who the football guy would be. Hank is cute. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's got that crazy hair, but... Goes all over the place. Who's something? Who's somebody the girls would love? You should ask your, the girls you know. Um, well, Nobody on the offensive line. No. I don't think, although Hunter's got, Daniil Hunter's got, is all rocked up. He looks like a model like that. Maybe Stingley? Daniel Hunter. Of course, you never see him. I mean. No, nah, not Stingley. Not Mixon. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Joe. Lance uh, has an opinion of you. No, uh, not, uh, not CJ. Oh, we already know your bias against CJ. No, I just don't think he's not like in the Jeremy Pena category and and Jalen Green. I don't know. Maybe the handsome guys. You know what? This is what I'm saying. I got it. I got it. Head coach, Demico Ryan. This is his thing. Demico Ryan is like the Tay Diggs of head coaches, Mm. but younger Tay Diggs. Once again, saying black people look the same. No, Um, I'm just saying he's got Tay Diggs as the mm -hmm. handsome guy. That's that's what Jalen's. That's what the head coach. So we go to our Cal. Cal McNair? He's a, sex, he's a sex symbol now after the way that wow. this team has turned around. What are you, Cal's what? a bit of a sex symbol What are now. you talking about? Wow. Cal, Cal's a bit of a sex symbol. No, Who no. does he have? You see Hannah? Did you think he could pull that? No, yes. you didn't. Yes, I did. You know why? Because, because he's he a did. good owner? You could, no, because uh, where do you, about his father's money. Why yeah. are you doing the money thing, Cal? <laughs> yes. Are you asking me if I'm surprised that Cal McNair has that a woman that looks like Hannah? No, handsome. not at I all. I just tell you this. Uh, if Hannah decided to leave Cal, Cal would scoop up even better. You know why? Well, even better. Because he's a good owner. Now, he's considered, he's a, he's one of the sexy boys now. 
<laughs> yep. No, not because of the money, because he's a great yeah. owner hey, hey, it's who makes good decisions. Hey, Cal mm. Single, it's raining all over. What's that? You, oh, that's not that's not rain. That's money raining down. You're talking about so, a man that's married. This, and this is him. This. this is what you're this doing. This is what Dell starts most of the okay. time. <laughs> How did My, I start it? What are the odds? Your your thing was Jalen. Jalen's a handsome boy. What? No, what? my thing was hot boys. If you want to play here with the hot boys of the of the, of the city, this is what you have to choose from. Now, Bregman's going to leave. Kyle Tucker's going to leave. Altuve well, will get. That's old. Astros. No hot boys. Yeah, on the all Astros. the Astros leave. All right, not the okay. We got to break it. MyBookie.ag, promo code BET975. That's where you go get your game on. You want to bet on tonight's game? Draymond says they're ending the Rocket season tonight. You believe him? You believe that they're ending or that he's ending the Rocket season tonight? If not, boy, they're going to come out fighting. But they're going to fight these Warriors tonight. Warriors come out to play, and you can bet on it at mybookie.ag, promo code BET975. Get your initial bonus for signing up for the first time, or if you're reloading, put in that promo code BET975 and get a bonus just for reloading. I mean, mybookie.ag, promo code BET975, is different than any of your local bookies. Your local bookies ain't giving you bonus money to play with. Your local bookies probably don't have all the casino games. They don't have the casino games that you can get live dealers at mybookie. you got live dealers. Dealers dealing you the cards or, or or spinning the wheel in roulette. All of that's happening at mybookie.ag, promo code BET975. When you win, you get paid. That's what happens every single time at mybookie.ag. Promo code BET975. You, you play, you win, you get paid. MyBookie. Yes. All right. Let's go. 713-780-3776 is the number. Dell, we can't see the name on that. Who uh we got a caller. And listen, you call in, you're getting right on. You get you call in, you're getting right on. If you wanted to call the show, you want to talk about your Astros winning again, day off today, heading to the Rangers. I'm going to be there next week. I'm going to go to that Monday night game. They play a weird schedule Friday through Monday series, which doesn't happen too often in Major League Baseball, but that's what they're doing. And uh, you got nice pitching matchups that are, are going to be coming your way um, with the day off today. Uh, Justin Verlander going to make a start for Sugarland on Sunday. Going to make the start for Sugarland on Sunday. So uh, I think that's a is that a home game? I, I hope. I think it might be. If it is. Uh, you need to get out and see Justin Verlander in his outing. Um, what else do we have? We had the hockey fight that we talked about a little bit earlier, which was tremendous. The pu- they dropped the puck to start the game, and everybody dropped their gloves. It was awesome. Anthony Rendon is a story. Anthony Rendon, I was looking at this contract. Rice guy. Holy crap, is this bad. It's bad. Anthony Rendon in 2018 – Hit was finished 11th in MVP. Okay, so in 2017, he finished 6th in MVP. In 2018, he finished 11th. He had um, he had an OPS of 909. Okay, for three years, he had a 937 OPS, a 909 OPS, 
and a 1,010 OPS uh, where he finished sixth MVP, 11th, and third. This is with Washington. We remember that guy in 2019. Then in 2020, he signed a new contract with the L.A. Angels, and that contract paid him, has been paying him uh, the amount of, it started off with uh, $26 million, then it goes to 28, then 36, then 38, and this year we're at 38 again. Now, the reason I mention that is I'm about to read you some stats. Now, who did the Angels sign to a long-term deal that they had a terrible deal with? Do you remember? Uh, it did oh, yeah. not work out. Yeah. Uh, um, Pujols. Pujols. Yeah. Albert Pujols. Pujols was not a good deal for nope. them. So they signed Anthony Rizzo. The first year is COVID year. He actually plays well COVID year. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. The next year, 2021, well, Johnny played 58 games total. He hit 240 and his OPS was 712. But 2022, this is another year. We'll be fine. 47 games he played. Hit 229 with a 706 OPS. Okay, 2023 is the year of Rizzo. We're paying him $38 million. Okay, great. Rendon. I mean, yeah, Anthony Rendon. God, I keep screwing up and saying Rizzo. 43 games, even fewer games. He hit 236, and his OPS is 678. Three years with the Angels in full seasons. He's played 58, 47, and 43 games. He's hit... He's had a 712 OPS, a 706, and a 678. How's he following it up with this year? Surely this year will be the year he earns his money. Well, he's 0 for 19. He has no hits. He has one walk. And this is the offseason where he was interviewed and said, Yeah, baseball is just baseball. I don't, it's not like my life. I don't, I got other things that are way more important to me. And if this is all ended today, I'd be fine. You know what's great when you've taken that much money, you've performed at zero, at a rate of zero. You don't play. You can't even get to 60 games in a single season. And then you tell everybody you don't care about baseball and you start 0 for 19. Who is this bad? It's really, really, really bad. This, this is. You can't call him a liar. He told you he didn't care. He did, he did tell us he doesn't care. He doesn't care enough to not even get a hit. This is this is one of the worst signings. I mean, it's worse than the Pujols signing. At least Pujols had some years. I mean, it turned out to be really bad. Only because, five out of ten of his years, the full time years, yeah. we're not counting COVID. But that's only, better than no years. Only five out of ten. No, did has he has Rizzo even got Rendon? Has Rendon even got to a hundred games? Only, only five of those ten years has he even gotten to a hundred games during his career. I'm not counting the COVID year, which you know you don't know on that one because they didn't play. Are enough. we blame? And then uh, should we blame Rice for this? No, Rice is no. They they're the ones who got him the contract with Washington. I mean, the, the great play. Wa- they smart. prepared him for Washington, and then Washington, he conned the yeah, Angels. No, so, they made him so too listen, smart. So listen, Rice doesn't care about sports. Is this? This is what I'm saying. They made him too smart, made him too oh. bit of a free thinker, and now he goes, ah, sports, whatever. Sports, sports. Yeah. I don't even care Do about it. blame him. Rice? What about Rizzo? What about Rizzo? What about Berkman? Did Rizzo? Rizzo? Why do you keep Did Rizzo saying play Rizzo? 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 Didn't Rizzo play at Rice? No. No, it's Rendon. I'm thinking Rendon. of Rendon. Where did Rizzo play? I don't, I don't no. know. Probably Where's, Seton Hall. No one knows. Seton Hall's my guess. He might what about Berkman? Ever... Uh, Berkman cared enough to win a ring. He cared enough, and he didn't care about school. No. Well, he was different different than Rendon. Really. He wasn't a typical different. rice no, guy. No, he that wasn't. I think he of. wasn't at all a rice. No, he's got no rice. He's in him. more of a Texas State guy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Only smarter. Hey, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah yeah not uh no and what boy, about jose cruz our, jr our boy didn't bring anything from rice with cruz him. jr loved playing baseball yeah um all the pitchers threw their arms out so i can't go to no, them none of them yeah <laughs> none of them what was the coach's name wayne graham, wayne graham. you're gonna pitch 305 innings this year because we, we only play like 60 games That's well it. strap up Get back out there, but I'm at 180 pitches. Get back out there. You got 190 in you? Let's I get guess. him and Augie. Derek in yeah, here. Yeah, Augie's like that, too. Hey, Derek. Good morning, James. How are y'all? Good. Hey, Lance, I wanted to ask you a question. Why didn't that tactic of do you want to win work with Saquon Barkley? He could have came and played with the hot boys of the Texans. Yep. But he chose more money. Why didn't that work on him? I'll hang up and listen. Because he don't want to win. He doesn't want to win. He don't want to win. He just joined the Eagles. 
And also, he didn't know we were the hot boys because the Rockets weren't playing that well at the time. Um, you hadn't had Jalen Green break out. You didn't have Daniil Hunter. You didn't have, uh, at that time, Joe Mixon. You didn't have... Um, well, he wouldn't have come. Well, he wouldn't have come Joe with Mixon. Joe Mixon, but you didn't have um, Stephon Diggs. He didn't know we were the hot boys, but we are the hot boys. He should have paid more attention to baseball, and he should have paid attention to Shingun. He should have looked at the splits and realized that Jalen Green is that guy. He's him in the second half of seasons. <laughs> Okay, he's so, so you know why I didn't work on him? Because he's a loser. Oh, because Saquon Barkley's Oof. a loser. If wow. he was a winner, he'd come play with the hot boys. He's him, <laughs> but you don't want to pay him. You don't want to pay him like he's him. Who? No. Jalen Green. No, that's outrageous money. <laughs> no, that's we're not paying. <laughs> I thought he was him though. Mm-hmm. He's him in the second half. Mm-hmm. So, he's not fifty-two million dollars a year. Him. Well, that's what I him. mean. He maybe is for another team, not my team. My team ain't paying a fifty-two mil. Are you paying? It's forty-five and fifty-two. You said for, for a max man, deal for both of them, seven million for those two, and then you got Dylan Brooks. This is going to be riding with twenty. Cruising. Uh, oh, he is. Oh, he is. Well, you got forty-three out of Fre- and Fred too. So yeah, but Freddie will go bye bye after yeah, no, next after, year. Yeah, they they no. can't afford to exercise the third year option on uh, them. A uh, pretty good point here. We'll talk about the kickoff rule and how that affects the Houston Texans. On the other side, right here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Right now, I'm talking about Houston Powder Coaters. I'm talking about Robin and how oh, excellent she is at what she does. You, There's a good chance that if you call Houston Powder Coaters, 281-676-3888, that you will talk to Robin, that she will see. You can send her pictures of your patio furniture, and she'll tell you whether or not she can fix it or you need to replace it. I mean, they can fix the hardware, the straps, the slings. They can do it all. They can make it look like your favorite team. Are the, uh, is your pro football team your favorite team? Your your pro baseball team your favorite team? Your pro basketball team is your favorite college, whatever it is, whatever color that is, red, uh, maroon, burnt orange, green, whatever your favorite, purple, Big Daddy, you want purple furniture? Yeah, you want it because you got uh, Houston Potter Coders, and they can make your patio furniture you're, you could listen when you go tailgating. You got that. It's perfect. It, they can make your furniture for your favorite team. They do it all the time. And and businesses, they'll come to you. Okay, they will grab the stuff. If you got a, a, a fence that needs fixing, they will put up temporary fencing and take that back, fix it for you, and bring it on back. Make it look all new again. Make it look great. They've been doing it for over twenty years, five years. Five star customer service. HoustonPowderCoaters.com. Tell Robin you heard it here. HoustonPowderCoaters.com. Hey, guys, I want to talk about Underdog Fantasy because 
Underdog Fantasy allows you to play daily fantasy. There's a lot of really cool daily fantasy games going on every day with basketball now, with baseball. You can make your selections. You can get involved in in, in three-man drafts, five-man drafts. You can do, um, or, or even larger, you can do drafts for a large group of people where you have a chance to get paid out on a, a lot of different payouts. Like, you'll pay 50th place, 60th place. But, you know, the one that everyone's playing right now are the uh, the Pick'em Challenge, where you go to the lower left-hand corner, it's the Pick'em tab, click that, and then go pick players, pick higher or lower on stats that you feel like are a little soft, right? You've watched all the Rockets games. You've watched the NCAA tournament. You've watched the women's tournament, golf, whatever you want. There's so many different sports, and you can mix and match your sports. You go higher or lower on that statistic. And if you hit, you're going to win, and you have a chance to win 100 times your original play. You have to pick between two and five players to go higher or lower than the stats. But the great thing is there's also boosters in there, which will increase your payout even more. So win up to 100 times your money and, and use your flex option to basically act as insurance, where you can win two out of three, three out of four, four out of five. It's great for uh, watching games and playing along with them. Makes it a lot more fun. It's real money that you can win, and it's completely legal in Texas. You must be 18 or older and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms and conditions apply. If you feel like you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Go to ncpgambling.org. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. It's hot boys. Right. You hear these hot boys? Listen to this, John. <laughs> huh. This would be, um, this would probably be Joe Mixon, this verse. If yeah. he's one of the hot boys. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, the new kickoff rule, are the Texans uniquely positioned? I mean, Frank Ross did an unbelievable job last year. Who do we have? Who, re- who returned two kickoffs for touchdowns Steven last year? Steven Sims? No. Wait. Remember? You don't remember who returned the other one? Hold on. It was a tank. It was... Our the tight most, end. The most unlikely. Of- yeah, a fullback. Back. Oh. Wait, that was that Remember? was a kickoff? Uh, against a kickoff? the Jags, yeah. Hmm. How did, that's right. How did he do that again? I was in, so I he was bob- in. He kind of bobbled it. And then, I was out of town when that happened. Yeah. He kind of bobbled it and then he went around and, yeah, he scored. We, we had, who, what teams had two kickoff returns for touchdowns last year? Probably not a lot. Probably not a lot. Now Sims did it in the playoffs, right? Yeah, right. So do we count that? Yeah. That was yeah. a that, that was like, a big one. Yeah. Texans had the lead. They were kicking their ass. Um I think the te- I th- Frank Ross is really, really good. Yeah, he is. Frank Ross is that really That was a punt good. return, by the way, not a kick. What was a punt return? The Stevens playoff one by Steven Sims. Oh, that's right. You sure there was two kickoff returns? No, it was just one. It back. Okay. Yeah. It might have been the only no, one all season. No, in the Damian NFL. Pierce had a kickoff return for a touchdown. Oh, yeah. Damian Pierce had one, too. Oh, that's right. Then yeah. he fumbled in the postseason. That's right. No, right. No, Damian Pierce in had one, too. In that game against the Ravens, he fumbled. We had two. I bet there's uh, – how many teams had zero pump, uh, kickoff returns Most. for touchdowns? Most. There are plenty, yeah. Yeah. Most. How many kickoff returns for touchdowns in the NFL last year? And so, so now that you're going to have to return the ball – the Texans are loaded up with special teams guys. Remember how how many guys? They, I mean, the Texans are just are special teams machines. So Mike Ford, who they added, his special teams percentages over the last three years, percentage of snaps, 74%, 83%, 77%. That means the only teams he probably doesn't play on are maybe field goal block teams, maybe. So he's a pure special teams guy. He did get into, um, in terms of defensively, He's one of the additions you had. Um, defensively, in terms of coverage stuff, he had. Let's see, last year, yeah, not a lot, not a lot of, not a lot of playing time as a cover man. So he'll do some of it. He's only been targeted in his career. He was targeted twenty-two times last year 
for 14 completions and five touchdowns. So I don't really want him covering. If he gave up five touchdowns and 14 completions on 22, targeted 22 times, gave up five touchdowns, <laughs> that's not great. See, that's the that's like what Nick Casario is doing, what he did. He's throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall, seeing mm -hmm. what sticks. That's but what he's he did. a team's guy. That's what he did with linebackers for a couple of years. But if you're going to keep that guy on your team, yeah. you have to hide him defensively. You can't play him. Can't so play him. he's basically a team's only guy. So you have to have – that's one of the reasons he's going after these other corners. But he's loaded up so many guys. How are you going to have all these guys, the C.J. Hendersons and the Lonnie Johnsons and the Eric Murrays and all of these guys and the Mike Fords and all of these guys that you – they're not all making the team. Not, not all of these. Jeff Fakuda. I mean, it's it's guy after guy after guy. How are you going to keep all these guys on the team? Mm. And 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 still, can you, can you afford a Mike Ford if you can only play special teams? Welcome to Houston. We are not able to keep guys on our teams. Well, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. We can't. We're, we're already all. talking about who and you. Then, and then we discard them, and people are grabbing them right away. Mm -hmm. We talk about Especially who you. Especially defensive back. Well, Maybe not that. <laughs> but the Astros, we can't. We can't keep guys. No, we can't keep guys. It's too hard. Rockets, we're going to have to trade one of our players. One or two of our players. Yeah. Too no, many hot boys on the players. roster. And then you look at the Texans like already, we just have too many players. That's what I'm saying. Uh, uh. I, 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 I really do boys. think, though, that, this, that with Frank Ross and with the Texans' ability to actually return kicks, that it's going to be a positive for the Texans as opposed to other teams. Yes. Yeah, uh, when you load up your special teams, and Casario's a big fan. Of, uh, he's a big believer in that because that's what Belichick is. Go get guys. Go win the third phase in, in terms of punt coverage, punt returns, kick coverage, kick returns, um, go, uh, field goals. Go win the third phase. And Nick Casario is now you do have a new punter, so we'll see, see how Tommy Townsend. Townsend does. I mean, he was a good punter and. And he's a long-haired guy, so well. You know. And there's a picture of him and Taylor Swift about to hug after the game. Yeah, I mean, right? I mean, if he's hugging Taylor Swift, I don't think we he gets want in the, that. We want that. If I'm looking glow. at pictures of him, he didn't get into the hot boys. We're not letting Tommy him Townsend can't be a hot boy. I don't know. Maybe. Well, you know what? I take it back with the long hair. Maybe. Oh maybe some. Yeah, I mean the hair. Look, he's got the backlighting of the hair. That almost looks like a glamour shot. That's so? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Oh, you going to hold that against that man? Yeah, you know what? Because he's got glamour okay, shots out there? We'll Let's put see his there. nails. Are they painted? The punters, I don't know. But the punters, the, well, all right, we'll make the punter a hot boy. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Mm, oh, and mm, by the way, he mm. plays every game. Punted in 17 games last year. Yeah. Okay. So healthy. The guy's he's jacked. Healthy. Durable. We got a jacked a, punter. Yeah. And by, as opposed to, remember our punter that was running on the field and bl blew up both yeah, his knees? Yeah, that was that years was a ago. Long time. That was not Hot Boys Texans, though. No, no. this is Hot Boys. Those were, those were Arian Foster thought that dinosaur, you know, did dinosaur sounds and stuff, wrote poetry. This is Hot Boy Texas. Last year, 41.8 average. The year before, 45.6 average. 43.8, 40.4. I mean, you and know, he's got hair. You know the problem with this? This song, I need a hot girl. It's a clean. It's a clean radio version, but there's still so many references to what a girl should do to you. So I, I, I'm going in and out to find the cleanest part. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. I, well, if it's clean, you yeah, can, but you can pretty lot. much get away with saying any. I've heard rap music on standard radio, and it's is, like holy crap. Yeah, true. So I was listening to to Joe and and Paul yesterday on my way up to the Woodlands. Did Joe go to a I black church? I got off 45, and I got on Woodlands Parkway. Joe went to a black church, didn't and he? And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, we just, I mean, and then it picked back up, but the, we lost, we were all dominated by a song, a, another radio station. This song was dropping F-bombs, C-bombs, B-bombs. Was it, it pirate was, radio? It, I have no idea. I have no, but I was like, how in the world is this playing? Did you have your Bluetooth? And it was on ours, and then all of a sudden we came back. Hold on, did you like, have a Bluetooth on? I did not have a Bluetooth on. Okay. This was. I was wondering if somebody Bluetooth no, it, to your it car. it just dominated our signal, and I was like, Wait, I hope we're not getting blamed for this, because 
it was so blue, this song. I've never heard anything. I mean, it was crazy. And it was playing over the air. There was some radio station or some somebody, somebody was overriding it. But it would only happen for like two minutes. I was and I, I kept listening. I was like, print up lyrics for John to read. For what? For Hot Boys? No, no, no. Just something from future. It doesn't matter. Anything well, we, that that. Well, we can do it tomorrow. Watch how sexual stuff is well, now. There's a well, there's rap beat. Everyone going wants on. to beat everything up. Well, well, I'm just saying, a lot of beating things up well, in in the songs. Things are getting beat up. Jackie <laughs> thinks that that punter was probably available because he tried to hug Taylor. They had no, to get him out no. of there. Taylor was like very excited to see him because he got that hair. You think that's why? Yeah. No. He got that hair. I'm telling you, he's a hot boy. He, he's going to be. He is. He, he is. He's, he's bonafide. Have, which he's one bonafide. is he? Is he juvenile? No. He's bonafide. Wait a minute. The Texans are going to win big. How many were there? Four? He could be in that Troy Palomalo commercial at any time now. They're going to put a punter in the commercial? In head and shoulders, yeah. I think there's only room for Tommy one Tommy Townsend, punter, is he Australian? McAfee. That sounds like an Australian name, Tommy Townsend. I've uh, never heard him speak. Well, I don't he know. sounds like a I've never ass. heard him speak, but he sounds Australian when I look at his face. No, he's from Orlando. He sounds okay. Australian when you look at his face. When I look at his face, he looks like an Australian. He sounds like Are no. you sure he's from Orlando? I looked it up. Well, he's, he's from Florida. He's dangerous. He, That's fine. He's from Orlando, went to the University of Florida after going to the University of Tennessee. Oh, that's right. I wrote him up. Did you call him a hot boy in your write-up? Let me see. God, I hope I did. I would be legend if I did. A future, it would be legendary. A future hot boy, it, it, Tommy it, Townsend. I, I'm pretty sure the NFL, your your editors at the NFL would not be. They'd be no. like, I it, put chopped and screwed in one time, and they took that is, out. Is your comp a young Lil Wayne? Is that what your comp was for Tommy Townsend? Yeah, look, my comp should be a WNBA player with that picture, because um, he's got kind of a. That's kind of a different face. Yeah, he, doesn't, he looks different. He looks better now. He, he looked like a WNBA. Player. Yeah, I don't know Here's what that what means. Say, he could play for frame. Iowa. Right. <laughs> He could. What Here's he, what I said. Picture, Townsend like comes from a punting Iowa family. Basketball. Not the what? not the guys. Townsend comes from what? a punting family with his brother Johnny holding most school records. Unlike his brother Tommy, slightly built, it doesn't quite have the leg that Big Brother has. This past season was a down year for him, but he still averaged 44 yards of punt. He's a decent directional punter with the athletic ability to pull off a fake punt here or there. But he will need to punt with even more consistency to have a chance of making the team. Oh, really? Because he was all pro. Nice, nice, nice job. Allow just one point three yards per return, so he hangs it up. Well, he he was all pro. Missed evaluation or from Lance Erline. I gave him. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you didn't have an all pro grade, yeah, you're wrong. I guess. I, I guess maybe you should stay away from punting uh, evaluations. Oh, okay. really? Hand yeah, that over to Tommy someone Townsend else. Is a hero. It's a superhero now. He is. He's good. Yeah, and he's a hot boy. Maybe he he hung your your evaluation up in his locker. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. Joe Cordona, a deep snapper, once reached out to me. He said, "Man, I can't believe you wrote up a long snapper." He goes, "That's incredible." <laughs> hey, you never know. Hey, uh, you never know. Well, I didn't know because I'm I'm stupid. When I when we bought our home, uh, I, we just went in. Oh, okay. Here we paid for this fee. Never talked to a mortgage guy. Never did. But they showed up that day and they charged us all kinds of stuff. When you're signing your papers, when you buy a house, there's a billion papers that you have to sign, right? Put your initials on here. Put find this thing. That. Well, there were all kinds of fees. And you know what? I didn't know. So you just sign. Yeah. Okay. Here's a fee. Here's a fee. Here's a fee. <laughs> Guess what? You don't have to pay those. There's a lot of ways you can get around all of that stuff. You know who does that? Kent Jones. So if you're buying a home, you want a broker. You want a mortgage broker. Be, and only 25% of the people are using a mortgage broker. You're doing it wrong, okay? Don't use that big mortgage company that puts its name on a bowl game. You know how they get all that money putting their name on a bowl games With this fee and that fee and this fee and that fee. They're not saving you money. You know who's going to save you some money? It's my man, Ken Jones. He could save you thousands at signing. Not only that day, but through the life of your mortgage. Dude's been doing it for 25 years. He really geeks out. He loves this stuff. He loves mortgages. Who loves mortgages? I don't know. Kent Jones, I know, loves mortgages. He's the only guy I ever met who, like, geeks out on this stuff. And so if you're looking for, if you're going to buy a home and you want to find out how much you're going to spend, all the stuff, all the preliminary stuff, this is the guy to do it. Dream Rate, the ultimate mortgage hookup. Give him a call, 713-520-5626, 713-520-LOAN, or go to 975loans.com.
You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Uh, all right, welcome back. What, what did we miss today? Did you see UConn's plane had problems? Mm-hmm. UConn's plane is this going to cause is this going to cause any problems for them? I'm sure Dan Hurley will use it as motivation. Oh, yeah. He'll sell. They don't even want us to make the trip. Yeah, they don't even want they us gave there. Us a crap plane. That's what yeah. they do with disrespect. Yeah, if you missed it, um, there it was. People were breaking it down. Apparently, UConn. Everyone else is in Phoenix, and UConn wasn't. They might be there now. So the tr- so the plane left. Cincinnati at like 1040 something landed but there was a question of whether they'd have to fly into a different location and then refuel and then fly into Phoenix but I think they're there now I think they left the area like at 1 30 Eastern a.m. so they should be there yeah they should be there but that's you know what if they lose it Dan Hurley's gonna I'm gonna blame huh? they know they can't stop us so they try to keep us out of the state relax Dan Hurley did y'all watch any of the Girls, McDonald's, all American. I didn't watch the guys. Well, the guys is coming up, isn't it? Or is no, that, not, no, that already happened. Played. They, they both played. They, yeah. how, how good is? Oh, you didn't see any of it. Cooper no, Flag. I know Cooper kid. Flag was a guy that he's he's a perfect next Duke guy. People, yeah, people are gonna really dislike him. Of course, he's white, so that'll add to it. Yeah, and he's really good. He's probably gonna be the number one pick in his draft class. Right now, it looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't see any of it either. But they he did. They did have it. Cooper Flag is, is that what's his name? Yeah, Cooper Flag. It's Cooper Flag. He's talented. Have you seen him? I haven't. Yeah, I, I see. Long, him. athletic. Yeah. I mean, he's a he's a good player. He'll let you Dude, know. He's going to Duke, right? Yeah, he'll let I you mean, know that he's really obviously. good. He's going to talk, so people are going to dislike him. Yeah, it's kind of the it's kind of coming up on White Boy Summer soon. I know Cooper Flag, White Boy Summer, Cooper Flag, Will Shipley. Uh, who oh, ran in a four oh, you mean fours? Your Jesse Owens, yeah, my Jesse Owens. McConkey, yeah, Lad McConkey, Ricky Pearsall, yeah, Dylan Lobby from New Hampshire, Cooper DeJean, uh, Cooper, Cooper DeJean, the yeah. cornerback, the white corner. Yeah, it's white boy. <laughs> it's white boy summer. Man, white boy summer's off to an incredible start. I don't See, know. now here's the difference. I don't count Luca as part of white boy summer. Josh Hader, white power. What? <laughs> 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 no, Josh Hader. Well, hopefully Josh Hader. No, Josh Hader is tremendous. Things are happening. He's definitely for, white for John's people. There's no question he's white. You're, he's one of your people too. Yeah, yeah, but John's gonna, more white. No, Cooper Flag, and you love Duke. You used to defend Duke back when Duke. they were bad Duke, but when they were evil they Duke, bad. they were never Duke. They just won and went to school and got great grades and were good citizens. Never See? got arrested. Look at him defending that piece of crap institution. I mean, honestly, yeah, we gotta hate those guys. Yeah, gotta yeah. hate them. Yeah, they're, they're dirty. They really trip. good they players suck. who never get in trouble. No, they trip. We gotta they hate were, on them. They stomp on your chest. Stomp on chest. There's yeah. They got uh, and. What do you mean and? And trip you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, trip uh, you. Stomp yeah, on your chest. Right. Yeah, we're that try little to win. weasel. We're winning. Those awful northeast kids who wind up there in that southern institution and, and are jerks. Snotty kids. K- oh. The Cameron crazies, bunch of jerks. Oh, northern institutions. Who didn't no, I like said northern slavery? Ki- I said northern now kids. Now they sent, you sent them down <laughs> no. south, and those are I the good people. I said northern kids who okay. go down to southern institutions and ruin them. Okay, came from the north, which, which opposed slavery. Dell, I don't know if you heard. You don't know uh, if I've heard. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure you heard, but you sent them down south. I don't know. That's I, why. I look at the faces of those nor- northeastern kids. I don't know how against it they are. <laughs> They we're against they fought for no when they, they fought for i don't know what you've seen john okay. but when they when they go down there and cheer for duke and the way they yell at the predominantly black kids on the other team i'm like well were they really against it yeah they were really because really. we saw a lot oh, of yeah we Scott, saw, scotty shuffler uh, summer too yeah whitey saw, getting a w now <laughs> and go oh, look a whitey getting scotty a w shuffler. in golf <laughs> we getting a dub in golf we getting a imagine yeah. that yeah yep white boy summer I don't know if we want to push this, to be honest with you. Hey, it, hey, social teams, don't clip this segment. Yeah, yeah, in advance. <laughs> Alpy's a white boy, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a, this is a white boy summer. I don't know. Hot girl summer, something people are, are okay with. White boy summer, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why? About time, Whitey got a win. Oh, When's the last time you guys took an L? 
<laughs> we take a lot of L's. Name it. A lot Name the of last L's. time. You got one on Monday. I mean, in, <laughs> in every sport. That's not white a, girls. Not on Monday. Oh, Monday, that's white girls. Okay. Oh, so they don't count? Yeah, Caitlin Clark. Mm. Yeah. Are you, though? Yeah, yeah. You I said am, you said her victory doesn't count. Uh, No, no, it counts. It yeah, counts. there you go. You yeah. just you didn't take it out. You got a major W <laughs> on Monday. Two, a couple of them. Yeah, if, yes. <laughs> yeah. Paige Beckers, Paige too. Beckers got over on Juju. You guys yeah. had a big we had, a we big a Monday. Big it was big Monday for you Boy, guys. Had a big, yeah, it was big. Proud Boys back. had a big day. Big Monday was back. Proud Boys had a big day. Proud Boys had a big day in sports. Yeah, but I like the fact that C.J. Stroud has co-opted that and taken the power away from that phrase. Do you think now he wants, Stroud Boys. Do you think he wants that? Um, I'm saying no. <laughs> you don't think he wants Stroud Boys? Mm-mm. Okay. All right. Uh, anything we missed? Hmm. There's a big fight between Matt Ishbia and Dan Gilbert. You know the Oh really? Yeah. Well the, oh well they're both not NBA. They're mortgage guys. Yeah, they are like they had an exchange uh, of you words. You know who'd win? Kent Jones at Dream Rate. Of course. Wait, what happened? Well, you don't, they you don't, don't like each other. You don't know the, they have a non basketball rivalry. Yes. There it's um Oh yeah, where they're, um, they're both mortgage companies. Cleveland yeah. and who's the other? Where's the where's the other guy? Uh, uh, Ishbia owns he the owns Phoenix the Suns. Suns, but he came. From, where did he come from? He was he played college basketball. I saw his story on. Um, I saw his story. Did he play on, at Providence or UConn? Yeah, something Providence like that. I saw his story. Not UConn, but I saw a story on Real Sports, and it was crazy. Yeah, he was a college basketball player, and it's the way that he's come up was was unbelievable. I also know that. Oh, Michigan State. Michigan State with Izzo, yeah. But Cardi B has had some issues, too. She got into a fight with the internet because somebody called her a Mexican. What? Yep. <laughs> I got... Who's laughing, Dell? <laughs> I got caught up. I got caught up, and now I'm like, oh, Cardi B's trending. Let's see what's going on. And then Cardi B said something, and Ice Spice got in there like, my dad's black and my mom is Dominican or something. And then people jumped on her like, why are you so light then? And... uh it's just, it was a lot of drama. Cardi was not happy why she's always got to be. You always got to call her ghetto no matter what she does. And it was just a lot of drama yesterday. Yes, when well, I was got, looking at I got Twitter. the sound from Ishbia. He's talking about Dan Gilbert. You're, you're, gonna, you're not going to really be able to tell because there's a lot of beeps. But Gilbert is Rocket Mortgage and, and Ishbia is United Wholesale Mortgage. Yes, yeah, so... Two mortgage bros, and they do it in in, in Indiana, Indiana. I think. I think they they battled it out, and I'm pretty sure it's one of the Midwestern states that they just went after each other, <laughs> and, and and it's it's they've been fighting for years now. These two, yeah, they don't like each other, and this sound will kind of ex- tell you how. Hey, buddy, hope you're doing good. Just want to say I love you. We fucking took those fuckers down, fuck them, and we're gonna keep sticking it to them forever those guys we're number one we take the shit out of them brokers are number one uwm's number one you're number one we're all number one together and fuck them i fucking hate them with all my heart and we're gonna keep kicking their ass every fucking day that's why i was here at 4 a.m again today i don't give a fuck. we're gonna keep kicking their ass and so love you man we talked about it we wait for weights to go up i'm gonna win you're gonna win both are happening right now keep hiring keep building keep growing let's go hold on what is this now that's ishvia talking that's about kicking ishvia talking it- about gilbert Kicking and Dan who's he talking NBA to? NBA owners. Who's he's he talking to? He a message to? for somebody to keep kicking ass. And the guy How did that get out? It, that guy put, the, put it out there. Got yeah, put out there, yeah. Yeah. How about that? Left, so this that is was, just about Phoenix beating Cleveland? No, no it's no, about, no, it's about mortgage, mortgage company. It, okay, company. so it's about mortgage. They're yeah. beating them in mortgage? Yes. Oh, and they oh play, no, no, no. It's a, it's a fight. And they, they played last night. The yeah. actual basketball teams played last night, and Phoenix wiped the floor with Cleveland. Maybe, and so he wasn't talking about that. He, he was talking, talking about, about mortgage. He was rates. talking about mortgage stuff. Yeah, yeah. man, and he beat their now ass he's basketball now I can too. tell you that, now he's a high energy guy. He was a bench oh. guy yeah. at Michigan State who played for Izzo. What you see is what you get there. But I was like, man, he is cutting everything loose. Woo. Dan Gilbert's going to be so pissed oh, now. Got, he's going to ride. They were, it was in Michigan where they fought it out. Rocket and yeah, and United. Sense. Makes sense. Yeah, oh, it's 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 a battle. No, I heard about this before, and I think it was Kent Jones that told me about this. Those two are 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 warriors in the mortgage game. And who's going to give you a better rate? Dream rate. Thank you. Thank you. Our guy going to work harder for you than these two. Kent you talk, see what they're doing? Owning Kent, basketball teams. Does Kent talk to you that way when you screw up a life? 
he, <laughs> Ken ain't like that. He ain't like those those guys. He's all about the people. Ken's all about the people, not those, not like that, not like Ishbia and Dan Gilbert. Okay. Uh nine forty four ESPN ninety seven five and ninety two five. Uh, you got to talk about the Zaddocks, and then we're going to talk about News of the Weird on the other side. Zaddock Jewelers, if you love fine uh, watches, if you love luxury watches, there's a lot of people who are really big into luxury watches. I can tell you this for a fact, nobody beats Zaddock. I was blown away. Now, they've got 28,000 square feet. They've got two levels of, of shopping, and I've talked about the diamond engagement rings. I've talked about the great jewelry they have from the top names, but the watches are... Not only do they have all of the top brands, they've got boutiques. They've got exclusive pieces specific to their store because they are the boutique. Uh, uh, ex- they have boutique exclusivity with pieces that you won't find anywhere else. And I mean the very best international brands that you can possibly find. It is a delight just walking into the store. Uh, met Gilad and I met Lisa and, in fact, all of the Zadik brothers. And what a great building they have and great inventory that they have for you to choose from if you're looking for luxury you're looking for selection you have found it it's at 1801 post oak boulevard you can look online at zadok.com that's z-a-d-o-k.com
Well, Dell, are you excited about the lunar eclipse? The solar eclipse? Excited it's, about it? Yes. It's going to be Monday at 2 o'clock, right? Yes. Well, apparently it's a big deal. My except in driving. one place. My wife is driving there. She is? Her and Maddie, yeah. She's going to go stay. It's huge. People are coming ar from around the country. Where is it? Where is she going Kerr to watch Kerrville. Kerrville, Kerrville has yeah. total eclipse for yes. the longest. Yes. So Ker you're, you're, Kerrville is going to get overrun. You're going. Your wife is driving to Kerrville for this. Yeah, yeah. At two p.m. Is that what? It, when I it's think happening? it's at two p.m. No, right? it ends at one thirty-eight. And like Dallas is big, but the hill country is is all. Yeah. Now it's also big in Michigan, and it's a little bit too big for one city called Luna Pier, where they have asked the mayor if he could please stop the eclipse. I've been told I need to stop this eclipse, and I do not have the authority to do that. So, yes, people are really concerned, but we're just trying to prepare them. Authority isn't the right word for stopping a lunar event. <laughs> right. It's really not You're something not that um, you can do. There's a man upstairs who might take He has the authority. He might be able to. Well, but if that happens, <clears throat> we're pretty much done as a society. If if, the, if that eclipse doesn't go down, something has happened if, if with the Earth's the rotation. Your mayor has stopped it. Or why don't you just get a lot of build, like buy a lot of cardboard and make kind of like a little, you know, maybe just some. A dome? Kind of a dome out of just temporary dome. Yeah. Like a Stephen King novel? Yeah, I mean, not a huge one. Everyone will have to get under there, but you can protect you against. I don't think anything's going to hurt you. Are you going to go blind? Which will cause you to go blind first? Don't ask. <laughs> Let Don't ask. Let's just, move just on. Just ask him. Remember when Trump was looking up the eclipse with no glasses on? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, he's like, I can do it. I was in Nashville when it happened. No, my wife's going. It's it's supposed to be a really big deal. Um, and you're right. They're overrun. Uh, oh. All those small towns, uh, it's it's an absolute it's, boom for all of oh the hotels. Oh, my God. Fredericksburg. To every, it's just incredible. Like, somebody told me that Bur in Bernie, they're charging $3,000 a night. Three thousand dollars a night for a hotel, and it's a three night minimum. Ooh, I I I can't believe that. Ooh, but I know that. Listen, can you jack, should you jack up prices? Yeah, it's so should, big. No, New York no, inmates. Yeah, no, you you just no, should you should gouge, yeah, prices, gouge prices? Yeah, yes, and yes, then absolutely. New York inmates. Well, if people are stupid enough to pay it, then they, you know what? New York inmates are suing the government to watch the solar eclipse after state orders prisons locked down. New York inmates are suing. Do you, you would assume that incarceration would limit some of your yeah. ability to do that? Yeah, yeah but uh, but this is fine unless it's a trick so that maybe one group can get out and shank the other one in a mass attack. I've seen blood in, blood out. Well, I've seen shock, American memes. Hello, everything's going to go dark. You're I've not going to be able seen YouTube to see videos. Shank. This is the perfect time to shank somebody. So what I'm saying. This, be could, so be a, dark this could be a big trick, yeah. yeah. This could be a trap. And the AVers are trying to get to the, you know, to the BGAs, and then you've got, yeah. you know, uh, whatever Miklo's band was. I can't remember his group was. Or the Aryan Nation. Yeah. yeah, the Brotherhood. Yeah. Well, the AVers, the Anglo Vanguard, or okay. the Aryan Vanguard was the AVers, AVR. Black Guerrilla Army's BGA. Okay. Yeah. So well, I was, you know, I was well, already you know counting for when it. you were in. Well, I just watched and I saw Shot Collar. I've seen YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. videos. I've seen Blood In, Jamie? Blood Out multiple times. Yeah. Jamie. Lannister. By the way, that's all CGI. Did you know that? He's not Yoko. He's not all Yoko. No. Ronald Reagan's shooter, John Hinckley Jr., says he's a victim of cancel culture because a lot of his concerts, since he's gotten out of prison. Did you know that John Hinckley Jr. was a musician? I didn't, concerts. Know, I didn't know that. Yeah. He's a musician. And he's putting on concerts around the country, but a lot of people are, a lot of places are canceling them because they don't want him there. What do you mean canceling? They didn't know beforehand who he was? Well, apparently, I don't know that he's drawing big crowds. Yeah, that might be a thing. That might be it. And maybe people don't want to watch. Maybe people don't care about it. That too. Maybe he's not good. Maybe, I, don't, I guess. It's all very ghoulish. And the, and the worst part is he sucks. That's why people don't Young want to people show up. Young people don't want to, they, they've never heard of him. They wouldn't care about him anyway. They probably think, wouldn't even care about an assassination. No. They don't care they, about anything. Lot, most people don't even know who he is. Mm hmm. But apparently, I don't know. Maybe his music's not as. Maybe that's why he's canceled. Yeah, possibly. Maybe they heard a track like, nah, we're out. Or maybe they. Or, or maybe they don't want to support a guy who tried to kill the president. Yeah, they shot at the president. Maybe you're a nut job. <laughs> I don't think people care about it. I think they're just like, why do I, why do I want to go yeah. hear John Hinckley? Who, who is this guy? Did you even know he was in music? 
Yeah, I did. Well, because I read News of the Weird all the time. So, okay, so was, would you want to go see him now? Out of prison, I mean, he's probably not going to pull out a strap and shoot you. But but would you go out? I wouldn't. If he was out in the hall, I wouldn't go see him. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, pr- I, I'm just the fact that I don't want to see him. I don't even care about the assassination no. attempt. Yeah, I got to know his features. Who, who who does he have on his album? He's going to need to get Father John Misty. He's going to need to get some people who have done some, some, some. Jason, uh, is Jody Ari- Jason Isbell maybe come Jody- on now that he's divorcing Amanda Shire. Does Jody Arias sing? Who? I think Jody Arias. Will she be on the album? Just she get could. all the worst people in the world and put them on the album. Oh, as features. that's the way you do it. Take the worst people. Yeah. Uh, well, what about the one who drowned well, our yeah, kids? Yeah, y'all do it. How many people are going to go see the worst people though? I mean, you want to go see the worst people perform? What about that Fisher? Music? Remember the girl who shot Mary Kay Letourneau in the face or whatever? Amy Fisher. Amy Fisher, yeah. Put her in this, John. What about the one that cut off her? Yep. Uh, 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 Lorena Bobbitt. Lorena Bobbitt. Let Lorena Bobbitt. How about her husband who got artificially, you know, yeah. and he was in a porn and everyone's like, this is not what I wanted to see. <laughs> he thought he was going to be like, I bet everyone wants to see this. We don't. No. The head of Yukon police sex crime been removed. For what, John? Well, apparently he couldn't keep his hands off the staff. Oof. Yeah. So a little handsy. Irony. Mm, that tends to happen The head a lot. of Yukon police sex crimes. Gotta go, gotta go. That tends gee, to gee. <laughs> Stop you know who would never do that? Touching. Christopher Merloni would never do that. No, he wouldn't. No. no. Nor would Mariska Haggerty. No, she would no. never do Hagerty. that. Olivia no, Benson would never. She's no. a legend. Olivia Benson would not. A man was arrested for firing a gun in downtown Nashville to celebrate divorcing his wife. I mean, shouldn't you be able to shoot off a there gun? A, a better way to, to celebrate? I don't know, but I think it's a celebration. Okay. <sighs> I don't know. I go, got rid of her. Go get drunk. I don't know if firing in the middle of the town. I don't know if I was go a great way. I might be better. lenient if I was a judge. I mean, you got to look. Oh no, I, I think they will be lenient. You yeah. would, you would, you'd be okay with that. Yeah, I think I would be. I mean, John's for open firearms, like shooting in the streets, and for gouging hotel prices for eclipses. Which, by the way, everybody hotels have dynamic pricing, just like yes, airlines do. Yes. So it's like this isn't new, just you like know the that, Astros right? do. You know what they charge for the Yankee series versus the Royal series? Yeah, and what a what? value and what a value that was for people. Yeah, well, yeah, right. <laughs> Even the Royals, I am paying for because they ain't winning. Yeah, why would I? They ain't beating them. Why would I sign up for that for a home series? <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, the floor. <laughs> How about this? A ten-year-old has been accused of selling a gun. To another ten-year-old, doesn't even move a needle for me. Yeah, it just. I wish it did, but it doesn't. For three hundred bucks, what I want to know is I, where'd that kid get three hundred bucks to yeah, buy a gun? Yeah, up now out of that's those the question. I'm far more surprised that the kid had three hundred bucks on hand than he, than he had the chance to buy a gun. Yeah, actually, oh, where no, do you no, get that? I would that? think that there's a lot of gun buying going on for the ten-year-olds now. Yeah, who yeah. gets that? You gotta, you gotta live in a, in a pretty nice family where you're getting birthday money and. Whatever money you're getting, because who may who has that kind of money when you're a ten year old? Ten year old, three hundred. Unless you're maybe moving some weight. Three hundred. Maybe large. you move some weight and saved up for your first gun. And that's what he needs the gun for. Yeah, for protection. <laughs> I, I can't be bicycling this all this yayo over to to this other spot. I can't be moving these bricks <laughs> yeah. without a strap. Unprotected. I've saved up enough money to <laughs> the get other my own. Ten year old. <laughs> the drug game is dangerous. We know that. Yeah. Time to talk. I saw the wire. Everything you need to learn about life is on is on it's TV. On the wire. Oh yeah, it's yeah. on TV. It's on TV. Yeah. Anything you need to learn about. Yep. If you watch enough TV, you'll learn about blood it. Blood in, blood out. Yeah. Yep. 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 I right, time to talk about. Listen, if you've got issues at work right now, you got you got an employee like I don't know the Yukon sex crime dude. Okay, he had to be he had to go. You know who took care of that business? HR. HR's got to take care of your business, too. If you've got somebody who's touchy at work, you need to get rid of them. Okay? How are you going to do that? You don't know how to do it. Actually, you're not going to be good at it. HRP experts in the HR game. You may mess the whole thing up, as a matter of fact, or may not address it, and that's on you, and that's a problem. All these HR issues are a problem, and here's the deal is you need an expert in HR, and that's HRP. HRP knows what to do. You don't. We've had HR issues here. Not me, probably Dell, but other people too. 
We've had HR issues. And if you have an HR issue, you need HRP. You have a payroll issue too. You don't know how to do it. You don't do it as well as HRP does. You don't do it as economically as HRP does. You got a bunch of employees, you need and you need a payroll company. You need an HR company. You need to get on the ball. Let's go. HRP.net 281-880-6525 or HRP.net. Welcome into the show. Another show where the Texans are the talk of the town. I mean, it's usually the Astros. We know that to be the case. And we'll get into the Astros as they uh, pick up another victory. Uh, they they win a series. They win the series against Toronto in dominating fashion. Uh, they dominated that entire series except for the ninth inning of the second game. And that's why, <laughs> that's why in a series where they scored... They hit home runs. They scored a lot of runs. Somehow, some way, 
even including the starting pit, pitching, who's now thrown 22 and a third consecutive scoreless innings, they somehow exit that series only winning two out of three because that's just baseball. If we throw that, if we throw in that cliche, baseball happened in the ninth inning with what you would suspect is your best pitcher overall um, without Verlander active. But hey, you win two out of three, you get you get back on the right track. You feel pretty good because the bats are alive, and then you go to Arlington and a place you do really well at. They are the defending champions. I'm sure that'll be brought up quite a bit, but you own that building. It's just unfortunate they owned your building, and that's why they got to go play in the World Series. But the Astros win. We'll, we'll talk about them. We'll hear from Espada and Jordan's big night. Jordan has got it going, and, and, the, and the entire lineup really got it going. First base will probably continue to be an issue throughout the season, but we don't have to be negative. It was good to have a stress-free night and bask in the joy that was acquiring a big-time wide receiver. So we're about oh, just over 24 hours from the trade because the trade happened right before this show started. And there are now some dissenting opinions about the trade. We'll hear from, look, this guy is an attention seeker. I don't know how seriously you can take anything he says because he's about that. He's about those clicks. He's about that getting those engagements. But we'll hear from someone who doesn't think the Texans made out well, who thinks the Bills won that trade. But he's like one of maybe one of one, very unique. I don't think I saw anyone who was like the Texans screwed themselves. It's been all about what it means for their franchise going forward and what it means for the city. And is this a, is this a legitimate contender? And certainly if you want to, you didn't get your thoughts in yesterday on the trade you want to today, you can call the show 713-780-3776. But just this level of positivity we haven't seen, this level of belief we haven't seen. And I think that's more important because we've heard like in the past, the Texans are dark horse Super Bowl contenders. That stuff even started after 2010 when people were feeling pretty good about Matt Schaub and Gary Kubiak, that stuff started then. Dark horse contenders for the Super Bowl, they're, they're next up. But now they're not even dark horse contenders. If you think about it, outside of Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, I, I haven't looked at the, the, the betting stuff. It's not my biggest concern right now because there's still a draft to happen. But if you talk about the buzz and what people think of this team, who else but the Chiefs are looked at as a Super Bowl contender as far as that that top two? I stand with, well, maybe score an offensive touchdown against Baltimore before we really have a discussion. But f as far as the narratives going after the Diggs trade, it's all about the Texans. And are they ready to be a real contender? And I think for the most part, everyone thinks so. Um, th I think there is a bit of a soft underbelly on, on the defensive side, but that's for a different time. Right now, all, pos all positives, which is something we haven't been able to say. I do find it interesting that, like a guy named Adam Rank, he is one of many pundits who talks about the NFL. He tweeted out something along the lines of NFL teams are jealous of this Texans build and how they built their franchise, and they're the in pretty much they're the envy of the, the NFL. And everyone's like, excuse me, how? And he also talked about how the teams are going to try to duplicate it, and er everyone's like, what? You mean, you mean? pay a guy at quarterback a lot of money who then goes on to do what Deshaun did, jettison him for multiple first-round picks, have three coaches in three years, finally get the right coach, then draft a young quarterback and hit on, hit on him at number two? Easy to duplicate, right? That's just easy to do, right? The Texans went about it and had a great plan in place and followed it step-by-step, step, and clearly this was how it was, it was supposed to go. Yeah, also only be in position to hire that great coach because he played for your franchise. He just happened to have a real connection with the franchise yeah. from over a decade ago. I, I saw someone say, oh, yeah, why didn't the Jets think about hiring a San Francisco defensive and coordinator? And drafting some, a quarterback <laughs> and drafting, at two. <laughs> drafting his yeah. quarterback at number yeah, how two. How the Jets didn't think about that? Just do that. <laughs> it's, it's just so easy to duplicate. Sure, being able to have a young quarterback on a on a rookie deal and have all this money to spend would be great, but it's not as if it's, this wasn't a bumpy road. Somehow they got there, which is probably the craziest part of it, that throughout all the, the missteps, the questions about the status of this franchise, even the the extreme talk of someone needs to take the franchise away from the, from the McNairs, even pushing that extreme talk aside that was never realistic, it was 
this this franchise is a joke. Houston is in trouble. Who would ever want to coach there? Who would ever want to play there? The acquisitions of accusations, the accusations of racism, despite the fact that the team continued to hire African American coaches. As soon as the name Josh McCown came up, we got to talk about racism. And and the thought was, and who knows? We don't we don't have to go through that through that alternate history or potential alternate future. The thought was if Brian Flores isn't dumped by the Dolphins and doesn't sue the NFL, the Texans are well on their way to hiring Josh McCown. This is this this is the franchise you want to replicate? No. I won't say they got lucky because you have to make a great hire. And they made the great hire in D'Amico Ryans. But one wrong move, and we're and we're in the midst of, well, what we had been through the last couple years with the Texans, wondering when we would get good football again. But we don't have to worry about that. Now you have a team where the, the consideration is how close are they to being the best team in the AFC? And sure, the the Patrick Mahomes obstacle stands in their way. He stands in the way of everyone. But why not be the next up? Like, if he's going to be the Warriors, if Mahomes is going to be the Warriors, why not? I hesitate to say this because the Rockets never got over the hump. But why not be the Rockets of that era who challenged them and pushed them and maybe with better luck would have gotten over the hump? So if if we're talking about a dynasty – standing in your way there's we've seen here that the that the dynasty was very close to falling it just so happens that bad luck got in the rock as well you just hope you have better luck but you want a challenge and 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 the texans will be one of those main challengers going forward uh, because they've had a, a really really great last 15 to 16 months so uh, all positivity there at least from our end we will hear from a guy who wasn't as positive and you can make your your judgments on whether you whether you buy into it or not. It's a lot of logic that I took issue with. It does. I don't think a lot of it made sense. But we'll hear we'll hear from him, and we'll hear from Brandon Bean. He's the general manager. Or at least I'll read some stuff from Brandon Bean. He's the general manager of the Bills. They'll explain why, or he'll explain why they made the trade. And there is some funny sound from years ago now. Vikings, the Vikings, which were the team that Stefan Dick started with, his teammates were asked questions about him while he was on the team about whether, well, to be fair, they didn't, they didn't direct, they didn't direct it at him. It all just funneled to him because the question was, who would you least like to date your sister? And all the Vikings are like, that guy, Stefan Diggs. And there's sound about why um, they don't want him. They didn't want him to date their sister, but frankly, He's going to be here to catch touchdown passes, not date C.J. Stroud's sister if he has one. Um, so it doesn't really matter. But I do think it's funny that uh, the the Stefan Dick story it is uh, kind of not a winding road, but it's one where there's pitfalls and there's some questions about attitude. But even the even his Vikings teammates at one time, great receiver, stay away from my family. So we'll so we'll play that sound uh, when we come back. But but I don't remember the last time that there was this amount of good feelings about this football team. Maybe maybe 2011. We've had this talk, Sean. Maybe 2011. Maybe the middle 2012. So we're talking about 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah. A- and I don't even – I'm not even sure if it was at this point. I think they were – it was the first time they have ever been good in the in the franchise's history, and it was – but they weren't – I didn't feel like they were Super Bowl content. No one was like, and they're going to take it to the Patriots. They're going to take it to, uh, I guess, the Ravens, who actually did win the Super Bowl that year. Like, no no one was was gung-ho looking forward to a playoff matchup and thinking that the Texans would come out on top, or at least not very many people were, whereas now – like the Texans are going to be the sexy pick to either make the definitely to make the AFC title game and maybe even be the like I'm not going to pick the Chiefs every year therefore I will pick who I think can beat the Chiefs and the it'll, the Texans are in that group. Yeah, they're one of the teams who people are going to clearly say that's your that's your division champion and that's a team who could possibly battle for a one or a two seed to at least have home field through the first two rounds of the playoffs that they play in. So it is um it's it's a new it's a new day. And the acquisitions, the star power that's on the roster now, very unique. Even even if you think back to when they were good in, in eleven or twelve, the star power is much different. I mean, 
Kevin Walter was like the second wide receiver. <laughs> it's a different it's a different ball game now. Hey, come on. He was he was. That's not yeah. a star. That's not uh, a star name. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I know he caught a big touchdown in eleven to win them the division and when they beat the Bengals on the road. But it ain't Diggs and Nico is funny. We're talking about Nico like he's a star. He's done it for one year. Yeah. And Tank I, and Tank Dell is good, uh, but he missed a large portion of the year because of injury. But people are very positive about the wide receiver core. Certainly that has a lot to do with CJ. But Kevin Walter was a three masquerading as a two. He had a great player in Andre Johnson, but the star power is just different. Owen oh, Daniels. Sure. But you got your own Daniels. He was the two. In Dal- that's true. You have your you have your you have your own Daniels comp and Dalton Schultz. And then you Oh, that's that's what? That's Dalton Schultz not a good not a as good of a disrespectful to uh, Owen Daniels. Pass catching tight end. Okay. Uh, Dal- Owen Daniels was a better blocker. Okay. But Dalton Schultz, as far as a pass catching tight end, they're very comparable. And maybe Dalton Schultz is a little better. But I think there's some profiling going on there too. What? Oh, what? <laughs> I can't compare two white tight ends to the, because a, I don't know if you've heard there are a lot of white tight ends. The comps are going to happen. They just they just will. Yeah, Owen Daniels was a better white tight end though. If you say so, maybe maybe you're just biased because he was a Texan bef- for a long time. I, Dalton Schultz has been a good tight end for a while. He's been good. Do we, I'm not going over the numbers. I'm not comparing those two. We're not getting into a fu- the, sec- the second I get you to pull up Owen Daniels I'm not pro pull- reference, nope. the pro football for reference, a line. That's, wh- that's when I win. There's a line I'm drawing. <laughs> we can talk about a lot of things. We can compare Joe Mixon to is if he was even as good as Devin Singletary last year, if we want to have that discussion. But I'm not having the Dalton Schultz versus Owen Daniels discussion, a guy who hasn't been relevant to the Texans in over half a decade, and maybe even longer. Shout out to Owen Daniels. Good Texan was part of their best teams, and now Dustin Schultz hopes to be part of a new version of those best teams. That's segment one out of the way. We'll come back with more Bills, Texans, trade stuff, because Brandon Bean, as I mentioned, explained why they traded Stephon Diggs. We'll get into some of that. Some of the numbers revolving your Houston Astros and why the 2-5 and five record isn't really indicative of who this team is, because... The way they're pitching, at least from their starters, and the way they're hitting the baseball out of the ballpark would suggest just some bad luck. And you guys watch the games. You, you've seen it, too. So a lot to get to. And also, a big game for the Rockets tonight. I mentioned them in passing, discussing who the Texans are to the Chiefs and what the Rockets were to the Warriors. Well, the, the Warriors are in town, and Draymond has some thoughts about burying the Rockets and ending their season. But there, here's a chance to keep hope alive. Hope is dim, but they got a shot. And beating the Warriors at home, would, even if it doesn't result in a playoff appearance, would be a nice way to stamp yourself as a team that will be not, maybe not a contender, but a challenger for a playoff spot next year. A lot to discuss. We'll be back.
This is the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. Shady, I, I don't like the move, but I do think it was a smart one. I think it was real smart. It was smart to move on from Stephon Diggs because you always have to sell high. Buy low, sell high. Okay. The Bills, they bought incredibly high with Stephon Diggs. Y'all know they're paying him a premium, but then they traded him for a second round pick? That's great math. Remember, Randy Moss at age 30 got a fourth round pick. Stephon Diggs got a second. The Buffalo Bills know better than mm. anybody if Stephon Diggs is over the hill, if he is talent is deteriorating. The Bills know that. So if you are able to fleece the Texans for a second round pick in the most wide receiver heavy draft we have seen in a mighty long time, this is the time to do it. It's about six or seven first round grade talents at the wide receiver position in this draft. So if you can move on from a $28 million a year caliber receiver in Stephon Diggs and get yourself a $2 million a year receiver or maybe a $2 million in totality of his contract receiver in a second round, that's what you have to do. Incredibly good timing by the Bills. If you were going to move on, sell high because you already bought high, Joy. That's Emmanuel Acho. One of the few dissenters as far as who won the trade, if, if you are siding with the Texans. And I don't particularly agree. Now, I, I'm one who says the, who wins a trade isn't determined in the 24 hours after the trade is made. We can talk about value and what it costs the Texans to get him. You're surprised that it only took a second. It didn't even really take a second because you got picks back. If Stefan Diggs is the great player for the Texans over the next couple of years, no one's going to think the Texans are fleeced. Hell, no one's going to think the Texans are, have been fleeced. People don't think the Texans have been fleeced now. So this opinion could age like milk for Acho. And as I said in the first segment, a lot of this is performative. He's talking about he's talking about things that'll get people to pay attention. And I played it to di I had Sean play it only because it is a different perspective, and we don't know exactly why the Bills made the move. We can guess. And Brandon Bean was asked about it. So I just wanted to have that lead into this. Brandon Bean asked about, he's the GM for the Bills, asked about why they did it. He danced around some issues. He didn't want to get into why specifically. He just said they weighed the pros and cons. And and when when it was put to him that why would you do it just a couple years after he signed an extension and what it might mean for your cap, he goes, hey, two years is a long time. Things change. And maybe the thing that changed is Stefan Diggs is not someone they want in their building anymore. Maybe they were fine with him a couple years ago, and now they don't. Now they aren't. And as Sean and I talked about it, Josh Allen probably is okay with this because you don't trade your star quarterback's number one wide receiver if he's not okay with it. And we're saying an offseason filled with Haley Steinfeld and no more Stephon Diggs may be a giant win for the quarterback of the Bills. And if he's okay with it, maybe we start to question why he is and, and he wasn't fighting to keep his number one there because – the narrative, right or wrong, is that Stephon Diggs, his his appearance at Buffalo changed the trajectory of Josh Allen's career. Uh, he was a struggling and accurate quarterback who people had questions with. He gets a star receiver, and he becomes one of the best players in the league. We believe C.J. Stroud is already going to – already approaching a level of being one of, the, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He didn't need a wide receiver at the level of Stephon Diggs. Now, maybe some of you think Nico's there, and, and co combining it with Tank in the system uh, is similar to – Having Stefan Diggs now, now CJ's going to have all of that. He'll have he'll have a number one. He'll have Nico. He'll have Tank, and we'll have a system that's very quarterback friendly going forward. So a lot of positives. But you but you know the Bills made this move for a reason, and it wasn't simply because we love Stefan Diggs and we and we were doing him a favor by trading him to a place maybe he wanted to go. They had the reasons for getting rid of him, and we'll see if those reasons rear their ugly head at some point here in town. What do you think the over-under is? Or, Sean, do you think he never becomes a, a an issue in Houston, or are you giving it a year, two years, or are we getting a different digs? I think, I think by Thanksgiving 2025, I think that's when we get not that's when it will happen by. I think that's like the that's when he entered the danger zone of a Stefan Diggs uh, pouting on the sideline, not talking to anyone during a 
you know, when the, everyone's huddled up while the defense is on the field and they show Stefan Diggs just sitting with his arms crossed, l- not looking at anyone. I, I would say, I would say like Thanksgiving, Halloween, um, ne- not this upcoming season, but the season after that. I feel like that's, if we're following the typical Stefan Diggs um, timeline on this, that's that's when uh, that's when it will happen. He's one guy I don't think is going to handle being a dimish- diminishing talent well, where no. everyone knows that he's not as good as he once was, but he doesn't think that's the case. He's and- still looking at Nico Collins being like, come on. <laughs> or if, I'm Stephon Dix. I don't believe he's going to be a guy who's who's self aware of what's going on. He goes, yeah, I'm not as good as I once was. I can still make plays. Um, he hasn't shown that personality. We'll see as he gets older if if he turns, I guess, on the other cheek and goes, you know what? I can't be as good as I was when I was 27, but I can still contribute. But I understand why other people are eating up targets. Uh, I don't foresee that. And and your thought that. By 2025, we've got a pouting Stefan Diggs. I, I think that's when we enter the That's when we enter zone. the potential yes, for that happening. I, th- I think it'll be a year and a half of We're good. He's good. He's happy. At least yes. he's at least he's outwardly happy. Yes. Yes. Because there's some sound from Dan Graziano we don't have to we don't have to play. He talked about the his teammates, and his teammates on the Bills were fine with him for the most part. He wasn't a problem with his teammates, but he was an issue behind the scenes. So we're not going to call him a bad teammate. It's just that if you're in the front office or the coaching staff dealing with it, dealing with Stefan Diggs, it wasn't the most pleasant experience. Mm. So maybe it's more of a when will Nick Serio be like, all right, I'm, enough, I'm enough, good. Enough of you. When will someone, the, can someone give me a fourth round pick? With when will guy? the coaching staff decide enough's enough? Yeah. But and then he trades them to like the Jets, a team that will. <laughs> the Jets are the perfect spot. <laughs> whoever whoever will trade for a 32 year old disgruntled wide receiver. Yeah, it it would probably be some team at the level of the Jets if they don't have a turnaround with Aaron Rodgers for the next couple of years if he's if he remains healthy throughout. So. The Diggs thing is will continue to be a conversation, and if you want to call in about it, certainly get in. A lot of positivity. If you're, for some reason, not all that thrilled, we're cool with that, too. Um, we're taking all opinions here, 713-780-3776. We're not shunning anyone who decides um, this isn't the move that they like. Open marketplace of ideas. Certainly. We welcome all. Uh, you've heard this show. You've heard the callers. <laughs> don't th- you've heard them? <laughs> yeah, we, you know what they. You, you know we welcome everybody. <laughs> yeah, you know we don't discriminate when it comes to opinions. Bring them. Uh, but the team who's kind of r- ruled this market for years now are, are the Astros. They get a win last night. They beat the they beat they beat the Blue Jays, and it wasn't great, Javier, but it was good enough. Um, didn't give up a run. Was struggled with his command it, as he has wanted to do. Wasn't a wasn't the type of outing he had in game one where he didn't get a win, uh, but the but the bat showed up, so he gets a win in, let's say, the lesser of the two outings for him. But it just goes to show you that the Astros, despite what the record is, have top-of-the-line talent. We're now at 22 and a third scoreless innings for their starters. They're, they're an elite unit, and that is without Verlander. They've been elite over the – over the, the first week of the season, and you think about the guys who've done it, Ronel Blanco. You have you've had JP France, Hunter Brown, all these guys who there are some questions about them because of whether can they do it again, or guys like Javier and Fromber who maybe v- validated some of your concerns, but when they're on, they can be big time. And we saw really good Fromber in a game that they lost, and you and we saw okay Javier in a game that they won. So. Um, the bats, when they show up, certainly change things. And they showed up last night in an easy win over the Blue Jays. And one of, and one of those guys was Jordan. Had a big night. couple home runs, missed another. And Espada talked about Jordan. And not just his night, because we can get to that, but he talked about Yor- Jordan knows when he's close. And, and he talked about Jordan coming to him yesterday and the discussion about about I'm close. I almost hit, I almost hit one out, and it, it's great to n- have a hitter know when he's about to go on a hot streak. And here's Joe Espada discussing Jordan and his ability to know that a hot streak is around the corner. You start seeing um, adjustments, you know, in his hands, and um, you know he just missed that fly ball to right field yesterday. Kind of 
got it with the end of the bat, and he comes in, and he's like, I'm closed. Anytime he says he's closed, he's, he, he feels it. He's strong. He's such a good hitter. It's fun to watch. Yeah, he did feel it. He was one of – he was the star of the night. The Astros lineup was the star of the night. And no blunders, right? No Jake Myers falling face first. No Altuve doing something that we laugh at. And then, oh, that's just Jose Altuve. So a good night all around. And so so the Astros win the third game of the series, win the series, and now they see the Rangers, a Rangers team. I've looked at a lot of Adoles, Adoles Garcia because – a lot of Astro Twitter is after him. He does have Simpson, Simpson baseball head. If you know that, if you remember that episode where where Mr. Burns accumulated all the stars of the '90s and all, and a lot of them, or at least a couple of them, had steroid head or whatever you want to call them. I don't know what what's going on with Garcia, but he reminds me of like Daryl Strawberry from that episode where his head's giant. I'm not accusing. Hey, you. You want to see me sock some dingers? That's what you're putting on <laughs> Adoles Garcia? I don't know what's going on there, but it is part of the rivalry to point out what happened to, what happened to his physique, physique over the last couple of years. And it's it's startling, the comparison. Um, but the, the Astros see him tonight. Um, we'll see if there's any if there's an altercation because we know the, these teams had issues in that World Series. And I'm not World Series, that ALCS. And you, that's expected. These are two teams battling for a chance to go win a World Series, and the back and forth was there. The the strutting after home runs was there. Getting guys getting hit by pitches were there. So it's not. It wasn't just the play itself. It was all the shenanigans. So we'll see what happens tonight. Or we'll see what. Excuse me. We'll see what happens in the series overall. I don't suspect it'll be the case. We'll see if Brian Abreu, if the if if the Rangers take issue with anything he does, because that was kind of the the jumping off point for for that series last year beyond the strutting after home runs. But good to play the Rangers. Good to maybe go up to what you feel is a place you you excel at and continue that. And just look up at that crappy banner that's up there and go, that should that belongs to us. Uh, Ryan, you want to talk about Adoles Garcia. We'll talk about him with you when we come back.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. Just want to clean up something that happened in the previous segment. It wasn't Daryl Strawberry who had the giant head. It was Ken Griffey Jr. on The Simpsons. He drank some tonic and had a giant forehead, which mimics what Adolis Garcia has right now. I don't know if Garcia's drinking a tonic, uh, but Ryan wants to talk about the Ranger Slugger. What's up, Ryan? Hey, sports to you, fellas. I'm not even – go ahead. <laughs> go on. Uh, okay. Uh, so wasn't there, wasn't there a weird story that came out with Adolis Garcia's mother? I thought that was a uh, – There was a weird video about Aroldis Chapman. Aroldis Chapman, not Adolis Garcia. <laughs> Are you, do you, do you uh, know okay, a story? Okay, so I got it wrong now. I got it. I got a second one for you. Okay. So what's the over and under on Brittany Snow being on OnlyFans? Just wondering. That's a – it's not a name from the past. Brittany Snow of um, American Dreams fame. Wait, That's way back when. I'm trying to think what people know her from now. Was she in the Pitch Perfect series? She was in Pitch Perfect. Yeah. She is a – The pacifier. She is a blonde actress who's maybe now in her 40s. I don't don't know um, now. But She's she, in Hairspray? Yes, she's been in plenty. She is recently divorced. So maybe Ryan saw an interview of her talking about it, and that's why he's thinking about it. She's coming. She's on hard times without a husband, so maybe <laughs> she's going to go to Olin fans. I would say she's done too much work to go know. there. I you don't, don't think so? I, I have, she I have she has TV money from being a kid. Like she, That series went on for a couple years, right? Yeah, but her parents might have stole it from her. I don't know how old she was. You might be right. I don't know. But I'm going to say, and she was in multiple Pitch Perfect movies. She's in three Pitch so Perfects. But. That money kept getting larger as that series kept going. She wasn't I, getting Anna Kendrick money. Well, no, she wasn't the she wasn't the first on the max call sheet. Con, max contract. Yeah, she wasn't first on the call sheet. Well, now that, I guess Ryan could think of if she's the breadwinner, maybe she had to give half to her husband. I don't know if a prenup was involved, so he thinks she may be on hard time. She's 38 years old. Um, surely Hollywood treats women of that age very fairly. Um, because we know that to be the case. But I feel like she has enough connections. Now she's a director. She's gotten out of the the strictly acting thing. She's directing. So she has another avenue potentially to to uh, continue to support herself. Ryan, I'm going to say there is a less than 1% chance that happens, that you see Britney Snow and OnlyFans. Less than one? Less than one. I feel like she's going to be able to continue to work. She's got friends in the business. There are always going to be opportunities, and we haven't heard like of a scandal surrounding her, so she doesn't have that stink on her. I feel like, Ryan, you continue to pick women who have viable careers going. On on IMDb, you can uh, see all, you know the list of movies that she's in, but there's also a tab for like upcoming movies. How many are there? There's six up- Yeah, upcoming. Ryan, sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of work I had for Britney Including Snow. a Christmas one, Cupid okay. and Me. Oh, the Hallmark movies, you can continue to work doing that yeah. stuff. I think she's done a co- one of those in the past. Uh, the Hallmark stuff, they 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 hire actresses of her level, and they just pump those movies out. They like, should just mark it on IMDb, like, this is a Hallmark movie. Because yeah, I can't tell. They at least let us know beforehand. Like, <laughs> yeah, just put a little, like, tag by it where it's like, Hallmark. Hallmark. Provided. HM. Pre- presented by Hallmark. <laughs> yeah. HM. Yeah, Ryan, nah. Forget about it. You're going to have to come back with another one. You're these the problem is you you've heard of these women so they're too damn successful. Well, I think it, it wasn't um one of the ladies on Sopranos and she uh was on only fans now. Is it Drea De, De Matteo? I, I, I think. The, so. the Christopher's girl? Yeah. Is that the one you're talking and about. So, I think he he has that in his mind of everyone who's been in something notable. It's like there's a chance. Yeah, she was in that show for she was on that show for a long time. But the problem is that show ended in 06. 20 years ago. Do you remember the last time she worked? Um, <laughs> if you don't, she's and she's been in stuff like an episode here, an episode there. Okay. Uh, she was in Mayans last year, so she's got upcoming stuff. I don't even know if she's the one we're talking about. I'm not sure she's the one who does have an OnlyFans. But yeah, Ryan, try try again next time. The, Britney Snow's not. It's not gonna happen, buddy. <laughs> the, the, the jury has decided. Yeah. Not gonna happen. We don't even need a third vote. Well, I, where do you stand? Uh, I'll I'll put in as no as no. well. I think the percentage is higher. You think it's higher? I don't I think, think so. No. I think we just saw six upcoming projects. Yeah, that does that, that does that make it speaks hard. to maybe it's zero for Ryan. Ryan, 
Um, another blonde woman. He uh, he has an affinity for blonde women and, and blonde women and their and their potential to maybe have to do OnlyFans. I think he's over four now. Um, try again. I'm sure there's another name on your list. I mean, there. I don't know if she's ever done nudity. Maybe that's what you can expect, Ryan. Maybe she'll do a movie, and you'll be able to. I won't say enjoy, but just watch. <laughs> that's that's the best it's gonna get. As uh as we move on from that. Those are those are the numbers, at least the percentages for for Britney Snow being an OnlyFans model. She's I don't think she's gonna lead the league in in that percentage, but Gander Diaz. Once again, more reasons to thank Dusty. He is the league leader in hits. The man rakes. And um it just makes people angrier and angrier every time he gets a hit. But this show jokingly has decided he wouldn't be this guy if not for Dusty Baker spoon feeding him major league baseball it was all part of the plan so all part of the plan to to produce a league leader in hits and and a potential pudge rodriguez um on, on the astros it just took dusty being the uh being papa uncle dusty or papa dusty whatever you want to call him and going you know what man a little bit at a time just a little bit and when i'm out of here and joe spot is ready to go and you're ready to go everyone's going to reap the benefits and that's what we've seen Yiner is unbelievable. Um, I don't even even it, now it's early in the year. Caveats thrown in there, but I don't think anyone could have suspected, despite what he showed last year, that he would be this type of hitter. And certainly he won't be hitting 500. But this is a guy who, when, when we talk about this offense going forward, and we're, now I'm thinking about years down the line, he's going to be one of the guys we, we discuss about. Can he be be a catcher? For long because how do we don't want to ruin him we do we move him the first base and there's an open spot there i um, mean first base isn't exactly a strength for the astros hey hey <laughs> it isn't jose brave is on under contract for this year and next oh i'm aware of the money that's involved and why he's going to continue to get at bats but i yeah i guess two years from now or a season after the next season the yiner the first thing I think we'll build because if he's going to hit like this, you, you want to make sure he's he's a guy who will be available day after day. And uh, we know the catching position can put a real strain on the body. So Yiner, man, um, he he he's a guy to he's a he's a joy to watch. I mean, you got Jordan, you got Yiner, you got plenty, but the Yiner thing is pretty cool to watch that guy uh, take over as a full time starting catcher and flourish. When do you think people will stop being? mad at dusty every time he gets a hit do you think do you think that there will be a time or a time this season where yonder diaz doesn't have a big night and everyone's first reaction is like uh can't can't believe this guy didn't play last year like do you think they'll become a tipping point is it until next this year's playoffs <laughs> how, how long are we i have think to do this? i think the that particular phrase i can't believe he didn't play last year is something people love. So I don't think it stops until next season where they can't, oh, I can't believe he didn't play two years ago. Yeah, or, yeah, 2023. Yeah. You know, like, I, I, can't I can't believe he didn't play him in 2023. Yeah, I think I think we're, do we're doing a whole year of this. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to be prepared. Yeah. Because I, 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 I am now, and this is ridiculous because it's, what, seven games into the season. I am now actually being like, he, he is going to be an all-star this year. Yeah. <laughs> he is going to be an all-star. And so I already know that's going to kind of kick things back up for his first full season starting if he's a, if if he makes it uh, to be an all-star. Well, we have a lot of thinking of Dusty. Yeah. Do. The man went 2 for 5 and that the batting average went down yesterday. That's how good he's been through the first uh Gotta step it up week of the season. Hey man, yeah, we need we need you to stay in that 470 range. Yeah. What are maybe, you doing? Maybe Caratini to uh starts uh on Friday. <laughs> don't. I don't. Oh, yeah. I, I just don't want him to get worn down. Well, you know? we know Karen, Carantini is per, apparently Fromber's guy. Oh, is he? Well, he pitched well with Fromber. Oh, yeah. Well, Fromber pitched well with Caratini catching him in his last outing. So we, I, let's not do that. <laughs> I'm just. Let's not. I that. am just saying. Not, not that Yiner won't go to. Won't, not that Yiner won't be available for at bats and yeah, at DH, DH. But And then you're putting Jordan on. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, I don't know, left, left field. Uh, but. It appears if if 
Fromber's going to pitch that well, that Caratini might be his guy, which will certainly limit the the time that Yiner spends behind the plate, which is not a bad thing as long as long as it doesn't become a thing where it limits his, his at-bats, and I don't see that happening. He's just been too good. Jeff, you want to talk about Yiner? We'll talk about Yiner as much as you'd like. On the other side, we are late for a break. So Jeff or anyone else wants to talk about, as, as Sean has labeled him, all-star Yiner Diaz. <laughs> you can do that, 713-780-3776. We will be back. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios is the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. 
Lance Zerline walked into the studio for a little bit only because there is a promise of food and he's waiting. That's all. He was, tr- he was questioning me on where the food was. I'm right there with you, man. I was told food. Um, and we, we are certainly looking forward to it. And But don't come into the studio. You stay out. I'm not looking for you to call me to the carpet for that. You uh, made a good point about um, how we are still waiting uh, uh, regarding when we were told that food would be here yes. at 1030. And when was that email uh, sent to us? April 1st, which would huh. suggest that it could be a joke, but it's a really specific thing and really targeted for, like, for three people. <laughs> like, you decided I wanted to fool – he, the person would have decided to fool me, you, and Joe for whatever reason. I really want to make these guys think three days from now, <laughs> food is coming, <laughs> but not really. I will say, though, it is probably the best and meanest one you could do. It is true. <laughs> for either of us. Because – as we talked about, we we don't really get hungry until about one o'clock, two o'clock. When well, you're still here, but I'm on my way home. Uh, but the anxiety of thinking food that was promised isn't coming is really messing with us a little bit and making us hungrier hungrier than we really probably actually are. But hey, we're looking forward to it, and hopefully this person didn't pull off one of the more mean but actually well placed April Fool's jokes. You never think if they're going so small that they're actually trying to target you, but you never know. But hopefully it's a real thing, and we'll see food here shortly. Certainly looking forward to it. But Jeff, food won't really help him, but he does want to talk about Yiner. What's up, Jeff? Thanks for taking my call. Um, I don't want to dump on Dusty too much. He, but he, you know, Yiner obviously was ready to hit, but he may not have been ready to pitch considering we we're going to have J.P. France and Hunter Brown, basically rookies. So he went with Maldonado. Understandable. I promise you, Dusty wouldn't have left Cole, the biggest stud in your stable, kicking, kicking and snorting in the bullpen in Game 7. I bet the house on that. But lineup-wise, why don't we split up Tucker and Alvarez and put Yiner in between them? And then Braggs and everybody else falls in line behind that. I'd love to see him split up those two left-handers since we only got two left-handers in the in the lineup now. Just thanks for taking my call, guys. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it, Jeff. Yeah, we've seen a spot. He made the big move uh, as far as the lineup was putting Yiner at – not Yiner, excuse me, uh, Jordan at two, at the two – in the two spot. Will he be more liberal with his decisions as far as, well, Yiner's been really, really good. Let's move him out, out, out of a spot he was he's really great at to change the change the lineup. That's, that'll be something to look at going forward because, you know, a lot of times it's like, hey, he's great here. Why would I move him? Um, and when the offense is on it, they're, they're dynamic, uh, at least when they're against the Blue Jays. We'll see if that, tra- if that translates when they go to Arlington. Um, but they've been really, they were really, really good in this series except for, you know, the one game. But, uh, but they put up a lot of runs when they get going. Hashtag relentless. So I, I am interested to see how Espada handles different things going on. Is Yiner too good to be in, in the spot he is now? Should he be moved up to three, or will or will he will he acquiesce to the guys who've done it for a while and say Tucker, that's you're my guy, you're going to stay at three? I think there's some of that going on where it, it is a it is a an acknowledgement of what Jordan and T- Tucker have done long term and just the type of hitters they are that I think. Because we've seen, we saw Yiner, he started the season batting six. Yeah, he's already moved him up. Batting behind uh, Jose Abreu. And then, like you said, he's already moved him up because Abreu has gotten like three hits, two hits all year. And uh, Yiner cannot not <laughs> get on base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so they he's already made that kind of, you know, reactionary sounds like a negative, but it is like a reactionary move. He's just reacting to the evidence. Yes, and so I think there's probably going to need be need to be a longer sample size because if we're being honest, for most of last year, Yiner was a better hitter than than uh, Abreu was, and so I can see how he makes that move this early in the season. But moving Yiner up past Bregman, past uh, Tucker, just to split up the lefties, that would be uh, 
I feel like that would be a bit aggressive, and it would not be something that they do until probably later in the season, maybe after he's already after I already successfully get him to the All Star game. Yeah, after he's a uh, yeah, we can't have our All Star hitting catcher hitting that low in the lineup. No, we gotta, no, but you know, maybe, maybe that if if splitting up the lefties does become a thing, it might be a Bregman hits between them, which is something we've already seen before. Um, splitting them up that way, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that Yiner is going to get to the three spot this early. Yeah, and, and and the other thing about it is Bregman is the slow starter. So are you elevating Yiner, who's been great over the notoriously so, slow starting Bregman, when you expect that him that he will come out of this and he'll be the out to Bregman you want him to be, and then. The, it's baseball. And I don't know the egos, but you assume egos oh. play a part. And you really, you think it's dumb, I guess, for it to play a part because. But it does. But it does. And, and it, part of it isn't just ego. Part of it is like routine. And yeah, some guys true. get super particular about. They don't like being, you know, jacked around in the lineup. Like they just they just want to be in their spot. They can prepare to be in that spot, and then they do their job. Now some of that does get a, into a little bit of. Um, the Framber Valdez mental game zone where I, I respect that your, uh, you know, your ability to want uh, to have a routine, but at some point you're being ridiculous <laughs> with your, <laughs> yeah. with your routine and your request. Um, and that, that one for hitters being like, no, I want to hit in this particular spot, especially when your play doesn't, um, and I'm not saying any, this applies to those guys yet. But when your play doesn't, you know, speak to you deserving that spot, that that's when it starts getting a little ridiculous with the uh, with the lineup uh, stuff. Yeah, the way Fromber pitched last year, his insistence on having a, a particular catcher, like you could, if you pitch better, we'll listen. Yeah. Um, but if you're not going to pitch better, uh, why will why will we acquiesce? Yeah. But you, you know, know, you know, we're not taking suggestions from a Taylor Scott once either. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, you have to reach a certain level of productivity before we'll start to bend, bend, bend to your will. And Yiner had Caratini, and he was great. We'll see if that's what it is going forward. And if Yiner's we not Yiner, uh, Fromber had Caratini, and Fromber is a guy who apparently is one who is sensitive. The right word, um, volatile, particular, particular. There it is. Very. That's pat- that's the neutral word. Yes, very it. particular about things. And if Caratini is going to be behind the plate and that's going to lead to what we saw on on Tuesday great it was Tuesday right he was great on Tuesday they, they still lost that's yes. how that broke down okay yes. if, when, he, yesterday was, was when, I'm trying to remember <laughs> I'm trying to remember when he pitched uh, yeah. but Tuesday yes so if that's what we're going to get from him on a consistent basis then I guess Caratini can catch and we'll move Yiner to a different spot uh, but it, this is all about why all because Yiner's been great. He's not the only one. Jeremy Pena has gotten off to a really good start. The power is back, another home run. Uh, so the swing alterations working just fine through the first week of the year, and we'll see how they how, how it goes now that they're leaving um, the fr- not-so-friendly confines of Minute Maid and heading to Arlington to face the Rangers. That'll wrap up, wrap up Hour 1. We'll get into some Rocket stuff, mostly because they have – it's a consequential game – Mostly because if they lose, let's we can wrap up any hopes of the play-in. But even if they even if they win, it's going to be a tough road. But it is still a game that is is important, even if it's just this one-off of playing the Warriors in a pseudo playoff type atmosphere. Mostly because it ends your season if they lose, uh, it'll it will be something to focus on. And certainly Draymond Green has thoughts on it, so we will hear from him when we come back.
Welcome to hour two of the show. We'll get to the Draymond Green sound here shortly. But Sean brought up a name and and a reason for him not being at what amounts to a walkthrough before a game. And I only, I'm only bringing him up because he might be one of the reasons the, the Rockets don't make the playoffs uh, beyond the whole slow start to the year. But remember when Golden State had that t- – had those two games in the state of Florida on back-to-back nights, and the Rockets were closer to them than they are now as far as the play-in chase. I think they might have been a game back or maybe a half a game back. But the thought was, okay, the Warriors are going into Florida. They're going to play a Heat team who's who's trying to stay out of the play-in and also an Orlando Magic team who's having a pretty good year. And then the news came down that Jimmy Butler was at a tennis tournament the night before and was sick, and now he's not going to play. First, he was – Probable, then questionable, then out. And that immediately torpedoed the Heat's chances of beating the Warriors, and it helped the Warriors gain some distance from the Rockets, and then they went on to beat Orlando the next night despite Draymond getting thrown out of the game very early. So that that game, that set of two games, probably changed the, the complexion of the season for the Rockets because despite all the winning, the Warriors continue to win. Now the Warriors, I think, have a five-game winning streak, the longest streak in the NBA right now. And I bring all that up because Jimmy Butler is once again absent from a shoot around. We don't know why he's probable to play, but it could be anything. Cause if you saw yesterday, he was seen in Miami, just riding a horse in the street on a big horse in a still shot. Just, I don't, I don't know if he was filming a commercial or he just decided he wanted to ride a horse someplace. So Sean pointed out that personal, cause he's been listed as v- probable, but he's not at shoot around because of a personal reason. And Sean said, Personal generally means something maybe bad happened and you need to take care of it. But considering he's supposed to play, it's more like, personally, I don't want to be there. Yeah, no, personally, I'm unavailable to be the, at shoot-around at, at a s- noon central. Stupid-ass shoot-around. <laughs> yeah. I'm filming a commercial or something else, so yeah. I'll be there when it's time to be there, you think. Because he was probable for that Warriors game, and it turned out he wasn't going to play. He was too sick or hungover or whatever it was. But I just think, the merc- mercurial nature of Jimmy Butler may have determined the Rockets' fate, unfortunately. <laughs> Just because he wanted to hang out with Carlos Alcaraz. Yeah, and I'm sick. Go to the Miami Open. Really, the, the Rockets got screwed that the Miami Open Happened was in to town. Be, yeah. <laughs> if it was a week later, you wouldn't have had to worry about it. He, uh. he probably would have been home and not sick, and he would have. And by the way, the, the capper to that story is he, after being ruled out sick and then being ruled that he'd be probable for the next game, he was back at the Miami Open. And people are like, oh, if you miss this game, nothing would happen because he's Jimmy Butler. But the, the- no, I will say being going to the Miami Open, being out listed as sick, and then going back to the Miami Open, that by itself is not a good look. No, it is not. It is not a good look. No, it is not. And his his willingness to enjoy his life down in Miami, and you understand it, may have cost yeah. the Rockets a chance. I thought we got at lucky. The play-in. I thought we were getting lucky because the F1 wasn't uh, – in town that week or who could, anything. Who could who could imagine that he would he would he would put being at the Miami Open over even, being available for an actual game. I didn't even know Miami Open was the tournament. Yeah, Come on. No idea. Uh, that's uh Stephen Ross bringing all these events to the city of Miami. Uh, thank you Stephen Ross. He's <laughs> another yeah, screwed the Rockets over. Uh but the Rockets do play the Warriors tonight in a game that is big. It still means something just doesn't mean as much as it could have because the Warriors can't stop winning, and the Rockets had a tough run the last couple nights. They had to host the Mavericks, and Luka was amazing in the first quarter, and and that led to a Rockets loss, and then they go to Minnesota in a game where they were up by 10 in the first half uh, midway through the second quarter, and then they give, gave up like a 23-4 to run. I think it, they were at 41-31, to and the half ended with them being um, – down 54 to 45 and they fought back in the second half late in the fourth quarter they were within one Mike Conley hit a runner and then the Rockets had a bad possession um, following that and that kind of ended their hopes there so the Warriors are in town Draymond knows that this is a chance to end the Rockets season and he talked about it on his podcast because why wouldn't he really big time win for us especially with uh the Rockets coming out to play um (laughs) <laughs> they have lost a couple in a row. And, you know, you, you're three games behind with seven games left, and you're losing the tiebreaker. So four games behind, in a sense, with seven to go. Uh, 
my math serves me correctly, tomorrow will be an opportunity to end their season, uh, their playoff hopes. If my math serves me correctly, maybe there will be one more game. I haven't looked that up. Uh, that's just some rough math for you math geniuses out there that's going to be like, no, they're not mathematically uh, eliminated. And you, like, great. Almost. Uh, Draymond. Draymond, I know what you're doing there, but like he's listening. I, I accused the, the, the previous show of doing hey, that. Now I'm doing be. it too. He he's in be. town. He might be listening. Yeah. I would suggest I would suggest it's already a loss that you're even having this discussion about the Rockets this late in the year for, when you're the Warriors. I suggest no matter what happens tonight, you are on the short end of this because this is a topic of conversation for the four-time champions. That you <laughs> no, are- the the fact that they won the battle for the tenth seed in the uh-huh. West. Uh-huh. You think that's somehow a negative? It, they beat mm-hmm. out a team who's. Two best players are 21 years old. And, and they lost one of them? And the other one wasn't one of their best players until March 5th? <laughs> yes. You are shooting back at a player who hasn't played, as you pointed out in, in the last time we played sound from him, in months. You responded multiple times. This is already a loss. The Rockets have already beat you, no matter what happens tonight. That that you're divert you're devoting attention to what should be another regular season game for you as you're maybe trying to get positioning for a four or five seed. No, you are trying to lock up a ten seed and then knowing you have to go on the road in game one and then in game two if you beat the Lakers. This is where we are. This is where you are. So I where think you find yourself. I think this is a win for the Rockets no matter what. You're the Warriors. What are you doing? Talking to Tar Eason multiple <laughs> times on your podcast. <laughs> I hope Tari Eason goes to the game tonight. He has to be at the game, right? Maybe. Well, he likes to tweet from home and watch the games from home. But in this instance, <laughs> yeah, he should I, be on the sidelines. I was going to say, it's not like he has to buy a ticket. No. Like, it, like, it, I get he he maybe likes to watch the game from home. He does have VIP treatment. He, he just loves he just loves uh, Craig Ackerman. He's like, man. <laughs> I don't know. Normally, I don't get to listen to him when I'm out there. No, he's I, had, he has plenty. Him he and had, Hollins are pretty got pretty good chemistry. Unfortunately, he's had plenty of opportunities to listen to him this year. Um, just the nature of an injury. But, yeah, the Rockets tonight, 7 p.m., could be as Draymond was going through the rough math of it. It's not math. They wouldn't be mathematically eliminated, but they would. They're all for really, for all intents and purposes, eliminated right now because yeah. the run they have to go on and the, and the downturn the Warriors would have to go on no matter what happens tonight would be drastic. But it's a nice night to pay attention to your team. Um, you know, it'll, you can you can have the two screen thing going if you want to um, watch. You know, it's not not the Astros; they won't be playing yeah, tonight. But other say. other baseball, if you want to do that, or or the NHL, I don't know. But they're but Shogun. The, yeah, sure. I, I I caught up on Shogun. But if you want to watch something else on on a small screen and have the Rockets up on the uh, on the big screen, great. Um, it it is a an important game to see where this team is and. You can tell from Draymond's attitude, despite some of the trolling, they want to put the Rockets away tonight. Let's see if the Rockets respond. Uh, it'll just be maybe a smaller step than we had hoped as they try to continue to become a team that is having – it's not fighting the 10 seed the ten seed for a play-on spot, but is really next season hoping just to be a team thinking about playoff positioning as opposed to being on the outside looking in. This is a game we thought could, like you said, be important for <laughs> – I, I I'm sorry. I cannot get over the phrase could be important for the 10 seed in the West. Like <laughs> it's what, nuts, isn't it? What are we talking about? Yeah. But could be you know, where, where this Rockets team is, could be important. This is a game we thought could be important for the 10 seed in the West. I, now it isn't. But I still think it is time or it's the opportunity to make a statement. I think it's a statement game. Will they the wear their Rockets. statement jerseys? Uh, well, they're handing out the T-shirt with the dunk guy on it. Those, oh, I guess that's the city. That, those edition. are the city edition oh jerseys. Yeah. Thanks, Nike. Uh, <laughs> thanks that I have to know this, <laughs> Nike. Yeah. It used to just be road, road, or, and an alternate maybe. A couple are alternate. Now it's a city. Edition now they all jersey. have names. They right? all have names. Uh, so the Rockets, no matter what jerseys they're playing in tonight, have a chance to at least make it interesting the rest of the way, and and just be able to tell Draymond, you're not gonna, you're not gonna practically clinch on our home floor. Hey, you could push around the old Rockets. You could push around yeah. James Harden. You could push around 
Eric Dwight Gordon? Howard, Eric Gordon, Chris Paul. You couldn't push around P.J. Tucker, but he was no. on those teams. Because if you tried, it'd be a problem for yes. you. Yeah. But you will not push around Jalen Green. You will not push around Dylan Brooks. Well, you already have, but yeah. you won't do it again. No, you won't. You can, you already won 0 and 1 all time against Fred Van Vliet in the finals. Thank you. Sure, it Boom. took multiple catastrophic injuries, but still, and he was the, the sixth man. <laughs> the record, he was like the maybe the fourth or fifth best player on that team. But whatever, he won a title. Yeah, you will not be able to push around Jeff Green. You will not be able to push around Jabari Smith. Although you probably did push around Jeff Green when he was a Cav. But you will still. not be able to push around Amin Thompson. No, this new day. We're setting we're setting the standard. You guys are old. Uh, That's the you, statement. You're past your prime. This is this is new blood, and we're going to show you that they're going to be a problem going forward. And of course, next year the ten seed is ours. Hopefully, more. <laughs> hopefully, 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 we're not having this discussion with six Clay or seven T- games left Clay Thompson, in the year. Clay Thompson, enjoy your last ten games on the <laughs> Golden State Warriors. Yeah, enjoy, enjoy getting smacked around by the Lakers in uh in that nine ten matchup in L A. So we'll see how it plays out tonight. But at least something to focus on with the Astros off. But the Rockets playing a team that is actually paying attention to them, and it's the four time champion, Golden State Warriors. I really hope Draymond gets thrown out early, just so I can get another Steph reaction. Yeah, the most recent dynasty in, in NBA basketball is is clapping back at Tari Eason because they because they have the ten seed because of an Instagram post because of a Tari Eason Instagram post about the ten seed in the West. Yeah, him com- him mimicking a movie from 1979. This is where we're at. This is where the Warriors at. I'll take all the entertainment they want to give us, but Draymond. I would say it's beneath you, but I've seen your act. It's not beneath you. We appreciate you paying attention to our team, and hopefully they make your life difficult tonight. And if you want to bet on this game, you know where you go. You go to MyBookie. MyBookie.ag gives you the opportunity. If you like the Rockets tonight or you like the 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 odds on Jalen Green scoring over a certain number, MyBookie has you squared away. It's the one-stop shop for all your sports betting and casino needs, complete with real-life Vegas experiences right from the comfort of your phone. Take your viewing experience to the next level with a real with the real live betting that lets you stream and bet the games right from mybookie.ag. Sign up now and take advantage of a generous welcome bonus on your first deposit all the way up to $1,000. If you put in 200, you get 300 ready to play instantly using promo code bet975. And of course, you know the fun doesn't stop there. You'll get up to the minute odds, props, and this week's expert predictions to help you decide who to put your money on. And the best part about mybookie, you can bet on anything anytime. From anywhere. If you think UConn's delay getting to Phoenix is going to affect them, you can put some money down on anyone but UConn winning the title. My bookie has you covered. Just use promo code BET975 to secure your welcome bonus today only with my bookie.
The Del Olalea Show continues on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's your host, Del Olalea. Welcome back. And the talk about the Rockets isn't just from current NBA champions. The two, the two guys probably along with Doc Rivers, who have milked the most out of one title, are Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. Like, I know that team was great, the invention of the big three, but the fact that you only won one. You made a finals again, and you lost the Lakers. You can point to injuries, like maybe Kendrick Perkins, of all people, you want to blame for not being able to close that out when you went back to L.A. But that, those, that team won one title, and they're looked at as legendary. Man, the Mavericks won one title. Are they a legendary basketball team? No, but but the but those two Celtics, along with Doc Rivers, have milked it for all it's worth, and now we're talking about 16 years ago now. But they were talking on the on Truth and the Ticket podcast in reference to their nicknames as players, and they were discussing the Rockets. What are they going to do? And that's been a discussion here. Without Shingun, they've taken off. We'll see how they close out the season after losing the last two, and and. I'll throw it in there that they had started playing well with, with Shingun, and that's forgotten by me because it's, it, it's been a long time since we played. But they're in the midst of turning it around with Shingun. But the talk has been look how great Jalen Green is without him. So here's Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett discussing uh, the Rockets' next move. Stepping up right now, Pete. He might have been holding them back. Man, he was holding them up. What you mean? He was one of their top, if not their best player, bro. You can't bro. say that. You can't say that. I get it. The numbers say that. So let me say this. When the one thing, say that. When, when you lose a weapon, you got to, you really have no choice but to switch it up and go to something else because you don't have that no more, right? When you can make this adjustment and then still thrive, that's what I'm saying. He, he wasn't holding it up. He was a he was yeah. an anchor. He yeah. out now. Now they're playing a whole nother way now because they got so to. This might be the way they need to play. Okay, say Did that. It. it was a longer conversation than what Kevin Garnett, who was talking about how important Shingun was, Paul Pierce was the dissenting voice is that he meant by anchor, not holding them down, but he was the reason why uh, they were afloat. Uh, and then the discussion became, well, maybe, maybe without him, they're better. Uh, you know, the big man, Kevin Garnett doesn't think so. Paul Pierce thought differently. And then they got into how much it would cost to pay them. And can you pay them both? And who, and what about Jabari Smith? Although Paul Pierce initially called him Jabari Parker. Hey, he misstep, but he, he corrected himself. But I just wanted to throw in Paul Pierce slander. That's just part of my my deal. But I know I noticed. Yeah, I can't stand the Celtics for multiple reasons. You pooped on the court. Let's be clear. Uh, you pooped on yourself on the court. Let's be clear. Faking injuries because of that. Uh, clearly, <laughs> there's no bias here. Okay, so the power rankings of who milked the most out of out of the two, uh, 08 Celtics. Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers. He's won. number one. Doc Rivers. I think won. those guys overcame Doc Rivers to win a title, and then the rest of them. In, Starting with Paul Pierce, Cam Garnett. I think Pierce won. I think Pierce you, even, won even beyond Doc. Oh no, uh, I mean of the players. But Doc is obviously number Pierce one. is number one of the players. Yeah, Cam Garnett was a Hall of Fame player before he even put on Celtics green. Paul Pierce was a Celtics legend. He wasn't an NBA legend, but you know they gravitate towards the guys. I understand he's your guy. You love him. Paul Pierce was fine, a good player. He won that title. Now, I, now he wants to put himself as one of the best of all time. Stop it. The next amongst players? Be beyond Pierce? Beyond Pierce. Kendrick, Kendrick Perkins. Perkins. <laughs> Clearly. Kendrick Perkins. Clearly. He's got that one title, and, and he's turned that into a a post-career that involves being on ESPN every, all the time. Of e course. Even per even during his career, I he feel like. He would lean on that. He <laughs> would. <laughs> you should listen to me because I won a title as their fifth, sixth best player. It'd be like. I don't want to throw slant. It'd be like if Fred Van Fleet did it. About the Raptors If title? he went in and was – all he talked about was how he won a title and why you should follow him. Well, Siakam was better than you in that series. I don't want to slander – Kawhi Leonard's the only one who really – And Kyle Lowry was, had a great series. I don't want to slander Fred Van Fleet because he's not Kendrick Perkins. Kendrick yeah. Perkins is the dude who will do that. Stop it. You start naming the more important Celtics on that, on that team and – you're 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 low on the list, buddy. James Posey was probably more important. Leon Poe had some good big moments. Thank you, big baby, big baby. Kendrick Perkins. Big baby hasn't really leveraged uh, hey, see, the title still, as much. He, he tried to. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know if being a, a NBA champion 
is how you make your in in the porn directing industry because that's what he did for a little bit. He tried it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, I'm Big Baby Davis. I don't. I don't know if you know. I won a title with the Celtics. Can I direct your porn? <laughs> 2008. <laughs> yeah. 2008 Celtics. Can I? Will you let me direct this this movie? I don't know if he did that, but yeah, we haven't heard a lot from Glenn Big Baby Davis about the title and and trying to use it as a way to be a part of basketball going forward. But Kendrick Perkins, number two behind Paul Pierce. Well, the point of the discussion, as we d- digress from ripping Celtics, <laughs> <laughs> is that is that is that the money came up. Who you're paying and how, and would you pay one this offseason? Would you wait? And I brought it up on the show before because, you know, the thought is, hey, we'll just give him $35 million. Can't we just give Shingun $35 million? Do you know what the max is for Shingun? Shams reported this a couple weeks ago when he got hurt. Um, is it like $30 million? It's five years, $225 million. Five it's years. an annual average of $45 million per year. Oof. That's what That would be the max if they want to give that to Shingun. Because Jalen Green's – they're in the same draft class, but because Jalen Green was drafted in the top five, I think, what, three – was it three overall? Number two. Two well, behind Kate Cunningham. Jalen would be over $50 million per year if they gave him the max. Now, we know before this run of success where there's another part of that clip where they were – where he was called Baby McGrady um, by one of the two. I don't remember. Before this run of success, no one was thinking we're giving Jalen Green money. Now, if you – if you couldn't get him to take less and he wanted the rookie extension max, fifty two million per year. Yeah, I'm not sure you can give either guy the max. The max they're both eligible for it, and that's why I, the topic sure, comes up. But I'm sure they're eligible for it. Yeah, yeah. but can you give I'm either sure they're one, asking for it too? Can you give either one of them those deals? I don't think you can do it. And then you wind up getting up up players who are upset. And I guess I wouldn't say rightfully so. I don't think either one is played to a level where you can give them that. Oh, I could also I could I also say, hey, we can we can sign you for less than the max. Yeah, that's possible. It is possible. <laughs> that, that's possible for No, for, it definitely is. For <laughs> two guys that have been good in the NBA for combined seventy five games. Yeah, you were, <laughs> like, like, they were what the are part we they were part of some of the worst ba- teams in, in the NBA over the course of the first two years and it didn't it took until after the All Star break for them to start figuring it out. So but, yeah, I understand the hesitation. I would be hesitant too. I'm just telling you what their options are and what they yeah. might think they should be get be getting. Do you think that it's either do you think it's possible to sign one and not the other? It's possible. It I just, mean no, I mean it it's just means possible, yes. it but just, like the, it, it the, just means possible. It like the just means the other one's out. Interpersonal relationship part of it. I think you ha- particularly because they're very young, you'd have to hope that those two really love it here and love playing with each other, which I don't know. Um for one of them to get all the money and the other one to be asked to take a discount or, or to be, or to wait on it. Yeah. Hey, or to be like, Hey, the deal's coming next year. Yeah, I don't know if you can give one a big deal in the summer and then tell the other one to wait without also say, we're going to trade you because we know Eagles play a part and Jalen green has played really well. And the, the thought was coming into this last 20 games before he took off was Shingun. If anyone's getting paid is Shingun and Jalen green would have to prove it but he is the guy with the higher draft status. And why that should mean anything three years in, I don't know. But it would. And if you're telling him that the guy who was picked lower than him is getting money, but when he exited the scene, yeah. you took off, yeah, and, you're, and we're not giving you any money, it, it could turn into something. I just don't know their personalities. It may not matter. It, they may be so so happy being here. That one could get paid and the other would say, you know what, my deal is coming. That's just not how the NBA usually works. It, it's 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 crazy how fast you have to make this decision. And especially with like the how the numbers in the NBA work. Yeah, now. when you haven't or, won anything and you have to make major decisions on, on guys like, who are very young still, but haven't as our discussion was previously, talking about hopefully staying in the ten seed race. Yeah, and and I think it it's harder because it's two of them. It almost penalizes you for having two good players as yeah. opposed to, like, the Hornets last year because, uh, obviously, the two guys we're talking about were in the 2021 uh, NBA draft. Uh, LaMelo Ball was in the 2020 NBA draft, and they signed him. Basically, like, it was a don't even think about it, here's the max, you're our guy kind of situation. And, I, and, you and now he doesn't play. Well, yeah, A, he, he doesn't play. Year, yeah. B, he, he, when he did play, he, he – 
he was good, put up some numbers, didn't but they Le- didn't Leeds winning. They didn't do anything, and they made the. I talk, we talked a lot about the ten seed today. They uh, they I think they made the play in. I want to say what was w- it one year or maybe both years and, and got, got destroyed. They lost by like thirty points both times. Yeah. Um. So, uh, but when he comes up, it's a no doubt about it. Got a maxim. He's your he's your doing? franchise player. Though. Yes, you have to give him his money. But when it's two of them, who is the franchise player? Yeah. The person who sits in this seat, I'm sitting in the land seat, will tell you definitively it's Shingun because he's irreplaceable because of he's, he's the big man who can do all the things on offense. A lot of people would say, you want the high-scoring guard. And the discussion has been, well, it's easy to find those guys. Well, you, you might think, maybe, but those guys are, are generally highly valued, and it takes a lot of assets to acquire them. And if you have one in your own building, do you let him go if you think he is that level of talent and the potential for Jalen Green and certainly what we've seen over the last month would suggest he he can be that guy? It just so happens that they're up against it, kind of. They don't have to do anything now. Yeah, It'll but, just be part of the discussion in the offseason. Yeah. It, it's just, yeah. I just would wish to have more than one season of of a data point to give these guys a combined $90 million a year for the next four years. While you're paying the the other backcourt guy 40-something and then your wing guy 20. And yeah, you know what? This for- What this really tells me is uh, Fred Van Vliet, enjoy, enjoy next year on the Rockets. Yeah. That third year will not be up. Yeah, because— <laughs> That team option will be declined. Yeah, because think about it. Jabari Smith is a guy—I'm not saying we're giving him max money, but— that that's the the benefit and the curse of having high draft picks and and a lot of them and a lot of them. Oklahoma City knows will know this soon. Um, they acquired Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, so it's a little different. But our, our Jalen Williams is going to want a lot of money. Chet Holmgren at some point will want a lot of money. Josh Giddy, they may say, we're good. We have a lead guard. We're not going to pay you, but we like our wing and Jalen Williams. We like our big and Chet Holmgren, and we have all these picks. In the in in the tuck, what do we do with them? So the Rockets are are probably the um, the proto Thunder, where the Thunder have made the ten seed and now they're one of the best teams in basketball. The Rockets hope hopefully will achieve that. And I don't know if it'll be as meteoric a rise because they don't have a backcourt guy like Shea, who's an MVP candidate. Maybe Jalen becomes that. We certainly hope so. But decisions will have to be made, and you have guys like like washed, overrated Celtics. <laughs> Kevin Garnett's a great player. Paul Pierce, whatever. Take him or leave him. But you have Celtics um, who are prominent voices in the space because of what they've done. People are going to pay attention to what they say. And they're having these discussions about what to do with young Rockets and who's important and who should get paid. And Rafael Stone and Tillman Fertitta, well, and along with Ime Adoka, will eventually have to come to a conclusion on that too. So, We'll see. Uh, we are way late for a break. We'll come back with more. We'll hear from Joe Espada talking about the pitching, which has been really good, particularly the starters, and also more on Jordan, who had a great night. And uh, he's warming up along with Yiner and Pena, who've been really good all year long. We'll be back.
you're back inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios with Del Olalea. I mean, you're not actually in the studio, but if you watch ESPN Houston's YouTube channel, it's kind of like you are. No, not really? Okay. That's the voice of Michael Carroll. We hope to have him here with us tomorrow to, to update you on what you should or should not watch. As far as pop culture, he was very busy last week, so he didn't join us. So uh, we'll see if Michael's available tomorrow. Before we went to break, I did want to I mentioned discussing what the Astros did last night. An easy victory over the Toronto Blue Jays. They win this game eight or that game eight to nothing. They have a day off and they head up to Arlington to face the hated Rangers. And it's weird to say the defending World Series champions. That's weird because that entire region has been really a dumpster fire about as far as success since about 2011 when the Mavericks won a world title but the Rangers are the champions unfortunately their Astros had their chance to make that not a thing and they couldn't win home games but we'll see what happens in this in this weekend series a guy who's feeling really good about himself coming off a big night last night was Jordan and here's a uh, Joe Espada discussing Jordan's big night not a lot of people can can leave the yard um right center field the second home run, it was more impressive because I thought that Meaza, like actually executed his pitch. That sinker was down, and he went and pretty much just kind of golf it. So um, that's how strong, that's how good, that's how good he is. Anytime he could put some good swings like that um, and and hit some balls hard, and it's a good sign. Uh, that's what you know. That's exactly what we need, especially doing it with people on base, and I think it's contagious. Kind of um, you know, spread you know, spread it throughout the lineup. Hey, nothing the win last night. Jordan with four hits, two home runs, and the Astros lead the league in home runs hit. And yet they're two and five. But the bats are alive, at least. <laughs> at least in, it's not been a consistent thing, but certainly playing Toronto has helped. They hit Jordan hit his two. Altuve hit a home run. Pena hit a home run. So they beat up on that Toronto pitching. So much so that one of the pitchers. Bassett, as Jordan, when Jordan drove in his second run of the night, doubling up Altuve at the end of the inning when Bassett got out of it, he said, you're effing killing me, man. Um, they shared a laugh, a little tap on the back, because um, Jordan has bombed Bassett throughout his career. Was it, is it five home runs? And that was before, I was, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, Really good stat in Jordan's favor, so and Bassett's aware of it. Um, the, it flashed across the screen, I think, right after they had their interaction that Jordan has punished that guy, and it continued last night. So the Astros get a get a win. They go to Arlington and, and they enjoy the day off, and we'll see and we'll see what happens um, up there. I did want to get to a couple other things regarding sports in the city, and really, it's a question for Sean because I don't know his stance on this. So. We're a we're a th ma we're a three sport town when it comes to the major sports. You want to throw in the Dynamo as well. You can do that. Um, so there are four professional options in this town, and hockey has been getting a push. They had a big event at Carbach maybe a month or so ago now, and a lot of people showed up. I think over the course of the afternoon or the day, I think four thousand people rolled through. Uh, or that's the level of interest I guess there is for a, ho a hockey team in the city. Do you think? This city would enjoy what happened with the Rangers and the and the Devils yesterday. If you missed it, I, there there are hockey rules that I don't know a lot about, but whatever rule says, we are going to agree that all five of us on each side, they, the goalies were excluded, they didn't have to fight. That all five of us, we're going to drop the gloves and start this game off with the with the melee. I'm in. I don't know what rules that what rule that is, but I welcome it. If I I, I grew up. In Southern California, not exactly a hockey hotbed, but hockey was becoming a thing when I was a kid. So I, I watched a lot of hockey as a kid. If you want to bring that to this city, please. Uh, the, the Rockets have been, been a welcome distraction over the last month, but if they were as bad as they were, uh, well, the last couple of years, we could have had hockey. We could have had things where five aside fighting. Sean, where do you stand? Let's even remove the, the histrionics of the Rangers and Devils. If I told oh, you, just in general, do I want hockey? Okay, I guess if I guarantee you, every fifteen games we're having a fight yeah, like that, uh, once or twice a season. Okay, you would you you would welcome hockey to to Toyota Center. It would definitely it would def it helps its odds. Yeah, it definitely it definitely makes it more appealing to me than just like. 
because my my stance on like the hockey to Houston stuff is um sure I sure whatever I don't care uh <laughs> do, do your thing I don't well if if Tillman Fertitta wants it so badly. Uh, there's nothing I can do to stop them. It's true. Uh, there's literally all I can do is not show up, which uh, I feel like a lot of people would uh, not show up at least early, early on. Uh, but we all know. I, I, I think we all know how it goes, and I think I am uh, very clear-eyed with what my participation with NHL in Houston would be. Yeah, I, very little yeah, in the regular season. I think I would. Ag- I agree. <laughs> Even though we do this, like. Think about this and what we do for a living. In a time where you hope the Rockets are going to be good going forward, the Astros are starting, the Texans offseason probably won't be as exciting all the time, so they probably wouldn't take up that much conversation. But it, we're leading up to a draft, and we're but the hockey season is kind of coming to an end to get into the playoffs. How much time would we devote to hockey? The Rockets basically are always at least a second top, most day, like, what, 75% of the year, they are capped at being the number two topic, either with number one being the Texans, now that they're good, or uh, the Astros. Yes. They, there's just, they cannot be the number one topic most times. Like a like a game. If yeah. Obviously, if they make they a major trade, trade or something, yeah. sure. Yeah, but uh, as far as like game to game, they're, and so that that's the NBA. Now you're throwing... NHL in there too, which season, which its season 100% overlaps with the NBA <laughs> into a city with a bunch of people. And I know there's a lot of transplants, but at least theoretically, if those transplants are hockey fans, they already have a hockey team that they support in theory. Yeah, I don't know how hockey fans do they are they easily movable? Like, all right, I'm in this city now. Uh, I'm a Rangers fan. Oh, New Yorkers are different, but I'm a uh, I'm a San Jose Sharks fan. If they exist outside of San Jose, um, and I'm here now. But there's a hockey team here now, so I'm going to root for them. I don't know how hockey fans operate yeah. when it comes to that stuff. And th- and those are the hockey fans already. Then you have the other large percent of the population, like myself, who has seen single digit hockey games in okay. my life. Okay. <laughs> like I've I've probably am like around five hockey games watched total lifetime. Um so I don't know anything about it, which would make my job harder. Uh or, depending or, on the show, maybe not. Yeah, would probably lead to us talking about it less. Uh or at least me talking about it less. But then you you just have to educate a whole bunch of people that again have no connection to your sport. Yeah. It already in a city where we see it when the Rockets are bad, when the Texans are bad, when the Astros are bad, interest uh, wanes. Yeah, hockey here say. in this town would have to be good early. They have to be Vegas Knights good early, yes. probably. And I, I even think like past, like just say, boom, snap your finger. Next year they're they're starting a hockey team, like the hockey team they're playing next season. I think they'll get a, a, a you know, a initial bump early in the season, maybe the first, like, 10 games of the season. <laughs> Hope they don't fall on Sundays during the uh, during football season. And then I feel like it will be a precipitous drop-off for the rest of the season until if they make the playoffs, they go on a playoff run, and yeah. then everyone will be kind of back in. And I think that's how I would approach it, too, is I will not really invest that much time in this team until they make the second round of the playoffs. Now, a lot of people here have – beards for facial hair who's most likely to be like i'm gonna grow a hockey beard for the playoffs to mimic the team and paul yeah, it's that's the obvious clearly the answer <laughs> clearly paul is definitely a hockey beard guy he, he i probably he probably because i think he he didn't he could when he moved to tampa the lightning that's when the lightning first got like really good okay and they, i think they won they they probably won a stanley cup somewhere in there and so paul was like into hockey in high school and then obviously has just like there's no need to follow hockey uh, for mm-hmm. his job anymore, and yeah. he's kind of like just fallen fallen out of it. So I feel like if hockey got brought to Houston, he would a initially be in, and then b would be willing to uh, grow his facial hair out because we got playoff run. We got a we got two Midwesterners in Joel and in Joe. I don't know if Joe's a Blackhawks fan, but he, there's a ho- there's got to be some hockey buried in, if we haven't talked about it. Hockey buried I, within him. He has never once mentioned hockey. Okay, me, so. who knows? And then Joel, I gotta believe. I don't know, but I gotta believe he's got some hockey there. And then you got Paul, who 
out and out, would have a beard, um, would probably for for Halloween dress up as a hockey player. Oh at some yeah, point. if there's like one cool hockey player that we that we find out we have this like awesome, you know, I don't know, Lithuanian dude, who sure, plays, Swedish dude who plays hockey, somebody from Finland, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Paul Paul would dress up for, as him for Halloween. So what I what I found out is when this station gets a specialty hockey show, you won't be hosting or producing it. I, I may be producing, but I will not be able to speak under on pro- air. <laughs> under protest, you'll be producing it. Well, I would, I would have to, I would be a, uh, I wouldn't talk as much. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like when Charlie Epps talks to one of his producers and, and asks them a golf question, and most of the time is like, what? Yes. Oh, you mean like me producing the Charlie Epps golf power? <laughs> or me when I did it. Yeah, the uh, Honda Open. I, I know enough. I can I can throw out some some guys and some, uh, you know. But if some... you ask me whose game fits the course, I'm out. Uh, I'm, I got no shot. So, Xander Schauffele? <laughs> that's a name, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> it is a name of a hockey, I mean, of a, of a golfer. Tony Finau? I can yeah. go all day. Yeah, I can, start na- I can name golfers how they play. I'm out. I just thought if we guaranteed fighting, on that level, I'd I'm be in. in. I'm in. I, yeah. it, it, yes, if we get what they did last night, I'm in. I'm in. If you missed it, it's out there. The Rangers and, and the Devils got into a a, a five aside fight because those the teams agreed to it beforehand because apparently the history is one of the Rangers knocked out one of the Devils with the, with a, an elbow or something and they had to ha- and they had to have reparations for it and they got into it and then the game went on. I think because of how hockey works. The guys who start the fight, the first two guys on opposite sides are good, and then the rest of the guys get thrown out of the game. So I think they just put on their all their like fourth liners or guys who barely hit minutes and go out there. Uh, so we can then we can finish off the game. Um, but if, if that comes to Houston, I welcome it. A, a Houston team versus the Stars like that, Dallas Stars, I'm in. Uh, we got one more segment to go here. We went way long, but hey, it was a, it was a discussion about Sean's disinterest in hockey. Why wouldn't we go long? <laughs> one more segment to go. We'll be back.
This is the Del Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Del Olalea. This show ends with disappointment. That might be always the case for you guys because you hate segments that we do. But for us, we found out. No food coming today for us. So it wasn't an April Fool's thing. It just so happens that maybe there was a miscommunication. So we are not getting food, which means Sean, who has to work till three, will have to make other arrangements. But that, and it's really about the promise of food and it not showing up. And that's what bothers us. Like I don't eat, I don't eat in the morning, and I don't, I eat when I get home. But I thought I was getting free food today, so I was ready for it. We're like, we're like dogs, and you put food in front of us. Yeah. And we start getting excited and agitated and waiting. And unfortunately for us, uh, the owner pulled the food away. Yeah, they showed us the Purina bag and <laughs> yeah. then pulled it away it's from a, us. Not, not today, not for you. Uh, so we will make other arrangements. But, you know, just just a personal aside is uh, we thought we were getting a delicious lunch, and it's not the case. So you guys benefit from us not chewing on the air because that's always good when radio hosts do that. We got, we got not a lot of time left, uh, so no food for us. But let me ask you this, Sean. If you thought of a, maybe, how do I put this? A more, not toxic, but the Conseco Manziel potential offspring, where, do you, where would you rank that on levels of Wait. hell? Not Jose Wait. and Johnny. Not Jose and Johnny, because yeah, that's gonna, impossible. I was going to say, you're going to have to talk, talk me through, because I can, zero reference to Jose Canseco has a daughter, Josie Canseco. I think okay. at one point she was she was on a, on a reality show. Uh, but she's, I'm, I'm sure she was. Surprisingly enough. Uh, but she's also a model. Uh, okay. Jose Canseco married well, or or at least for a little bit. He had an attractive wife. And oddly enough, a baseball player would. So he has Josie Canseco, and she was seen on a plane where her feet are up on who on a person who appears to be Johnny Manziel. Can you imagine that wedding? Jose Canseco showing up to a wedding featuring Johnny Manziel. I don't know if, look, I'm sure Josie Canseco is a very nice young woman. But the Canseco-Manziel combination, I'm here for it. Only because I would like to hear Jose Canseco's thoughts on Johnny Thoughts on his daughter dating Johnny and everything that comes with it. I mean, we would know this isn't. It's not a long lasting thing, you don't think? <laughs> the, well, but when I think of the last name Conseco, and I don't know Josie, so maybe she's different. When I think of just the last name Conseco and I think of the last name Manzel, the phrase that comes to mind is not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. Here for a good time, not a long time. <laughs> and I cannot imagine that that. It, hey, again, maybe love is love. Maybe I'm wrong. They were here in Houston maybe. for Travis Scott's Cactus Jack celebrity softball game. Oh, yeah, where all romances start. Amber uh, Rose and CJ Stroud that they had uh, to not, say wasn't a real thing. <laughs> gonna, <laughs> not real. Don't spread misinformation the that, last 10 seconds of the show. Yes, that was something that was quickly – Put pushed aside <laughs> and put to bed. That's not a real thing. Unlike Amber Rose, that rumor was put to bed by CJ Stroud. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly nothing happened. He was just being a nice guy. Gave her a ride. Because the sprinter van left her. Of course. That happens. Classic. So he just gave her a ride. An actual ride. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm just, you want me to clear things up? I'm yeah, clearing no, things up. Yeah, no, no. I can tell we're both hungry and we're not on our A game. Right we're now. punchy right now. <laughs> but the Josie Manziel, the Josie Conseco future wedding with Johnny, I don't know if it's imminent, but I'd welcome it just to see what happens after after the wedding and how Jose Conseco would handle it. Handle it. We're done for the day. The, well, I'm done. Sean's here, unfortunately for him. He's hungry. But Gallant and George up next, followed by the Killer Bees. I'll talk to you tomorrow.
Galan George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome in. Happy Thursday. No Astros game today, but once again, the offense back in a big way. 8 nothing last night. One hit by the Blue Jays. And they were smart enough to not score 10 runs. Yep. 10-run curse is real. Jordan Alvarez in last night's game could have gone yard for a third time. Deep fly ball that he had to center field in, what, the eighth inning? Mm -hmm. But he chose not to. He chose not to. Restraint. He he chose to hit it 400 feet to an out. It's a great night for Jordan Alvarez, for any of the people out there who were panicking about him. You're you're crazy. Uh You say you're effing crazy. I said you're crazy. You're bleeping crazy. He had five batted balls with an exit velocity of 100 miles per hour plus. And three padded balls with a projected distance of 400 feet plus. Add in an Altuve home run. Jeremy Pena. A home run by him. And it's just so damn frustrating that this homestand is a two and five result. It's crazy. It, it is. There are. I, I think there's more positives than negatives with the Houston Astros right now. If you take away the record. The, the ERA from the rotation is incredible. In two of these three games, they gave up one hit combined. They they dominated. Yiner the Diaz. Blue Jays. Yiner Diaz leads the league in hits. He's tied with Stephen Kwan on the on the Guardians, and he's caught a no hitter and a one hitter. I as mean, pointed out by Enfuentes Respecter on the Twitch. Again, uh, would Martin Maldonado have caught two perfect games against this some, Blue Jays offense, which apparently sucks? Yeah, uh, apparently. Possibly. Some people are saying that Martin Maldonado would have two perfect games on the season already. We, no one can prove otherwise. That's true. No, I'm not, not saying here that. Anymore. I'm not saying that, but some people, <laughs> some people would say that. But man, they, the offense just, it, it came alive again yesterday. And if you look at, you know, Brian McTaggart put this out yesterday. They lead the league in home runs. They lead the league in runs, I believe it is as well. The offense, as much as they've, struggled because even in this game right you have what two opportunities with bases loaded and you get nothing nothing comes through left 10 on base four for 14 with runners in scoring position which i suppose is actually decent yeah in baseball terms right but still math so the left on base numbers (laughs) (laughs) we can't add them all up from the first seven games of the year just know there's been a lot of dudes left on base yeah look they they out so this is what mctaggart tweeted they have outscored their opponents 30 to 23 they've out hit them 71 to 47 they have 12 home runs and have allowed six. So, and the middle relief last night, four innings pitched, very good production from your middle relief. So, it's not that this is some kind of corner turned, but of all the, the negative that comes with a two and five record, there are much more positives than there are. Think about it. You're not, you know, about to play baseball in Sacramento. You're not having it like the Oakland A's are. You don't have 2,000 fans going to your game and being told to only have them buy Oakland merchandise. You'll never have a game rained out because the roof is always closed. And if a game <laughs> were to get rained out because the roof was leaking or I something like that, story. you wouldn't be like the Philadelphia Phillies, who I guess had a game rained out, but they couldn't play it the next day because they had a wedding scheduled for Citizens Bank Park. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That happened. That's a re- that's a real thing. Well oiled machine. Yeah. So the, our the, Houston Astros. The Astros just it, it's a, a good win, a good bounce back getting a series win over the Blue Jays. Who yes, their offense is not as advertised. It's definitely not. Vlad Jr. did not really get going. I mean, Bo Bichette is not really lived up to the hype that he had. I feel like when he first came to the big. So yes, you did not just dominate the, one of the best teams in baseball, but. It's important to get a series win when now you have a Rangers series coming up and we'll air the Astros Rangers game on here on ESPN 975 on Sunday night to speak to the Blue Jays lack of offense. I mean, Christian Javier gave them every opportunity last night. No earned runs, but he had six walks along the way. Took him 22 pitches to get out of the second inning. I think 23 out of the third, Uh, the fifth inning. It took him 28 to get out of. So you look at the middle relief. On the other hand, the positive, and hey, they finally closed the game. But this might be, this series, more than anything, a referendum on the Blue Jays' complete lack of offense. I, I Yeah, I hear that. But at the same time, I, I want to look at, I'm going to go glass half full here today, Paul. I, I think I was just glass half you full. You are. But 
They have they've had a lead in every game but one. Hell yeah. Uh, I mean, in in that game, one. it was three three to three in the ninth inning. So the Astros are are right there in every single one of these games. So I feel very good. But yeah, it, the Blue Jays, eh, probably not great. I'm gonna give you a glass completely full, hot okay. take. You ready for this? Ready. This is maybe the spiciest take that I'll ever have, and some people are gonna think it's disingenuous, but. The Houston Astros, Joe, Sean, they're on pace to have their best regular season ever. You're probably thinking okay. to yourself, Paul, what are you talking about? They started off the season two and five. You know who else was two and five after seven games? The 2019 Houston Astros. Hmm. How many games did they win? Oh, 107, just the most in franchise history. You know how many runs they scored in those first seven games? 14. Guess how many runs the Astros have scored? In their first seven games, 30. They've outhit their opponents 71 to 47. Guess what the Astros starter ERA was for those seven games in 2019? 3.3. Hmm. Guess what the Astros starters ERA is this year? 1.29. No home runs allowed. So the best team in Astros history started off two and five. 108 wins? Is that and what you're saying? It was a lot worse in those seven games. 108 wins for your Houston Astros. Write there it we go, down. Sean. Write it down right now. We're Use gonna... it for the breakout clip. Put it on TikTok. Put it on Reels. It's happening. 108 wins. Does any of this make sense? Probably not. Shh. Just, just remember, the 2019 Houston Astros were 2-5 and five and were a lot less impressive, even though a lot of what the Astros have done offensively was from legitimately two of these seven games. You feel good, Sean, though. I, I like I like that talk. I like yeah. that talk because we uh, last time we were at Le Burge, uh in Lake Charles, we bet on the Astros to win 93 games. Uh, the 2019 Astros did that. And we also bet them to win the American League. They also did that. Feeling so, good. Boom. We should just. No, we need a, a different result. We at already the end have of that money. Yeah, we that already money's have already that money. I can spend just start it. spending that money. Yeah, already. let's order a pizza. Spend it. This is going I to might be. Have to. Uh, statistically, we have the proof to suggest. You, you, you got to learn from history, right? History often repeats itself. The Houston Astros have their best seasons when they go two and five. Oh, that's fact. Fact. <laughs> Maybe you should say best season, but. When they're two and five. Hey, but you don't know how the season's going to play out. It could be, it, you, like you said, 108 wins, another trip to the World Series. Mm-hmm. This one will end in a World Series victory on like 20, 2019. Oh, man. So, you know what? We're feeling good on a Thursday. I'm getting hot and bothered just thinking about it. Uh, you know what I get hot and bothered the most? When Yarner Diaz comes to the plate. Damn. I love it. This guy's awesome. Oh, I He's thought I was so you were attracted good. to him. I was like, okay. No, 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 no. I thought no. I was the gay one on this no. show. I thought you were going to say no. something about Nothing Jeremy Pena. Yeah. No, I, I, leave, I leave the Jeremy, Jeremy Pena. Pena love for Paul. We can't love the same person And, that and the way. women of Houston. Yeah. Ah, I have my babies, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm going I'm to be Team Yiner. I'm going I'm to try to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a song for Yiner Diaz like you sing for Jeremy. Okay. But I, that's Yiner's a tough one. Well... So, we'll it, have to figure out a... You just have to find something. That's all. I got to find something. Is... Two syllables in nature, and you could, I don't know, how about how about this? Have you ever heard, uh, this is a song by Dio. It's, no. It's, I'm musically challenged. Someone just asked me if I'm going to the DMB concert, and I didn't even know they were talking about David Matthews' band. I thought he was misspelling oh, it's also, it's DMB. It's Dave. It's called Dave now? They changed their name? It's always, isn't it always Dave Matthews? I thought it was the David Matthews band. I don't think so. Uh, whatever. Listen, I don't know much about music, but I do know there's a song. By Dio called Holy Diver. Okay. How about this? It, it, it sounds like this. Holy Diver, you've been gone too long in the midnight sea. Oh, what you've done to me. Something like that. How about this? Holy Einer. Holy Einer. <laughs> How about that? Huh? I guess that's a good start. I've been I've been blaring that song a lot recently, so that's yeah? like the first one Why? that came to mind. That's, that's like your go-to? Uh, I was watching an old episode of South Park, and they play that in the episode a lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, but yeah, Yiner Diaz is what, what he's done so far. Holy it, Yiner! He, all these multi-hit games that he's having. It, this is not a referendum on Dusty Baker. It's not. I, I'm over that conversation. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is. <laughs> but it kind of is. No, Even I, I'll admit it. You like, know what? He, he leads the American League and hits. I, was, I, I, he looks different to me. He, he looks much more. He looks more patient. Oh, okay. I thought play. you were about to say Adolis Garcia different. No, 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 <laughs> okay, no. Not, good. not. He's not roided up. 
Uh, he Allegedly. he looks more patient at the plate. No, Odolis is on steroids. Uh, I didn't say it. I did. Joe George. Here. Don't hurt me. At Joe George Radio. Find me. Uh, <laughs> Yiner Diaz, he looks more, more patient at the plate. He looks like he has more control. Mm-hmm. And it just, it is a a very, very positive thing that's happening. And you include that with Jeremy Pena. Where you're gonna, dude, that thing was a tank shot again yeah, he smoked from that. Jeremy Pena last night. It was, if, if that's what they're giving you in the lineup, then Alex Bregman can take his time getting hot. Okay, because, good. Because you were you were hard on Alex Bregman. Yeah, I, I still want to be. But even last night, he was better. He, he had a good game last night. It, it's the offense. This is what they can be. That's why the first four games of the season are so frustrating. Because what you've seen, this Blue Jays series, even though you only won two of the three, what you've seen is dominant offense. And, and with that, with the most impressive starting pitching and relief pitching now when you include last night's game besides a Josh Hader moment, the Astros, it's all good. It, it is all good right now, it feels, after that four-game series. And, and now you're going on the road where you're better. And you're going on the road where you're better, and there's some... I, Vengeance I, on your mind. There's some juice to this series. To there me. is. There I, is. Tab, this isn't just scared? a normal series. You scared, Tab? The Rangers... You better watch out. This is a red hot Astros team that's on pace to have the best season in Astros history, even though they're two and five. I'm really bummed about Tab. I, I really. What? Why? Why are you bummed about? I him? feel like he does, he missed the lineup change or something's going on. I hope something's not going on. Yeah, don't don't put that out there in the ether. He's, you never maybe, know. Maybe maybe he moved. Maybe he moved for his that's job. True. Yeah, he's, he's out in the Golden Triangle. Yeah, I just I feel like I was hoping to get some Tab experience in my life when we when I join the show maybe maybe it'll happen tomorrow yeah maybe tomorrow yeah after tomorrow i don't know maybe af- may- tomorrow will be a huge test the the tab test yeah uh monday will probably we can probably uh decide yes or no whether we can expect tab for the rest of the well season. if the astros win the series uh, th- then he will definitely will not call no monday, no so. no he oh. you don't know tab oh. you don't know tab tab is a man of honor okay tab is the only tolerable rangers fan. win lose or draw he'll and then he'll go you know, Paul, I have to tip my hat. For, you know, he tips or, the hat, so we tip it back. Yes, so we got into a hat-tipping contest, basically, in the ALCS of right. having to tip hats one way or the other. And, and in case any people are new to just me in this time slot, we had a caller in the 10 to noon time slot named Tab, who was a Rangers fan, with, with a uh, um, who, who was just a very likable Rangers fan. He'd call in regularly over the course of the show. We'd talk a little bit of trash. He was talking a lot of trash when the Rangers were in first in the AL West. Of course, the Astros won the AL West. But then the Rangers won the World Series, so he got the last laugh. Um, so, yeah. Uh, other news, um, I, I sang a Jeremy Pena song in public, but I, so I, I did it quietly. You listened to me. Yeah. Did, we literally had this conversation yesterday where I said, why didn't you just you, – yesterday you heard the Diggs news. You left the gym as soon as you arrived yeah. to go home and work. And then all of a sudden yesterday I'm on Twitter, and I got Paul – on, on the elliptical? On the elliptical. Sweating my ass off. Singing Jeremy Pena to me. But I did it in a hushed tone because I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> I, I'm i more embarrassed to do it in public than I am on the radio. I which is ironic because more just, people are listening to this. Yeah, but at the same time, it feels like it's just the three of us. Yeah, it also, you know, they're... People know what they signed up for when they're listening to this. So you are reaching more people, but you're reaching people expecting a uh, a song to break out at any moment. I do think, though, hushed tone is kind of weirder. If I'm at the gym and some guy's just, like, whisper singing. <laughs> he's just in his phone, like, on the camera. He's sweating his ass off on the elliptical. Jeremy Pena yeah. hit another home run. What if I was on the elliptical today? That yeah. sounded like, like that. I mean, was the game on at the gym? Uh, I had it on my phone. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if they. Thanks, Fubo so, TV. Yeah, some glad. gyms have, like, will have TVs and they'll, yeah. and they'll have the Astros game on. You could sing Jeremy Pena just as it's happening. No, I would have. I would have it on the TV there. I would have took it more in stride if it was a full-throated one. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, full throated singing. Uh, well, because when you're doing Eddie Fetter, you gotta use the full throat. Um, a full throated uh, Jeremy just Pena. Saying, just keep saying it, Sean. What? You said full throated like four times in the last. We're six not seconds. talking about the women singing no, about no, Jeremy Pena. Yeah, and no, screaming his name. We're talking Jeremy about Jeremy Pena explodes. Singing. I want Paul to be full throated. We're talking about singing like Jeremy Pena, right? Uh, yeah, I I love Jeremy. singing like Jeremy from Pearl Jam. Jeremy Pena is he's having an incredible start to the season as well. It's there's lots lots and lots of positives uh from the Astros after an 0 4 start. Now they're two and five on the season, take on the Texas Rangers. And just a reminder, once again, we will carry uh the Sunday night baseball game Rangers Astros here on ESPN 
97.5 and 92.5. At 12.30, we'll be joined by Tyler Dunn of the Go Long Substack, longtime Buffalo Bills beat reporter. So what's what's really going on with the Bills and why why they moved on from Stephon Diggs and maybe he will make Paul's uh, fears even worse about the kind of person or teammate that Stephon Diggs will talk to him at 12.30. But we'll continue talking about your Strohs next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. Tyler Don of the Go Long Substack, longtime Bills beat reporter, joins us in about 10 minutes from now to get the latest on why the Buffalo Bills traded Stephon Diggs. Uh, the Athletic reports that Diggs has been talking to C.J. Stroud and other Texans players for over a month. Is that mean that there could be some tampering charges i it's always i feel like that's it's really complicated with players because i would say no when, when players can talk to players yeah they, they can do whatever they want and, and like and if cj tells nick hey stefan Diggs really wants to come here like he told them about saquon barkley i think that's and all it's a still lot. a trade like it's not like he left in free agency yeah, yeah that's true true but you could potentially uh potentially but you could potentially poison the water, if you will. If you're CJ oh, Stroud, you, you think sure. you think you think that in the last month that's when the water got poisoned yeah. for Diggs' time in Buffalo? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Listen, maybe I'm, I'm just saying in a league that has punished its greatest player ever for more probably than not deflating balls. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Patrick Mahomes never got in trouble for that. I'm waiting to see if Paul's going to respond to that even. I think you just really upset Paul. How dare you? <laughs> I think I think Paul's really upset now. You really just triggered Paul in a big way. You might have just ruined the whole show, Sean. Just, I'm, I'm so a- glad Patrick <laughs> Mahomes won the third <laughs> Super Bowl because it makes it so much better. Yeah, he um, only has four more to win. How many more to make? What is that? Uh, six? He's almost yep. halfway there. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of Sunday, though. I was going to deal with C.J. Stroud and Stephon Diggs. Fact. Uh, speaking of Sunday for the Houston Astros, you can listen to them here on ESPN 97.5. On ESPN 92.5. You can listen to Justin Verlander pitch for the Sugarland Space Cowboys. You'll hear that. You'll hear. Thwack. 
of the glove. So JV is going to pitch on Sunday for the Space Cowboys, and then they're anticipating one more rehab start in Sugarland, most likely, and then he'll be back up with the Astros, uh, which is a very, very good thing because even though the rotation's been awesome, and JP France, congratulations on the birth of your baby. Uh, so he will make his he will likely make his start on Saturday. It's TBD at the moment, uh, but they're they're just doing that as precautionary reasons. They expect him to start on Saturday. That's now maybe the most intriguing thing about the Astros over the next two weeks is Blanco versus France, and, and who Who's wins that stay. spot in the rotation. Definitely hurts JP France that he had a kid. Does it? I think it does. Dad strength. I mean, think about it. Ronald Blanco. Is at the hospital all day. Mm-hmm. He has a baby. A second baby. His wife has a second baby. He has 10 strikeouts against the Space Cowboys. He makes the opening day roster. A week later, he throws a no-hitter. J.P. France has a baby. Pitching on Saturday. Astros no-hitter on Saturday versus the Rangers? I mean, you can't rule out the possibility. Just saying. Dad's strength seems to be real within the Houston Astros organization. It would help if they were playing the Blue Jays and not the Rangers. Yes. Because the Rangers offense looks to be pretty good. It's very, very good. Who's this new kid? Wyatt Langford. He was the fourth overall pick in last year's draft from the University of Florida. And if you didn't see the play he had the other day, he was out. But he went from first to home on a grounder, and it was electric. Hmm. The comp, because I will I've talk heard, about this later. I've heard this too from Jeff Passan. I heard he really this. pissed me off. Um, Jeff Passan said the comp for him is 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 Mike Trout. Yeah, I heard that, too. which made me want to vomit. To be honest, the idea that they've added that level of a player, he almost they almost brought him up for the World Series last year to get at bats. So yeah, their their offense is awesome. It almost made me vomit, too, because, honestly, I mean, that might be really, like, slandering Wyatt Langford. Because, let's be honest, Mike Trout's never done anything that matters. It's true. He's played in three playoff games, 1-0. They lost all three. I mean, if he's an MVP, then, I mean, shouldn't the Angels have won multiple World Series when they had another MVP on their team? I love doing that disingenuous argument with baseball. It's the best. There are some Mike Trout stands out there. And I know for us, watching the Astros, when you watch Mike Trout, you know he's a good baseball player. Yeah. You know he's one of the best of the generation. But you also know that he almost never does anything against the Astros. I don't know why his numbers are rather pedestrian against the Astros, but they are. I used to sarcastically, and people in Seattle don't really understand sarcasm, but sarcastically say while I was up there that Mike Trout, man, just just not a very good player. Yeah. And people would ask, why do you say that? I was like, well, he can't do it against the Astros. I mean, does it does it matter what you do if you can't do it against the Astros? Same kind of argument I used to do with um, Texans fans. Back in the early uh, 2010s, I was like, oh, what are you going to do against the Patriots? The answer was nothing. Yeah, exactly. A uh, question here on the Twitch from Scarecrowzilla. Hmm. Um, what a name. Or really, it's just a, a take. Uh, Dia stats uh, are very, very good. Long way to say it. But if Bregman doesn't get going, he would move Diaz up to the number four spot in the lineup. Now, I'm not normally a big lineup guy. But the way Yiner Diaz has been playing, I actually will entertain this conversation. Because as much as I love Alex Bregman, and I was very frustrated with him yesterday, and it was better, Yiner is, if he if this is who he is, I want to play the analytics game here and get him more at-bats. I want to reward him and move him up in the lineup and just keep moving Abreu down as well with it, like to the nine spot as these other guys continue to have success, even though he didn't play last night. But I, I am very intrigued by... Joe Espada going forward and how he will handle guys like situations like that. That's my, that's what I'm most curious about. Not exactly of the lineup order, but what is Joe Espada's approach? Cause we've already seen him make the move with, with Yiner to move up in front of Abreu. We've already seen him be willing to bat lefties back to back, which is just something Dusty Baker never would have done. So Joe Espada is very open to that as well. I'm curious over the long term if there's more struggles from these guys what are the lengths he'll be willing to go to? Yeah, I like that he's not as patient as Dusty was. How long was Jose Abreu in the cleanup spot last year? Mm-hmm. It felt like it was a while. Effort forever? Right. It felt like? They had Abreu high up in the lineup for much longer than they should have. So you're hoping, and we've discussed this before, 
that Espada is going to be not constantly reactive or impatient with the lineup, but if a guy's hitting well, move him up. Mm -hmm. I, I think the tricky thing right now is you have a couple of guys who are hitting very well in the lineup because Jeremy Pena is also hitting well while Bregman's off to a slow start as every single year. That's what you kind of expect out of him. Are there other moves to come? I don't know. But I think the good news is the Astros offense has put together two games where they've shelled the ball and the potential for this offense is limitless. They just got to figure out how to get hits with runners in scoring position and how to stop leaving guys on base. Uh, Tyler Dunn, go, the go long sub stack. He's been covering the Buffalo Bills for a very long time. Why did the Bills trade Stephon Diggs? Why did his production drop as much as it did at the end of the season? We'll ask Tyler that and more next when we get back here on Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, I got to tell you about my friends at MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. You enter promo code BET975. You're going to get a deposit bonus immediately up to $1,000. And you can play with that right away. Maybe you want to go crazy. You want to do the unthinkable. So you're going to bet on the Houston Rockets to actually beat the Golden State Warriors tonight. Oh, the Rockets really have only pride to play for, but Draymond Green's been giving them a lot of reasons to play for more than that. Talking trash not once but twice over the last couple of weeks. The Warriors, four-point favorites on the road against your Rockets. Did you see what they're doing at the arena tonight? They're giving out those awesome rockets spaceman t-shirts just lying on the chair waiting for you so hey go to the game you get that on top of that you put up some money on the rockets to cover four point spread boom you're gonna be feeling really really good about yourself you can bet on so many things at mybookie.ag promo code bet975 for that awesome deposit bonus of up to one thousand dollars they will match it and you can play with it and Put it on all sorts of things right away. It's mybookie.ag. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere. Only with mybookie.ag.
You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. Gallant and George here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Joe, Paul, and Sean here with you till 3 o'clock. You can find us on Twitter at Joe George Radio at Gallant Says and at Sean A. Mapes. We go right out to the HRMP guest line. We welcome in Tyler Dunn of the Go Long Substack, longtime Buffalo Bills uh, beat reporter. Tyler, how's it going? Doing great. Gosh, thanks so much for having me, man. How you been? Doing pretty good. Doing good, um, Tyler. So I, I will, I'll start here. Uh, it was interesting reading your story that you put up about the, the breakup that has happened with, with Diggs and, uh, and the Bills. What's the main reason why? Because just reading your story, it feels like it's more of an issue about the direction of the the Bills offense that the team was heading in less than his relationship with Josh Allen. Right. I, I think the relationship with Josh Allen, it's probably a piece of the, the puzzle of discontent, uh, but it's not the main piece. It's, I wouldn't even say it's that big of a piece. It wasn't in Minnesota – Either with Kirk Cousins, I, I think a lot of people looked at that as a case of Sean, or, uh, Stephon Diggs not wanting to play with Kirk Cousins. It was Mike Zimmer moving that offense a direction that he didn't like. It was, you know, back to the mid-90s, pounding the ball. He didn't like them throwing the ball all over the place. So he gets out of there. He, he's in the prime of his think He had a little bit of deja vu uh, this past season when you know, Stephon Diggs is not a declining talent. And... I get it. It's easy to pile on the guy in Western New York right now. It's, it's, and, uh, they'll never trade him because of that 31 mil dead cap hit. Uh, or, or our kind of thing, oh, the Bills never needed the guy. No, this is a talent. I mean, he had 834 yards and seven touchdowns through nine games. And he was on pace for a career season. Um, granted, they're right around 500. They make the change of coordinator. They start running the ball a hell of a lot more. And uh, he basically, I think, as I wrote, became uh, DJ Collett on the track. Not a lot of the, not a lot of impact there from Stephon Diggs. I don't think he was at fault. I think it was the direction of things. So we'll get into it. I mean, there there are a lot of variables when it comes to Diggs, but I do think that he wanted out. And Brandon Bean was asked point blank at his press conference, the GM for the Bills, did Stephon Diggs and his representation ask for a trade? And he tap danced around it and cited a great relationship with Adisa Vakari, his agent. I, you know, it doesn't take a law degree or anything to realize Stephon Diggs asked for a trade. He wanted out, and, man, he, he landed in the best possible spot. He sure did. You have C.J. Stroud. There's a lot of weapons there. But I do wonder, with all the weapons here, Tyler, with Nico Collins coming off of a breakout season, with Tank Dell having the rookie year that he had, Dalton Schultz is here already. I wonder – how Diggs is going to handle perhaps not being featured as much to your point about him not being used as much in the offense, the second half of the season after their coordinator change. Yeah. But they also, the bills were six and one over that stretch. So I, I suppose what is it that's going to keep a guy like Stefan Diggs happy when if you take a look at where he's been his whole career, in Minnesota, they never had a losing record. The Bills, they made the playoffs every single year. Seems like he has some very, very high demands. You're not wrong. I mean, you're winning games. So can you really be that ticked off if you're Stephon Diggs? I think and it's, it's only Stephon Diggs knows what's going through the brain of Stephon Diggs. But I think on top of this, he didn't have a good relationship with Sean McDermott. And I've had multiple players tell me that as recently as this week. One player said, you know, he heard that this was in the works for several weeks. You know, since the season ended, D- Diggs made it pretty clear he was done with Sean. Now, Sh- Sean McDermott is the head coach, and, yeah, he did kind of move the offense this direction. But I, I think that that disconnect existed so long before that. So, you know, D'Amico Ryans is, is probably – going to need to develop a strong relationship with Devon Diggs. And I, I think you know, I was just talking to Herm Edwards, and he was Tony Dungy's right-hand man in Tampa, head coach, Jets, Chiefs. We all hear from Herm. Um, he kind of put it best. He learned this from Tony. You know, he said, if you're the head coach, you really got to take, take on three or four of those personalities on your roster and, and build a real authentic relationship 
with that player. We all know who they are. They all always need a little special treatment. I, I just don't think that Sean McDermott and Stephon Diggs ever really mesh. Um, it just they're they're two two very different people. Oil and water. It, it never really worked. And uh, Diggs eventually wanted out. And the Bills were happy to oblige. And maybe that final straw was, you know, the latest cryptic tweet that Diggs had kind of taking a shot at, at Josh Allen. But, you know, this isn't the first time we've talked about a wide receiver, you know, coming with some baggage. I mean, the Bills knew what they were taking on. He did this in Minnesota. And a lot of receivers are demonstrative on the sideline. A lot of receivers have the cryptic tweets and the off-field interest with the fashion shows. I mean, I, I don't. I don't really think anything Stephon Diggs did in Buffalo was super detrimental to the, the final score. You know, he had the bad drop against the Chiefs. You can, you can point to that, and you can point to some poor playoff games. But all the other stuff, I don't know. I, I feel like that's just par for the course for a wide receiver one. We're talking with Tyler Dunn of the Go Long Substack here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Tyler, were you, were you surprised that they, the Bills were willing to make this trade uh, to a team in the AFC that's so clearly on the rise, like the Houston Texans? I was. I was. I, I really thought that both sides, everything I just said being true, would, would realize their best together, that, that Diggs would want to stay with Josh Allen and realize, look, there is a path for him in this offense, in this city, and that the Bills would realize, man, we can't part with – a, a true number one who's still in the prime of his career. And then I, that was the shocking part of it, to see them basically pass the baton to the Texans and say, all right, you know, you're the Super Bowl contender now. This season is yours if you want it. You lift it off the weapons. Man, I spent some time with Nico Collins for a feature last year down there. That dude is special. You don't see receivers of that size move like him. And Tank Dell, and Dalton Schultz, and Joe Mixon. It's it's a scary offense, so I I just think it kind of speaks to how bad it probably was behind the scenes. Maybe there's something we don't know. You know, whoever's at fault between the the Bills and Diggs, because you just you rarely see a team with a Josh Allen in his prime. And look, Josh Allen's not going to be able to play this way forever. You know, he runs through people, around people, over people. You know, can, he can throw it through a cement wall. I mean, you, you want him in full. You don't want to sanitize his game like they tried to early last season. So when you let Josh Allen be Josh, it's not going to last for five to ten years. So I, I, I was I was stunned. I guess to answer your question, stunned. He went to the Texans. I thought that they would take less just to send him to the NFC. But it, it does speak to maybe there is something that we don't know and maybe we'll never know. I got a kick out of some of the parts of your most recent column on your sub stack about Stefan Diggs and you had mentioned a little bit earlier you know talking with Herm Edwards and you also referenced Andy Reid with this line that really jumped out to me every team has a few players that require more attention from the head coach and to what you have just been talking about clearly Sean McDermott and Stefan Diggs that didn't work uh, Isaiah McKenzie a teammate of Stefan Diggs joked that he was the one that would tell him, Diggs, to chill the bleep out when he had temper tantrums. I, I guess, is, is that just something that somebody in the Texans organization is going to have to take on their own, whether it's D'Amico Ryans or C.J. Stroud? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, that was brought up by Isaiah McKenzie uh, m more than once over the two seasons we did a show at Go Long. It was it was comical. I mean, he basically was Stephon Diggs' babysitter. You know, there was the, the loss to Jacksonville. He remembered uh, Diggs kind of losing his mind that he wasn't getting the ball and the team wasn't playing well, and that stuff would happen often. And, and when you've, had, you've got veterans on the roster, I, I think guys like Isaiah McKenzie, who are just honest, you know, they, they'd give it back to him and, and kind of call him out on the, the 10% of times when he was just blatantly false. Because a lot of the times he had a point you know, with whatever he was uh, complaining about, according to McKenzie, but you do need to have that, that, that presence. And maybe there is somebody on that roster who, who knows Stephon Diggs and has the clout in the locker room, offense or defense, that can kind of keep him in check. Because it's, to your point earlier, it, it's going to happen. There's only one ball to go around. There's going to be games when he only gets 
four or five targets. Uh, and if he is concerned about winning a Super Bowl, he's going to have to take on a lesser role. So you know, whether it's a coach, it's a player, I, I think that's really important because, look, McKenzie wasn't on the team last year. There were some other veterans that I'm sure played that role that, that weren't on the team last year, and maybe that's the reason things did kind of boil over the way they did. I can't say that that's the uh, the best, most ringing endorsement I've ever heard for a player. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, out of curiosity, just based off that, I- I'm going to take a-, a guess here at a player. I'm just curious. Do we know any much, or do you know much about the relationship that Stephon Diggs has with Case Keenum since he's still the backup quarterback? Because right now I feel like Case Keenum needs to be the, the Stephon Diggs whisperer when he gets to town. <laughs> I don't know anything about their relationship. I I, get, I, I don't want to sound like the bearer of bad news because I, I think the Texans should be jacked to get Stephon Diggs. I, I guess I'm, I just think if you're that talented, you're going to have some, uh, so, some SHIT to you to some degree. <laughs> like There's going to be something. Like You're going to have to deal with it. You almost, if you look at the draft, and you see it at wide receiver and you see it at cornerback. Like when you're going through the negatives, the cons, whatever these scouts are saying is a knock on a prospect, like get, give me the knocks that you get on a Stephon Diggs because he cares. He's competitive. He's going to fight. You know, when they lost that 13 seconds game to the Chiefs, I had a player tell me he was in that locker room screaming. Like, again, it's the same thing again. I mean, they, that's what the team needed. All right, this is a team that's been banging their head against the wall here for five, six years, and maybe their window did close. I don't think it did because they have Josh Allen, but they, they might have lost their chance at a Super Bowl when you had a receiver in his prime there. And he would speak up, and I think to an extent that is absolutely needed. Uh, side note, Diggs, you know, he's back when he was coming out of college, you know, he, he's interviewing with NFL teams, and they'd ask him, like, man, it looks like you, you took some plays off there that senior year. I should say before they even asked him that, Diggs was the first to say, "Yeah, I, I did take some plays off because you know I was making business decisions. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to get hit." But he's going to be honest with you. Is my point? Like he'll, he'll be up front. He'll be honest. He'll say what's on his mind, and he'll be competitive as hell. So I, I think this is a good situation for him. It's just going to take a, the, the threading of a needle, right? You're going to need a veteran or two who who, who will be able. To speak up to him, and I think that having a former player as a coach who gets it is going to be huge. He hasn't had that his whole career. He's had Mike Zimmer and Sean McDermott. I think the Nico Ryan's everything I've heard on the guy is he, he relates to players in a way uh, that the prior to just cannot. To put a further positive spin on some of the stuff that you were just saying in your piece, it says that. Bill's teammates agreed with Stefan Diggs' very honest and candid comments 90% of the time. The other 10% of the times, that was where somebody like Isaiah McKenzie had to step in and say, okay, dude, relax just a little <laughs> bit. Exactly, right? I mean, and that, you know, there, there, there's going to be some lines that are crossed. And you're going to need somebody to point out that that line was crossed. Like if, if he's being hypocritical or if he's complaining about something that he shouldn't be. Look, the last tweet where he kind of takes the shot at Josh Allen responding to somebody on Twitter. Well, you know, somebody said, uh, you know, you, you, you need, you need the, the, the great quarterback, not the great receiver. I'm paraphrasing. And, and Diggs is like, you, you sure? I mean, to take a public shot at your quarterback is not ideal. So I'm, I imagine Isaiah would have spoken up in that case. Uh, but, hey, maybe this all kind of – we see this with some receivers, right, later in their career when they've kind of been through the ringer, that they're, they're willing to take a step back to a degree. Like, I don't think Stephon Diggs is going to Houston expecting 12, 13, 14 targets a game. I mean, he, he's got to know that Nico Collins, is a star, that Tank Tell is an ascending star, that they've got other weapons, and C.J. Stroud's a young quarterback. I, I don't think you're just dropping this poison into something that's really, really good. I think, he, I think he'll be an asset. You can find Tyler on Twitter, at Ty Dunn, with the two ends there, and the, at golongtd.com. Tyler Dunn, 
covering the Buffalo Bills in the past. Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Buffalo News. Make sure you check out his work. Great stuff. Appreciate you coming on. And and maybe the uh, we'll have you on before the Texans and Bills play on a primetime game this year because I feel like that's the direction we're headed now after this trade. Absolutely, man. I'd love to anytime and definitely try to uh, check in on those Texans as much as I can and go along if people want to check it out. It's good sub stack. Tyler, thanks, man. Thank you. All right, it's gone, George, here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 a week ago. Uh, this felt like the most anticipated Rockets game in a long time. Oh, They've man. lost a couple games oh, man. since. Is the buzz is the buzz still there? And it's Thursday, so I got I got a take. We got to find out if it's a good take or a bad take. Yeah. That's next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Before we do that, I want to tell you about my friends at O Athletic. You can check them out at oathletic.com. 767 North Shepherd was just there this morning to get a little bit of a workout in, try to keep working towards these goals. Whatever your goals are in 2024, whether you want to add muscle, get lean, or be like me and lose a bunch of weight, that's the goal for me in 2024. We're on our way, down seven pounds so far in about a month in, to this journey, feeling pretty good about it. Would like to lose a little bit more, but, you know, I was told by my, my trainer, Cam, got to be patient. It doesn't all come off at once. So when you go to O Athletic, make sure you check out their classes. They offer over 100 per week. Every kind of class you could want to take, whether it's mixed martial arts, boxing, weight training, agility drills. So whatever kind of workout you want, whatever kind of goals you have, you can accomplish them at O Athletic. Check them out, oathletic.com, 767 North Shepherd. And when you sign up, for membership, make sure you tell them that Joe George sent you by. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Gallant and George. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Remember once upon a time when everyone was so excited about the 713 connection that was going to happen with the Texans? Yep. CJ Stroud and Tank Dell? Well, it's back. Maybe it's back. Stephon Diggs is in Houston, and there's a number one next to his locker. So you got C.J. Stroud, number seven. Number one, Stephon Diggs. Number three, Tank Dell. We're on our way. Texans are back. I feel like that's excluding Nico Collins. I know. I didn't know how to. Is there a 12 in there somewhere that I can include? I don't think so. 12 plus one equals 13? He could change it to. 713? 83.2? 281? 
Jake Why don't we have three? Can we get three numbers on a jersey? We have no. number zero. <laughs> no, that, like, no. <laughs> we have the number zero. Why can't? No. Why can't someone just be seven one three? So if this Nine, is three, the worst six. take segment, Joe, that is it. <laughs> if you have three numbers, everyone's just gonna assume you're morbidly obese. That's fair. Even if you're in the or, best shape possible, people are gonna look at you and say, hmm, "Probably mm. fat." There's already. Double digit numbers that you get that guys will get. I mean, we talked about it when uh, the Trailblazers were in town. They had a guy wearing number seventy two, and you're like, okay, he got he definitely got handed that jersey with that number. That's like I, the the first guy that that gets a number with three digits on it. It's like, oh, this guy's like on a ten day contract. Yeah. Okay. It remind who's the who was the shortstop or third baseman for the Yankees that was wearing number ninety five in their in the opening. Oh, so, was that uh, was that Volpe? No, that might have been uh, Oswaldo. Yeah. Our guy Oswaldo. We're we're at 95 in baseball and like you're playing on the infield. Well, think about this. If you're the best, if you're marginally good wearing Mm -hmm. the number 95, you could be the greatest Yankee ever to wear number 95. Does that mean you get a statue in center field? Does that mean you get your number retired? I don't know. That is that, that's a good point, though, with the Yankees and the Celtics, too, with just, like, how many jerseys they have retired. Just yeah. do a wacky number. Yeah, well, guys have to wear, like, number 36, yeah. I think. Like that's number, all that's left. Well, no one's worn 69 in the NBA. No. Uh, de- uh, didn't doesn't Dennis Rodman try? I think that was that might be Urban Legend, where he, he tried to wear 69, and uh, David Stern was like, no. Nah. And so he wore 70 instead with San Antonio. I mean. They, just, they banned it? 69's banned? It's 69 is banned in the NBA? So, such a woke league. Unbelievable. That's so lame. Yeah, I, 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 when, I, the only time I remember is the story. Again, I don't even remember it. It was just a story that got told. was that Dennis Rodman tried, and t- David Stern was like, yeah, we're not doing these jokes, all right? Uh, Rodman requested number 69 when he joined the Mavs. They even printed up Mavs. a few jerseys. Which I'm told Mark Cuban still has. This is from Mark Stein. Uh, but thanks, then, China. Uh, yeah, David Stern said no. <laughs> David Stern's like, nah, we're not. That's doing lame. It. Uh, any buzz tonight left for the uh, Rockets Warriors game? I mean, I hope that there is still a going? squab between Draymond Green and Dylan Brooks. Yeah, I'm still going. Going to go to Highway Cantina before get my mark and then head on in to the arena. I am still going, but there's definitely a lot less implications here. This is a game for pride now for the Rockets, especially with Draymond Green chirping multiple times about the Rockets. Remember the press conference where he was asked about the suddenly surging Rockets, and he said, I don't care. I don't think about the Rockets at all. And then I think on his own podcast, he had this to say about tonight's game against the Rockets. Really big time win for us, especially with uh, the Rockets coming out to play. Um, (laughs) They have lost a couple in a row. And, you know, you're three games behind with seven games left and you're losing the tiebreaker. So four games behind in a sense with seven to go. Uh, my math serves me correctly. Tomorrow will be an opportunity to end their season. Uh, their playoff hopes. If my math serves me correctly, maybe there will be one more game. I haven't looked that up. Uh, that's just some rough math. Joe George math. Yeah, I think he's uh, correct. He's 100% correct. That's what sucks. He's yeah. 100% correct. Everything he said there is right. Tari Eason did say Warriors come out to play, and they have lost two games to playoff caliber teams since that happened. And the Warriors have won, what, is it six in a row, five in a row? Five games in a row they've won. So it sucks, but he's right. Yeah, he's right. And, yeah, so there's not as much luster in in the game tonight. I'm still very intrigued because this is now about I want to see who you are. Like, are you going to fold as a basketball team, not with seven games left? Are you going to – try to cause some chaos and make a run out of it. Like, like who are you as a basketball team? I'm very curious because I would imagine Ime Adoka, he does not care if they get eliminated from the playoffs. They're still, his intention would be for them to play as tough as possible. And they should. The remaining stretching game. So, they should. It yeah. just, it sucks that this was building up to potential revenge for 2018. Mm-hmm. Or if it's not revenge for 2018, maybe nothing really can be revenge for 2018. Definitely it, not the 10 seed. It's it's a moment where 
you stop the Warriors from being the Warriors and then they break up this offseason. Like, you had that as an opportunity. But with the way that the Warriors were playing, I mean, you would have had a one-game lead with a couple of games left against teams that are, I would say, probably favored against you, some of them. So yeah. it sucks. It, it, it has taken a little bit of the buzz out of tonight's game, even though they're going to be giving out those uh, Space City uh, T-shirts at the arena. I saw per Vanessa and... On top of that, Dylan Brooks is going to be mic'd up. Whoa. But that is a bold, bold no, it's choice. The perfect it's not choice. really. It's, it's the perfect it's choice. It's not really. I mean, we're not going to have that on the actual TV broadcast. Yeah. We'll hear moments, clips of it, but yeah. we're not going to get the full unfiltered. We, If we did, it would be amazing. They could not air it. They would not be able to air it. But Draymond versus Dylan Brooks. I, I want to know what Dylan Brooks says. And I want to see, uh, excuse me, I want to hear just how bad the things Draymond Green supposedly says hmm. are. Who who doesn't want to hear it? I mean, what I really need is what we saw last night. It took Twitter by storm and hockey, the five-on-five five fight to start Ooh, the game. That was pretty sick. Just drop the gloves. Let's just drop the gloves. Dylan Brooks, Draymond Green, tip-off fight. Let's go. <laughs> so Let's go. I, Let's war. I, I, I'm going to mansplain hockey to our audience in case you don't know, but generally there's four lines in hockey for a team. You usually have as your fourth line it's the line that plays the most it's a bunch of scrappy guys who essentially are just there to one clear the puck and two bleep stuff up i'm assuming joe you know more about hockey than me that both of the lines that came out to start this game were the fourth line i think so the grinder line I mean, they started off like eight guys got thrown. It was great. It's the only sport where goons are still employed. Yes. Right? Because Vontez Perfect, he was a good football player. He was just a dirty football player. Basketball, the days of guys like Bill Lambeer are kind of gone. Yeah, where you just you it, defend your teammate. Literally just Draymond. Or not just Draymond. It's Dylan Brooks, too. Yeah, but too, see, but- Draymond, but Dylan Brooks is more goon because he's, I do think most time he's defending Both his guys. Both are elite defenders, where Bill Lambeer... And uh, look, a lot of my knowledge of Bill Lambeer is from watching that Pistons 30 for 30 about the bad boys. But from what I understand about Bill Lambeer, Lambeer was just a big body that you had down low to essentially club people if they yeah. were going too close to the net. Because every team had a guy like that. Like, hey, if you're going to try to get beat us in the paint, we're going to send you to the effing curb, which is a kind of cool element of basketball, yeah. even though it's definitely more athletic and there's better shooters these days. But hockey's the one sport where guys are employed even if there's less fighting, just to hurt people, mm-hmm. yeah, to police the game. I love it. No one in the NBA or the NFL now is like, yeah, he just he just sets the tone. Like there's, no, it's like, what was he good at? Well, he, he sets the tone. He lets you know that you can't go over the middle. It's like that guy doesn't really exist in in these leagues. It's like, oh. no, you kind of have to be good. Kareem Sorry. Jackson got suspended <laughs> twice this past season for being similar to that. You know? Yeah. I remember, the tone. was it like Brandon Merriweather or one of those guys got, was yep. like, it, Brandon Merriweather when was they bad. first, when they first changed the rules, like drastically, there's one guy who just constantly gets suspended. Brandon Merriweather, one of many successful former Miami football player rappers. I think my favorite part about fighting is when the NHL tried to ban it and the players revolted. And so did the fans because the ratings started to tank out as they tried to eliminate fighting. And then as soon as they brought it back up, they slowly started to creep up again. It's a dangerous and violent game, and yet it polices itself. So the dirty stuff actually doesn't happen that much. And it's funny. They have unwritten rules as well, just like baseball. Yeah. But baseball, the unwritten rules are policed by a pitcher. That's it. Like No one else essentially polices a baseball game like you never see a batter charge the mound with a bat <laughs> but but uh, but think about it i, I mean know. the pitcher has a weapon why doesn't the batter get to do that you also you also don't really see like actual brawl like you see benches clear and maybe some like yelling and hold the back shove, stuff right and then the bullpen running in uh, 45 seconds later, uh, but <laughs> most actually, they, get but you don't, they never get there. You don't actually see like the like Nolan Ryan, Robin Ventura stuff, or the yeah. like uh, yeah. Yankees, uh, Red Sox 2003 stuff. Mm-hmm. Like you don't actually see that. Yeah, and I mean, sorry to be barbaric, but there is an element of when two people fight each other and shake hands afterwards and just move on, where it does diffuse tension. 
Now, if someone dies, you don't want that to happen. Would you? Do you think Blue Jays? Do you think the Blue Jays fans last night would rather Chris Bassett throw at Jordan Alvarez or joke around with him walking off the field? Be like, oh, you got me again. How do I get you out? Because that's what happened last night. Lame. Hockey, way better. But what are you supposed to do with Jordan there, too? I, I, that's I, I true. think Jordan's going to snap Chris uh, Bassett in half. That's a valid point. You don't have to fight him, but can you not be like, man, you really got me tonight? <laughs> it's like, so can, dumb. Can you, like, man, I think he if, has six home runs against him. Like, if, if J.B. France, the next day, he gets lit up by the Rangers and it's like, man, you Dolis Garcia, you got me again. Like, bleep that. Yeah, Come on. Veto. Not allowed on the Houston Astros. He's Canadian. By association. I don't yeah, know if he's actually Canadian. That's a good real point. Life. He lives in Canada. He's, he lives can, in, he's Canada, lives in for Canada now. though. He's yeah. Canadian for now. Uh, all right. The, the Vegas odds have changed, not dramatically, for the Houston Texans and the Buffalo Bills. We'll get into that next year on ESPN 97.5 and Glenn George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. On Monday, uh, we will be broadcasting live from Space Cadet. Uh, a great place to watch the national championship game. That'll be happening on Monday. Sorry to our beloved Cougs for not be playing. But I do have something else to promote with that that I think everyone's going to love. Yeah. Uh, they are going to be doing uh, free Astros victory beers. Oh. All you have to do is be there by the third inning. And you can get a free Astros victory beer when the Astros win games. Now, when you Google Space Cadet, this is a new bar opened up about a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it does say they're going to be closed on Monday. They are going to be open this Monday while we broadcast there from noon to six and to watch the national championship game and the Astros take on the Rangers, I believe it is, that night. Yeah. It's a four-game series. So we'll be out Space Cadet. Come hang out on Monday. Also next week, we'll be at East River 9. On Thursday, Friday, we'll be at Jack's Grill. If you win uh, a prize from our March Madness bracket uh, from ESPN 97.5, that'll be the prize pickup day as well. So the Vegas odds, Paul, as we look at them, have they changed? We all, we all expected that, you know, to see the Texans' odds improve across the board, Super Bowl, division, MVP for C.J. Stroud. I will say they 
some of these moved less than I thought they would. I, I want to start with the, the MVP. Uh, this one moved more, I would say, than the rest. CJ Stroud was plus 1,200 to win MVP in 2024. He moved to a plus 900. But what I found interesting about this was that he did not move past Josh Allen hmm. in terms of MVP odds. That surprised me because I would say that it's not just the addition of Diggs. It's what the Texans have also around CJ. He is going to be the... He's the, the Texans are one of the biggest stories of the 2024 NFL season. They really became that at the end of last year when they made the playoffs and won the playoff game, but they are a major topic on every talk show this offseason. Every time they make a move, they're going to be a Super Bowl pick. I thought C.J. Stroud's odds would be higher than that um, and would at least surpass Josh Allen, who is working with a lot of nothing at this point. Yeah. I, I think with Stroud, he should be ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm glad he's not. I think you have to look at it from this perspective. Forget who you think is better between Josh Allen and CJ Stroud. Who's going to be on the better team? Because ultimately, the MVP award tells the story of usually the best player on the best team. That's why Lamar Jackson's won the MVP twice. The Ravens were the best team. In the AFC back in 2019, they were the best team in the AFC this past year from a win-loss perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why he won it. Uh, Jalen Hurts with the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, they had the best record in the NFC. They had the, I think they had the best record in the NFL. So it's one of those things where you have to look at it from a press perspective of, hey, who's going to win more games? And if the odds haven't changed yet, I, I feel like they're asking you to take them. And I know mybookie.ag, promo code PET975, Stroud's plus 900, Josh Allen's plus 750. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah, I agree with that. It was funny when someone asked earlier in the Twitch chat, we were talking about Mike Trout, why is Major League Baseball the only league in which your team can be dog and you can win MVP because Mike Trout has a bunch of MVPs and three playoff appearances. For C.J. Stroud to win MVP this year, they, they likely will have to be. Yeah, you'll be the one seed. I think you got to be the one seed here because ultimately you're going to yeah. be competing with Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, who's going to put up statistics even if you don't buy into him that much. And I mean, that's just a couple of the quarterbacks in this conference. We're not talking about even Trevor Lawrence or Deshaun Watson, who I don't think it's completely off the board that those guys could have career years. Anthony Richardson in his second season. There's tons of competition. Aaron Rodgers, when he comes back, yeah. tons of competition in the AFC. So it will likely be more about win-loss record than touchdown-interception ratio statistics. Yeah, the last time a the MVP was won by uh, a quarterback, because that's all that ever wins it, that didn't have the best record in the NFL was in 2020. Aaron Rodgers and the, and the Packers won 13 games. Aaron Rodgers won MVP. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs won 14 games that year. So, but you look even so past still that. So still won like second most games Exactly. In the you have to win a ton of games. And I bet statistically Aaron Rodgers. Should have been Rogers, Brady that year, but you know, whatever. I think that, yeah, that was the next year when they, uh, that was 2021 Rodgers and Brady. They both had 13 wins. I agree with that. It should have been well, I think I think the year before, you know, the, the Bucks won the Super Bowl that year. So that's I mean, true. 2020. Uh the Texans division hmm. odds. Um, they move from a plus one thirty five, plus one fifteen. I saw Christian Kirk uh tweet out this long complainy tweet about you think we're just gonna roll over and die because everyone's talking about the Texans and how good they're gonna be. Uh, this to me is the last time you're gonna get the Texans at plus odds to win the division. So if you want to bet on that, I would take it. They are going to I would imagine that the Texans will be, you know, minus 105, minus 110 to win the division by the start of the season. I I also don't think Jacksonville is the team I'd be most worried about. No, I, I'm looking at Indy. 100%. Indy almost beat you in that Saturday game. They would have made the playoffs if they beat you in that game. And on top of that, you've got to look at the Jaguars. And you, you wonder, how much better are they going to get? It's not about rolling over and dying. It's what is your ceiling? And it seems like the Jaguars reached their ceiling. It's about a 9- or 10-win team. Nothing they did this offseason scares you in the same way that the moves the Titans made. Mm -hmm. And I, it's not like I'm saying, hey, the Titans are going to be better than the Jaguars next year, but the Titans traded for Legereus Sneed in a division that just added Stephon Diggs to their wide receiver court. The Titans brought in Calvin Ridley. Mm -hmm. And Tony Pollard. 
right. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, like it's they it's lost not, Derrick Henry, and it's but, not like they they they've had some losses. Uh, uh, the two guys that went to the Texans, Danico Autry and uh, Aziz Al Shair. So, okay, I mean, they at least made some splash moves, but yeah, you you look at the Jaguars, and you're like, what the hell did the Jaguars do? The Colts never make moves during the off season, but the Jaguars seemingly lost more pieces than they added. Yeah, they brought in Gabe Davis, which is kind of funny to connect the Bills and the Jags with where they're at now. I I thought that's a that loss to me means not a lot to the Buffalo Bills. I think Gabe Davis is one of those guys. He has a fantasy football name. I don't think he's a really talented wide receiver. He's a guy who has one or two big fantasy football games every single year. Everybody then wants him, but he's not a week in week out guy and you know, him and Calvin Ridley, maybe it's a little bit of a wash. I would lean Ridley's the better player. But, th- yeah, the, the Colts are the team that I'm most curious about in, in 2024 for the AFC South. The Titans are fascinating. I think they're a 6 7 win football team. But they're making moves like their plan is to win the Super Bowl. Like, like adding LeJarrius Sneed is a, mo- it's a win now move. But I don't think they're in position to be winning now. Yeah, that's they're an odd team. That's what's tricky about the Tennessee Titans. There's this clear direction that they've been moving in the last couple of years where they traded away AJ Brown. They traded away Kevin Byard at safety, who at one point was an all pro guy. He goes to Philadelphia. Um, You're letting Derrick Henry walk. You're moving on from Ryan Tannehill, though with Tannehill, it's understandable, especially after drafting Will Levis. But you make two moves like this. It's it's. It's a move that you're making because I guess you believe pretty strongly in Will Levis, mm-hmm. and yet at the same time you fired your head coach. Yeah, like that's like it's not like they fired their head coach and, and improved and brought in in Brian Callahan a guy who might be a good head coach. We don't know, but it's a boring hire to me. Okay, hey, they they brought in his his dad or just Bill Callahan, who's mm-hmm. a great offensive line coach. So that should help the Titans offensive line out a little bit because it went from being arguably the best in the league to one of the worst ones over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, I I don't know really what to make of them. uh, What I do know is I hate their fan base, and I think there's generally full of uh, hill folk who wouldn't say no to Roasted Squirrel. Literally, as I'm looking at my Twitter account, I see I am not moved by the Texans offense. Titans still winning the division. Let's be real. Whatever you guys are smoking I mean, down there, stop. If you're if you're picking the Titans to win the AFC South right now, I think you're crazy. Yes. And I will say this over and over again. I don't talk to the Titans fans living in Houston. I, I don't think you're worthy of conversation. I think you're less than a man. If you're still a Titans fan, and never even won, you're still rooting for the Titans after they love the draft of Vince Young. Oh, yeah, didn't they also... Uh, end his career, mm-hmm. as some of you say. Unfairly. Generally, yeah, generally racial overtones with that argument. Jeff, Jeff Fisher. Right. Uh, Tennessee is a state that used to have the volunteers. And we're talking like 1998, 1999. And they have such delusions of what that program can be. It has seeped into the actual NFL team that's right in front of them. It is a state that just knows very little about football. Fact. As a whole, despite having that claim. But the, the Vols, we got Vanderbilt. Shiny, shiny new stadium, though. The Chattanooga Mocs with Terrell Owens. Uh, one Texans note we did not get to because it, it's, I know not everyone, I think most people actually are excited about this. April 23rd, officially the uniform release party uh, for the Houston Texans. So that's when we will see all the new jerseys. Uh, for the Texans uh, for the 2024 season. Looks like it's going to be a raffle to even get in. So if you want to get in, you're going to have to enter a raffle to go check out the New Jerseys. We'll see. Um, I, I'm I'm excited about most of them. The first ones were a little bit of letdown, but I'm ready for the rest of them. I let's, feel Let's hope they started with the, you know. The worst one. Yeah. By force. I, I think they did. And look, there's a lot of, there's a lot more horniness mm to the reveals from what I understand than the so light they're gonna be blue. even hornier there's one wow. specific item that is extremely horny good oh, thing wow. they traded for Stefan Dix hint hint <laughs> wink wink don't let him date your sister I'm a good guy what are we talking about but 
there's not as much of the uh, the, the light blue as I think everyone's hoping for. Hmm. There will be light blue, though. Uh, there's going to be a lot of takes heard on the show today uh, that we have not got to so far from other people. Emmanuel Ocho, Adam Rank, Jeff Passan. Stephen A. Smith? Stephen A. Smith. Hell yeah. There's a lot of weird takes going on about the Texans and Houston sports. We'll start with Emmanuel Ocho trying to claim that the Bills fleece the Texans. That's next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. This is Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul and Joe inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios. Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. We'll get you with the 10-minute drill uh, in the next segment. But Emmanuel Ocho, he's... He's, he's got, got the takes. Yeah, he's got takes. He's been a very popular topic on, on Twitter, uh, mostly for what is his thoughts on the women's tournament and, uh, and angel he was Reese, getting roasted which is funny because it's one of the few things i've ever agreed with him on yes. i mean this is the same man who has a book that he wrote and when i was still doing the show with vanessa i remember coming back from puerto rico for a wedding joe that i saw in the window of a bookstore a book Featuring Emmanuel Acho. Illogical. Saying yes to a life without limits 
Emmanuel Acho with Acho wearing a pinkish hmm. color jacket. And I don't know if that was the moment right there where my hangover kicked in or where I caught COVID-19 for the second time. But I'd like to think that that book made me so angry that it reduced my immune system. Hmm. And then, yeah, uh, didn't, didn't do so hot. How many times week. did you get the vid? Twice? Twice yeah. Same. First Not time enjoyable. I got it was right after I got the booster, which my sister demanded I get so I could come home for Thanksgiving and see my uh, godson. Yeah, it's uh, I got huh. it twice. It's not an enjoyable experience. The first time I got it, my son was three weeks old, and he got it. Oh, that was the that's terrifying. Brutal. <laughs> that's terrifying. Brutal. I was like, <laughs> especially what? when we didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah, that's like mid two thousand. So that's like March. It's April two thousand twenty one. Oh, is God. when that happens. And, like, we didn't know anything. And they were just like, oh, he's going to be fine. And I was like, all these people are dying. What do you mean? I'm confused. Uh, so that was, a, that was an interesting experience. He was fine, obviously. Uh, Emmanuel Acho, though, he's got he's got takes on the Texans and the Bills trade. And he's really the first national person to say that, well, Texans didn't do very well in this deal. <laughs> Shady, I, I don't like the move, but I do think it was a smart one. I think it was real smart. It was smart to move on from Stefan Diggs because you always have to sell high. Buy low, sell high. Okay. The Bills, they bought incredibly high with Stefan Diggs. Y'all know they're paying him a premium. But then they traded him for a second-round pick? That's great math. Remember, Randy Moss at age 30 got a fourth-round pick. Stefan Diggs got a second. The Buffalo Bills know better mm. than anybody if Stefan Diggs is over the hill, if his talent is deteriorating. The Bills know that. So if you are able to fleece the Texans for a second-round pick in the most wide receiver heavy draft we have seen in a mighty long time, this is the time to do it. It's oh, about six idiot. or seven first-round grade talents at the wide receiver position in this draft. So if you can move on from a $28 million a year caliber receiver in Stephon Diggs and get yourself a $2 million a year receiver or maybe a $2 million in totality of his contract receiver in a second round, that's what you have to do. Incredibly good timing by the Bills. If you were going to move on, sell high because you already bought high, Joy. Sell high. How do these idiots on Fox, not ESPN, not just because we were ESPN. They do so much better than this. How do these idiots like Colin Skiff and Emmanuel Acho go on television all the time and just give out factually incorrect information? He's talking about it being a second-round pick in this year. It's not. It's a 2025 pick. Like, you idiot. Even if it was a second-round pick in this year's draft, some of what he said right there is exactly why I get so annoyed when I hear the certainty with which people that watch highlights of draft prospects speak about yeah. what these guys are going to be at the NFL level. The idea that you're going to find someone like Stephon Diggs in the second round, certainly not impossible. Look at Rasheed Rice for the Kansas City Chiefs this past season, 55th overall pick. But there's also a chance that you end up with someone who's not good. And again, you're moving on from somebody in Stephon Diggs, who was a former fifth-round pick, who had an incredible time in Minnesota and an even better time when he got paired up with Josh Allen in Buffalo. It, it's weird to think that a second-round pick and a $31 million dead cap hit yeah. is advantageous for anybody. And then further, to say that they fleeced the Texans. It's a second-round pick. It, it's... It's not a fleecing. It, it might be the appropriate value for Diggs. We'll see what Diggs is this coming season. I, I, I think that when Tyler joined us earlier, and you can check down the Gallant and George podcast, he did say that this lack of production down the stretch was more about the changes offensively for the Bills than it was about Diggs deteriorating as a player. But, yeah, I, I don't see how you can try to make the argument that the Texans were fleeced here. Just like I can't see how you'd make the argument, Joe, <laughs> that this is similar to Randy Moss going to the Patriots for a fourth round pick. Do you know how many touchdowns Randy Moss had that season? With the Patriots? Yes. 23? Yes. He had 23 touchdowns that year. Well, it's so funny because the comp for this trade <laughs> Make is... Make a comparison to any other wide receiver trade, man. It's also like the reason he got traded for a fourth was because he stunk. Yeah. Like, it's like... <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Uh, the the draft thing is like, uh, honestly... It just it, annoys it, me. It's crazy that, A, he was with the certainty of which that it was a 2024 second-round pick. Again, it's not. 
And two, yes, there might be seven good, uh, seven or eight good wide receiver prospects. That doesn't mean there's seven or eight good wide receivers <laughs> in the yep. draft. And it doesn't mean that it's all the first seven that get picked. Yeah, the I mean, we it's funny with Diggs getting traded for a pick. He got traded for a first uh first round pick that became Justin Jefferson when he got traded from the Vikings to the Bills. The pick before Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver that was picked before him. Was Jalen Rager? And think about to the, that. To the, the Philadelphia Eagles. If the Eagles draft Jefferson and the Vikings take Jalen Rager, we do not glorify what the Minnesota Vikings have done in the way we have now, because Jalen Rager is on the Minnesota Vikings now as like their <laughs> fifth string wide receiver, making the minimum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, sure, you can draft a wide receiver in the second round, which, by the way, you don't have a pick in this. It's the 2025 second round that we're talking about. But it, it doesn't mean that this guy's going to be – even Tank Dell. Like, Tank Dell is a third-round pick. Like, there are success stories in the draft and young guys that, you know, Puka Nakua was, what, the fifth, third, fifth-round pick, something like that. So there are guys, but that doesn't mean you're going to pick the right one just because you have a pick to take one. Right. Yeah. I mean, for every – uh, as you said, Tank Dell, uh, mid round draft. Yeah, there's a Puka. there's a Nelson Aguilar in the back of the first round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like this, like I don't even understand how this trade could be a fleece. Yeah. That that's it's the a second round pick. Yeah. Big I, buzzwords. I, yeah. I mean that's what okay. It like is. let's so you can put in the title fleece. Yeah. In all caps. But obviously that's not what going is going through Ocho's head. The social team there is probably thinking to themselves, "Oh my God, we got a beautiful segment that oh, we can man. post." Yeah, he's gonna giving draw, a real, he's giving engagement. a real take. What he's giving it an honest opinion, right? But yeah. uh, well, opinion. I don't know if it's an honest opinion. I I, I think I think it's a little contrarian. I I think it's contrarian because he knows he's going to get engagement, and he is the yeah. master of getting engagement. Like I I don't think he's a complete moron or anything like that. I I think a lot of these guys that are on these TV shows they know exactly what they're doing because it's not about the totality of the show. It's about the small snippet that gets brought up. But along the way, this is what frustrates me. These shows have multiple producers who all have the ability to speak to the people in studio, any of whom could have corrected Acho on any of those points while shifting the conversation elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is what drives me crazy. These shows that have all of these resources and they don't even use them, because I'm envious of these shows, you know? It, for us in the radio game... Not, not to play the sad little violin or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, we are doing a lot of this stuff on our own. And, yeah, sometimes we end up not doing enough work. There's no excuse for Acho to not know when that second-round draft pick is. Yeah. There's the, too many people in that room that should have been able to stop that from happening. Christ, and I thought Emmanuel Acho was stupid. Look at that. Guys, what are we doing here on the Twitch? Diggs is washed. What has he done the past three to four years? He is almost 5,000 receiving yards and 37 touchdowns in the last four years. Yeah, his first two seasons. I, I would, if you want to limit, are we talking limit about? the sample size to the second half of the year, if you want to make the contrarian argument, and, and this is where my skepticism is, they were 6-1 and one when he wasn't really involved in the Bills' offense. But, but the offense wasn't better. They just won games because <laughs> they ran the ball more and Josh Allen stopped throwing the ball to the other team. I, I can't argue he's washed. I can't do that. Didn't he lead the league in uh, yards like in – like the last five years, <laughs> like that's it's you pretty... know the Twitch though. Half of what they say, they're just trolling. Yeah, well, this new yeah, this new Red Jello guy I've never seen before. He said Texan seven and ten. He started you, going. You know stuff. exactly who Red Jello is. Oh, it's one of the people who got banned by Jeremy. Probably uh, and Joel <laughs> and Brian. <laughs> um, oh wow! Uh, okay, what we're showing all all that's behind the kimono. Well, I didn't ban them. <laughs> um, they know. <laughs> he he said there's some people that might have banned. <laughs> them. Killer bees. All, all <laughs> <laughs> okay, is this I'm gonna, is this a flea scene? If, if Stephon Diggs gives you 2,700 yards and 17 touchdowns over the next three years, is that a flea scene for a second round pick? Hmm. It kind of depends on how it's like distributed. Yeah, say those numbers again. Seven, uh, 2,700 yards and 17 touchdowns. Wait, 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 wait. What? Over the next three years. Oh, I thought you said that. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, that's no, that's what I heard oh, thinking oh, no, next no. year. I was yeah, like, no. damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Please, <laughs> only 2,700 yards. Next, he oh, sucks. Yeah, over the next three years. 2,700 <laughs> yards, 
So that's 900 yards a season. Yeah. And how many touchdowns you said? 17. Legitimately, this is what I would look at. It, it would be about what he did in the playoffs. So in that article, the Go Long article about Stephon Diggs, the Tyler Dunn, who we had on earlier, put out there, one of the comments that was made about Stephon Diggs is that in big moments, he has not necessarily shown up. That's fair. And, I mean, the last example of that would be in the game against the Chiefs, pass down the right sideline, right in his hands. Mm -hmm. Right in his hands. And Look, it's one moment. All receivers have moments like that, but that was a bad time to have that moment. Yeah, I bring up those stats because – I would never, even though it did not end great for DeAndre Hopkins in Arizona, I would never see the Texans fleece the Cardinals. And that's what DeAndre Hopkins did for three years in Arizona. <laughs> 2,700 yards, 17 touchdowns and while he was a Cardinal. And there's a steroid suspension in there. Too. There's a steroid suspension so in there. it's not even, so, whatever, 17 times three. Yeah, he played, he played uh, 35 games, it looks like, over mm -hmm. three years. So, like, I wouldn't say the Texans fleece him. So, that's how... Using that word fleeced by Emmanuel Acho, I, I struggle with a second-round pick being able to accomplish the the goal of that word. Also, the Bills sent out a fifth and a sixth in the deal, too. So yeah. it's not – they didn't just get a second. They had, they had to give stuff up to get a second. There's so much math. The Texans, second next year. The Texans could end up with a better player in the draft than the Bills in this trade. That's the reality of the NFL. They could draft a player that's better in the fifth or sixth round than the Bills do in the second round in 2025. They could, and they could not, too. The, the Bills could draft Nelson Aguilar, the Texans, in the second round with the second round pick that they got, and the Texans can draft Puka Nakua in the exactly. fifth round pick that they exactly. got. Exactly. All right, 10 minute drill. That's next here on Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, though, let me tell you about my friends at the Highway, Highway Cantina. They've got the best margaritas for 975 that you've ever seen uh and that's where i'm going to be going before tonight's basketball game downtown there's so many awesome reasons to visit the highway cantina not just because it's smack in the middle of edo by the foot by excuse me by the soccer stadium gotta get that right the baseball stadium the basketball arena it's also close to downtown looking for a happy hour after work boom Go there. The margaritas, fantastic. Wood-fired oysters. Really, really good fajitas. The chicken fajitas are the best I've ever had, but good beef fajitas as well. Hey, maybe you're looking to impress your boss downtown. You're one of those, you're one of those, you know, O and G folks. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I, I got to get that big promotion. How about you take the big old boss out to that place? He is going to be blown away. It's fantastic stuff from drinks to food. Highway, Highway Cantina. Again, it's fantastic. And tell him Paul Gallant sent you.
10 minute drill here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Jim Harbaugh. Oh boy, you want to run through a wall? It's Thursday. Oh. We're all trying to get to the end of the week. Yes. Sometimes you need a, vo- a motivational speaker to get you there. So Jim Harbaugh had, I guess, the free agency recap press conference for the Chargers. I'm not really sure why they did this one, but I think every single Chargers fan is probably pretty excited about what Harbaugh brought to the table. Los Angeles Super Chargers. Los Angeles Chargers. Here is Jim Harbaugh's opening statement at that press conference. I'm not an opening statement, guys, so it just, uh, just feels good. You know, it's like the uh, start of the new year. Happy New Year. That's the way it feels. You know, it's like that, uh, that first day of school, family reunion, um, homecoming. I know those that uh, most people think January 1st, the uh, start of the new year, those that espouse to Christianity, Catholicism, uh, correlated with the birth of Christ. But uh, us in football, today, April 2nd, start of the new year. I, I. <laughs> started. He's the best. I love him so much. I, I mean, like the references of just how happy he is. I homecoming, family reunion, start of the new year. It's so good birth that he's of Christ, back in the birth NFL. of Christ. I. Uh, that makes sense. It's the start of the new year, the birth of our Lord. And that Savior. does. There's some logic behind that. I will say, if he d- isn't coming off of beating Ohio State three straight years, and winning a national championship. He's getting hit with the Nick Sirianni press conference. This guy, this guy's an idiot. Like, he's getting hit with the when we whip, you know, uh, you know, snap judgment on people's on head coaches press conferences. Think Dan Campbell. Think Nick Sirianni. <laughs> that opening statement. He did preface by saying he's not an opening statement guy. So lowered our expectations a little. But then he delivered. But then he delivered. But I feel like people be like. Who the hell did the Chargers just hire if he didn't have the name Jim Harbaugh and the resume attached? Yeah, he's something, man. He is something. He even spoke about the benefits of teamwork using a very interesting animal to expand on why it's important to work together. What's good for the bee is good for the hive. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the, the rationale. What's good for the bee is good for the hive. Okay. Which makes sense. Someone attacks the hive. Everyone attacks what attacks them. Yeah, protect protect the queen and bee. You might die along the way. Yeah. I mean, let's let's be honest. Bees are perhaps the, the best white knights of all. Why, they really care about women. Yeah, because they boink them and then they die? No, 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 no. That's <laughs> not how it goes, Joe. That's so disrespectful. They fight and die for the queen. Okay. I think you're thinking of praying mantis? I think I am, too. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right, let's add up. Bees, uh, they sting you and then die. That's right. Bees facts, also not yeah. good. Insects. <laughs> math that, that's and okay. insects. We're okay with, we're okay with insects. They'll math. rarely come up. They'll come up less than math. Jim Harbaugh, also someone who believes that actions speak louder than words, but he said it in a way that is just classic Jim Harbaugh. Uh, what you do speaks so loudly that we can't even hear what you're saying. Um, so that's what you do speak so loudly. I mean, the rest is talk. I'm not going to talk. Just talk about it. Land the plate, Jim. (laughs) Land the plate. That's my favorite part. You know, what you do speak so loudly, and I'm not going to talk. You know, his talk is... Just talk. It's not action. <laughs> Man, he's just <laughs> he just keeps rambling. he's just lost up there. It's it's like it's literally the Michael Scott from yes. The Office. Sometimes yeah. I start a sentence and I don't know where it's gonna end. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's just he starts with a metaphor that's like I. He's trying to make a point, but then he doesn't just stop talking. He just keeps going and he, explaining th- it. That's what he is. He's Michael Scott. Like, if there was an NFL, no, because Michael Scott wasn't successful. Yeah, we're talking about Michael Scott started Michael his Scott, own. Michael, Michael Scott started his own business and sold it for a bunch of money when they were going bankrupt. Uh, Jan Basically cheated on Michael scam. Scott with a with a like a intern guitar player, fifteen year old guitar player. Inappropriate. <laughs> that was right. Michael. I don't think Michael Scott cultivated 15? a culture in which all these people. Uh, that kid in, in the office was not eighteen. They allude to that. That night, you made everything all right. Michael oh, Scott. 
Scott. Jan. What a song. Michael Scott is a, a leader and, and cultivated a culture in his office in which there was love in the air. Yeah. The, so much love. This is offensive. That it broke the up office. marriages. <laughs> I, I, I've never heard, once thought about changing the channel because of how uncomfortable Jim Harbaugh has made me feel. Where that is true. Back in the day when this was on live TV, I routinely would change the channel for two seconds while watching NBC because I couldn't handle how effing cringe it was. But I was like, but I got to go back because it's so damn funny. But Jim Harbaugh is the coach in the NFL that would be most likely to have an exaggerated movie of his life like Michael Scott did with Threat Level Midnight. Like, 100%. Jim Harbaugh, (laughs) Threat Level Midnight. Like, Jim Harbaugh has absolutely has a movie in which he goes to Russia to kill Putin. Probably would. 100%. By the way, Jim Harbaugh has takes as to how to prevent concussions. And it has to do with the body part that you wouldn't think of off the top of your head. Yeah, the, the back. The back is just an untapped gold mine. The back is an untapped gold mine of muscle. And you know why it's an untapped gold mine of muscle? Because if you have a strong back, you'll also have this. Uh, yeah, do you want a steel rod uh, in your neck or do you want a, do you want a, do you want a noodle? Uh, advise, piece of advice. I mean, you want that, you want that steel rod, a trunk, you know, that, it goes into the, the, the roots go into the traps and. God, I, he's so he just great. trailed off. <laughs> he just, I didn't cut him off. He just kind of trailed off. Mumbled. Like, he, he, again, if he wasn't, if I didn't know how successful of a head coach he was, yeah, I would have thought he's like a drunk uncle, t- like watching, no, <laughs> watching football on Thanksgiving. He's somebody that wants to be a trainer. And what he's saying here is that if you've got strong back muscles, your neck becomes like a steel rod, and that steel rod means your head's not going to vibrate when you get hit, and that means you get less concussions. I can't wait till they play the Chargers in 2025. Wow. The Texans? Yeah. When the, the, is it an AFC West year, or would the Chargers win the division? It's a uh, West year. Okay. But I just want to I want to hear Jim Harbaugh talk about like CJ Stroud again. I feel like, oh, oh yeah, especially talk about Stroud. Especially because the Ohio State yeah. side of Because he was, he, I mean, he Would he blo- take a shot? But he's he, taking a shot at the Ryan Day still. Uh, he he glowed. Uh, he was pretty positive when they were here uh, for the national championship game. That's true. Because he also, I think, talked about Nico Collins, though. Oh, yeah. He, oh, about, yeah, uh, he, yeah, he loves him. Nico Collins. Well, some of that is Michigan guy. Yeah. Michigan man. Yeah. Once you got to boost the, boost the program, man. Gosh. I, he's one of a kind. He he's really is. He really is. How I, is he so different than his brother? He's living in an RV right now. I for lo- no I, reason at I, all. I love guys like this. Like I, I, we need more just absolutely like weirdos, wackadoo yes. weirdo. Like, but also like unapologetic weirdo. Yeah, where he's just like I agree. Y- he has the resume to be like this. I, I'm just gonna sit up here and talk about and say the back is an untapped gold mine. Yeah, just be you. Like that, that's what he. Yeah. He's just Jim Harbaugh. I, I would rather Jim, Jim Harbaugh. Jim being Jim. Yeah, just be Jim instead of trying to be John or be like your dad. Like just be who you are, and he's a he's never, a weird. Never character. try to be John. John's John's gonna whine about rules that the Patriots have exploited to pull his pants down. It's true. I, I knew the second he he said the word John. Yeah, I gotta bring it up every time. John Harbaugh, twenty ten AFC title game. Yeah, Little Miss <laughs> Amendola, suck it, Ravens. Uh, only other thing you got for ten minutes drill. Uh, Rasheed Rice championship game again. Uh, Rasheed Rice did admit to his involvement. With the uh, crash officially also. Well, that's good because, I mean, you know, it was only caught on three different <laughs> cameras. He also signed it. Like, it was like a like Instagram yeah. story, and he, like, signed it. Yeah, you put, like, his autograph. Yeah, like, it's very just interesting. The worst, the worst part of all of this when it comes to Rishi Rice is that, like, he is going to get such a light punishment. And if this was any one of us in this situation... Jail. Street racing, impersonating Dom Toretto. Not jail, but you're not going to be able to pay that fine that you're going to get. You'd be in des- you'd be destitute for a while. He's got that second round pick contract. He's going to get the best lawyer possible. And they will hopefully it's a learning lesson for him, but he could have killed people with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, his his actually his attorney just is speaking with people now. He even admitted to just, he's driving the car. And he went out the passenger side. Right. It, it, which I mean Two no. people got out of the front passenger seat. This is 
this is not that hard to figure out. The car was registered in his name, as was the other car that crashed. All right. All right. Um, here, Gallant and George on ESPN 975, 95. That's it for the 10-minute drill today. Uh, what are we, Stefan Diggs, disgruntled about in our everyday lives? We'll discuss that next here on ESPN 97.5 and 925. You are listening to Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. 713-780-3776 is the text line. What are you, just Stefan Diggs level, disgruntled about in your life? So, Stefan Diggs level disgruntled means that you're upset about it Mm -hmm. but you probably shouldn't be as upset about it as you actually are that's fair you don't have a perfect situation but you have a pretty good situation. yeah like like things are good but But you want them to be better Mm -hmm. i feel like that could be me in the dating world that's what you're frustrated by i feel i feel like i have options but the options I want are the ones that are unrealistic. I'm looking for my C.J. Stroud, where yeah. in reality, you know, if I get a Josh Allen, I'm lucky. Now, let me ask you this. Like Stephon Diggs, how much of this is your fault? Because, you know, Tyler, Don, earlier, if you missed it, you can check it out on the Glotton George podcast. He made it clear some of this is on Stephon Diggs. So how much of your frustrations are 
Are you looking in the mirror about Paul? Well, as someone who hates himself, I'm going to say... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. I'm going to say... Let's see. I'm gonna say good, like seventy three percent. Okay, that's it's a higher number. That's a high number. It's a high number. That's a high number. Do you need an as Isaiah McKenzie in your yeah, life to uh, to let you know I think that I do? Hey, I do have a therapist. Doing a lot. I do oh, have okay. a therapist. I talked to him yesterday. I was trying, nice. trying to think back to what he was saying about what Tyler was saying about Isaiah McKenzie, and trying to think of who in your life that I know could be your Isaiah McKenzie. Uh, so McKenzie said that Diggs ninety percent of the time. He's right. Yeah. With the stuff he complains about. It's about the way that he does it. And the 10%. And yeah. the 10% where it's just crazy. People. Is temper tantrums. Okay. Which... Could, could, hello. It's could, me. <laughs> could Vanessa be your Isaiah McKenzie? No. Mike Meltzer. No. Hmm. No. Mike tries to wind me up. <laughs> It's funny. Mike's the opposite of what you need. My, you Mike want. will just say one word and he knows that I'm going to blow up. <laughs> Like he knows the triggers. He'll he'll bring up some sort of fantasy football metric. I love the you know. clip you put out. It was funnier than I thought it was on the air yesterday. Oh, uh, yesterday, yeah. I lost my mind because Joe was like, "Oh, well, how's it gonna affect the full team?" Yeah, but you know what we say to that? Nico Collins production. Fair, and in, in honor of Mike Mouser. <laughs> Mike will just send me a name and say, "Right, love you, Mike." Uh, Sean. What? Anything in your life that makes you Stefan Diggs frustrated? Yeah, you're Stefan Diggs frustrated I'm about it. Fascinated to see if he has an actual answer. You well, seem not frustrated with anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh you you don't see a lot of Stefan Diggs in my game. No, I don't. Uh, nah, you're, I, don't I don't see a lot of Diggs in you, man. You're very the dude in Big Lebowski. <laughs> you go with the flow. Um well I'll I'll say um, something from um from just today. We talked about it. Uh, it was the theme throughout the Delaleye show uh, this morning. Got resolved right at the end. And when I say got resolved, I mean it didn't happen. Uh, we were <laughs> promised. Uh, we weren't promised anything. We were told to expect um, some chicken sandwiches here at the station being dropped off, which happens from time to time. Uh, food from sponsors will come by just to, so we have some and can talk about it and just everyone everyone wins everyone eats um that didn't happen today oh man. we were promised and the promise was not delivered now why i think this makes me uh, a little stefan diggs ish is a meal prepped oh yes it's like should i be complaining that i didn't get a free meal today <laughs> at work should i be complaining about that how upset, good question how upset am i allowed to get at that especially when not only has it has it been result like Stefan Diggs, ninety percent in the right. I feel like ten percent in the wrong, but I also kind of did get my way where I did go from a Josh Allen to a CJ Stroud because uh, well, I was able to secure lunch. <laughs> I don't think Joe was anyway. able to secure lunch. No, I'm. I'm just gonna. You're a little hangry, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Maybe that's why certain things are really triggering me today. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> I feel uh, like they. I feel like you haven't been that triggered today. No, there was I, one moment on the Twitch where you got annoyed. No, but that's I was like uh, once a show. I was you. more. I there was, was more annoyed pre-show. before the show. Yeah, there's a pre-show. Uh, yeah, a little little frustration brewing. Oh, it's like people need to just it, chill out. Man. Was it my fault? No. Okay. Good. I mean, maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Uh oh. I, mean, I guess you're technically part of it. Oh. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> nah, they can catch people, my ass. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just Pay kidding. me, Rick. Put it on my shoes tomorrow. Yeah, I'm only doing in. four people's jobs. Um, <laughs> I would say I, I'm Stefan Dick frustrated with my kid, man. Yeah. <laughs> this dude will not sleep I, through the night, and oh. it's driving me nuts. I love that we have our own parent corner here. He's three. Sleep through the night. Have you ever thought about, and look, I know Pendleton Whiskey wouldn't endorse this, but Honestly, have you ever thought about yeah, a little, little, little whiskey? I, a little, at, li- little nip of whiskey. I'm at the point where, like, well, that's I'm, what they did back in the day. They I'm would... open to suggestions. Hmm. He's waking up at three o'clock, and the... see, here's the thing, Paul. One day you might understand this. I said, my, I don't, I don't know if you really want well, kids. I do ever. have a cat. It's like a child. Yeah, he has a cat. But like, it's one thing if he just more difficult sometimes woke up and was like crying. Like that's fine. I can, I can, I can do that. But the fact that he's woken up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning every single day for the last five days, like it is 8 a.m. in the morning, and he's just like, it's, ga- it's game what on. What happened? I don't know. He's I, just waking up. Something and he's must just, have changed. How early just, is he going to bed? 
he like I got to bed at 10 o'clock last night because he wouldn't fall asleep, and then he woke up at 2 in the morning like he was ready to party. Hmm. And I was like, what is happening? Is he taking a nap? What is going on? Uh, well, something you theoretically could maybe. do. You could be like those really annoying people that do, are interviewing themselves on a podcast, They're those life coaches. Oh, yeah. You could seize the day at 2 in the morning, Joe. Think about all the things that you could get done. If, you're, if your son is helping you mm-hmm. wake up early, mm-hmm. think about all the things yeah. that you could get accomplished if you also get up at 2 a.m. You have more problem. than 24 hours in the day. This, this is the problem. It. You can be that, like Russell Wilson. <laughs> this is <laughs> where it's the Fon Diggs issue, right? Is that it's also a me problem because I have things that I like to do. That's a legitimate thing, though, to yeah. complain about what yeah. you're going yeah. through. Because well, a lot 90, of parents go 90% through that. in the right. Well, because the problem is, is that, like, my kid, I, you know, he goes to sleep. And then my wife goes to sleep. And then that's that's me time. That's when that's when uh, I, I got that's you. when I'm I'm running, running game on Madden <laughs> online. At, and I'm staying up till one thirty in the morning. Gonna, I thought you were going to say <laughs> fantasy football. So no, somehow no, that's no, a no. step up. It's, no, that's when I'm killing people in Call of Duty and killing zombies. So I'm staying up till 1, 1.30 in the morning mm. playing video games, and then I go to sleep, Right, and then he wakes up an hour and a half later, and I'm hurting. Well, I mean, maybe maybe you're being so loud while you're playing these video games I, I wear he's head, hearing I, you. I wear headphones. I thought that might have been an issue, even though his room is uh, not close to I'm mine. I'm not talking about the TV volume. I'm talking about you and perhaps <laughs> words uttered <laughs> by you. A, a a northerner, a a Chicagoan, yeah. a, a fiery man. I believe you got a little Irish blood in you, right? Seventy five percent. Okay. Uh, is it possible that you've been too loud? I'm screaming, yelling at eleven year olds, swearing at eleven year olds <laughs> online into that headset that you're wearing. Uh, no, have I'm you pretty, called. Have I'm you pretty called eleven year olds any slurs this week? I have not. <laughs> not uh, mainly, week. yeah, I've not. Uh, he has. Good. He has. He did. He said the F word the other day. <laughs> no way! Oh no! What are you gonna do? How do you fix this? I yelled at him. It but said, no, I almost feel like you have to ignore and it. And said not again, and he hasn't said it since. But my biggest fear is he's gonna say it in front of like, he's at my parents' house right now. Oh, blame it on your parents. Yeah. You should gaslight your parents if he yeah. says it. Yeah. He's like, well, you guys swear all the time. Potty mouth. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, they don't. So it's very clearly from from me if that happens. Uh, Benadryl has been suggested. I don't know. I don't want to medicate too much. Well, <laughs> I, I like how whiskey was somehow more on the table. Was was I'm open to all options, and then Benadryl. You're like, I don't know. Dude, our entire yeah. society medicates a ton as it is. I don't think medication. Yeah, I'll let him here. medicate when he's old enough to decide if he wants to self medicate. I'm not gonna do that. And make that decision for him. Uh, all right, that's it. That's what. Those are what. Uh, what we're Stefan Diggs frustrated with. Uh, this season, this Astros season is going to be a roller coaster, but it's also Ranger. The Rangers series is here. How much does it mean to you? How much does it mean to the Astros players? We'll talk about that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
couple follow-ups from the last segment here, Paul. Um, uh, Fred asks, when will Joe's son be taller than him? Uh, I would... Oh, that's not <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I think he is going to be taller than me by, like, 15. You think so? Yeah, he's pr- growing pretty fast. Is uh, is your wife's family a taller family? No, but this kid seems to be... Uh, there's some tall members of my family that, like, are not... Like, my uncle is very tall. Okay. I, and there's some tall members of her family that, like, not directly connected to us. Like, not mom, dad, stuff like that, but... Were you ever the tallest and or fastest in your class? I will say I was. I Were was, you an early bloomer? Yeah, I got to five, six. I was tall. I was the same height as most kids my age until like freshman year of high school. Oh, okay. And then. So. so and then they just kept going. Middle school. I think we're going to like lean heavy overs for all of your son's statistics. Yeah. In whatever sport. Oh, yeah. All yeah. of his rebounding. It can't yeah. be legalized by then. Especially so. on kids. Especially, yeah. The kids need to learn Fifth that there's basketball. things at yeah. stakes for them, like, like you know, possibly supper. <laughs> Daddy had to bet on you to make money. Well, what? Inflation's going up. We all need more money, so we better be able to gamble on our children playing yeah. children's sports. I'm, I'm there heckling them. <laughs> MyBookie.ag, promo code PET975. Uh, Todd, the show does say, if you want to know why the Astros struggle at home, now you know why, Joe. Hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe there's initial dad strength, but then you know once, you don't sleep enough. Once that thing starts getting in the mind of its own, you you can't go to sleep. Yeah. I think Todd the show is trying to say that the Astros hate their family, and I would <laughs> never say that. I would never say also, that. Also, like there's a big difference between because those guys go to work at like eleven o'clock for a seven o'clock game. <laughs> Jeremy Pena is literally one of the you know, sports Space City sports whatever videos they're doing right now. It talks about how he takes a nap before every game. Which I think that's a wild move. I guess some people it works for them, but I couldn't imagine. He said he he'll like he'll he'll do his workout. He'll he'll stretch. He'll work out. He'll go eat. He'll take a he'll take a nap. Then he'll do his another stretch and final warm up before a game every day. That Man. wouldn't be. I don't think that'd be me. I don't think I'd be a pregame napper. I would. I can't do the pregame nap because my naps end up being three hours and I have usually the most terrifying <laughs> dreams that I ever have. Oh, really? Oh, my God. They're always they're very vivid. I, when I nap, it is a deep, deep sleep. I always try to do it for 20 minutes. It ends up being two and a half hours and I wake up and I don't feel uh, like recharged. I feel like what the hell happened? Where am I? Yeah, I'm not a napper. I don't. I'm the same way. I'll sleep for too long if I take a nap. I I, I could see I could see why he's napping because he has to he has to be on seven to like eleven o'clock at night. Right, and that's I mean, when he that's, has to be on. That's fair. And just like Joe, your your son is keeping you up. I'm assuming that every woman in Houston is trying to keep Jeremy Pena up. Yeah, those DMs. Jeremy, huh? have my babies in the DMs. You're so handsome. Oh my God, your arms are so <laughs> swole. Let me lick them. What? Why are you guys both it sounds like so quiet. I mean, you were like, I was like, this is, and then you go, let me lick them. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying what the ladies are uh, saying. To me, it was the voice. I mean, the subject matter also, but the voice too. Yeah, like, that's what women it was sound like. Popeye's like. wife. I respect women, and that's what women sound I just, like. I, Call I, her I, by her name, Olive Oil. I, I guess I, I didn't know her name. I really do understand pain. more of your, your frustrations with your dating life if you think that women want to lick your arms. <laughs> I do. I mean, maybe I want the ladies to lick my arms. I don't know. I want <laughs> Paul, just give me that arm. <laughs> Dude, you sound like the gingerbread man. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like the gingerbread man from Shrek trying to hit on Jeremy Pena right uh, now. I don't know. I mean, that's that's what all the women sound like to me. <laughs> oh, yeah? That's what I tell them. I, that's that what must they be all part sound of the, like. That's what the, that's what the dating is, is going All right, so, well. so uh, the Astros don't play today. <laughs> Uh, they play the Rangers this weekend. Uh, Brian McTaggart and the and the media were, you know, going around asking some of the players about how they feel about playing the Rangers for the first time and returning to Arlington for the first time since the ALCS. Jose Altuve said, quote, new season, everything is different. Every season is different. I can tell you that. We're ready to create some, create some momentum to win games, so we've got to be ready. Jordan Alvarez said there's no bad blood. Obviously, they're the champs from last year. They played some good baseball, but that's not going to change anything. We're still just going to try to go out there and win. I want there to be bad blood. I want bad blood. 
I I would imagine that these are very. This is a this is a game with calm a, statements. This is a game without stakes. We, we can't be the only people that are hoping that things get escalated because remember to. when when the Adolis Garcia temper tantrum happened and Brian Abreu got ejected. Basically, the idea of retaliation in that moment, which is why I don't believe Abreu did it intentionally, and going forward with the series, uh, the stake of the series at that moment in time, you know, we're, we're in game six, we're in game seven. To me, it, it feels like there are some things that have not been resolved. And obviously, it's different for players in situations like this than it is between fans of the Astros and the Rangers here. But I, I think everybody would love to see a little pound of flesh. And I imagine that there are some people in the Astros dugout that feel the same way. I know Martin Maldonado's not here anymore. He's the one that was going back and forth with Marcus Simeon, who had that big stomp. But there is legitimate bad blood between these two teams over the course of this entire past season, which obviously had a division race and a playoff series that we have not seen since 2015 where the Astros finally got good mm -hmm. and the Rangers had been good for a while. And there were some dust-ups that year, but then all of a sudden it just kind of faded away. There's definitely a chance for some fireworks this weekend. I'd be shocked if there wasn't, honestly, because as much as there could be on the Astros side, I would imagine there's plenty of bad blood on the Rangers side. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, if you're the Rangers, think about this. How many times in a row have the Astros beaten you yeah. in Arlington? And, I mean, and they Brian beat, Abreu. They won. Oh, there's that. But they won all three games in the ALCS in Arlington. And remember also that regular season series. I forget what the combined aggregate score was, but remember that sweep that they had in Arlington mm -hmm. where I called the Rangers dead at that moment in time? Whoops, I guess. But I think that they outscored the Rangers over three games, 39 to 11 or something like that. They were just uh, Jose Altuve, I think, had four home runs and four at bats or something. It, it was insane what they did to Texas. So I imagine for the Rangers, yeah, they won the World Series, but they hate these guys too. Yeah, they outscored them 39 to 10. 39 to 10. Okay. September 4th close. through the 6th last year in Arlington. Uh, yeah, there's there's definitely going to be bad blood. Uh, these these quotes are tamed and maybe not escalate the the issues ahead of time uh, before the, the, the games get underway, but – I, I even would assume that some of the Phil Maton stuff that just happened this weekend, even though he's no longer on the Astros, hitting three straight Rangers players, breaking Josh Jung's wrist, even though Josh Jung swung at the at the pitch, I, I would imagine that that factors in as well. And honestly, you know what? Good. Because we talked about this all the time. Who is your rival? Who is the team like that was the rival for the Astros? Well, they finally there's, have one. There's no rivalry with the Yankees. You're their daddy. There's no rivalry with the Red Sox. You don't play well enough. The Red Sox are bad now. This is the first time that even more than Seattle, because they were... Seattle faded. It was a fun three-game series, a crazy three-game series, for sure. The fan base in Seattle does keep the energy that we would assume from Rangers fans, who now exist, but definitely outside of tab, did not exist last year. Yeah, this is the first time that there's a real rivalry for the Astros, and in my view being in Houston now for nine years, the first time that anything Houston versus Dallas slash Arlington really, really matters. It really matters for the first time I, in a long I time. Can't, I can't disagree. I'm sure that there are some Rockets Mavericks moments in the days of Dirk and the days of Yao, Tracy McGrady. Yeah, where they, it, it was interesting, but was it ever bad blood? Yeah, they played a first round series in 05 that yeah. went seven, and then the Rockets lost by like 70 in game mm -hmm. seven. It was like uh, what, 2016, 2017. There was an early playoff. 2015, what, yeah. it was. Uh, yeah, they, I think the Rockets won in five. That was the uh, series where Ray John Rondo quite quit on the court. Um, and, it, yeah, it was a total mis mismatch. But there hasn't been, like, a, you know, a knockout, drag out where both teams think they can win the title. I mean, probably since that 05 series, but even that one was a first-round series. It was a 4-5 matchup. Yeah, so this is – and that's what's good. It's just, it's th There's more regular season intrigue with this Astros team now because – partially because of things like this. Like, the, the series just – this does feel different. This does – it's not just that you're 2-5 and five and starting the season and the Rangers are 4-2 and two to start the year and, and having a good, you know, role at the beginning. You know, it's 
there's juice to this series. Yeah. The, I mean, you haven't had this since probably the Cardinals, the early 2000s. I would imagine, yeah. Playoff series, uh, the NL Central chases. And maybe you want to go a little bit further back. You could talk about the the back and forth with the Atlanta Braves, but that seemed to be more in the playoffs. And Atlanta's a weird kind of sports town. Uh, and also, just the, the, the fan base of the Braves was always interesting because they were on TBS, so there were so many people in the Southeast who liked the Braves. So you would probably run into some Braves fans, actually. But it's also weird because Atlanta's just not a very good sports town, but... Uh, anyway, to, uh, tangent aside, I, I'm I'm excited for this, and I mean we could leave this open to the the peanut gallery seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Who starts bleep this weekend? Fromber, hmm. Adolis Garcia. Is there somebody else that we're we're not thinking about? Because see, the pitching matchups are interesting because the Rangers really aren't going to throw anyone of consequence in this series with connection to their history of what happened last year because everyone's hurt everyone's hurt just kind of like yeah kind of similar to the astros but uh cory seager would be a prime target for some sort of retaliation if people care about him using alex bregman's comments against him yeah in the parade that's oh, that's true is too. uh is nathan uvaldi uh pitching i mean if he no is, they're gonna not, they're, they're gonna mess. Glad jordan montgomery's gone <laughs> Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna miss Ivaldi. Right now they're projected to face Ivaldi next weekend okay. on the 14th when the Rangers are here, but they're gonna miss him. Right now it's Hunter Brown versus Bradford. Don't even know who that guy is. Uh, JP Fra- uh, JP France versus John Gray, and then Ronald Blanco versus Dane Dunning, and then uh, Monday is Vol- is Fromber versus Andrew Heaney. I, I wish um, you know, they're going to get DeGrom back at some point this year, you would assume. I, I really wish Scherzer was healthy. Scherzer, Scherzer batting practice is fun. Yeah, I mean, he they're going to get they're gonna get three guys back this year. Last year. Yeah, that's yeah. true. They, I mean, they've got as many reinforcements as the Astros coming back, and arguably, I mean, not actually arguably, they, with DeGrom. DeGrom's, when he's healthy, the best. He's, yeah, I would say it's the time. Uh, Verlander better than Scherzer, for sure. DeGrom, it's, DeGrom is... Yeah, he's... He's, he's like, one of the best three pitchers in baseball. Yeah, he's I was gonna say he's, he's like on another planet. Yeah, but the thing is, he he, can happen he again, makes though. nine starts a year. And the more you get hurt, the more often you yeah. can get hurt. What, what's what's interesting about that for the Rangers this year, honestly, is that they're not projecting him to pitch until August. Oof. So if he pitches ten starts this year, it's probably deep into the playoffs. On, for them. Honestly, that's how I, I that's how I would want you know want to do it is just sit to grom the whole year yeah just like try to stay try, try to stay relevant and then just just pitch him to ramp up for the playoffs in the playoffs because if you if he tries to pitch more than that he gets hurt every yeah. year yeah it's gonna be fascinating the, the one thing about the astros too and the rangers this year the last time they will play each other is august 5th 6th and 7th they will play the all the rest of August and all of September without playing each other. So if there is oh, a wow. close division race this year between these two teams, you will not have that last month and a half stretch in which Scherzer, Degrom, yeah. uh, Garcia, McCullers, and Verlander are all back, assumingly for these teams. You will just not play each other. Who? Oh, God, baseball is so dumb. Who well, decided that? Well, because they come out with the schedule before the playoffs. I get that, yeah. but. Even to that point, it was a close division. The Rangers I mean, were good for the first time in forever last year. You assume the Astros are going to be good because they're the Astros. Man, that's a big, big misstep. Obviously, to your point, Sean, you're right. The schedule's released early, yeah. but come on, guys. I mean, this is an obvious. You got to have at least one series between these yeah. teams the last month of the year. Not There's having none? Because I kind of like. Insane. I kind of. And Joe, you, you mentioned it quickly that. They play this weekend, mm-hmm. the t- Astros and Rangers. The Astros and Rangers then play in Minute Maid Park next weekend, too. Yeah. Which is that, that's the like, keep an eye on that series. That might be where it like really gets wacky. Yeah. Super pops off. But to then have it so like front loaded, that, that is, that's very, strange. yeah. You play 13 times. They play seven times between tomorrow and <laughs> next Sunday, the 14th. The next time they will play after that will be the three games before the All Star break. That's they play early in August, and then they wouldn't play potentially again until the postseason. So, Oof, it, it, it is a, a bizarre schedule. That's why more people watched the women's basketball uh, <laughs> game between LSU and Iowa in the Elite Eight than they watched World Series games last year. The sport is dying. 
It's a good thing that the Astros are good. Yeah, 7169. Garcia needs to get plunked his first at bat to get ahead of the warnings. Uh, honestly, uh, he's one of the guys I'm not going to hit because we saw what happened last time. Yeah, t- it, that seemed to backfire. Or, or you just, like we mentioned with the uh, fighting and hockey, the, the vaunted fourth line. That's get, true. Get one of these fourth line middle relievers out there. No. Hey. Hey, if you want to, if you want to suspend Dylan Coleman for this? the rest of the season, go for it. Uh, how about Miguel Diaz? <laughs> who? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, who the Astros claimed today and is going to be on the forty-man roster? Uh, Penn Murphy, Luis Garcia uh, were just transferred to the sixty-day injured list to clear forty-man uh, roster spots for Cooper Hummel, who is a what? catcher outfielder from the Giants that they just claimed. I like that. Um, Co- Catcher I guess in first base as well. Oh. And then they brought oh, in this man. Miguel Diaz guy uh, who they also claimed. So, Miguel Diaz, you, you are the thrower of baseballs at the Rangers. Welcome to the Astros. <laughs> Those, that's, it's like, I like that. It's like a gang initiation. Yeah. Well, like, you go back to us talking about the hockey. It's like your fourth line. Yeah. Where he's like, all right, just come in, gang initiation. That is funny. And he's going to be the first one that gets got. Like yeah, in that yeah. episode of Peaky Blinders where they get this little this little pee pants to go kill somebody and he gets his throat slashed in jail. Yeah, he's, Rojas is going to get jumped in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's a, it's a day that ends in Y, which means uh, there's dumb asters takes out there that we're going to have to address. Uh, and, and who knows, maybe we'll be forced to apologize because I've heard that that's happened here before when Jeff Passon makes idiot comments. But we'll talk about them next here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Gallant and George. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, so once again, uh, people are making comments about the Houston Astros and their past, and some of them annoy me, some of them don't. Um, Both of these annoy me in different ways. We'll start with with Dave Roberts. Dave Roberts, if you didn't see this, the other night, uh, there was an in-game interview going on in Sunday Night Baseball between the Dodgers and the Cardinals. And this is actually kind of funny that you could the, – the pitch comm was being heard over the hot mic, um, which I, is, like, not a major issue, but I would imagine, because it's like – it's that, that would be impossible to relay. But if people were stealing signs again – yeah. That's that's exactly how you'd be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, we're we're there's going to be a pitchcom sign stealing scandal at some point in which someone like hacks into it, uh, which I, I can't wait for. I, I hope it's like the Cardinals who end up doing it. Yeah, same here, they suck. Uh, they're <laughs> the God. worst. I forgot that's your least favorite. Um, oh, but Dave Roberts was asked about this after the game. He said, "Quote: I would have a little comment about a trash can, but I'm not going to go there." But you did go there. But you know what my issue with the comment is? Is what? he didn't. But don't he, be a bitch. He did go there. Like, he said something about it. Either don't mention it, or if you're going to mention it, say something witty. That That's not witty. That's a, that's a, <laughs> you know, and it's one of the things that elicits laughs from those uh, media types who are on the beat every single day. Yeah. And to them, it's the funniest thing they've ever heard. And they're like, oh, wow. Well, well, that's because... Like, my column might get 12 clicks. Yeah, that's all they have. I mean, well, Astro's Twitter is pretty much the only reason why the LA Times probably exists anymore. Because... I know, with all the, the anger <laughs> clicks yeah, and the, rage the... and comments and engagement that they gave Bill Plaschke. Yeah, Astro's Twitter is the reason why they exist and the reason why a lot of writers for The Athletic have jobs, too, because you guys rage click a lot of stuff. You do. Um, but So that was the first one, which, mm-hmm. like, it's... Like you said, it's a nothing comment, but it's kind of just annoying at the same time. Yeah. If yeah, you're going to yeah. say it, just say it. Say it. Like, don't be a coward. And Or, or specifically say, if you can't say, I'm not going to say anything about it, if you already did. It's a, it's a, it's the, it's a wink, wink. It's the butt. Nudge, nudge, yeah. shut up. We, we, we know what you're trying to do. You may as well. Yeah. Admit it's it. the, it's the, the butt thing when people talk is, I, I don't mean to be sexist, <laughs> but. And then you know that anything after the butt is going to be sexist, or I don't mean to be racist. Right. But, and then everything after that is going to be racist. It's basically, you, the sentence begins after the word butt. Yeah. It, it's just, it's so dumb. And then there was this one. Uh, Jeff Passon was on Pardon My Take. And after this qu- after this comment, he was asked about why he got rid of his Hall of Fame vote. And the reason why this comment annoyed me is because what he eventually would go on to say, which I'm just going to explain. He, he talks about the Hall of Fame and that he gave up voting for the Hall of Fame because they left out players like Barry Bonds and they are choosing when to be sanctimonious and when not to be mm-hmm. about players that are going to be in and that these steroid players like Barry Bonds deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. And Jeff Passan goes on to acknowledge that it was a rampant part of Major League Baseball and you can't just pick and choose. But what annoyed me is right before he said all that stuff about the Hall of Fame, he made this comment which is very slanted about the Houston Astros. And that's, it just annoys me that he still wants to portray this story as an Astros problem. When that's just, it's factually incorrect. Like, we know that the Yankees and the Red Sox cheated. We know that Chris Bassett, who was on the mountain last night for the Toronto Blue Jays, went on MLB Network and said that the Astros were not the only ones doing this. We know that Joey Votto went on the Dan Patrick show and said the Astros were not only doing it. We know that the Colorado Rockies were using a massage gun and using it on their metal bench to steal signs around the same time as the Houston Astros. It's just, I don't, I don't like when you have a prominent national writer who adds to this false narrative that the Astros were the only team 
cheating in the way they were in 2017 and 18. It's just stuff. I, I get what you're saying there. That comment that he made about Otani and saying that you don't want to have a, I guess, juiced ball scandal at the same big, time that they're investigating Otani. Big Cat was trying to insinuate that Major League Baseball should juice the balls again to make the game more entertaining. And I, I think they should. That That's what also was weird agreed. about what Passon said, because Passon even mentioned in that interview that the sport was better when people were cranking balls all over the place. So, yeah, I, I, I suppose a bit of hypocrisy there on Jeff Passon's front. Yeah. But I, I feel like if you are someone like Jeff Passon, who is widely respected and is... At the very least, one of the baseball writers, maybe not here. Obviously, I know a lot of people don't care from here, but he seems to be one of the baseball writers that's not looked at as a fuddy-duddy and or fossil mm -hmm. like so many are now because it's generally been like the same national beat guys for a while. Ken Rosenthal, Jason Stark, Buster Olney, to a lesser degree, Keith Law. Mm -hmm. He should be one of the people that's actually out on the forefront. Yeah, and like, and that's where it's it's funny too when he says the Astros comment versus openly talking about how he's not going, how he doesn't vote for the Hall of Fame anymore. Where are you on the side that it's really right now? It's just Jose Altuve. Justin Verlander will not have an issue getting to the Hall of Fame because of what he did with the Tigers. Um, do you think Altuve will have the struggles to get into the Hall of Fame? I that hope he doesn't. Others have had. I mean, I, I I brought this up on Twitter after Jose Altuve went yard on Tuesday night. I mean, he's had two careers where you, you can make an argument that he's Hall of Fame worthy, and by mm -hmm. two careers, I mean that that stretch that he had from 2014 through 2017, which culminated with an MVP and a World Series crown. And then what you've seen out of him the last three years specifically, you can put 2022, uh, 2021 in there if you want. But, mm -hmm. I mean, since 2022, his numbers are better than they were from 2014 to 2017, at least based off of the metrics that a lot of people look at now. You don't look at batting average and hit totals as much as you look at OPS. His power numbers have gone up incredibly. 2022, yeah. great year. When he was healthy last year, on pace for a lot of awesome numbers. And thus far already, I mean, he, another home run last night. I I feel like if he had retired or had a stretch of extended bad play after that scandal, it might have happened. But I think now a lot of the national folks, when it comes to Jose Altuve, have come around. And you you saw it last year. You did, and 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 he's one of them. That's where it is. Altuve does get talked about very differently than the organization, the team as a whole. But it took time for him to get talked about that way. Yeah. And there still are some places, Seattle specifically, where they look at him as if he's demon spawn. Yeah. I, like Todd, the show says Altuve gets in first ballot. I would be surprised by that. You think you'd be surprised? But no, he, he's one of the best second basemen ever. I agree. I mean, statistically, yeah. he's he's got to be trending up there. I, I, I think there's a very good chance of him getting 3,000 hits. Mm -hmm. uh, his power numbers, I don't know what they're ultimately going to end up being, but, I mean, you've seen, like, the last three years, this is a guy who is capable of 30 home runs a year as well. So, most home runs in playoff history. Yeah. It's just, I, Led I, the American I, League in hits four years in a row from 14 through 17. Led the American League in stolen bases somehow despite being a horrible base runner uh, for two of those seasons. I just struggle with the idea that these writers, even though they will age out and change a little bit, that prevented the best baseball player of, like, the best hitter of all time and Barry Bonds that kept him out of the Hall of Fame will not be vindictive in the way. Now, the big difference is, is also their personality. People hated Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds was not liked by the media. And if he was nice to the media, that would have probably helped him get in. Altuve is obviously beloved. I hope everyone's right. I hope he gets in first ballot. He is one of the best second basemen of all time. The statistics are there. 3,000 hits, most home runs of all time in the postseason. He might hit so many that he makes it an unreachable number still in his career where the idea of someone passing out two home runs in the postseason seems impossible. He should get in right away. I just, 
the the writers it's of of all the writers it's the most uppity nonsense group we have in the yeah media. they're part of why the sport's dying they have not done a good job of staying young and a lot of the people that uh, I, I would say this is this is baseball's biggest problem who do you go if you're someone from houston to follow somebody who talks about the game on a national basis because the few younger people that talk about baseball mm -hmm. it's like john boy and who from houston would watch anything that John Boy does yeah. after the Altuve buzzer allegations. Then after that, um, there there was a I, I think a TV show called what was it Intentional Talk? It oh was yeah, Kevin yeah. Millar and Chris Rose. I want to say mm -hmm. I yeah. think they even canceled that. So because uh, I'm not sure that he works at the MLB Network anymore. Uh, Chris Mad Dog Russo is a cartoon. Uh, he's kind of pro Astro, so I will say. Not, hey, but he's not a young voice. Right, no, that's not. what I mean. Like, he's not a young he's, voice. He, the most prominent people who talk about baseball are largely forgotten around people that are younger than us. Yeah. And that that's a huge problem. Like, There's no one that covers the game in an entertaining and passionate way for, I guess, the next generation. Besides really John Boy. And, and and look, you could have some players that are doing it themselves. Obviously, you're, you're seeing a lot of players jump into media and do their own podcast and do their own video shows and, and, and whatnot. So maybe it's not in trouble. But, I mean, a team like the Savannah Bananas travels around the country and is selling out Minute Maid Park. And you see what the Astros, defending AL West champions, are drawing for weeknight games against the Toronto Blue Jays. And the A's are playing in Sacramento. I can't get enough of that story. Did you see, uh, see what the owner said? What no. He, 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 he actually acknowledged that that's something. I, I figured he would uh, continue to hide. Well, because he was at the Sacramento like ballpark like announcing that that's what they're doing. And he said, basically, it's the most intimate uh, ballpark in Major League Baseball, which is true because it's a AAA ballpark. Uh, and then he also said, I can't wait to see uh, some of the game's biggest stars like Aaron Judge hit home runs here. What a, it's so much like the Phoenix Coyotes playing their games in a in a. They play the Phoenix Coyotes play in a college arena, and yeah. the Oakland A's intimate. Yeah, and the Oakland A's are gonna play in a minor league ballpark. And, and their intimate. owner, their owner is, hey, come see Aaron Judge. Other players hit home runs against the yeah, A's in Sacramento. Um, I really wonder how they're gonna make it work in, um, Vegas. I don't think they will. I think it's going to, it's going to, they're either going to, it's going to go two ways. They're going to be forced to sell the team because it's such a disaster and Vegas will want them out. Can they move to Nashville? Can we have an AL West team in Nashville so we don't have to stay up late anymore? That'd be nice. Uh, Nashville's coming at some point. And then, White Sox, or, right? That's where they're moving. I could see the White Sox moving there. That'd be funny. It wouldn't shock me. Jerry Reinsworth's the worst owner in sports. Um, all right. Is this a, a troll take or a real take coming from Adam Rank of the NFL Network? We'll discuss that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at Pendleton Whiskey. Honestly, for this Adam Rank take coming up, I feel like I might need myself a glass of Pendleton Whiskey because he brought things into a world that I just absolutely hate. But the world I don't hate is the world of a glass of Pendleton Whiskey. One rock, two fingers worth of that very smooth, very refreshing goodness is a great way to cap off my night. But you can make all sorts of different cocktails with the Pendleton Whiskey. You can make a Rodeo Mary. It's Pendleton Whiskey, Bloody Mary mix, hair of the dog. It's a nice thing to wake up to on a Saturday or Sunday where I'm having my big old blueberry blackberry pancakes. Pendleton Whiskey is, one, cut with Mount Hood Glacier water, two, made from the finest northern grains, and three, barrel-aged in American oak. You blend it all together. It's not just the legacy of the cowboy. It's also true Western tradition. It's Pendleton Whiskey. You can find it at Pendleton or your local liquor store. Pendleton Whiskey, true Western tradition.
This is Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul and Joe inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios. All right, is this a troll take or a real take? Adam Rank, which you suck, NFL Network. Uh, James Palmer was like my favorite person. They let, laid him off. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that bummed really disappoint- me out. Andrew that, Siciliano yeah, as well. That really disappoints me. Uh, who, uh, another Syracuse guy, but somebody who helped me out when I was early in my career. Sucks. Yeah. Just sucks, but uh, that's that is media <laughs> yeah, today. It, it is. We know. <laughs> we uh, know very so, well. Uh, Adam Rank tweeted, who I like. He's more of a – He's. Uh, I think you probably hate him because he's a fancy football nerd. Uh, um, that's all – It's all. everything he does is about fancy football or the What's Bears. What's the wide receiver three <laughs> uh, going to do for you this week? He said, NFL teams are going to model their franchise after what the Texans did for years. I Don't they already? Spending a lot of money when you have a quarterback on a rookie contract? Or is he saying they sucked on purpose for two years and they're going to do more of that? I think his idea is when you find a rookie quarterback who's actually awesome, you go all in with said quarterback immediately because he's on the rookie deal. But the problem is when you think about all the things that the Houston Texans did before this situation was even possible, which was one blowing a 24 seven first half lead Mm -hmm. against the Kansas city chiefs the eventual Super Bowl champions that year to having a vice president who went from being team chaplain to vice president, combining with Bill O'Brien, making some of the worst executive decisions possible, which led to, one, J.J. Watt quitting, Mm -hmm. and two, Deshaun Watson quitting before we found out that Deshaun Watson was a serial sexual misconductor Mm -hmm. and was then untradeable with a no trade clause despite not wanting to play for the Texans having all of the leverage you had to find a team willing to sell their soul and make that trade and get everything that you've gotten in return for Deshaun Watson, which now all of a sudden we're counting Stephon Diggs as part of the return to the Deshaun Watson trade. I think there's a little bit too much uh, math going on here. You had to go through all of those things yeah. just to get to the point where you fired one black coach after one year, then fired another black coach after another year, which makes your organization even look worse. But before you fired the second black coach, the coach – ultimately won a game that everybody in the city and the organization probably wanted to lose so that you would have the number two overall pick in the NFL draft and end up falling backwards into the second best quarterback per consensus in the draft. You, If, if that's the way you want to replicate the Houston Texans, unbelievable if you're able to pull that off again. It yeah. is one of the craziest luckiest breaks that we have ever seen a franchise get to go from all of that to through the mile of poo out of the Shawshank <laughs> prison to having the best quarterback in in that draft as an arguably a top five guy. And on top of that, an extremely likable head coach, it, uh, by the way, and ex- Will Anderson. extremely likable head coach who is one of the top head coaches, head coaching candidates uh, of that draft. A hiring cycle who really the only reason your job is attractive to attractive to him is because he played on your team a decade ago <laughs> and, and then now is a as a hot shot coach who then can uh then you can hire him yeah it's it's impossible <laughs> like what, what the texans have done now there are certain things the texans have done that i think the nfl needs to more widely accept and do going forward yeah the San Francisco 49ers did this first, of course, but mm-hmm. once upon a time, they fired Jim Harbaugh because things were not going well. And he didn't get along with Jed York. They made a really dumb decision. They hired the mustache man, Jim Tom Sula. They fired him after a year. Need and then they time. hired... They chose Ch- Trent Balky. And then they hired Chip Kelly, who they fired after a year. So they went through three head coaches, really four if you count interims, because I think Harbaugh had an interim. 
They went through three head coaches at a minimum in three years. I don't know, just like the Houston Texans did. They fired Bill O'Brien, they fired Cully, they fired Levy Smith. That's one thing I wish NFL teams would collectively do more of. I, If you got it wrong, just say you got it wrong. Like, it, There's nothing wrong the with that. The thing hack at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the Broncos did. I give the Broncos credit. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Texans got called a racist because of what they did, but they also got it right. They did. It, it is funny. It, it has all worked out in the end, and a lot of people have to walk things back. And it, it is strange that people got as mad as they did moving on from those coaches after a year. Anyone who is following the Texans with David Culley, you're like, oh, man. Your GM's on the headset telling him when to challenge plays. And on top of that, when he spoke, it's uh, listen, we don't want to hold a, you know, a guy at a, in front of a microphone against him as an indictment against his ability to coach a football team. But some of the things that Cully would say publicly, you're like, oh, man, do you know what's going on up there? And then on top of that, like, Lovey Smith was an energy vampire. He's an older guy. Mm-hmm. His prime was past. His beard, very white. They moved on from him, and it was correct for them to move on from him. And it's funny, like a lot of people would have had the Houston Texans just roll into another year with him as the head coach, acting like you need to have that stability. No, sometimes you just know. Yeah, for what? Sometimes you just know it ain't the guy. And if you have the money to buy the guy out and give him a nice, sweet retirement package, then do it. Yeah, like that's what, and that's what other NFL teams should do to be like the Texans. I give them credit for fire people. I believe. Be impatient. I. (laughs) think bill o'brien is still under contract or still getting paid by the houston texans no, no way i think it's over now yeah because when he signed his extension in 19 he's been gone since 2020 so didn't he sign his contract extension right before that season how long was the extension five so years it's either four or five years so he either is just now just now this will be now just not getting paid by the texans or potentially like you're, you're still paying cully they're yeah. still playing Lovey. Yeah. They're probably still paying Jack Easterby in some way. Like, and then Cal McNair went into this offseason and said, okay, here's my books. Take all of my money and pay these guys and just spend, spend, spend. I get like what the Texans did is lucky. It's impossible. It's unlikely. It will never happen See, again. Th- that's that's the big thing here. Look, everyone thinks that there's a formula. But ultimately, it is about getting lucky. My favorite team, the Patriots, got lucky. Pick 199 Mm -hmm. replaces a $100 million quarterback who had just signed that extension in the weeks before he got hurt. (laughs) I mean, and and think about what happened before that. I mean, they were the worst organization in sports. Up until 1993, their owner went bankrupt hosting a Michael Jackson concert. So they had to sell the team and they almost moved to to, uh, St. Louis. Their first head coach quit after they made a Super Bowl and left for the Jets. They had Pete Carroll and and they're like, nah, he never had a losing season. Yeah. And they moved on for Belichick, who was a failure. Like, who would have thought Belichick would be this as a head coach? Yeah, all no one. And then the Brady thing too. It, it, you're right. It's all none of we all try to replicate these things. But I mean, the Chiefs. Okay, first off, Philadelphia, for whatever reason, thought they could do better than Andy Reid. I mean, they they've won a Super Bowl and been to a Super Bowl with two different coaches since then. Andy Reid goes to Kansas City. Kansas City sticks with him for a while, and the Chiefs end up getting Patrick Mahomes tenth overall, tenth. It's all luck. There's there's no replicating any of this stuff. Yeah, it's impossible because all it is, it's all about the quarterback. Yeah, the the best, I think the most simple and the best tweet dunking on Adam Rank was from a Jets fan that said, man, I wish the Jets would have thought of hiring a San Francisco defensive coordinator and drafting a, a quarterback number two over us. <laughs> I really wish they would have exactly. thought about that. <laughs> like... Yeah, I it's I'm guessing it's more of a troll take than anything, but it, it is just what the Texans did is it's all luck. It's all it's all it is. Mm-hmm. The 49ers are lucky. Mm-hmm. They got Mr. Irrelevant. They're paying him like forty eight thousand dollars a game. 
He is the, the cheapest quarterback on the planet. Right, they you are, Ken. No, they haven't won anything yet. But all right, that, that does it for that segment. So <laughs> troll take, I would assume. Uh, garbage time. That's next here on Glant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. This is Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul and Joe inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios. Gallant George here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, Astros off today, taking on the Rangers in a four-game series starting tomorrow. 8 nothing win last night over the Toronto Blue Jays. Only giving up one hit. Middle relief was very good. Once again. Hell yeah. And the Houston Texans have officially, officially acquired Stephon Dix. They tweeted that out and sent out their email blast. I, I like how you said once again for the middle relief. Because there's been a, there's been uh, three straight games. One other game oh, well, where they were good. Two other games. Yeah. Yeah. The middle relief was good. Josh Hader was not. He's not middle relief. He's end relief. He's the end of the game. Yeah. <laughs> the middle relief has not been good this year until last night. Uh, they've had the, the Hunter Brown game was. Good enough. He left in <laughs> he left in the he left in the fourth inning and Seth Martinez and Parker Mashinsky got you to the got you to the seventh without giving up any runs. Good old Parker. Yeah. And then it was a Bray Presley and Hater who dumped the bed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, with Joe on this. I'm just saying, like I'm with Joe on this. Like they were good yesterday and the last time you really needed them, they were fine. <laughs> All right, garbage time. Let's do it. <laughs>
So for those who don't know, Joe, George, and I, we are in charge of some of the social media content here mm-hmm. at ESPN 97.5 and 92.5 after all of the changes. And yeah, some people maybe not so happy about that. But uh, Joe, mm. uh, I have a question. We can do this for content. Okay. You walk around a restaurant and you touch random people's food. Oh, no. Because someone did that in Miami and the woman assaulted them, which is pretty awesome. I... It was a child, too. This person was definitely... Well, that's tough. It's not tough. I yelled at a kid yesterday. Hell yeah. He was driving a, he was driving a four-wheeler around my parents' neighborhood, and he literally nearly hit me. He nearly hit you? Yeah. Well, you, you showed that car as it drove off. Would you, would you, Did the windows... Were the windows rolled down? Could I you rolled my windows you? down. Would you, oh, you were driving in the car. I thought you I were was walking. Drive, no, I was driving the car, and he nearly hit me with a four-wheeler. Jesus. And huh? would you... Would you? I just said, don't be an idiot. I screamed at him. Okay. Was he like, was, don't be an idiot. Yeah. Like that? Oh. Oh. I know. I don't know why. Joey Lopefino <laughs> might be on the Killer Bees today. Ooh, that's nice. Okay. More home runs and strikeouts. So uh, you're not in on walking around restaurants and touching people's food as a prank. You would yell at them if they mm. if they did that. I would. I would. Yes. <laughs> now, if we were gonna do this. I would just have Joel Blank walk around and just like be like, "Your food needs more ketchup," and just like catch up people's food. <laughs> that would actually, that would be pretty funny. That would be actually. I'd like, love to see Joel just walk around and put ketchup in people's. I food. would love to see like what John and Lance like they get breakfast tacos a lot. Just like Joel, just like walks in, in the middle of the segment, so they can't get up and do anything, and just like just ketchup. blast them with ketchup. Uh, okay, how about this as an idea for content? Uh, you go to fast food places and you pull guns out at the window, but uh, as a prank, as a prank. That seems like, like a bad prank. I like that one. That one's better. So this actually wasn't a prank. This is just a crazy Ohio man. An Ohio man pulled a gun on a Burger King employee for giving him a discount. What? <laughs> he got two sausage, egg, and cheese croissants, a sausage biscuit, and two hash browns. Normally, it's $11, but due to the discount, the Burger King employee offered him an $8 final bill. This man was confused by it being cheaper, thought that the order was wrong, and pulled a gun out on the drive-thru window. Classic Ohio. People are so stupid. Classic misunderstanding. Well, if if the final bill was different than what you expected, and you go and get this all the time, which I'm guessing this guy does. Well, but like, I can, don't you like look, look at you? Like, but yeah. it'd be lower. <laughs> but I get why like, he's worried that his food's gonna be wrong, so oh, he's arguing. A he's just order. an honest man. Yeah, That's he's like a wrong order. Yeah, okay. he's an honest man. He's just trying to keep everything. I so like, I get check. that. I'll double check before I start waving the tool around. Just be like, hey man, like, can you read my order back to me one more time? <laughs> One more time for One me, more time. please. Like, and as, like, you're, hey. as you're reaching for your gun. I just feel like, hey, man, like, I don't, you know, I don't. You could have gotten it for free if you followed through. I don't want a discount, but can you explain why it's cheaper than Five normal? Five-finger discount. There. <laughs> See, I would be worried that, like, I was getting, like, ripped off all the other times when my order was $11. I thought maybe that's why he was angry. He's mm. like, dude, I've been getting overcharged for the same breakfast order every single day. That could be it, too, but I, I don't think that's the case. Whatever the case. So, okay, we're not going to do that as a prank. Uh, and the last story that we have in garbage time, uh, Botswana is angry because Germans aren't killing elephants enough and they are threatening to drop 20,000 elephants in Germany because there's too many elephants. Botswana has one third of the world's elephant population. Yeah, why do the Germans need to kill them? Because the Germans are the largest importers of tr- hunting trophies in Europe and apparently Botswana's economy relies on uh. poachers coming in killing <laughs> elephants for 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 trophies huh. <laughs> so never... they're threatening to just drop twenty thousand elephants in germany so they're just walking how, around like we have deer. too many damn elephants how do you lot, drop man. how do you drop twenty thousand i think you just just like... put them in a plane and just like yeah keep pushing them out the back like, oh like, so it's gonna be like fast and furious <laughs> yeah like the cars and fast and <laughs> put parachutes on them why not That's garbage time, folks. All right, that does it for us. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow at noon. The Killer Bees are broadcasting live from Constellation Field before Spencer Aragetti takes the mound for the Space Cowboys tonight. Uh, Hopefully, one of the players, the Space Cowboys, will be joining them today. Hell yeah. We will be back tomorrow at noon. Goodbye. Peace.
Ooh, what up, H-Town? Hey, how we doing? He's blank. I'm Brandon. Brian's out here on site engineering in uh, Irod. Austin Rodriguez back at Gal. It is a Thursday edition of the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5, and we are broadcasting live from the beautiful constellation filled in Sugarland. Beautiful day. The sliding glass doors are open for us. The players are warming up. Spencer Eric Getty's on the mound tonight. He has been dominant in his first two starts. Uh, this is the type of day that you, you like to broadcast a show with the sunglasses on. Uh, with the door open, look out the beautiful Mother Nature. Uh, it is gorgeous today. When they say a beautiful day for baseball, I think this is what they're talking about. There's a nice breeze in the air. The field looks gorgeous. This is a beautiful stadium. BMAC and I were talking about there's not a bad place in this entire building to watch baseball from. And, you know, you got, like you said, a good matchup, potential for JV on the Hill Sunday if you want to come out to some of the games here in Sugarland. But you need to come out and see this place at some point because it is a little bit of a hidden gem uh, in Houston. Joey uh, Loperfito is going to be joining us at some, at some point in the 5 o'clock hour. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, but a great spot to, uh, to do a show. It's a great spot to watch some baseball. I had a friend tell me yesterday that if he could have season tickets to any uh, team in Houston, he would pick the uh, the Space Cowboys. Man, a little hot takey. Uh, but he said that. Oh, man. He said that. I'm not necessarily okay. going to echo that. But people love their minor league baseball. You get a cold beer, watch some ball. Uh, and now it's a AAA affiliate, of course. It has been for several years. Uh, but much better now that they're an affiliate of the Astros as opposed to being an independent league team because now you get to see the, the guys that are knocking on the door, the Can guys that will be future tickets? Astros. Can we resell those tickets? I mean, if you, you get to choose the season tickets you want, I would think that if, if you had the ability to resell them, you could make some coin on some yeah, of the maybe, other teams. Maybe we'll talk about that uh, at a different time. Uh, maybe though, I mean, it's not. It's not a bad. That's not a bad take. Uh, Secondary income. Astros uh, finished up their seven-game homestand to start the season yesterday. We don't complain about series wins. However, you get series wins, we don't complain. Uh, the Astros needed a series win after they were swept in four games by the New York Yankees. Uh, Astros get the win yesterday. They do it in dominating fashion. Great to see the offense do its thing. Good to see the middle relief do its thing. Uh, four shutout innings. Javier, I didn't think, was fantastic, but five shutout innings, you're not going to scoff at that. Uh, just what the doctor ordered yesterday for the Strohs. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I think that uh, aside from, obviously, the walks, uh, they kept the hits down. Uh, they got the bats rolling again. It was great to see Jordan do what he did. Great to see the offensive explosion and them keep piling on more and more runs. And when you look at just overall uh, the end result of the Toronto series, they should have swept them. Uh, they did a lot of what you wanted to see from a starting pitching perspective to keep it rolling from the offense, getting key guys, uh, big, big home runs and at bats. Uh, you take a lot of positives away from that series. And again, people losing their mind. But you look at the Yankee series, you weren't blown off the field. You, you weren't an embarrassment. You were winning or tied in every single one of those games. And now you parlay that with what you did in the Toronto series. I don't think anybody should be losing their mind about this team. You could write the ship real easily, depending on how you play in Arlington. But regardless, this is a good baseball team. Yeah, I don't think anybody's really losing their mind, though. I, I I've don't... seen a lot of people that are, you know, they keep wanting to nip. Well, this is wrong and that's wrong. And these, this is a big problem. This, I mean, I, I saw some of the. I mean, that happens whenever the Astros were winning 100 games. It can, but at, at the same time, I think it's a prisoner of the moment. People just get so caught up in, like we talked about when it, when it was the Yankees, or the fact that you know they're not more dominant right out of the gates. Which it's a 162 game season, and a lot of teams don't come out, you know, with guns blazing. They're gonna be just fine. But there have been people that are like, you know, starting to doubt this team early on, and I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, I've seen more criticism than like, oh, this team's the windows closed or whatever. Yeah, not window closed, but yeah. Yeah, uh, 713780 ESPN, where you stand with the Astros after uh, seven games. Just uh, a few of the nuggets from yesterday's game. Uh, I, I thought just starting with the pitching, it's great whenever you shut out a team, obviously. Like you're going to take a one-hit shutout every single time that you play. Uh, I was more impressed with the middle relief than I was Christian Javier, particularly. Uh, I didn't think Javier was his finest, but whenever you can get through five innings, not allow a run against a pretty good offense, that's cool. Like, you're not going to have your A game every single time you're on the mound. I thought Javier in his first start had his A game. It didn't factor into the decision in game one. Yesterday, I didn't think he had his A game. He had you know, five walks and over five innings, which is kind of his MO. He doesn't have great command. But I always look at his strikeout to innings pitched number whenever I look at Javier's sharpness. Three strikeouts over five innings for Javier is not where you want that number to be. 
but the zero runs is where exactly where you want the number to be. Yeah, look, we, we already know that he's not going to be a guy that that is, you know, a control specialist. His pitches get up there. He doesn't get deep, deep, deep into games. But we also know that his stuff can be unhittable uh, when he is on his A game in terms of just the ability to throw the pitches he has in his repertoire. And, and I like the fact that he came out and did what he did, uh, made sure that, you know, he handled his business, you know, handled the walks, uh, did what he had to do, uh, and got you a big win, as you mentioned, to get that series win because it would have been devastating to lose a series where you were so dominant in all three games. Super encouraging to me with uh, what the bullpen did because the, the middle relief has not been good uh, for the Houston Astros up until yesterday. You didn't have to use any of your big three, which, I mean, your offense was a big factor of that. You ended up outscoring them 8 to nothing. Uh, but Seth Martinez, scoreless inning. Rafael Montero, scoreless inning. Taylor Scott, Taylor with an E, uh, scoreless inning. Dylan Coleman, who has command issues, scoreless inning. Like, and you're not going to get four shutout innings from your middle relief every single night, but as bad as we've seen them in the first five games of the year, really nice to see that outing yesterday. Okay, these guys can get some big league hitter hitters out every now and then. Yeah, I mean, you know, right from the from the jump when, when the, they uh, brought in Seth Martinez, um, you know, he doesn't have an overpowering fastball, but he did what he had to do, and he got the guys a little bit off balance and got the outs that he needed to get. I think it seems to me that early on, Espada has a lot of confidence in Scott. He likes him. He's going he's gonna to go to him frequently. I think he was the first guy he went to in the bullpen in the opener, um, but he's getting usage, and he looks like he can get guys out. Um, Coleman's a guy that I kept from the time they acquired him. I was like, this is a guy that I hope is a veteran that you can really plug and play in the middle of the bullpen. And even in a mop-up role last night, the control got to be where I was like, Eesh. I mean, th- you should be just, you know, wheeling and dealing right now. And it looked like he was struggling. That, that's always going to be his fight, I-, I think, is his location. And, you know, he's kind of in his late 20s. That's not something that really gets a, a lot better with time. Uh, but his stuff is certainly really, really, really good. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of criticism about Jordan Alvarez batting second. Uh, what's wrong with a spot as lineup? You know, something you can find at Jeremy Brown every single day. Um, a lot of people don't like the Jordan hitting second. I, a lot might be too big of a word. That might be a stretch. There's been a loud minority that they don't like Jordan hitting in the two hole. Uh, I think that yesterday's game alleviates all the concern of Jordan hitting second. Four for five, couple of home runs, was about 10 feet shy of his third home run of the game. Uh, he had been hitting the ball hard, the, the just didn't get the results. Uh, that the, I guess the idea that Jordan hitting second, ruining Jordan Alvarez, we can forever forget that, right? We can. We can no longer talk about Jordan <laughs> struggles in the two hole, right? Well, we, you and I, will probably be forced to deal with it at a certain point if it doesn't continue to go the way people want it to go. But yeah, look, I mean, and you mentioned that last at bat. He's four for four with two bombs, a laser of a double, and then he hits a ball further than the Altuve home run in the in the inning. I mean, he's. He, I heard uh, Espada talking about the fact that he felt like he was close, that it was something with where his hands were, and he was watching a lot of video, uh, and, and that he had told Espada that he felt like he figured it out. Boy, did he figure it out because, you know, that's the kind of Jordan that we're used to seeing, and when he's that dominant, it is tough to beat that ball club offensively. Yeah, I wonder if there's anybody still out there that will argue that, that will argue Jordan Alvarez should not be in the two-hole. I want to hear from you. 713-780-ESPN, HRP listener line, 713-780-3776. I can tell you who they tell you to put there uh Pena yeah it's not a good idea not a good idea but I'm just telling you that's what I could see Astros fans saying you know Pena was so great in the two hole that's where he should be hitting yeah like I I defend Pena probably more than most because I think Pena is a really good defensive shortstop uh, I think that he had he had some signs offensively in year one and I think he improved in some areas in year two and so far so good when it comes to Jeremy Pena like second home run yesterday that, that was really cool to see Jeremy Pena again getting lift on the ball because we know Jeremy Pena is strong like you can look at Jeremy Pena. Whenever you look at Jeremy Pena, is pretty much how people see me. When people look at Jeremy Pena, like that, that is a behemoth of a man. That is a sculpture of a man. That's how people view me. So you know that he has power. You know that he has strength. It's just about lifting the ball with him. He got better at seeing pitches out of the zone. He got better at swinging at better pitches. Reduced the strikeouts. If he can put it together in year three, the best of year one, the best of year two. I mean, I've said it before. I think Pena can be a top ten shortstop in Major League Baseball. Do you want Do you want people to lick your arms? It depends on who. Okay, because Paul brought that up last show that when girls flock to Jeremy Pena, 
they say, can I lick your arms? Never, ever have I heard that as a thing. And even Joe was like, wait, what did you say? Yeah, I didn't know that happened. I, I think you're, you're right, though. I think the big thing that we talked about was, we, you know, a lot of people pointed to there was a power outage with him last season, what was going on. I kept saying, look, he doesn't have to have monster power numbers or big-time power numbers if he can just lay off the breaking pitch on the outside corner uh, and stop chasing as much. The fact that he's kind of put a combo platter together where, like you mentioned, he's lifting the ball for power, and he's also staying off the, the chase as much as he has chased the, the kind of down-and-out breaking pitches, you just hope it continues because whether it's the, t- the little kind of ca- subtle changes he made to his swing or whatever the case may be where he's a little bit more still and quiet before the ball comes in, it's working. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Singleton in the six hole. It didn't take a whole lot of time before that reared its ugly head, huh? He comes up in the first inning, two outs, bases loaded, and it's like, great, you got Jerry. You, you, you got uh, John Singleton up. You got John Singleton ready to bat in a critical spot in the first inning where you're like, hmm. I wouldn't mind Chaz in this spot. I wouldn't mind Pena in this spot. I wouldn't mind Dubon in this spot. If I could pick one guy in the lineup yesterday that I would not want to bat with the bases loaded and two outs, it would be John Singleton. But because Espada uses John Singleton in the sixth spot, here we go. Here you go, John Singleton. Right out of the gate, you get this critical at bat. and well, He had a decent at bat, flew out to left field. But I just don't trust John Singleton to deliver, quite frankly. I don't either. Uh, I think that you and I had talked about the lineup before we even got to that point last night where you saw it kind of rear its ugly head. But, I, I look, you've seen John Singleton is who he is, and he's not going to change. And nothing's going to drastically come all of a sudden kind of make John Singleton this super, you know, powerful and, and uh, explosive first baseman that can play, you know, DH and, and play first base for you. He, I don't think he should be on the roster. And if, if that means he's no longer a member of the organization because you got to cut him, so be it. But I, I like what you had said about finding a guy like a Brandon Belt, but find somebody else because right now he looks like he's overmatched a lot by, by major league pitching. And, and for this team to be as good as they are, if you're going to give guys days off and do some of the things you're doing because of Braves not hitting, I don't want to see John Singleton playing first base. Yeah, it'll probably be Joey Loperfito. Like if I had to guess who Singleton's How, how much longer is the lease for? I would say June. Because like yeah, I mean, he's a backup. That's longer than I'd like to see. He's a backup. Like you can you can carry that guy. You can carry him for a couple of months. But like, is there any scenario where you want to see him in the game? That's the problem. No, I mean, he's a guy none. that he's a guy, he's a guy that hits what at best a buck fifty. You're really loud. Am I really loud? <laughs> well, I, like I will turn says. myself down. <laughs> Whether he's starting at first base or not, you also don't want to see him come up as a pinch hitter in a big situation. No, but here's here's the thing. No, like yes, the answer is I rather see Lo Perfido get major league baseball at bats than John Singleton. But they're looking big picture. They're not looking what gives me the best chance to win games number eight of the season they they Joey Loperfito needs to get at bats he needs to get at bats every single day and right now at the big league level he wouldn't be getting at bats every single day so this more big picture 20,000 mile view uh let's look at the forest not the trees but that's why whenever you get into critical games later in the season that's why it won't be John Singleton and it probably will be Joey Loperfito unless there is a move before then which I don't really think that there will be uh I really like Chris Bassett I'm a huge Chris Bassett fan I've always liked him ever since he told that no good son of a gun Chris Rose that everybody in Major League Baseball is sign stealing it's not just exclusive to the Houston Astros but how about the personality that he had yesterday with Jordan I love Alvarez? that I love he, that exchange cool. coming very off the very field. cool yeah. he gets Jordan Alvarez hits Chris Bassett like a professional hitter hits slow pitch softball like he just crushes Chris Bassett for whatever reason Chris Bassett literally throws the kitchen sink at hitters he's got like 22 different pitches he's tried them all to Jordan Alvarez and Jordan Alvarez crushes every single one seeing Bassett go up to Jordan in the uh, the middle innings of that game you should be like, I got nothing for you. You're, you're killing me. I, I really like Chris Bassett. No, I, I, I actually do the same thing. I think that that's the kind of personality you love to see uh, and camaraderie around, amongst baseball players. Sure, it's also fun to see rivalries and heated exchanges and those things too. But the fact that, you know, he can laugh at himself and basically say there's nothing I can throw you that is going to get you out at this point uh, was a nice, a nice kind of a sidebar to that game last night. It was fun to watch, and, and kudos to him because he seems like a good dude. Uh, and, you know, th- they've seen a lot of Bassett over the last several years. We talked about it yesterday. Uh, Jordan definitely has his number. He's got really good numbers against Bassett. 713-780 ESPN, the HRP listener line. Busy show on a Thursday. Uh, K- Killer B Fight Club Tournament. We have two tickets punched to the Final Four. Two more today. It is a bad take Boulevard Thursday. Who belongs on the list? Who made the list? We'll look ahead to Rockets Warriors coming up a little bit later tonight. Uh, top five pass-catching trios in the NFL. Who are they now after the big move yesterday by the Texans? Corby Craig will be joining us uh, from BetUS 
at 3.30 as well. But Astros, 713-780-3776. Are you still a believer that Jordan shouldn't hit second? 713-780-3776. The seven-game homestand in the books, do you feel any differently about this team? And despite their 2-5 and five record, lots of numbers in baseball. Wins and losses are just one of those many, many different numbers. How about the other numbers telling us that this Astros team is really good and that their record is a lie? 713-780-3776. Uh, I don't think we can be on Twitch today. We're on, uh, we're on Sugarland Space Cowboy Internet today, and they don't let their employees use Twitch. So what does that say about you, Twitch? And also, whenever I try to go to it, it says your connection is not private, and it says that uh, attackers might be trying to steal your information from Twitch. So King of Twitch, this is probably your doing, King of Twitch. Well, whoever stole the gift card is now trying to steal personal yeah, information. I think it's King of yep. Twitch is doing. We're on uh, YouTube, though, at ESPN Houston. That's where we'll be conversating with you that are on the uh, the streaming platforms. Of course, you can always text call the show, 713-780-3776, or tweet us. Uh, Joel's at Pac-Man Joel on Twitter. Brian's at Sacked by BMAC. I'm at Jeremy Branham. We are the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Houston trade, the Texans wiped out the final three years on Diggs' contract, giving him the ability to become a free agent after this season. The Texans also took the $3.5 million guaranteed to Diggs next season, moved it up into this season, giving him a raise and assuring him of $22.5 million in guaranteed money in 24. Uh, but if Dick plays the way that he wants and Houston hopes, he will hit the free agent market next offseason with the ability to make it count. Houston now anticipates getting the best version of Dick. So Dick's on a prove-it deal. Good news on that front. Bad news is he could be a free agent after the end of the year, second rounder for a potential one year of a guy. Uh, we'll discuss that at 345. Uh, 713-780-ESPN, HRP listener line. 3667, doing good for one game does not does, uh, does not solve that two-hole problem. Why would you put your hardest hitter in a non-cleanup position? 
because you get more at bats and because as the game goes on, you're still going to have opportunities like Jordan had last night that you're going to have ducks on the pond and ability to knock guys in. Um, I just, I mean, you have convinced me more and more. I, I don't like him in the leadoff spot like some teams bat. I don't hate it. They're, they're, they're best hitter and biggest power guy. But I don't mind him in the two hole. I think that you're still having to have the table set for you enough where it's not just going to be about his power. He's going to have plenty of opportunities to drive guys in, and I like the, the chance that he gets a, a possibly for an extra at bat. As long as Jordan is batting in one of three spots, I'm cool with it. I'm cool with him in the two spot. I'm cool with him in the cleanup spot. I'm actually cool with him in the leadoff spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, guarantee him the most at bats. The, the two hole's fine. The two hole's good because okay, well you got a chance for your leadoff man to get on base. Cool, you're coming up with your leadoff man on base. Uh, it's also good because, like you said, it gives you the most opportunity for at bats. Uh, I'm not a fan of the three hole. Uh, there's no spot in the lineup that comes up more with two outs, nobody on than the three spot. I think the three spot's the most overrated spot in the batting lineup. Now, all this to say, I don't think it all matters that much. I think it's very, very, very marginal over 162 games. So that's why I wouldn't bat him in the uh, the top. Uh, that's why I don't mind him in the two hole. No, yeah, and, and I hear you. And you know, the more we've talked about it, look, it makes sense. That, you know, the numbers show that if the three hole you're coming up actually at a disadvantage a lot of times because you're coming up a lot with two outs. I mean, this guy is your best hitter basically for we know for power, but he's one of your best top with top two hitters for average. Uh, You want him right there next to Altuve in that mix. And when you start talking about moving him down, then you start possibly having to move Bregman up. And, you know, Yiner started the season really hot. But the last thing you want to do is with Bregman the way he's hitting, move him up or try to shuffle too many too many different spots in the batting order for me. 8863 because everyone is expected to get on base including 789 he gets more at bats. I don't really understand the logic there. Uh the two hole is going to bat more than the four hole. Like whether 789 is getting on base or whether 789 is not getting on base. Second spot will always bat more than the fourth spot. How do I know this? Because two comes before four. That's how. And you're not you're also not only relying on 789 to get on base for the two guy to come up with someone on. It can be the fifth or sixth hitter too. So in this Astros lineup is deep. The really the only time it matters for this conversation of well he's second up in the lineup and he's got nobody on and that's obviously discounting the fact that Altuve could get on but the only time it matters is the first time through the lineup every every time after that he could he's just as likely to come up with people on base from the two hole as he would be anywhere else. Uh, I mean I could nitpick that uh, maybe that's just as likely but I, I think the difference is marginal. It, if you're if you have. I mean, if you have three guys with an on-base percentage of 500 in front of you as opposed to three guys with an on-base percentage of 250 in front of you, what's the likelihood of you sure. coming up to bat with somebody on base? So, uh, you know, the, the guys in front of you do matter, uh, but I, that's why they're batting them second and not first is because they want Altuve to get on base before him. I, I like Jordan in the two spot. I'm not going to waver off of that. I also like Jordan in the four spot. So, uh, to me, it's either way. I'm cool with. Uh, key from L.A., why is Pena batting in the bottom of the order? Because Pena has an awful career on-base percentage. That's why. Yep. And, again, and you, you, you want to keep it. If you look, he's in his in his history too. When he's comfortable, don't mess with him. I mean, you know, we every. That's why I said the conversation will come up. Oh, he was at his best when he was in the two hole. Well, because he got comfortable, and, and then the, you had a lot of guys talking about it. He's comfortable right now. He's it, leave him alone right now, and just see how hot he's going to get, and and how how far he's going to ride this out. I wouldn't get too cute tinkering with too much in this lineup right now. I don't believe that if Abreu's in the lineup again, that he should be as high as he's been, and I would drop him. But I don't want to get, you know, too cute with the, the top part of the lineup. Stephanie on the uh, ESPN Houston YouTube channel says, uh, no need to move Jordan. Move down Breggy. Uh, Breggy had another rough go of it yesterday. Another weak, weak, weak pop-ups. I don't like a swing. I'm telling you. Like, his swing right now is one that's going to lead to a lot of weak pop-ups. He's not seen it well. Uh, he is a notorious slow starter. We get that. Um, but I'm not moving him from the four spot. That's it. That said, I'm still not moving him from the four spot. For now. I mean, you got to see what happens, right? I mean, Yiner continues to, to hit the ball very, very well. Um, you expect, like you, you talked about, he is a, a notorious slow starter. He does find it. Even last year, he had some ups and downs. But for the most part, he settles in, and you hope that's the case. I think there's he's putting a lot of pressure on himself. Obviously, he put on weight. He's, he's betting on himself to get a new contract. Uh, and right now, it seems like it's the perfect storm, uh, as well as it being the start of the season, that he just doesn't look comfortable at the plate. Yeah, he needs to. Uh, I'd like him to get it going. Uh, maybe he needs a little roadie uh, to get it going. Well, get last away from the last at bat, he got the double, right? 
Uh, yeah, he kind of, yeah. Eh, I mean, he kind of sneaked it down the third base yeah. line. It wasn't it, a laser, but it got down in the yeah. corner. I mean, it wasn't really like a. It was like a medium hit. Like I don't know if that's. I just, just, just that. It wasn't a dribbler, but it wasn't a rocket. Right. Like it was kind of you know medium contact. Bricky's just done this so often throughout his career, as you guys have mentioned, with the slow starts. I mean, he he started slow last year, and he ended up being uh, what second on the team in RBI. So I believe he, I think he had ninety eight. Did on you the just year. say RBIs? He no. just said RBIs. Uh, uh, he said, said R- RBIs. I did not. Got to go to the Blankers, tape. what do you think? Uh, it was it was. Borderline I think he said RBIs. A Rod checked the tape. I think he, <laughs> he, go to the he tape. We might have seen the evolution <laughs> no. and the Heard. maturation if, if I had, of the if I education did, it was of Brian. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure I did. I'm pretty sure I, I did. I don't know. There's a bit of worry on your face right I now. Think I just want to say that. There was an S there. Well, because yeah, we haven't checked the tape yet, but I'm pretty sure it said as I will. I will hold final judgment though until A Rod checks the tape. But it's just you know. Bricky's just done this. It's, it feels like we're getting mad about the same thing we've gotten mad about in April for the last four or five years. And Bricky just does this. Yeah. This is the player he is. I mean, you know he's going to turn it on. And by the time we get to the playoff, his numbers will be where they always are. Uh, two and five record. A lot of the other advanced numbers and stuff uh, say that the the Astros have way better. Like they're, they're off their batting average. They're starting pitching ERA. Uh, a lot of the other numbers would show you that this team's better than two and five. Is their two and five record a lie? I think so. I really do. I, I think when we talked about it in the opening segment, we've talked about it previous to this. I think when you look at just the the ebbs and flows of how the Yankee series went, I don't think anybody should have been overly worried except for the fact that the middle of your bullpen didn't do what we knew there was a chance they weren't going to be able to do, especially early on. But overall, uh, you were in a, every game of the Yankee series. You came out and should have swept the Blue Jays. I believe that it is a bit of a, a fool's gold record at this point in time. Uh, I, I saw the ESPN did their power rankings, and they fell from three to eight, but they're still in the top ten. I think most people realize it's a really talented baseball team, and it's really early in the season. Yeah, I mean, their, their ERA and their runs allowed are both top uh, – one's top five, one's top six. They're second in the league in home runs. Their run differential overall for the season is, is, is in the plus on the plus side. I, I don't see this as anything – look, they got unlucky, obviously, with a couple of blown saves and a couple of missed opportunities, especially the Blue Jays in game two. Uh, but, yeah, this team is much better than the 2-5 and five record would indicate. 713-780-ESPN is the Astros record a lie. 713-780-3776. Also, when we come back from BetUS, Corby Craig will break down uh, all of uh, March Madness from this past weekend, and we'll look ahead to the Final Four coming up this weekend as well. And it'll be a depressing conversation for me. Corby Craig with the Killer Bees up next on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Appropriate time to talk about Gentle Ben. Uh, the top of that list is that Gentle Ben is the very, very best. Uh, the vodka, best in the state, the gin, best in the market, or the bourbon, the double platinum winner at the prestigious Ascot Awards. Gentle Ben uses their innovative, revolutionary technology that eliminates impurities for the cleanest, smoothest spirits you will ever taste. Smooth, clean, eliminates the burn. Don't labor through your drink. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Savor it. You can do that with Gentle Ben. You'll love what's not in it, including gluten. There's no gluten in Gentle Ben, but Gentle Ben isn't going to brag about no gluten. You know why? Because all spirits are naturally gluten-free. You can find Gentle Ben at the liquor store. You can find it at the tasting room in Alvin. The Gentle Ben tasting room, great spot to hang out. Ask for it at the bar. Ask for it at the restaurant when you go to dinner. Or if you're going to an Astros game at Minute Maid Park, stop by Gentle Ben's bar. Pick up some Gentle Ben on the way to your seat. Uh, Also at the Toyota Center, stop by Ben's bar on the way to your seat. Pick up some Gentle Ben before you go watch the Rockets or you're watching a concert there. If you just want to order it straight from the website, you can do that too. Head to GentleBen.com. You can learn about their incredible story, their incredible legacy but you can also order the stuff straight from the site that's right order gentle ben at gentleben.com that's gentleben.com gentle ben highest craft soft as sip
You're listening to a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, live from Constellation Field. This is the Killer Bees. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. He's Blank. I'm Branham. Killer Bees broadcasting live from Constellation Field in Sugar Land, ahead of the Space Cowboys matchup tonight. Spencer Arigetti on the bump. arigetti has been brilliant in his first two starts. Imagine we'll see him with the Astros at some point this year. Uh, let's go out to the HRNP guest line. Joining us now, our friend Corby Craig from BetUS.com. Let us know everything that's been going on in college basketball. Corby, what was your uh, what were your main takeaways from last weekend? Sweet 16 Elite Eight matchups. Yeah, it seems like um, the, the talk of the town is Zach Eady, how hard he is to stop, and for good reason. I mean, this guy is an absolute tank. I think all of us combined on this phone call uh, couldn't stop him from scoring if, if we had the fate of the world on hand. So he's been great. Uh, we've kind of seen the cream of the crop rise to the top. This UConn team is dominant as one we've seen. Um, and I'm excited for this, this final weekend of March, wrapping up the best tournament, the best season of all of sports. I mean, let's look at it right from the jump on, on the team that's been the most dominant, and that is UConn. And you, you take a look at what they've been able to do and how they've just been able to put everybody to bed quickly. Are we looking at the fact that if Alabama's got a chance, they're going to have to rely on their three ball? Otherwise, we could be seeing uh, another double-digit victory for uh, the, the Huskies? Yeah, it seems like the market is expecting this to be a double-digit victory. We see 12 now, which I think is kind of crazy. Um, you you hit the point on UConn being dominant, and they have been. But what do they dominate? And it's kind of this defensive pressure in the mid to low post. Uh, Klingon is a great defender, and he's raised his drive stock considerably. But if you watch Alabama, they don't drive the basketball, really. They, they, uh, they're they getting fast break layups or they're shooting three. So I'm not sure that UConn's scheme is going to work. Also, UConn runs a really complex offense, one that's hard to schedule and and trained for in two days basically now you give nato a coach who's great uh, a week heading into the final four i think this is a spot where alabama if they're hitting their shots has a pretty decent chance like we see this line at 12 uconn played northwestern and that line was 11 and a half so i think there's just too much love for this uconn team they are great and everybody i do think they win pretty easily but i, I think 12 is we're cutting it a little close there well, what's fascinating to me, uh, to me as well, being joined uh, by Corby Craig on the HRMP guest line from uh, BetUS.com, what, what's interesting to me when we look at Alabama is that they kind of subscribe to the idea of modern basketball offensively when it's like the, tr- the three true results, three-pointer, in the paint, get to the free throw line. I was looking at their shot chart the other day for what they do offensively. They do not believe in the mid-range jumpers, which is what NBA teams have kind of evolved to. Uh, how much do you think that plays in the college game? Yeah, it's, a, it's an analytic standpoint that makes a lot of sense. Like, why shoot an 18-foot shot when you shoot a two-foot shot if they're worth the same amount of points? And um, NATO's had great success with that thing from an analytic standpoint. I actually come from an analytic background, um, so I love it. I, I think that it plays well. The issue is sometimes they get a little too analytical and they'll shoot shots with players that probably shouldn't shoot those shots. Like we saw for – Quite some time, Grant Nelson shooting corner threes. And, and on paper, it looks like a good shot, but Grant Nelson's not a corner three-point shooter. Um, they've made those changes. That's why they're in the Final Four. But I do think at the end of the day, if you play the analytics game, it's kind of like in football, we're watching this happen as well. It's no fun. No one wants to root for the, the right play. Everybody wants to root for uh, kick the field goal or, or kick the punt. And analytics are saying go for it on fourth and six. It just feels weird. Uh, but I do think inevitably it is the right play from a math standpoint. If we are going to kind of see that spread come into play and see Alabama having a fighting chance to make it a single-digit game, uh, are you expecting them to have to be consistent with the three ball? Are you expecting that, obviously, they're going to have to share the wealth? Uh, I think Sears has really looked good in this tournament. But, uh, I mean, what's your outlook on just other things about that game? Yeah, they're definitely going to have to hit the three ball. More importantly, they're going to have to feed their their better players. The, The issue we saw with Illinois is, they kind of got set in this idea of like Terrence Shannon's being pressed and double teamed sometimes. Let's just stop giving him the ball. Like if y'all want to cover our best guy, we have other ways to beat you, which obviously they didn't. Uh, Dumas tried to play a one man game and we saw a 30 to nothing run in that game, which is one of the craziest things I've seen. Um, <laughs> Alabama just has to get spread the ball, spread and find the players that allow them to play the basketball they want to play. And if you force those guys into doing things that they're not comfortable doing, you're going to lose this game. 
by 20 plus, and that's what UConn's really good at doing. They like forcing somebody like Domas to try to post up a defender when in no actuality he wants to be a point guard. So, in an interesting spot, UConn um, by far is the best team that I've seen in the nation. But I think there's yeah. two really interesting matches here in, in UConn, Bama, and Purdue, NC State. It's it's crazy the respect that UConn's getting from the odds makers too. Like like UConn's playing an Alabama team who's a four seed, really good talent. They're an eleven and a half point favorite. Then you have the other side where Purdue, another one seed, uh, was kind of listed in the same conversation. UConn, Purdue, Houston, top three teams uh, throughout the entire regular season. They're playing an eleven seed. Sure, NC State's incredibly hot. Purdue's favored by two points less than UConn's favored uh, against uh, I think a better team. Yeah, it feels crazy. Um, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, I bet Bama plus 12. I, this is just a UConn, like, see the stars. Everyone's starting to buy high in this team. Um, like I said, we saw Northwestern literally the same line three weeks ago. And is Northwestern better than Alabama, or are they even close to Alabama? They shouldn't be. Um, but on the other side, I think the NC State game is an interesting one. It is one where you're going to get a matchup that I think nine points, honestly, might not be enough, which is crazy to say with the backing that NC State has had to get to this point. I, I look at this, and I'm curious, just from your perspective, we know what Edie can do, but Purdue and, and the, you know everybody else is going to have to be uh, acutely aware of this, this NC State team that's gotten red hot, and with, with Horn and, and, of course, Burns, who's everybody's favorite uh, player in this tournament, um, they're going to have their hands full on the other end. It's going to be interesting to see what wins out because obviously Edie has the size and the reach, but boy, Burns has been able to have his way and back down on just about anybody that's tried to get in his way. Yeah, DJ Burns, I talked about this on a show earlier today, but DJ Burns has quickly become the nation's favorite child of basketball. And it's hilarious to see. He's been on podcasts. He's been making his celebrity tour. And I think it's great. I think it's great for basketball to have a guy that's as lovable. Like you see him truly enjoying basketball on the court. But I will say, and I, I kind of brought up that I think they have a really good matchup here. Um, I don't think D.J. Burns is going to guard Zach Eady. And I, I think that's where everyone continues to get like, kind of worried about this game. Is six foot seven D.J. Burns going to be able to guard seven foot three Zach Eady? In the cases, every single time, no. Uh, but they have a guy in Diara who's 6'10". They have Middlebrook who's 6'10". Uh, and then D.J. Burns in the help side, backside, which – He's a high IQ basketball player. I think that he'll make the right reads. I think they have enough bodies to throw him. Like, we go look at Tennessee game. Tennessee had to play a true freshman who had basically never played all season because they got in foul trouble and they didn't have big men. That's not the case of NC State. They have an abundance of big men on the bench, um, and they can throw every body that they want at Zach Eady. They also have – you brought his name up to attention, but DJ Horn is one of the scrappier guards you'll see in the nation. And the big issue that I have with guarding Purdue is everyone has tried to guard Zach Eady which is great. Like, obviously you're going to have to, but you can't let somebody just throw the ball to him open. Like, like they've given Braden Smith the ability just to toss the ball like me and you were throwing catch. And uh, of course you're going to not be able to stop Zach Eady once that happens. I think DJ Horn is a really good matchup to those guards, make that pass a lot harder. He's just so feisty at all times. Um, and, and if you make that pass harder and you make somebody else in Purdue beat you, I'm not sure that they can Corby, Corby Craig, Bet US. Tell us what we want to hear, Corby. If Jamal Shedd plays in the final 26 and a half minutes against Duke, in which they lost by three, uh, does Houston is Houston one of these final four teams? We talked about this um, opening weekend, but I had Houston futures at 20 to one. I think Houston was the team who could beat Purdue. They, I, I talked about that you have to be able to force guards to make tough passes, and we've seen Houston do that all year. I think Houston's in the Final Four. They beat Purdue in a game where they have they don't have the size, but they have the physicality to push Zach Eady around. And then you get a, an amazing matchup in UConn versus Houston, a style that wants to play slow, rugged, um, and a UConn team who, again, I think Klingon, though he looks great, is kind of soft, and um, Houston loves to pick on those soft guys. So an unfortunate injury i i absolutely hate it's the worst thing you can see in sports especially when it's the heart of your team somebody like shed uh it made me upset to see and especially against the team that they were playing against you know no listen if you're going to lose your, your school going down the one school you don't want to see your school lose to is duke ever in history uh so it made it just a little bit worse Thanks, Corby. I appreciate you putting the uh, the salt in the wound there a little. I'm still very sports sad about this, but we appreciate you joining us. Uh, enjoy the Final Four, Corby. Yes, I appreciate it.
It's Corby Craig at Bet US. Uh, great guest. Uh, great having him throughout the NCAA tournament. Even if he, even if he kicked me while I was down there a little bit. But uh, all, all in. Uh, he's right. He's right about that. All right. Let's get to the Stephon Diggs news. The, the Texans have torn up his contract. Basically, they've all made it a one-year prove-it deal. They've thrown the guarantees into the first year. Stephon Diggs can be a free agent. He will be a free agent after this season. Do we like it? Do we hate it? You tell us. 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5, ESPN Live from Constellation Field for a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, this is the Killer Bees. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. He's Blank. I am Branham. We are the Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. We are indeed broadcasting live from Constellation Field in Sugar Land. Great place to watch some baseball. Come out tonight. Spencer Arigetti's on the mound. And then a, a certain future Hall of Famer will be making a rehab assignment on Sunday. That'll be a tough ticket to get. A little noon baseball with JV on the mound? Maybe, they're saying. Who's saying well, maybe? The people around here are saying that they are uh, cautiously optimistic, but they think that they're waiting until it's final. That, yeah, that so he they're, they're, not, they're not giving out the word because they don't want to be proven well, wrong. Well, they want to. He, he said he does have to throw the bullpen today and everything like that. But, yeah, all, all arrows are obviously pointing to him 2 o'clock on Sunday. Yeah. Here. Unless he has some sort of major setback in a very normal mid-start throw day, he'll be pitching here Sunday. 
Against well, and they said too when you Las and I, Vegas, I guess. when you and I were talking about it, if he's going to make two rehab starts, it's not going to be for Sugarland because the second game where it would line up, they'd be in Albuquerque. JV ain't going to Albuquerque. He's not going to Albuquerque. <laughs> no, he's not going to be Breaking Bad in Albuquerque. Yeah, I don't think so. With Walter White, he's not going to do that. Uh, Stephon Diggs has had his contract with the Texans restructured. We figured there'd be some sort of restructure after the Texans acquired him. They made the deal official today, and now it's been reported that the new contract is. A one-year deal. Uh, added incentive for the Stephon Diggs trade, according to Adam Schefter, is that the Texans have wiped out the final three years on Diggs' contract. So remember last, yesterday we were talking about he's got this year and then three more. Well, they've wiped out the final three, which gives him the ability to become a free agent after this season. Texans also took $3.5 million guaranteed to Diggs next season, moved it up to this year. He'll make $22.5 million this year, and he will be a free agent after this season, your thoughts on this, Blankers? Initially, to me, is it's it's a it's a bit risky. It, it's it's the risk reward of yeah, you don't have the risk now if he becomes prob- a problem child off the field, or you hear all these different things from you know what we've seen to his brother and Twitter and all these other things. I, I mean, I understand that standpoint that you're not on the hook for that, but if he balls out and he he plays like he's fully capable of still playing. Uh, and then he walks for us, and you gave up a second-round pick to get him, that's a bit concerning because that pick from Minnesota is going to be fairly high in the second round, and and you would think that if you're making a move like that, you were solidifying him for at least a couple of years here. The uh, the way that I understand it, too, is that he's not on the board for any sort of compensation because of the way they did the deal. So originally I was thinking, well, you get compensation if he leaves, maybe a third or fourth round pick. I even put that out there on Twitter and got fact-checked by, uh, by certain people. So I don't think the Texans can actually get compensation because of the restructure, the way that it's worded or whatever. Uh, they couldn't get a compensation pick if Diggs were to leave them in free agency. Uh, I like the aspect of this that it's digs on a prove it year. Uh, I really like the aspect of that uh, because you know this this doesn't this doesn't give digs the security of well I got a bunch of money left on my deal. He really didn't to begin with either. But it's I need to go out. I have to prove my worth to the NFL where I've had my image damaged. Uh, if whether it's fair or not, I think a lot of reasons it's probably not fair. Uh, Diggs was really good in Buffalo up until they they got the new OC, like Brian pointed out yesterday. They were taking him off the field on third downs when he's a really good third down receiver. So he has to repair his image or who he is as a player in the NFL. And now that he's on a prove it deal, I, I think it could bring out the most of Stephon Dix. The negative is that you more than likely used a second-round pick for one year of Stephon Diggs. If he plays really, really well, well, now you got a big decision to make because who are you paying? Are you paying Stephon Diggs in the final year? Are you paying Nico Collins who will be in this final year? So there's that aspect of it as well. In my mind, after we see the restructure of the deal, the Houston Texans are trying to strike while they have a quarterback on a rookie deal. They don't want any of Diggs' money to carry over until when they have to re-sign Nico Collins. I think Stephon Diggs is a rental. I think Stephon Diggs is here for one year, and that's it. Because if he plays really, really good, well, you're deciding between Diggs at 31 years old or Nico Collins, your own guy. I think right now we would go Nico. Now you do have 11 months to kind of change your mind. If he plays poorly, you're not bringing him back. So I don't see a scenario in which Stephon Diggs is with the Houston Texans past 2024. The one thing then then with what you just said, too, is you it begs you to ask the question that were there other teams involved in Diggs and could you have given up less to get him if he was indeed going to end up turning out to be a rental because it seems like, look, all, all looks good for this year and they're in complete go-for-it mode, and that's fantastic. But if he is a rental and he walks at the end of the season and he gave up a second-round pick for him, I think that seems a bit high unless there was competition. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people thought when they saw this trade that they didn't give up very much. Uh, you got two additional picks. You trade a future second rounder. People were throwing around the word fleeced uh, yesterday. The Buffalo was fleeced. So I don't, I don't think you can make this trade without a second-round pick. I don't think Stephon Diggs is a Houston Texan unless you were willing to give up a second. It, it, to me, to me, I just think it, it seems like it's a little high. I might have at least tried to flip flop and, and give up the Texans pick or do something a little bit more because I think the Minnesota pick is going to be close to the end of the first round. I don't think Minnesota is going to be very good, um, but we obviously don't know if they were planning on this from the time that they started negotiating with Buffalo or not. I was just curious if there were, if we thought that there were other teams involved to where you'd say, okay, well now we've got to make sure we get our guy, so we might have to make this offer with, with uh, fully understanding that they were going to do this deal and restructure. Fuentes, Fuentes asked, how did this benefit the Texans in any way? Uh, to me, the only way it benefits the Texans, which could be like impactful, is you get digs on a prove it deal. You're, and you're off the hook if 
It, well, yeah, I mean that's worst case. Like worst case, he's a problem, and you know he's yelling at C.J. Stroud on the on the sideline, and you don't want to be committed to any sort of money for him past one's one that's year. What I'm talking about, yeah. Best case scenario is you're trying to get the absolute most out of a top ten wide receiver talent in the only year that he'll be a Texan. It's kind of what I wanted Joe Mixon to do. Yeah. I wanted to prove it and see that he's still got plenty left in the tank yeah. without giving him I mean, a, a, a year extension. But, but even that one's only two-year guaranteed. So, yeah. like, only the guaranteed money's in the first two years. So, they're kind of similar, except Mixon gets the one more year mm-hmm. guaranteed, but at a much, much affordable price. Yeah, and at the same time, like, to your point, look, he is going to be in full prove-it mode. He's going to be, you know, betting on himself and, and playing for a new deal, whether it be here or elsewhere. Um, and pr- prove that he can still be a premier receiver in this league. That's fantastic for a guy like CJ that now knows that he literally has depth and talent across the board at the wide receiver position, and a guy like Mixon behind him, Schultz at the at the tight end, uh, and then they can worry about uh, left guard. But other than that, it seems like that offense is is pretty lock, stock, and barrel, ready to go and be pretty impressive. Honestly, I think this the, this restructure of the deal makes me like the deal less. Not that I I hate the deal by the I don't I don't want people to get that impression for what I'm saying, but because the bills were eating the dead cap money, every year after 2024 was basically a fake year anyway. You could have still basically gotten out with n- no dead money against you and still uh, had the flexibility to then go uh, offer Nico Collins a massive contract and let Diggs walk if you wanted to do that. But now this limits, your, to me, your options if Diggs does play really well and you did want to bring him back. Maybe at age 32 hitting the open market, his value isn't great and you could still accomplish that. But I don't know. I just don't, I don't love the idea of taking one-year shots with a team, even though I think they're right there on the verge. It's still a, you know, a fairly young team with a, team, with a quarterback in his second year. I don't love the idea of a one-year shot with a second-year quarterback for a second-round pick. Is there any way he's here past 2024? I just don't see it. I don't see it now. I mean, unless you're going to tell me at 32, there's no value for him on the open market as a wide receiver. And he signs a sweetheart deal. Right. That's, he loves that's it. Houston. That's it. And he knows they got a chance to win a Super Bowl. Well, I mean, not not that that's, that's impossible. I think it's in play. It's not impossible. Yeah, it's just, I think it lowers your chances. I I agree. I think because he'll be 31. I mean, he's, he's getting paid this year. It, it, yeah, I just I, I do think it's a long shot, but maybe not unrealistic. You're trading, you're trading the risk of him being a headache yeah. for the risk of – the one year shot on a second round pick. I, I do like that. The you know the first point though, like you, you don't. Now he wasn't. It, what's interesting though is the restructure because he was only getting like two and a half million dollars guaranteed next year. Yeah. Like it wasn't this huge number that you needed They're, to get out of. Doing this really doesn't change the Texans' flexibility for next year. But yeah. it, it, to me, it does limit your options as to whether or not you wanted to bring Diggs back. Yeah. yeah are they doing him a solid and just saying, I think "Hey, that's right, what it is. right from the jump, we are with right. you. We're going to do this so that if you have a you know a, a massive year that you can cash in, whether it be here or elsewhere, it's a player for the move." And why do that? Kind of points that I, why after kind of points that. Know, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm yeah. saying why would the team do that? Like, I, if I'm if I'm running the team, I'm doing team-friendly moves, not player-friendly moves. No, and I hear what you're saying, but I think that from, because of the fact that we don't know everything that happened behind the scenes and whatever, if you get off on the right foot with a guy that has a tendency to possibly be volatile from time to time and you go, hey, we love you being here. We want to do this and make this a win-win for both sides. We're going to do this right off the jump if you're open to it, and then we'll, we'll re, you know, re reconvene at the end of the season and I mean if you're digs I'm sure you're you're like hey that's that's cool because if I do feel like I still have plenty left in the tank I'm going to cash in one way or another and I'm still getting that money that I was going to get next year the um that's like I, I also if, if Diggs does have a future with the Texans beyond just this year I, I never want to go more than one year anyways like it's I risky. want it to be a year by year with Stefan Diggs anyways I, I don't want him to have a three-year guarantee for two reasons. One is age, and then two, the baggage that he's had. You know, But his, 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 his previous contract before they tore it up kind of was that because there was no guaranteed money or what would you say? It was yeah, it was two, like two and a half, I think. Right, so basically zero. Yeah. His, his current deal that had this year plus You're three right. more after that was basically already year by year because the bills were eating all that dead money. True, yeah. I was talking about it more from like a separate point. Sure. Like now that you have done this restructure going forward, I would never give Diggs more than no. a one-year contract. You're right. I, this is more – this is super player-friendly. It is not – in my mind, Ooh. team friendly. Like it kind of does put you behind the eight ball. If he has a really good year, well, now you're how much is he demanding? You have the decision to make between Nico and Diggs. I think they pick Nico nine times out of ten because of his age. Uh, if he plays really poorly, well, you just gave him what was it, twenty five and a half million dollars guaranteed and a second for round really pick for and one a, year, and a second round yeah. pick. So it it it's 
it's not as team friendly as you would like it to be. Uh, it's a little bit head scratching. It's a bit expensive to just be a do them do them a solid and, and and have one you know have him for one year in go for it mode. Uh, because you're right, I agree with you. I mean, I think that he's obviously a guy that's that's chasing the bag at all times, and he's going to want to get paid. Uh, probably in the upper echelon of receivers, looking at Hill, looking at other guys in this league, going, hey, if I have another great year, it doesn't matter how old I am. I want this, and I want it for this many years. I don't think Nick Casario is going to sign up for that, especially with Nico sitting there trying to get his deal done and you wanting him to stay. D.O. says uh, the deal benefits Texans and Diggs. We broke down how it benefits Diggs. I don't know how much it benefits the Texans. He, D.O. says we don't have to risk uh, him being a piece of bad word and throwing fits. Uh, Diggs gets the big deal if he balls out. Now – there wasn't much risk involved next year. Like, it was a bit of an insurance. It's $2.5 million guaranteed if he plays really well. Well, cool, you bring him back on that deal, and now you get two years out of a second-round pick as opposed to what is more than likely going to be uh, one year for a second-round pick. ED on YouTube, this isn't baseball. I don't like giving up a second-rounder for a rental. Uh, it does very much feel like you mm -hmm. gave up a second-rounder for a rental. Uh, 4218, is there any chance they restructure his contract to flip him for a first this year and he never plays a game? Nil, no nil, none, zilch. I always say there's, there's always a 10% chance of anything because nope. Dan Harrington taught me that in his book. No, there's no way you're getting a first-rounder for Stephon Diggs. Uh, and no one's trading for a guy on a one-year contract and using a first round for that. Uh, 2284, this tells me the Texans still draft the receiver just in case. They don't need to because uh, they have seven guys that are pro-level guys right now. Two of them are young and developmental players, I think, in Mechie and Hutchinson. Now you can. Like, if it's best player available, you can. I think it opens up the possibility can. more. Yeah. Like, yesterday when we were talking about this, I was pretty much dead set against any wide receiver in the second round. I think this opens up the idea of it if you know Diggs is gone next year. Yeah, I think that this is probably what y'all said. Like, this is let's curry favor. Let's have a really good relationship. Let's hope Diggs has a really good year. And then Diggs loves playing in Houston so much, and you have an organization that was willing to take care of him. He gives you a team-friendly deal in year two. Uh, that's the best-case scenario, I think, after the restructure. But it very much feels like a second-rounder for a rental. Uh, did the Texans make all these concessions to Diggs in order to sign him to a long-term deal? I don't believe so. I don't think you're signing a 31-year-old to a long-term deal. In fact, it, it actually, to me, screams the opposite because you mm -hmm. put all the guarantees in year one because I think they're scared of having any more commitment after the one I, year. I think this screams to me that there is a little bit smoke and fire to what happened in Buffalo, and they're worried about a guy. One, even if there wasn't anything off the field, this would be a concern because of his age. But two, because of the fact that what we saw on video and then what we've heard uh, leads you to believe that there were some issues with him and the organization. It was time for them to move on, and he wanted to go. Uh, this maybe leads more sm smoke and fire to that than anything else, and the Texans don't want to be caught in a situation that they are on the hook for multiple years for a guy that could – not, I don't want to say completely blow the whole thing up, but he could be a pretty big monkey wrench when he wants to be. Yeah, I think that they're. I think this is for the relationship. I think this is to have a good relationship with Stephon Diggs, which could lead to another conversation. Like, or the moves of trying to make sure you have a good relationship with a player, a wise one. Like, you know, I if you're if the finances you're, are like that, yeah. It also probably shows a little bit too where they're they're at least they're not, I don't think they're worried that Diggs is gonna come up here and change up the culture and mess up the culture because they wouldn't have traded for him if they were worried about that. But it does have that built in insurance where it if seems he like does, it's on their mind a little if bit. If he at does, least. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like insurance a bit. But are we to the point that, that uh, with all that being said, that you're willing to roll the dice and risk your second round pick on a rental? Especially since it's like we say or second not even yours, Minnesota second right, round pick. Right. And that's the point. Like we say second round pick, but obviously a second round pick could be, you know, pick number sixty. But this likely could be pick thirty five mm -hmm. to forty. This mm -hmm. this is damn near a, a first round pick. So look, whenever they have the Diggs press conference, and I know he's in here in Houston, I saw the photos of him in the locker room. Nick Casario and whoever speaks are going to tell you they have no concerns about Diggs off the field sure. or, or, or about the culture. But to me, this move uh, tells tells otherwise. Like, I, I, I grade teams more on their actions than what they tell us in press conference. Same. And to me, this action tells me whether it be age or the – you know, the drama. Volatility. That, right. The drama that Diggs has caused, they're concerned about it. Yeah, no doubt. I wonder how much the agent was involved here, too. Like, hey, we're going to need a new deal. Uh, I think that could oh, I think that could be a possibility, uh, too. I think that definitely would. Any agent that's doing his job is throwing that on the table. Hey, we still think he's one of the premier receivers. You're seeing what the premier receivers are pulling in these days. Yeah. 
we'd like to be in that ball ballpark. And he held out last year, so like it could it could also be a power play from Diggs. It, uh, let's throw that out there too. Uh, Four oh nine, Josh. I think Houston should have gotten rid of the final two years of the Dig contract. There was no dead money after the season, but having control for a second season would have been nice. Uh, Diggs contract has been restructured. Final three years have been wiped out. Um, Second round pick for a one-year rental, too much to pay. Yeah, he balls out in contract year. You can't re-sign him, whereas if you would have left contract as is, you would have him on the cheap. I think the Texans feel that by giving him all the money in year one, they feel they can get more out of Dix. I think that's where they're at. If I if I had to put my feet in the uh, shoes of Nick Casario. Especially because of the fact that if he if the if CJ's spreading the ball around and everybody's getting theirs and he knows, hey, I came here thinking that I'm going to be the one that maybe he could start to get a little bit emotional. And you don't want that early on with a team that is going for it with so much talent on the offensive side of the ball. 6-4-4-4, Texans should build through the draft for lasting success just like the Astros. That, look, that's the other part of this conversation. Like, you didn't trade a pick this year, but you could have drafted a receiver this year. You could have drafted one at 42. You could draft one with your second, second-round pick. So, like, the price is high for one year of a player. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. That that was my biggest takeaway hearing that. You know, and we, you know, we joked, hey, let's hope that they don't do anything, you know, restructuring or otherwise or adding on, what, like, the mixing deal with Diggs. I wasn't expecting this because if that this is the case, then that's the first thing I said. That second-round pick, as it really, because it's Minnesota's too. But even still, I just think that's too much of a price to pay for what looks like, regardless one way or another, is going to be a rental because you're going to have to open up the checkbook big if he plays well. I think Joel hits on an interesting point. He points out the idea of like what we've seen from Diggs in the past, being unhappy with the target share he got. Certainly, second half of last season when Buffalo fired their OC and made the change to a more of a run-heavy offense, he was complaining a lot. Now, I think by putting Diggs in a in a contract year where he needs to prove it with numbers. I think that actually could actually make it even worse because at least w- before, even though he the guaranteed money is basically the same, he had a he had a four year deal. Now he's in a situation where he has to prove it in numbers. <laughs> it is coming into a situation with Nico Collins, right. Tank Dell, and Dalton Schultz, where there's no guarantee with the way they spread the ball around that Diggs is going to get the type of numbers that's going to get him the contract he wants. Yeah, I don't think I like this. I don't think I like this. It's, I it's, think he's on to something because, you, you know, you, you better hope. Winning. No, I think, I think it makes it worse. You better hope winning cure all, cures all ills because there's a chance he could get sick. Yeah, I don't, I don't like this restructure. Uh, I feel better the, with, the, with the previous deal. Now, I think Diggs' agent came into play here. I, I really do. I think it was. Do we know who his agent is? Uh, we can find it. But, like, why would you do this if you're Nick Casario? Like, there's, I don't think that there's any rational reason to do this. You might say, well, they don't want the guaranteed money in year two. It's only $2.5 million. It, I, wasn't, it wasn't very much. It was a small risk it was a small risk to play for him, i think so. you hit on it the only reason well we've all talked about it but i think the only reason to do this if you're trying to curry favor with digs and hopeful in hopes that you get a team-friendly deal the next time around yeah well and, 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 and that feels like a low that feels like a low percentage play it's also knowing and liking the fact that you've got a chance to win win right now you got a quarterback that you, you is going to make any but we saw it he makes everybody look better so you got a quarterback that can help him immensely uh, and, and, you know, he obviously had issues with uh, with Allen. So maybe, you know, he felt like, hey, this is a great situation for me. I want this guy throwing to me. But I don't think he's in the market to give anybody any deals. Yeah, one of the uh, YouTubers asked, do the Texans get a comp pick? We mentioned it a little bit in the uh, beginning of the segment. It's it, The Internet's arguing on it. Uh, it does not look like they do based on some reaction I'm getting to tweeting that. So I don't think that they get a contra- they get a compensation pick for this. Uh, just because of the way that it is worded in the deal. Um, some guy on Twitter says, Houston cannot receive a comp pick if Diggs walks in free agency since they altered the original agreement. So uh, there must be something in the NFL bylaws, I wasn't aware of that, that if you have the original deal, you can get a comp pick, but if you alter the original agreement, you can no longer get a comp pick. I wonder if that changes with restructures. Yeah, I'd have to look up the rules. I'm not sure how yeah, that – I don't know. Not, I don't know how that works. Uh, yeah, I'm not, that'd be interesting. Six zero nine one. We won last year's draft. We won this year's free agency. But did they win the trade? Seven one three seven eight zero. Give ESPN. up too much so you can't win the draft next year. Um. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Two tickets punched to the final four in the Killer Bees Fight Club bracket yesterday. Who advanced and who are the matchups today? It's the Killer Bee Fight Club tournament. We return on ESPN ninety seven five and ESPN ninety two five.
We are getting down to some tough matchups in the Killer Bees Fight Club bracket. Yesterday, two punched their ticket on their way to the Final Four. We'll have two Final Four matchups and then the championship match coming up on Championship Monday. The first of the two matches yesterday, in fact, the second one, actually. I'm going to go with that one because that one was a squash match. The final in the Ralph Cooper region, Booker T, Paul Gallant. You want to guess the results here? Booker T in a landslide. You want to guess it? 92%. And not quite. Brian? I've already seen it. So I oh, don't okay. Want yeah, yeah. 78% Booker T, 22% Paul Gallant. Paul Gallant was begging for chairs yesterday. <laughs> he was begging for weapons against Booker T. Uh, Booker T on to the final four, the first of four tickets punched. Who's had the biggest runaway victory so far? Seth uh, Payne. Was it Seth? It. Seth Payne. Yeah. 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 the show. Yeah, it was Seth. Yeah. Yeah. He was in the yeah. 80s. He was in the yeah. 80s. The second matchup of the day came between Adam Clanton and Clint Sterner. Catsfan.com, which is, a, uh, I guess, a fan group of – Bearcat Nation. In fact, the bio. I thought it was Paul Gallant's secondary (laughs) Twitter site. The uh, (laughs) it might be. He is a cat daddy. He's a big cat fan. At catfans.com is a uh, it's a Bearcat sports thing. Like, hey, look at us. We we talk about Sam Houston sports. Uh, He quote tweeted the matchup yesterday, saying, "Calling on a hashtag Bearcat Nation to support hashtag Sam Fam member at Adam Clanton in this poll." Hashtag eat them up cats. So Clayton got the support I told you that was gonna happen. of the Sam Houston sports fan group, I guess. But it wasn't enough. Okay. It wasn't enough to get the win over the Baytown Batty. The Baytown Batty didn't just defeat Adam Clanton, but he also defeated CatFans.com. The Baytown Batty, Clint Sterner, on to the Final Four as he beats Adam Clanton by the thinnest of margins. So Hog Nation, greater sign, Bearcat Nation. <laughs> yes, it matters more. Straight, the power it of that Arkansas more. milk, brother. Yeah. It means more in the SEC. So Clint Sterner, the narrowest of margins, avoids a feisty Bearcat uh, in beating Adam Clanton by 1.5%. We have a, we have the first semifinal between Clint Sterner and Booker T, a matchup that's coming up tomorrow. That one should be good. Two matchups today, though. I think that these are heavyweight fights, too. These are really good. First one, the final of the Rich Lord region. Sean Salisbury, QB1, fighting Lance Zerline, our very own Lance Z, going toe-to-toe. So you got a, you got a, I guess, a, uh, a king of the trenches versus a quarterback mm. going I toe-to-toe if Lance, here. Uh, it's probably going too far back, but I wonder if Lance had as a draft profile I Sean Salisbury. It. I don't think so. Yeah. Never <laughs> underestimate what Lance can find when I he's evaluating talent. Uh, all right, so uh, this, was, this is obviously – Tough to uh, pick a, to who's going to argue each one because obviously Lance, uh, both know Lance very well. I'm going to go. I'm going to give Lance to Joel and have uh, Jeremy argue okay. uh, since he ordered a, for a quarterback yesterday and that quarterback won. I'm going to give another another quarterback today. So Jeremy will argue argue for Sean Salisbury. Joel, you will argue for Lance Zerline. Let's just start right from the, where we left off, and that is Lance is an unbelievable uh, uh, talent evaluator with the ability to dig up what he needs to find. He That's found eight bode well to fight. He found eight millimeter film on Salisbury. He knows okay. where his weaknesses are. He knows where to attack. He knows from He's got all film the way from search. SC through. Uh, the Vikings and everywhere else, he knows how to attack Sean Salisbury. He is going to be cagey. He is going to stick to the scouting report. He's going to make sure that he makes Salisbury move more than he has to. And he's going to do what he needs to do to try and use his ground and pound when he has to by tripping and falling, faking an injury, (laughs) and then when he's down on the mat claiming that he slipped on a wet surface, he is going to cheap shot Sean Salisbury to do what he needs to do to come out on top. That's dirty, a very cowardly rope dope Dirty but, tactics yeah. from Lance Hey, Irvine. it's anything goes. But anything if Salisbury goes. does his prep and knows Lance has a propensity to hurt himself, Lance goes down, are you okay? Boom, pow, there you go. Thank you for Man, making my first soft. point for Sean that'd Salisbury. Be, that'd be soft if Salisbury uh, lit up and asked him if he was okay in the middle of a fight. No, Sean, Sean's a fighter. Sean's a competitor. He's not going to, like, help Lance up after he may plays possum and fakes an injury. Help him out. Just check if he's all right. Lance might be able to pull up the, you know, eight track or whatever you said it was. Eight millimeter, it's a, it's eight a, millimeter film. For it's real. A, it's a phrase that outdates me. Uh, 
Sean Salisbury is a professional athlete that played in the NFL. Lance Zerline sprains his ankle playing disc golf. Lance Zerline might be able to break down the film, but it's one thing to have an excellent game plan. It's another thing to execute that game plan. And do we think that Lance, whose best sport is, again, disc golf, has the ability to execute the game plan against a former athlete that is faster, that is quicker, that is bigger than one Lancer line. Uh-uh. Sean Salisbury on his way to the Final Four. Uh, Jeremy, you mentioned game plan there multiple times. As Mike yes. Tyson once said, everyone has a game plan until you get punched in the mouth. Yep. And I don't even know if Lance will be there for the punch in the mouth because he's going to trip on the way in and yep. he already be down on the ground. So I will give the fight to the former professional athlete. Lance Z can't stay on his feet. Sean Salisbury wins 10-8. Now, the next fight, it would be interesting if Lance won because the final of the Kenny Han region features his oh, co-host, John Granado. Oh. Oh. So it would be entertaining. I think for ratings I, I purposes, think I'm rooting for that. it would be nice to yeah. have Lance versus Granado. But the second – and Granado's got it uh, – he's got a tough matchup here, though. Ugh. John Granado – going up against another former NFL player, Seth Payne, one half of PP on Highway to Hell. That, man, I, it's, it'll be interesting to hear the argument from Granado. I, I, Joel, I think you've worked with Granado longer, so I will give you Granado, uh, and Jeremy will argue for, on the behalf of Seth Payne. Again, i got a professional athlete. i got a professional athlete who looks better in retirement than he, than he did during his playing days. It's because he spends time doing a bunch of cardio, and when you're doing a bunch of cardio, you got the endurance. So he's, he can last the distance one half of PP on Highway to Hell. And then secondly... He's a former athlete. He's faster. He's bigger. He's quicker. I think he's got an Ivy League education. Did yeah, he go to an he Ivy did. League? He did. Yeah, Ivy League that. education. So he's got Cornell. it all upstairs. He's the total package one half of PP. Uh, total package is Lex Luger. He's, Seth Payne looks better than Lex Luger these days. <laughs> well, uh, he's also a solo artist. And the thing that you're looking for here is strength in numbers. And when you're talking solo about strength artist. in numbers, yeah, it's Seth against the world because that's what Granado's bringing to the table. He's bringing all the Italian nation and all the Italian <laughs> stallions out of the wood. <laughs> to come swinging and poking and ripping and doing whatever they got to do to assist in what needs to be done. It doesn't matter how they get it done. It's that they get it done. And Granado and his paisans are going to come to fight. They're going to fight dirty. They're going to fight often. They are going to have things rigged or at least planned out so that the entire fight from start to finish has sidebars that can be brought into play at any time. And Gr Granado, forget about it, in a landslide. If, if Granado, uh, if, we're, if we're leaning into the Italian stereotypes, if Granado is able to get in his uh, fellow Paisans into the fight, that might bring Granado back into the fight. But don't one point Jeremy didn't make is Seth Payne is from the mean streets of Buffalo. It's, it's a man ah. who grew up in a, in a, in a you know, I didn't the, know that. In the yeah. hard why are you of, arguing <laughs> instead of judging, Brian? I'm making the point why I'm, I'm going to side with Seth Payne. I mentioned the anthem is being performed by a violinist and that case can carry other uh, things. Gun? Yeah, it yeah. Can carry I didn't say gun. that I, you did. I, I've seen that movie. I've seen that movie. I, I look. I got. I, I. I'd like to see Granado versus Lance, but I got a side for Seth Payne by knockout. Seth Payne, to me, uh, is the eventual winner of this fight. We are headed towards Seth Payne versus Booker that's T. A, that's a slobber knocker. That's that. That is a fight I, I would know. pay to see. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Baytown Batty. Baytown Booker Batty. Yeah, is a, yeah. He's a live underdog for sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I will pick Seth Payne in the knockout here over the Godfather. Yeah, and All by right. the way, speaking of the movies and. Brandon taking another shot at me. Eight millimeter was a Nick Cage movie, and it was pretty good. You're a fan of Nicolas Cage. Nick, Nick Nicholas Cage, he's the had actor, a, has had some pretty. He's had good a films. bit of a comeback. He's had some good films. He's had a bit of a comeback. Uh, my co-hosts like Jason Statham and Nick Cage is their favorite <laughs> actors. Sheesh. I didn't say he's my favorite actor. He has talent Jason as an actor. Jason Statham is great. Nicholas you Cage. have said you love Jason Statham. <laughs> Does Nicholas Cage have talent as an actor? He's got a bit of a yeah. comeback. Seven one three seven eight zero. I know you ESPN. didn't watch the Oscars, but he stood there as a representative of having won an Oscar uh, in a starring role. Uh, 0834, pre-fight mill for Sean Lance's barbecue. Oh, the more dirty oh. tactics from Lance. Uh, we'll see who advances the two final four matchups coming up tomorrow and then playing down to our championship game on championship Monday. All right, these Texans are showing you they aren't the same old Texans. Splash after splash. Can you believe this is true, that this is who the Texans are? 
It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, right before, before we go to the break, I want to tell you about the good people at my bookie. My bookie is where I always tell you to go if you want to put some money down. You've got college basketball again this weekend, both men's and women's, and you know that those wim- the women's games are going to be highly viewed just like the games last week. If you're watching and you're looking for a little rooting interest, put some money down so that you can make even the most uh, uninteresting game because you don't have an allegiance a lot more interesting. It's mybookie.ag. They take care of you in a variety of ways. If there's no games going on, well, there's casino games that you can play because there's live dealers standing by at all times for poker and blackjack and so much more. When there are games going on, you can go and get to their live streams, part of their website, where you can actually bet on the games, in the games, while you're watching the games on the website. And they always take care of their customers. That's right now. They're doing it again. Up to $1,000. You put money in. They give you more. They're Therefore, you have more money in your account, more games you can bet on, and, of course, more chances you can win. Uh, for example, you put 200 in, there's 300 in your account instantly, and you have more money that you can use to do whatever you want to bet. You can bet on games, you can do prop bets, you can do casino games. It's a whole heck of a lot of fun. Check them out today. What you need to do in order to get that bonus is our promo code, which is BET975. Anytime and every time you see it on the website, you've got to use it if you want to truly cash in as much as you can. Go to mybookie.ag right now. Now, use that promo code BET975 and understand what I always tell you. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with the only place I tell you to do it. It's mybookie.ag. Live from Constellation Field for a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, this is The Killer Bees. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Well, these aren't your uh, same old Texans, huh? Just splash after splash after splash. I think you can go all the way back to D'Amico Ryans, you know, the top coaching candidate on the market. Didn't seem like he wanted to uh, – some people reported that he didn't want to be here. Well, they got it done. Uh, C.J. Stroud, the pick at number two, you got a little bit lucky there because if you're at number one, maybe you take Bryce Young. You got lucky that he didn't get taken number one. You had the controversial trade that worked out because you hit on your evaluation of Will Anderson. And now you have the Texans who are making splash move after splash move, and it doesn't seem like the Houston Texans in the – entire franchise history have been a team that's been willing to make these splash moves, which helps because you're capitalizing on C.J. Stroud's rookie deal. You look at just this offseason alone. You you make the tough decision to let John Grenard walk. Okay, well, how are you going to get better there? 
Daniil Hunter. You bring in Daniil Hunter, who's a better pass rusher than John Grenard. Joe Mixon, which I think was plan B. I think they've told you that because they were very hot and heavy for Saquon Barkley. The price got a little bit too high. But you bring in a Joe Mixon, maybe a little controversy there. I don't know if the former Houston Texans do this. I don't know if Bob McNair brings in a Joe Mixon. Mm, These Houston Texans do. You add a little bit of star power at running back because Mixon does have some clout. He has some cachet. And in the move yesterday, you trade for Stephon Diggs, even if it might be a bad trade because it's a second rounder for a rental, another player with cachet. The Houston Texans seemingly are going all in, splash after splash. This isn't the Houston Texans that we've known for their existence. I think you're right. I think you take it a step further, too. If this was Bob McNair's Houston Texans, not only Joe Mixon, but would Stephon Diggs be a consideration as well because he didn't want any possibility of any bad apples or any problems in his locker rooms. And now you, you look at it and go, we've talked about this in the past. Past. This team didn't have a, a big reputation for using free agency as a way to go make splashy moves and get big time players with big time names. Now you look at it, and, and I heard someone say, "Well, you know that they added some talent. They added ten sacks. No, they added twenty six and a half sacks." When you think about the combination uh, of the two guys they brought in, when you think about improving your running game and doing what they did with Mixon and adding digs to the receivers you have and giving CJ every weapon that he could possibly have while he's still on that rookie deal. You have to love where this team is and the direction it's going and how it's going about his business because because now we're looking at a team that hasn't even broached the draft yet and the three days that are still yet to come, and you are a significantly better football team than you were at the end of the season. That's what's so fun about the uh, – like, you might not agree with all these moves. Like, we, we've argued the – the impact of Joe Mixon. We we talked about Diggs and the restructure of his contract today, and you know is giving a second round pick next year more you know worth more than than one year potentially of Diggs because of this contract restructure. And I think you, it's a fair conversation to have, but it's fun. Like it's fun to have a team that's willing to go for it. You know, Keith from LA always tweets us that Nick Casario needs to be like less need and do bad things to draft picks. Well, he kind of did a bad thing to next year's draft pick of Minnesota. Uh, you go out, you get a player who's proven in the NFL, wasn't great in his final seven games in the playoffs for Buffalo, but the Houston Texans feel that was for other reasons that don't involve the production of Stephon Diggs, or at least the uh, the player that, that Stephon Diggs is. So, like, this, it's fun. It's fun to have an organization that is willing to go all in. I don't think they'll do this whenever – uh, C.J. Stroud gets an extension because he's going to take up a huge percentage of the salary cap. But while you have this opportunity, mm-hmm. go for it. Attack, and they are attacking. See, on that point, Jeremy, I think you might see the opposite. I think we, what you've seen when Mahomes, once he signed the mammoth deal that he signed in Kansas City, now you're going to see the fact that they're going to make tough decisions going the other way to let go of players that were impactful for them because you don't have the luxury of having your best player at the most expensive position playing very cheap. But while they are capitalizing on this, as a fan, it's not your money. It's not your draft picks. Yeah, you worry about the draft pick part of it more because you know, as a savvy fan, how that factors into the overall sustainability and development of the team. But if you're a fan for this year, knowing this is the offense they're going to put out there for you, a top 10 type tight end, those three wide receivers, a, a, a good, steady, proven to this point. I know we've had our discussion about with, with Joe Mixon and a better than average offensive line with one hole to fill on it, whether you believe in Kenyon Green or you think they're going to go out and get another option. That's a pretty good offensive lineup to put your, your your stock in going, I love what this team has done, and as a fan, I couldn't be more excited and ramped up already for a team that is going into its second season under a coach that everybody loves, doing things the way you would want it to be done if you were a fan. You enter the draft, too, where you can sit back and take whoever falls to you. Like, you can take the best player available, which is one of the goals I had in the offseason. Like, do things in free agency or in the offseason, in this case, via trade, where you can go into the draft and just take whoever is the, the best player on the board whenever your pick comes up. And I think the Texans have done that. Uh, 7196, I think this is the beginning of the golden era. What is stopping y'all interviewing Diggs? Welcome him. Learn about him. Well, the, the well, Houston Texans and the flagship. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you two <laughs> things that are stopping us from yeah. doing that. Contracts. Yeah, mostly, contracts. mostly contracts and things that we can't work around. Uh, I, I, I think we've learned about him, though. I got cagey and did it and pulled yeah. the wool, pulled the wool over their eyes one time. That didn't go over so well. It's probably before he even was signed, though. Uh, he was drafted, but not signed. Yeah, so he probably wasn't yeah. even under contract yet. Yeah, talking about Kenyon, Kenyon Green, Green. whenever he came. Did, <laughs> yeah. we, did the Killer Bees ruin Kenyon Green, though? I thought about that too. <laughs> <laughs> did we? Did we <laughs> jinx it? We had, we had something uh, when when I was over at the Highway Hell. We had something similar happen where we got our hand slapped from the Astros. We had Alex Bregman on. I don't know if you remember this, Jeremy, but we had Alex Bregman on when oh, he was yeah. still a prospect, and we asked him like, "Hey, when are you coming up?" And Bregman actually said. 
by naming the the colors on the jersey when he was going to coming up, the Astros caught wind of that. It even went as so far as to delay Bregman's call up to the big leagues because they were so mad about it. So yeah, no, we, we're not able to. Oh, get, we're not able to get digs on. They uh, slapped on, him on, on the, the wrist. Pump. Yeah, they slapped him on the wrist, uh, which was uh, fun. Uh, Joaquin says all the Texans did was move down the draft 19 spots to get digs for one year. Seems pretty fair to me. Yeah, I, I I think that is fair when you look at it that way. Now, the trade for the for Stephon Diggs was Minnesota. Like, you already had that in hand. Mm-hmm. Like, you already had Minnesota's second-round pick in hand. Then you flip the second-round pick for Stephon Diggs. So, you know, you have to make a decision if you like the trade or not. I think the other thing, too, Jeremy, is the fact that normally moves that, that are made like that are teams that don't have any more holes to fill, and it's a luxury pick where you can feel like, I can give that up. I'm still such a, a, a solid overall team. Uh, that, you know, we'll take the risk and, and, and run with it, and if it doesn't work out, so be it. But we know the Texans still have a couple of positions that they could draft that could actually help them, but it for, it's for next year. So at next year you come to that, you come to that bridge when you, you get to it and then cross it however you choose to do it. But for this season, to put that guy on that offense with that quarterback and everybody else that we mentioned – that's going to be a whole heck of a lot of fun to watch no matter who they're playing. Albert Breer's tweeting now that uh, the Texans can get a fifth round comp pick. Oh, so they can get comp. I don't know what to I, believe. I don't either. I don't know what the one guy saying that they can't get compensation, another guy saying they can get a fifth rounder. I don't know. I don't know. If they, it's, it makes sense to me that you couldn't get compensation for an original deal that you altered. I tend to believe yeah, that Yeah, that one. does seem to be the it's, way it, that they can monitor. It seems logical. Yeah, because you would think that teams that suck are going to try and do whatever they can to restructure deals so they can kind of get stockpiling of the potential to get picks, right? Yeah. Uh, Bennett Souza had short surgeries after the year. Just oh, wow. scrolling that, too. So, no more Bennett Souza mm. for the Houston Astros. All right. Seven, well, it lasted. So, yeah, 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 those, what, six games? Yeah. Uh, Look seven, good. What, was your, what was your favorite moment from uh, Souza as an Astro? The fact that I thought that it would have been great if we had him on a playoff roster because he pitched well down the stretch. He, uh, that he gave Dusty a lefty. Sort of. That too. For six games. Yeah. Uh, Bad Take Boulevard. What were the worst takes of the week? Who belongs on Bad Take Boulevard? 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, I don't need to be flipping my shoes off with a cardigan sweater on to tell you it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And and those aren't going to last for very long. Because before you know it, we're going to be in 100-degree heat. And you're going to be hoping that your air conditioning, your HVAC units are all going to be up to snuff and operating the way they're supposed to. Whether you want to get out in front of it and get someone that is an expert to take a look at everything you got, tell you what you got going and check your system, or you need someone with a number that you can remember and and people you can trust just in case something goes wrong, I need to tell you about Vanderford Air. Because from plumbing to HVAC and air conditioning needs, there's nobody better. They are local. They are not some big-time company that's going to big-time price gouge you. No, they are locals that are concerned and focused on taking care of people in the Houston area. That's why they guarantee their work across the board. And when I say that, it is a five-step guarantee that you're going to love. From repairs to an a, to a replacement system or parts replaced, you are going to get 100% satisfaction guarantee or your money back. That means the performance of whatever uh, product that they bring in or that they fix, the quality workmanship is guaranteed. Guaranteed, the comfort assurance guarantee that the temperatures are exactly where they need to be. The value at the lowest cost to you is guaranteed. And your money back if you are not 100% satisfaction guaranteed is the one that makes you smile. And the other one that's going to make you smile, if you do wait and this summer your air conditioning unit goes on the fritz, you can call them and you have the guarantee that within 24 hours of time they're going to be at your house. They're going to be helping you out. You don't have to wait days on end in the triple digit heat going, Woo, I'm really sweating this one out literally. No, they're going to take care of you every step of the way. That's why I tell you to go to Vanderford Air. You can go to VanderfordAir.com or call them because the number is so easy to remember. 281-557-COOL. 281-557-COOL.
He's blank. I'm Brad. I'm Killer Bees broadcasting live at Constellation Field in Sugarland. He's blank. I'm Brad. It's time now for Bad Take Boulevard, the worst takes of the week. The other day, the Astros tweeted out their little lineup tweet, which, you know, they do that every day. Mistakes happen. We understand that mistakes happen. They show that their game was being televised on ESPN Plus instead of Shin. Mm. You know who owns Shin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jim the Crane Astros and Tillman Fertitta. And the Rockets. Yeah, I don't, I don't think. I bet you that's a mistake they don't make again. Probably right, but I will throw the caveat of the fact that the people that are in play right now probably aren't as stung by it as the previous regimes when they had some hot headed people that would have blown their stack if that had happened. I know when. When I worked for the Rockets, if anything like that happened and the Rockets got shortchanged or it didn't get right, oh, my God. You worked for the Rockets? I knew you were going to say <laughs> something smart-ass yet again. <laughs> like, Tad Brown was the most hot-headed. If that would have happened, oh, heads had to roll. He would have been. I was about to say, when you, were, you were there for rough. a while. I, I, yeah, yeah, I was there. I, I don't think that person would have. Well, hell, we saw it with the horsey head emoji. I don't think that person would have survived. Yeah, poor Chad. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't deserve that. Never saw it coming. Well, kind of like the horse. Even did the horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rough. Um, how about talking baseball? Here was talking baseball before the season, talking about the weakness of the Houston Astros. This is, I think, the weakest Houston rotation I've seen since they became the Houston Astros that we know and fear. The rotation as listed is Framber Valdez at the top. You like that. Christian Javier is your two. Jose Urquidy, your number three. Hunter Brown and then J.P. France. So right now, it's not at full strength, and that's obvious. When I think of the Houston Astros and all the winning they've done in the past few years, I think of rotations. And they're going to be relying upon a lot of bounce back, which is always a little scary. If anything is going to hold them back from winning the AL West again after losing it last year, I think it might be their starting rotation. So it's only seven games in. Like we we can't There's do this. Number of we can't there. do this seven games in. What were, were the problems you noticed? Uh, well, one, he said they lost the AL West last year. That was one. That was one problem. <laughs> the other problem was he, he they listed Jose Arquiti as the third, third starter. There was, three, ne- yeah. there was never going to no. be a world where Jose Arquiti was your third starter. No, that, so those were both bad takes. So those are bad takes in and, in and of itself right there, just off the uh, off the rip. Those are bad takes because you have zero clue what you're talking about when it comes to the Astros. Secondly, I, it's too it's too soon to dunk on them for seven games. Like, oh, the Astros' rotation's brutal, but the Astros' rotation's actually been really, really good. But when is the threshold to where we can dunk on them, where we can say that this is a really bad take because the Astros are really, really good? Uh, Memorial Day? That's kind of the classic line, right? I was going to um, say a month or more. If, they can, if they're like, consistently. Well, okay, well, like maybe when Verlander gets back. Because you would only expect it to improve by adding Verlander and taking out whoever uh, exits the starting rotation. So they if, obviously if, didn't. Remember. If their numbers are still great when then Verlander returns, I don't think they have an argument anymore. They're obviously just looking at what the starting rotation for the start of the year might look yeah, like. Yeah, because they they're Verlander. not factoring in Verlander coming back, the other guys by midseason. You know, Urquidy, who wasn't going to even start the season no. in the rotation. They didn't do a whole lot of homework here. But at the same time, I would say like a month in, if you're still talking about one of the, the top, what, three to five starting rotations in baseball, that, it, that, that that's a bad look. I mean, I get the kind of the heart of their argument because we obviously had tons of conversations this offseason about Javier bouncing back, Fromber's second half. Uh, some of the other concerns we had, like injuries to Verlander and, you know, LMJ coming back, Louis Garcia get back. So I get the heart of the argument that there's questions about the rotation, but they obviously took the take way too far. Yeah, this is uh, – I'm going 40 games. 40? 40 games. Quarter of the year. So mid, 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 mid-May? Yeah, that's about 40, isn't it? Yeah, probably, I, yeah. I think. Mid-May. I like Memorial Day, too. That, that's a good one. Uh, Carl Ravage, this is the company that, that Brian McDonald keeps. Carl Ravage was calling the Cubs-Rangers game. I think it was opening night. Uh, bottom of the 10th, tie game, bases loaded, one out. Take it away, Carl Ravage. Time again. And watched him come through a high chopper, fielded home. The force is out. They had it out at first if they wanted it, but they get it at home. What a play. It was the winning run. The winning run at the plate. Yeah, he's talking about getting the out at first. Yeah. What's he? What's Carl? He's sleeping. What is Carl Ravage talking about? Ugh. He might have been combing his hair. What is Carl? It's, it's not all real. I know. It's not all real. Do you remember this botch? Also from Carl Ravage, College World Series. I think it was the last College World Series. It was Oral Roberts and TCU. 
Oral Roberts was down two runs. They had two runners on in the top of the ninth inning. Again, I emphasize this was the top of the ninth. Can you win a game in the top of the ninth inning, guys? No. No, 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 you can't win a game in the top of the ninth. Carl Ravitch, again, your brilliance. And this one is hammered to left field. Did he do it? Yes, sir. Walk-off home run. The nine-hitter <laughs> Blaze Brothers. And Oral Roberts rallies and wins it. TCU, I should say, in a walk-off. Top half, that's right. Not bottom. 3-1 shot, though. <laughs> oh, 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 what a cluster. You can... Wow. Six well, Jeremy, five. great the call. You can zero point zero. <laughs> you can hear the producer. You can't hear it, but you, you can yeah. tell the producer's getting into his ear. That's oh, why yeah. he's like, "Oh, he confused him." I'm sorry, TCU. Oh, it's the top of the ninth. What? I'm sure he had a terrible feeling whenever that happened. Can we stop putting this guy on TV? Well, ESPN has oh, ESPN has done this for a while, where they take guys that have been Sports Center personalities or, or talking heads, and they try to just change the role into. Into the play-by-play guy. Now that's worked well with Chris Fowler. I Fowler's think. worked well. Chris Fowler, Reese Davis. Wor- Reese Davis. Where right. they moved him more to the b- college basketball obviously side. Obviously, that hasn't happened. With, like Carl Ravitch started off as a sports center guy, or is, is, a, is a baseball tonight host, and then all of a sudden they try to force him into this play-by-play role, and he's clearly not up to snuff. We need to get rid of Carl Ravitch calling our games. He needs to stop calling baseball games. This Carl Ravage fella. Staying on that as your presidential platform. He doesn't. He doesn't understand that the winning runs at third, and they had to play at first. Okay, what are you talking about, dude? And then he doesn't understand the top and the bottom half of the ninth inning. Can you tolerate him doing little league? No. Well, yeah, I don't watch. Well, you're not. Let's say you're not watching. I'm gonna say it. At least give him something to do. Was it a charity? Maybe, well, maybe the, the kids are getting better on the field, and he's getting better in the box. Well, at the same time, the kid's like, oh, we got Carl Ravitch. Okay, this yeah. is a big deal. Dave Roberts, the manager of the Dodgers, mm. uh, his pitcher, or his second baseman, rather, Kiki Hernandez, was um, was doing the mic'd up the other day on the ESPN broadcast. And you could hear the pitch calm calls. Uh, take a listen. 3-2. Three, 3-2. Two. Three, two. All right. I don't have to cover now. But you're still diving. Uh, I'm still diving even more now, especially the line. I might bring in two. Now, all that stuff's on delay. Like, there's no way the other team's getting the signs there. I think it was neat to hear what it, it was I was cool. always curious it, to hear what it to sounds, hear what like. It sounds yes. like. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I did like the voice. The voice is better than, like, Siri or S2, anything. S2, he got a job. But uh, Dave Roberts was asked afterwards about the whole thing or whatever, and he said, I, I would have a little comment about a trash can, but I'm not going to go there. You just you went did. there, dude. You, you did. Went, went he, he did go there. He, he's stealing your bit. <laughs> he, he did steal my bit. Yeah, he did. You should yeah. be mad about that. Yeah. Uh, Dave Roberts. I mean, Josh Reddick, whenever he came to the Astros, later later said that the Dodgers were also stealing signs. So, yeah, be on your high, your high horse, Dave Roberts. Didn't, your glass uh, houses. What was the catcher? Eric uh, that was with Milwaukee said uh, that the Kratz. Kratz. He said that the Dodgers were cheating as well. Uh, Paul Pierce, surprised oh, a white man. girl Oof. from Iowa can play ball. Listen. Yeah, it's not. It's let me. It's it's beyond that key. I'm. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna just keep it 100 with you. We saw a white girl in Iowa do it mm-hmm. to a bunch of black girls. Mm-hmm. Well, of course. That that yeah. made it like, oh, <laughs> that gave my respect. That gave my respect. I, I hear you. You're like right. that's like, oh, she didn't do this to to uh, some other little white girls that was over mm-hmm. here in yeah. in Colorado, wherever. She mm-hmm. did it to some girls <laughs> from true. from LSU yeah, who we did. thought was some dogs. Defending champs. Defending yeah. champs mm-hmm. and put them on her knee and spanked them. Spanked them. And so <laughs> that, and it's, no. I know, but I didn't expect that. He Ugh. does that with KG and who's the other guy? Oh, it, uh, it well, was Skip. It was on their show. It was Skip and uh, it wasn't Oh, KG. that was Skip. Yeah, it wasn't KG. I was, was talking about the podcast Keyshawn? where they were talking yeah, about the Rockets was, the other it day. Was, it was Keyshawn. Yeah, it was Skip Paul and Keyshawn. Pierce should not be. Is he no. wrong, though? Yeah, Paige Beckers. Yeah. Paige Beckers has been doing it for several well, it years, just, It too. just comes off as a take of you clearly haven't watched any. Sure. Of but, her. I mean. Because this is not like Caitlin burst, uh, Caitlin Clark bust on the scene yesterday. I think like she's been doing this. Sure, she held her own All against LSU she's last faced. year. Yeah, but the first time you see, look, I think I think that Paul Pierce is onto something. Now it does show that he hasn't really paid attention to Caitlin Clark, but I do think the first time you see like a white guy or white girl in this case, like they can go, you're like, oh dang, they can go. There's a it p- does it is more surprising small, to you. There's a small but, part of it that I where I get where Paul Pierce is saying, but it, like I said, it comes off as like, well, you clearly yeah. haven't watched. Clay but if it was Caitlin the first Clark. time that like anybody had ever seen. Caitlin Clark like it was if you didn't know who Caitlin Clark was 
and you just turned on the Final Four, not that this would ever happen, let's say you're in a coma, you turn on the Final Four and you're like, oh, damn, she can play. You would be a little bit more surprised because she's white than if it were the opposite. There's a guy from French Lick, Indiana, that took the country by storm, too. And, and everybody talks about the color of his skin, and he's like the greatest white guy. Right, the but they knew he see. could play before he played Magic in the finals. Well, you didn't know that until you saw him play. That's what I'm saying. The first time you ever see somebody play and they're a white person, it catches you a little bit more off guard, a little bit more. It's the same thing with Cooper DeGene at Iowa. Oh, there's a white guy that's going to yeah, be a cornerback right. in the NFL? Absolutely but, it comes into play. Uh, I See, I, I think that when you look at it, you've seen enough Caitlin Clark over the last several years to realize it. Sure, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the very first time that you lay eyes on a white athlete and you're like, oh, they can go. Yeah, it catches you a little bit more off guard. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying. But I'm, I changed the conversation. Like, I agree with Brian that the, the bad take here is that he has no idea who Caitlin Clark is. But if you take that little piece of it, like, yeah, a white person that can play is a little bit more surprising. But the other thing to me is, he didn't. He, obviously, she's been in the game for a while. You look at what she did last year to LSU and South Carolina, and she held her own and then some. Sure. To where yes. it's a pretty. I think just think it's a pretty idiotic take. Uh, yes, that part of it is true. But if it was I the very first that. time watching Caitlin Clark, I totally understand why it would catch him by surprise. I just love how Paul Pierce buried entire states. He mentions <laughs> Iowa. He mentions Colorado. Colorado. It's like yeah, the entire state has no players you can play. There's probably some truth to that too. <laughs> Gotta go look at the NBA and go pull up the state by state. There's probably a lot of guys from Cali. Uh, well, There's they also a lot have of guys lower from Florida. A lot yeah. of guys from Texas. I, I mean, that, that's not a surprise. Wisconsin. We see it all the year in college football. Like, where is where are the most D1 players? Yeah, it's always te- well, it's, it's always Texas. California, Texas, Florida. California, Florida. California, Florida, Georgia. Yeah. Those are the top like, four. It's, it's, there's absolutely yeah. truth to it. There's a scary number of Wisconsinites in the NBA, just to let you know. The uh, Now, the, the, you're the, right. Yeah, they're located on the bench. <laughs> no, that's not true either. <laughs> the, the bad take is that he was kind of surprised who Kaylin, like she had game they, when she's been around forever and she's been really, really good for a very, very long time. All right, last one. Peter Schrager and Albert Breer think that uh, NC State's DJ Burns could play offensive tackle in the NFL. Brian put this one in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually defend this. How do we know that he can't play offensive tackle in the NFL? Well, it, it was, it's not so much that they were saying that there's a possibility that he could make a roster at some point. They – the quotes go on to talk about seemingly they, the the belief that he could actually be not only possibly make a like a camp invite, but actually be really good and pay top money. It was like just because he's what I, I know. Antonio Gates played basketball. Uh, Tony Gonzalez Keep played going. basketball. But they're not even talking about DJ Burns then playing tight end like those guys. There's another one that's well because you got you got Hall of Fame right there. Uh, oh, oh, across the, the, the board, the, yeah, and there's the, another one. The Colts, the Colts tight nope. end. Oh, that's You're talking about Gates. Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers. Oh, Julius, Peppers. Julius Peppers, Peppers started on Carolina's right. teams and, yeah. and is in the Hall of Fame. As the, a, yeah. who, who am I thinking of? The Colts tight end that played ball, George Mason. Uh, oh, you're thinking of uh, – I know exactly who you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah. But I can't – his name's on the tip of my it, tongue. They, anyway. The Texans or the Cow, Texans or Cowboys had a guy, too, that, that played college basketball, never played football, that, and they brought him into camp. And I want to say he ended up making a roster. It just feels like a lazy take. Mo like, Cox. Mo Alley Cox, yeah. It just feels like a lazy take, like, oh, well, this guy's six seven and, you know, 290, so he could just step in and play. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. When I, when I watched him one. play – It's foot, not that easy. But it's his footwork. That's, when I watched footwork. him play during the season, I was like – Whoa, big fella! Did you ever play football? Because your footwork is unbelievable. Maybe there's maybe there's similar traits, but the idea that he's just going to step in and play in, in command, you know, no, money as well, a left tackle is just. I, I bet you. Teams will put you on the no, practice squad exactly. too if they think you money got talent. Money left tackle, absolutely not. Practice squad. I, if he wanted to, I bet you he could give it on Some a practice team will squad give team. him a, a tryout. I, I believe that part of it. I just don't believe how far they went with their opinion. Yeah, like where you're talking about the amount of money he can make yeah. a year. Like, like I don't think he's going to be a top shelf left tackle. No. I think he could be a practice squad guy with a chance to maybe see him develop. Uh, can but he play left guard? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'd pick him up. I'd let him block some guys. Um, I, I mean, to me, he's probably going to play basketball overseas, though. I think that's where he's at. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the if because of his footwork and his touch that an NBA team puts him on there, g- drafts him with a two way or puts him on a two way yeah, and, and puts him in the G League. He's, he's kind of he's got a big body with touch and skill. Three three three. He can't shoot though, like outside. Three three three. You don't three, think so? Eight, um, I think his mid range is pretty good. I don't think he, I'm talking about. Well, three he's point said shot. outside. He's said outside. Oh, yeah, I think yeah he he's not a three point shooter. Ten, now. twelve feet. He can't shoot from three. Three 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 eight. Ask Blankers to name five players from Wisconsin. In Sam, the NBA, Sam Decker. Yeah. No, he's not in the NBA right now. <laughs> uh, Pod, Podjinski, what's the, the 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 rookie from Golden State, starting for Golden State? Oh, he's a good player. Yeah, he's a good player. Uh, Jordan Poole is a good player. <laughs> Kayvon, Kayvon Looney 
is an NBA player. Are, you me here, are these all Warriors? It's like it's or, Wisconsin a pipeline to Golden pull, State? Pulls with Washington now, though, but right? We started yeah, off at Golden with State. Warriors, yeah. Yeah. Um, what a pipeline, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you named three, right? Yeah, I should know this. <laughs> I know that they're there. Now that makes me mad because mm. five, seven, seven, four. Fan, George Fan Frank played Kaminsky, offensive is he tackle. Still in the league? No, George Fan played no, offensive tackle. Overseas played too. basketball only at Kentucky, uh, Western Kentucky. Never played football straight to the NFL. So there you go. Maybe that's the inspiration story for DJ Burns. Speaking of the Warriors, Rockets Warriors tonight. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about this one. Must win for Houston. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Killer bees. ESPN ninety seven five and ESPN ninety two five. Mike Holly, U of H class of nineteen ninety. Go Cougs. Great people at HRMP. Mike Holly uh, runs at Chris Fisher over there. They've been protecting the interest of businesses for nearly twenty five years. HRMP provides comprehensive human capital management services, including HR compliance, benefits administration, and payroll. HRMP will work with you to customize a plan for whatever you need. There's nothing cookie cutter about HRMP. You need a little help, a lot of help, anything in between. HRMP will create a plan for what you and your business needs. Also, their customer service second to none. You'll never talk to a stranger on the other side of the line. You'll be calling someone that's familiar with you, familiar with your company. I can speak to that customer service anytime I have a question. Always get a quick response easy to understand let hrp take on the demands of human resources and eliminate your hr burdens so you can get back to growing your business give them a call at 281-880-6525 let hrp customize a plan for you 281-880-6525 or check them out at hrp.net that's hrp.net Live from Constellation Field for a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, this is The Killer Bees. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Rockets, Warriors tonight. This is the last hope for the Houston Rockets. Uh, three games back, seven games to play, and Golden State owns the tiebreaker, which a tiebreaker is worth half a game. Damon Green thinks it's worth a full game. Uh, his math isn't very good. Learned that at Michigan State because he was talking trash to the uh, to the Rockets the other day. And Tari Eason, a lot of anticipation for this game. Uh, you had Draymond Green say he didn't give a darn about the Houston Rockets. Tari Eason, he went to social media, talked about Golden State, which, I mean, Not a good move. I didn't really love that. Like, you got to be at least playing. Yep. Uh, Golden State's a three-and-a-half point favorite tonight. The game, of course, in Houston. How do you see this one playing out? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Rockets are going to be competitive tonight. I think the Rockets are going to treat this like when we were talking about a playoff game. This is as good as it gets in terms of getting your young players the experience of playing a veteran-laden team that's been there and done that, though they're not the team they were in the past, that are looking to bury you and put you to bed once and for all. You play better at home. You've been playing well of late. You're going to have to put your best effort forward because Golden State, they've got a chip on their shoulder when it comes to Houston. The guys that we're talking about, the Draymond Greens, the Clay Thompsons, the Steph Currys, they've had issue with this organization and the players before. They would love to come in here and shut the door, put them to bed, have Steph do his little thing uh, with his little night-night uh, gesture at the end and, and say, your season's over. But I think the Rockets can hang with them. Athletically, if they run up and down the floor and if they really push them, Draymond doesn't run a run. Steph can still run. Clay's a shell of himself. I think that they can take advantage of their athleticism, youth, and speed, and they can really put the, the, the Warriors on their heels. But this is it. I mean, this is do or die, and I think that the Rockets are going to be competitive, but that experience down the stretch for Golden State means something. They had the Warriors on the ropes earlier this season when Steph just went nuts. And I just think it's too soon. I think this is probably where it comes to an end. I looked at the schedule last night. I don't know. I think there's a chance that the Rockets, for as great as that winning streak was, they might finish the season losing just about every game. Oof. Um, I actually like the Rockets' chances tonight. Like, this is their Super Bowl. Like, this game means a lot to these Houston Rockets. Like, okay, now we it's a game against the team that's in front of us, our last hope to get fight for the play-in. Um they, they've been trying to build to this, et cetera. Like, they knew this game was down the pike. They knew it's the team they were chasing. And Golden State doesn't need to win this game. Like you you were saying, like, the, the Rockets' schedule down the stretch is much more difficult than Golden State. Uh, it's in Houston. Even if Golden State were to lose this game, they still have a two-game lead over the Rockets and still have the tiebreaker with just six games left to go. So, like, this game is not massive for the Warriors, where it is massive for the Rockets and and probably the Rockets fans. Like, I I imagine they'll have a good crowd with Golden State there. I imagine that it'll be a big game for the fans. I bet you that, you know, that the Rockets will be lifted up a little bit by what I think is going to be one of the better home crowds this season in Golden State. eh. I mean, they're, they're a team that, like you mentioned, they're veteran, playoff, all this stuff, and they know that this isn't a game that they must have. But I think that when they walk into the building and they feel those things. Maybe. Maybe they need that external motivation because otherwise you're right. It's just, eh, it's Houston. They're young. So what? They get their hopes up and then we crush. But they walk in, they feel that and be like, okay, all right. You know what? Maybe that's the external motivation they need to go. Well, let's do it again. Let's do what they hate to see us do. Come in here and put them to bed uh, and go at them. I think it's a great test for the Rockets. I think, again, whether they make the playoffs or not, these type games, the fact that Craig was saying the other night about, you know, you haven't seen a meaningful game for a team like this in quite a while, and these are the kind of emotional things that these young players need to feel. It's great for Adoka and everything that they've done to develop these young kids. Uh, 60-30, who gets a tech first, Dylan Green or, or I'm sorry, uh, Draymond Green or uh, Dylan Brooks? I think uh, uh, Draymond Green. I think he's going to come out run, bumping his gums again and doing what he did when he got the tossed out within seven minutes of the game against Orlando, and he just can't, like – Get it there, get close, but not over the top. He's going to come out over the top. He's going to come out overly demonstrative. I could easily see him being the first guy to get a tee. Yeah, I could see it going the opposite way. Not that I disagree with you, but, like, if it goes starts going a little bit south for the Rockets, this game has been a lot to them. Dylan Brooks gets a little frustrated. Chirps to an official. Can I tell you the kicker why he won't? Why? He's mic'd up tonight. Uh, is that going to stop him? Yeah. Like, he's a guy who likes the Dylan the villain mantra. He does, but he also, you know, a lot of it is hearsay Gimmick. of what happened on the court. If he goes and starts saying a bunch of stuff and they got tape of it, the league office can still get you – know, I, I just think he's going to be a little more careful. Yeah, that will be um, – well, I don't think that anything you say on the mic up is going to cost you from the league office. Like, how, how could they? How, how, like, that, they that, can't use it so. on the air. Sure. But you're going to get mic'd up on something that never comes to air? No way. We'll see. No way the NBA PA would ever allow that. No chance. I don't know how they do it when the local teams now are getting the the flexibility to be able to mic a guy up. But when the national ones do it in the playoffs, there's an NBA PR person and an, and a, a Rockets PR person or whoever it is. That could, they can find you. Well, they can utilize it in their case against you if they're looking for proof. Did he say something? Depending on how defamatory and, and inflammatory and and uh, offensive it could be, that. I just I think and I think most players are smart enough. If they know they're mic'd up, they're gonna they're not gonna bring their A game verbally. Remember the um the the best the best example of that of it's actually the opposite of that was when Peyton Manning 
went over and yelled at Jeff Saturday in the Colts' sideline. And he's like, and Jeff Saturday's like, we need to run the ball. He's like, you're the lineman. Don't tell me what to do. I'm the quarterback. Blah, blah, blah. Block for me. Just block for me. Stop going into business for yourself. And then, like, he cools down for a second, sits down. I think it was Brandon Stokely. And he looked at him and he goes, I just realized I'm mic'd up. Like, he had forgotten that he was mic'd up. And, like, somehow, I mean, it wasn't anything too crazy. They just got into a little bit of a football argument that happens. But it's one of the so, – it's one, it's one, it's probably my favorite mic'd up moment. And the reason why I say what I say is because we were in the playoffs against Portland. And Mikhail looked at J.B. Bickerstaff when – I think it was LaMarcus Aldridge was just handing them – and, and they went on to say some things that Mikhail – forgot, I guess, that he had the mic on, or he was told that whatever they said was not going to be used, yeah. not going to be accessible, and all of a sudden, it not only got, the word got out, the audio got out, and it was an NBA person that was in the truck, and he's like, get the NBA on the phone, right now, during practice, he's got me on my cell phone going, get him on, because I'm never doing it again, they told me the opposite, this is, bu-. and I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it, because they can't, they were trying to come back, he goes, you can't do that when I'm doing you a solid to putting a microphone on. Yeah, they got, you have to be a really good editor on that. I, I, I would be shocked, though, if you can get that fine. Now, to use it as evidence, I could see that. Yeah, uh, 713 ESPN HRP listener line. All right, two worries with the Texans that uh, maybe you can put to rest. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. This is a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, live from Constellation Field. This is the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Welcome back in. Killer Bees broadcasting live from Constellation Field in Sugar Land ahead of a Sugar Land Space Cowboy game. Being joined now by Joey Loprofito of the Space Cowboys. Thanks so much for taking a, a few minutes with us. Thanks for being on. Uh, how, how's it going so far early in this season? It's going good. Um, it's been beautiful weather out here in Sugar Land so far and got a really good group of guys, great clubhouse um, and a great staff. So it's been good vibes this past week. So when Joey's in the kitchen and he's cooking, because we hear that cooking might be a hobby of yours. What are we eating, spinach? Because the power game has been off the <laughs> charts right now for you. You don't have to laugh at that, Joey. You don't have to laugh <laughs> no, at that. Was funny. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I mean, in the off season, I'm trying to make, you know, some clean, good food to eat for my roommates and I. Um, and in season, I don't get to do as much cooking for myself. Um, but definitely trying to, you know, keep on the good weight and 
What are you whipping up? What's your specialty? Italian food? Um, So I made a paella at spring training, uh, and then I love making Italian food. So I love, like, a good Sunday sauce, Sunday gravy. Just, like, one big pan of uh, (laughs) red sauce and meat and put it on some pasta. Not a bad idea. Um, We were trying to talk our way into you being on the Astros opening day roster after a fantastic spring. What was the message uh, as you start this season in AAA? You know, I think just, you know, do everything I can day in, day out to prepare myself to play in the big leagues. Um, You know, as the player, you always feel like you're ready and you always want to do that and want to be up there. And that's obviously the goal. Um, But, you know, I think to approach, you know, this season starting here in AAA and Sugarland is anything other than, hey, I'm going to, you know, day in, day out, make myself a better player. So when that time comes, I'm that much more ready for it. Um, It's kind of what I want to do and been able to do that so far. How much do you, especially being this close to the big club, how much do you, besides your day-to-day here in Sugar Land, how much do you keep an eye on the Astros and looking at what they're doing and who's doing what and trying to figure out, like, when my opportunity might come and if there's a chance for me to get 30 miles down the road? Yeah, I mean, even as a fan of the game and of the team, um, you know, I do my best not to, you know, let it consume me like that. (laughs) We'll watch, like, the post-game, like, condensed recaps back at the apartments Uh um, just as, like, see what's going on, and I'll watch that one in the Phillies uh, with CJ. Um, But you just don't really think about it like that. Like, for me, I day-to-day here would, like, just want to go throughout my work and my business without really thinking, like, oh, I wonder what who so-and-so did last night, uh, that kind of thing. Just I think if you do that, it kind of creeps in, and, you know, before you know it, that's all you're thinking about, and you're not really we'll taking care of your own business. Don't worry about that. <laughs> we will absolutely yeah, do it yeah, for yeah. you. That's, that's what we do. We, we say a lot of nonsense, uh, or sometimes it makes a lot it makes of sense. a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Loperfito joining us here at Constellation Field in Sugar Land. A uh, lot of fans of the Astros, well, he's our future first baseman. He's our future center fielder. He's our future corner outfielder. You played everywhere. You played some second base as well. What, what do you think is your best position defensively? I love playing center field. Um, but again, I think that, you know, versatility defensively is something I pride myself on. Um, really since I was in high school, I mean, I'd play shortstop, um, for my high school team. And then in the summer circuit kind of play more center field. Um, and then in college, my freshman year first was kind of the way into the lineup. Um, and my sophomore year second was kind of like, Hey, Joey can really help, help our team this year if you're able to do this. Um, but got to play my last two years there at Duke, um, in center. And that's kind of where I like to be best. Um, but I think just continuing to get, you know, more comfortable in the other corner outfield spots and also, you know, keep first base in my back pocket is something I can do, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, can only help you. Well, and it can, especially because, again, I'll take it back to the big club, but we know that, you know, there are opportunities, that fourth outfielder spot. We know that going into the regular season, they were looking at center field. Obviously, you having the big spring made a lot of people pay attention. We know that they're always looking for a bat off the bench. Your versatility has to come into play. You look at a guy like Dubon and all the things he was able to do last year because he could play an infield spot or two and play the outfield. That has to lay uh, in your favor uh, no matter when you get that first call up. Yeah, and as a young guy, I mean, when you look at the big league team and and how good they are, I mean, they're competing for a World Series every year, which is, I mean, where else would you want to be? But I think that kind of furthers the point that, like, hey, you got to be able to hit and you got to be able to play defense well at at multiple different spots um, because you never know where. Where, the where did that come. first base experience come in? Um, I played it uh, my full freshman year at Duke. Okay. So every every game that season. Um, and then in 2022 and 23, um, probably played almost you know, 20-something games each each year there. Joey Loperfito, our guest, Constellation Field in Sugar Land on ESPN 97.5. We mentioned all the uh, positions. How many gloves do you have in your <laughs> bag? Um, here at the stadium, I have – Probably six or seven. Okay. But a couple are just, you know, extras that I haven't broken in yet. Um, I'm with Marucci, and they have – they give me these little, like, glove carrier cases to kind of protect when we go on the road. So I'll bring four for road (laughs) trips. I'll bring two outfield, uh, a first base, and then a a normal infield one, too, just kind of an emergency. Gotcha. That's awesome. So you grew up in Philadelphia. Just outside in okay. Haddonfield, New Jersey. In the yeah. Philly area. Yep. Uh, I heard there's a little bit of a – you had a little experience watching uh, your current club and your hometown team of the Phillies uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in some big games. <laughs> um, so I was fortunate enough to go to game five of, uh, of that World Series last that year where Chaz made the catch. Uh-huh. Um, and it was awesome. I mean, that environment in Philadelphia, um, even being a little split between, you know, my hometown team and um, the Astros, it was just so much fun. Um, and I remember my roommate, Chad Stevens, um, he's in double A with us. Uh, 
we just looked at each other a couple times during the game and we're like, dude, like this is what we're working for. Yeah. I mean, you looked around and even being there as a fan, I, I asked Jake and Chaz and all those guys just like a ton of questions this spring training about, you know, how was it, like the atmosphere, all that. Um, and that's just what you're working for. Um, you know, you can see, you know, the grind of the season, but, you know, more or less at the end of the year, that's where you want to be playing and, and to do stuff on that stage is really what everybody wants. We know that you're you're working for your dreams. So you have to put in the time, of course, in the minors. We hear all these horror stories about players in the minor leagues. It's much different here, you know, with the Space Cowboys. You get up to the higher levels, but you're not that far removed from single A. What's the worst thing you could tell people about being a minor leaguer? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in the recent years, the conditions that we've, you know, had have been far and away better than years past. Is that the union? Yeah, I mean, just like the the quality of the affiliates, um, the housing, uh, the food. I mean, they paying for the housing, everything right. like that has been so much better. Um, and even being the way they structure the schedule, being in the same place for six games in a row. I mean, I think in the Texas League last year, like that travel is fifteen hours on the bus sometimes. <laughs> and I mean, even doing that for six games straight is one thing, but if you were going 15 hours, play a couple games, then like overnight bus, play another couple games, like that's brutal. Yeah. So, you know, I always say to older guys that played in the minors before me, like, hey, you had it much worse than we did. So I feel like we're pretty spoiled right now. I, I can't really think of anything. You go to camp with all those veterans, and you talk about how good the team is, but you got some guys that if they're willing, and sometimes we hear stories, some guys are, some guys aren't, but coming out of camp and, and being in a camp with that many veterans that have done what they've done, who was who was a guy that really kind of took you under their wing a little bit and kind of you had some good conversation with? I think all the outfielders. Um, that group's not only you know crazy talented and had individually so much success, but they're pretty tight-knit. Uh, my locker was right next to Tuck, um, and so he was just kind of from the beginning, like, talking to me every day, which was cool. Um, but Chaz, Jake, um, all those guys in the outfield just, you know, going through drills every day with mm -hmm. them, um, being in the same groups. Uh, and them just, you know, years, a couple years before this, being in the kind of my same shoes, um, you know, they were all really nice to me. And Chaz has got some Pennsylvania roots, right? Yeah, Westchester. Yeah. Uh, but, no, just a great group of guys, and, and they work really hard, too. They're grinders. Cheese steaks, are they overrated? No, they're not. <laughs> I wouldn't say. This, the best going, this isn't going back home. You can oh, be honest. Where's the best one no, in Philly? I'm from not. Wisconsin, and that's not cheese. <laughs> so the best one in Philly is uh, is Angelo's. Okay. Um, far and away, uh, their rolls are just superior. They, uh, they're on the same street as this really famous bakery um, in Philly, so they get really fresh rolls. Um, good meat, and then they use Cooper Sharp cheese, Okay, which is really good. Real cheese instead of that cheese whiz crap. <laughs> I mean, I've had cheese whiz on my cheese steaks. It's coming, like, more late at night, maybe, like, after some uh -huh. some entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> maybe that's a cheese whiz time. But if I were just going to have a, a good, like, my favorite kind of cheese steak, it's from Angelo's with yeah. the Cooper Sharp. And Looks they make really good. good pizza, too. They okay. were uh, – they started in my hometown, Haddonfield, and uh, then they moved to Philly, and everybody was, was devastated. It's good stuff. Good. You, you looking to make a, an order? Or? Uh, I was seeing if I'd been there before, because I've been to Philly a few times, but I never remember where I go. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible with names. So I was seeing if it's something, you know, jogged my mind about being there, but I don't think that I've been there. It, it doesn't look familiar. It looks delicious, though. I will say that. The bread looks phenomenal, uh, like good. you were talking about. It does it's look game, really it's good. a changer because, I mean, when we went with the Rockets and, and the, the whole thing, I was in on how they made the meat and uh, the onions and all the other, and then I saw the cheese whiz, and I was just like, oh, man. Yeah. I don't think I can like that. Joey, you uh, you talked about just, hey, focused on the year, what happens, what happens. Is there an ETA for you, the, the goal for you? Uh, no, I try not to think about goals like that, even like statistically, um, I think as minor leaguers, you know, you work all off season for this and to put like any kind of statistical cap or anything like that on yourself. Um, it's just not needed. So yeah, I'll do everything I can every day here to put myself <laughs> in the best spot and yeah. I'll let the chips fall where they may. As a dookie with a coog, I mean, if shed plays, yeah. are we talking about a different story? That's a great question. Mm. It's a great question. I don't think this was Duke's year, yeah. whether or not he played or not. Um, 
But I think if you look at the recruiting class that they got next year, um, I'm a big fan of Coach Pretty much Shire. every year, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're so loaded last year. They're loaded next year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they'll get it rolling. I think, I think they'll keep competing. So you do think if Shed played, they'd win. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Joey, thanks for the time. Uh, good luck, man. Love watching uh, what you did in spring. Been paying attention to what you're doing here. We'll be rooting for you, and good luck the rest of the way. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. You got it. Joey Loprofito stopping by on the HRP guest line live from Constellation Field in Sugar Land. We'll step aside for a moment. We come back. I have the top five pass catching trios in the NFL. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. This is a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, live from Constellation Field. This is the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Good kid, that Joey. Really good Wilper kid. Fido. Good kid. Um, it's interesting to me that he's played more center field this year than any other position. Just saying, like we all thought he was going to come down, like play first base, be the guy that takes over for Abreu. But he's been playing more first base or center field. Yeah, I'm, but I'm saying if he's got wheels, it's kind of surprising to me he ended up at first base regardless. But I guess you know you look at a guy like – and I mentioned Dubon, but if you look at a guy that brings that much versatility to the table, he doesn't have to play there every day. But, man – his pop numbers are unbelievable right now. I think, like I've been, I've been clamoring for Brandon Belt. Uh, I think that Loperfito is your best left-handed bench option. They just don't want him to be on the bench because they want him to get everyday at bats. Mm -hmm. I fully expect Joey Loperfito by summer, unless they sign somebody, which right. I don't think they will. 
Uh, to be a, no, I don't think so. Uh, I fully, ex- I would like them to. I would love for them to sign Brandon Belt. I'll pound on that table uh, each and every day until Brandon Belt has a baseball team. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's very, very slim. I think that Loperfito, by the time they're in the playoff race, like you know, the actual like sh- playoff stretch, the stretch drive, he'll be their bench guy unless they make a trade. Yeah, he seems like with that kind of versatility and the pop that he's shown, uh, and if he's got wheels, uh, I mean, he'd be the perfect fit on this team. Like, you know, you, you can plug him anywhere. But, I mean, if he's he's got five hits on the year and four of them are bombs already uh, here in Sugar Land, that's, that's exactly what they'd love to have in a plug-and-play whenever they need a guy. Now, the – the knock is that he, he swings and misses a lot, the, that he strikes out a lot. So the, they're trying to clean that up. Like last year, 134 strikeouts, 467 plate appearance, or 467 at-bats. This year he's got 10 and 21. So, like, that's the area mm-hmm. where for him to be a big league player, good big league player, he's going to have to cut down on the swing and miss. But he has power that plays, and I think he's a good defender. So uh, someone to definitely keep an eye on. I thought there was a decent chance he was going to make the team coming out of camp because he just performed so well. But it also is a pro- is kind of proves that we probably, you and I, everybody that follows spring training, puts way too much emphasis on spring training numbers. Uh, la- was it Last year, Jacob Melton went nuts in spring training. They they left him unprotected in the Rule 5 draft, never even sniffed the big leagues last year. Meanwhile, Corey Jolks had a good spring training, not as good as Melton last year. He broke the he broke camp on the team. So spring training numbers, we put way too much stock into them. But rooting for Joey Loperfito, great, yeah. great, great guy. Spent the whole commercial break talking to us about football and yep. stuff. So uh, good to have him on. We'll certainly be rooting for him uh, and hopefully gets called up sooner rather than later. We were going to discuss and are going to discuss the top five, in my opinion, pass catching trios in the NFL. That's why Joey he was like, well, you got to throw my Eagles out there. The top five, I have two that are honorable mention, first and foremost, uh, that I want to bring up just to say let's keep an eye on them. Uh, first one, Chicago. I don't think you can put Chicago there yet because their third one. And look, let's be very clear. I didn't go running backs here, and I went receiver tight end. Pass catching, pass catching options. Didn't go running back. That's probably – you could have that argument, but we're not having it right so now. So we're not going two wide receivers. It's a you, can go, you can go three receivers. You can go two receivers, one tight end. Pass catching options on your football okay. team, but I eliminated running backs from the conversation because running backs are more running – like they, they're more running oriented. Sure, they'll help you in the passing game, obviously, uh, but receivers, tight ends is what I'm operating with. The Bears, to me, are a team to look out for. They're not in my top five yet. They're like a team that's in the conversation. They're receiving votes. They're in the hunt. Because uh, I love DJ Moore, and I love the addition of Keenan Allen. That's a really good duo, but it's a steep drop-off to Cole Komet. And I went well-rounded here. I went well-rounded. Your third option better be very, very good. So Cole Komet, too weak of a third option to make the top five. Now they could change things with their second first-round draft pick. That could be something that changes the equation here a little bit. And the rumor is that they are looking hard at a, a wide receiver to give Caleb Williams another weapon. The other honorable mention I have here is Minnesota. And Minnesota Ooh. might be – you might argue Minnesota with me. The reason I have them out of my top five right now is because of the injury to TJ Hawkinson. Mm-hmm. Uh, Torres ACL, MCL, a couple of days after Christmas. Yeah, they're not expecting him back till November, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, it's the fact that if, if they had him healthy, they're squarely in the top five. Yeah. No problem being in the top five. But they don't, so who's their third guy? I don't even know who their third guy is. I mean, K.J. Osborne's not even there anymore. No, so who I, the I, Patriots? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I th- I thought he would win. Either way, he's not on the team anymore. So, yeah, I, I don't Addison know who that – Addison Jefferson and then who, Addison right? Jefferson great are a great two. one, too, but who's the third is the question. So, now. that's why they're on my honorable mention, a team to keep an eye on, but they're not quite, they're not quite cracking my top five. Number five is going to surprise you guys. It's going to surprise you guys. Kansas City Chiefs. Travis Kelsey, I think the best tight end in the NFL. They signed a Hollywood Brown, who I think is one of the more underrated receivers in the NFL. And then Rasheed Rice had a fantastic rookie year. He's going to have a better second year. Now, the big hang-up now with Kansas City at number five is, will Rasheed Rice be suspended? Yeah. So the legal actions of Rasheed Rice could totally change them in my top five. But on the flip side. If he's playing, they're in my top five. If he's not, they're out. The other flip side is, is that from a first round pick perspective, that yeah. last pick of the first well, round. Well, you can't you can't account that for that yet. You okay. can't like the, they're not on the roster, so you can't be like, well, I guess they're going to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. So no. now they're in my top five. So I can't I can't account for that yet. You and I had when we were doing. I think Jeremy was out one day when we were doing one of the ones where they we had seen that whether it be the, one of the receivers from Texas 
or from LSU that they were pretty hell bent on using their first round pick at the end of the first oh, round there were rumors, on a wide receiver. Yeah, there were rumors about uh, uh, the Chiefs being interested in Xavier Worthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, there was a couple mock drafts that had him going there with the last pick of the first round. We'll, we'll see what happens in the draft whenever the draft comes. I, I'm, I'm not going to. No, give but low key, they did a nice job replacing MVS and and getting some guys in there for for uh, for Mahomes. Number four, Joey wouldn't be happy with me. I have the Philadelphia Eagles. Their duo is incredible. But, again, I'm looking for a well-balanced three. I probably don't put as much value in the top two because you need that really good third piece to round it all out. We're talking depth here. We're talking trios. We're not talking duos. So I have the Eagles at four. Uh, love A.J. Brown. Love Devontae Smith. But Dallas Goddard's a pretty big drop-off to number steep three. That's a drop. That's a steep he drop to number three. Big catches, but he doesn't make a yeah, lot he of was, catches. He was under 600 yards last season, so less production than even Dalton Schultz. Uh, Goddard's had a, a, some good moments, but he's not the steady – threat at number three that would move them yeah, further he, up the list. You know, he's a guy that Hurts is going to throw to in big moments, but he's not going to get the volume yeah, of reception. Yeah, there's no to volume yards. to him, yeah. Number three on my list, Detroit Lions. Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, who's had trouble staying on the field, uh, whether it's injury or whether it's gambling. You likes to gamble a bet. I was going to say, you want to make a bet? He's on the field. Who sure. matters that he gambles a little bit? Who cares that he gambles a little bit? And I love Sam Laporta. I know it's been one well, year, Porta, Sam Laporta, I but I don't care. Two. I actually did. Yeah, I actually yeah. had Sam Laporta as number two. So, St. Brown, Laporta, Jamison Williams, I'm bullish on that trio. I love that trio. Detroit's my number three team. So, so far we got Kansas City, Philly, and Detroit, mm-hmm. I can pretty much guess the last two. Well, I, I just don't I, know the order. I, I know we're not including running backs, but if you if you did, then then Detroit also has a running back sure. there that would Jameer be Jameer Gibbs. Yeah, Jameer Gibbs yeah. Is and an Montgomery. Yeah, well. the bo- yeah, both guys, but Gibbs is really yeah. really was a yeah. Gibbs was, is dynamic with the ball. Pass catching trios here. Pass catching trios. Number two, San Francisco 49ers. Ooh. Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. They're my number two pass catching trio in the NFL. My number one. Houston Texans. The Houston Texans have made that Man. leap. They have the best pass catching trio in the NFL. Nico Collins, Steph Diggs, Tank Dell, best pass catching trio in the NFL. And if you want to make this a quartet, they have an even yeah. greater pass catching quartet than anybody in the NFL. You could argue Houston, San Francisco, one, two, I get it. You might argue some other people with the Texans from a pass catching trio. If you went pass catching quartet, I don't think it's even close. Because now you got Dalton Schultz at number four. All these other teams that we're talking about have they don't have a number four. Schultz is better than Philly's three. Yeah, he's no, better than Goddard. Obviously, you have to have three. So, because the two teams I was thinking that might still break your top two were either Miami or Cincinnati. Miami doesn't have a three that I like. Yeah, that's the problem. Miami doesn't have the third. Cincinnati doesn't have the third. Um, Miami's tight end's probably their third. What is it? Because uh, Boyd Joe Smith? and Boyd's gone from Cincinnati, right? He, yeah, well, he's a no, free he's agent. Still, he's that's what I'm saying. He's he, he's probably he's, he's not cur- signed, he's but he's not with without them. a team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, there's a big drop off even if Boyd was on that football team. Like, yeah. it, and now you have to give them Higgins. Like, if I'm not giving you draft picks, you have to give them Higgins. But that's a duo. Like, who's you tell me who Cincinnati's third receiver is right now? Joe Mixon. He's not a receiver. <laughs> and he's not with the I, I, mean, I, guess. I, I guess I, I might have put the Browns for others receiving votes. I mean, Judy I, I, I guess Cooper? it depends on what you're – yeah. I don't think – Well, I, and then David Njoku was really and good. Njoku, so there's Njoku your three. Njoku was really good last I wouldn't, year. I, wouldn't, I guess it depends on your thought on Judy. I wouldn't have the Browns in my top half. I think they're Ooh. I think they're right around the middle of the NFL when it comes to pass-catching trios. Like, Amari Cooper obviously killed the Texans. Mm-hmm. Really good receiver. But where is he relative to other wide receiver ones? Eh. Probably in the bottom of that conversation. Kind of on the downside, I think Jerry right? Judy's overrated. Now, I do think – I do like Njoku. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a fan of Njoku, but I'm not going to say Njoku's a top five tight end. So, he's yeah. not there. So, Miami, no, I don't – he's not a top five. five Miami's right. third option, I think, is Jano Smith. Like, okay, like that doesn't yeah. scare me. Who was the other team that you said? Uh, I said Miami, and I said Cincinnati. Yeah, Cincinnati because they don't have a third option. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going duos here, Miami and Cincy are probably in your top three. Mm-hmm. That's where I was they, at. They might yeah. be one, two. They might be one. Philly's two, in that I, conversation. Eh, I wouldn't have Philly ahead of Cincy as currently constructed with Chase and Higgins. I would have Chase and Higgins ahead of Philly. I would have Tyreek and Waddle oh, yeah. oh, eh, ahead of Philly. Uh, I would have Cincy one. Those three right Minnesota there. Minnesota would be in my top three, quite frankly, if we're going duos. Top three? Yeah. Ooh, I yeah. go top five, but I don't think I go top three. Justin Jefferson, Justin Jefferson. Jordan Jefferson. Addison, yes, sir, in my top three. Addison yes. had ten touchdowns as a rookie. Yes, those are my top two. In fact. I'm going really? Minnesota. I'd probably go Cincinnati, Minnesota. I would probably go Chase Higgins. Then I would go Minnesota. I'd with, actually, I think I would go Jefferson Miami Addison. too with Tyreek. I would and, go them third. Waddle. I think Waddle's the, the 
I think I would take Waddle, Waddle over the reason, Higgins. He was dinged uh, up last year. I think yeah. Waddle's more yes. dynamic than Higgins. He's he, he's shiftier. He's quicker. Um, I don't know if he's a better like downfield option though. He's faster. Ooh, he's definitely I mean, faster. Yeah. Hey, you're definitely right. I mean, faster. Higgins is a bigger receiver. Maybe you're, like contested catch scenario, you'd probably want Higgins over Waddle. But as far as just game breaking, I would take Waddle. The other thing too, and like maybe why I'm like probably I'm not trying to poo poo Waddle here, but I'm doing it because for the sake of the argument. If you get rid of Tyreek, I don't think Waddle's nearly as good. I know Waddle had a big year without Tyreek. He, he had 100 catches as a rookie Sure, without but it was Tyreke. more slot, more over the middle type of stuff. Yeah. It wasn't like – and then he went – I mean, Tyreek came in there but and changed a, the I mean, dynamic of the offense. 100 catches as a rookie, not only without Tyreek there, but they didn't – I mean, Tua wasn't even the full-time starter at that point. I can't remember the other quarterback they were – I think that might have been the year that Ryan Fitzpatrick split. No, 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 no. It was the kid who was with the Jets, wasn't Mike it? Mike White. White. Oh, so, I mean, yeah. No, he went, I don't think so. When, when, when Tua it, got I, hurt? I, no, I think they signed – because um, Ryan Fitzpatrick was the starter that two would replace. No, I think you are right. I, th- I think it was White. I think he well, left the Jets. He, regardless, and, yeah. either way, he was he was dealing with lesser than a quarterback. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. If I'm going, if I'm going duos, I would go Cincy one, Minnesota two, Miami three, Philly four. I'm going so maybe San Fran five. I'm I'm putting Minnesota uh, ahead of San Francisco, but behind Philly, Cincinnati, and where Miami. were the where were the Rams fit in with Cooper Cup and Puka? I had the Rams fifteenth because they take. I, a, I'm talking about as far as a duo. Oh, duo. Well, like if you went to duo, yeah, but Cup no wasn't one, as ahead good as he was guys. two years ago. No, not ahead of those guys. I would probably have the Rams around seven or eight. Yeah, if I'm going just fair. duos, that feels fair. With I mean Chicago's depends, duo, depends on, yeah. Chicago's duo yeah. needs to be in that conversation. Green what? Bay's got three op- four options, but yeah. they're not there yet. None the of them are like studs I, yet. I don't know if right. – yeah, is any one of them a one? That's the kind well, of Well, Watson's issue. supposed to be the can't stay healthy. Now, the Texan yeah. – like a Texan duo I think is probably outside of the top seven. Like what helps the Texans here is the trio aspect, and their mm-hmm. third receiver is just better than anybody else's third option. Yeah, Maybe. but Tank had a great year, Maybe. and Nico had a great year. I think mm-hmm. that just those two guys could – yeah, You go in Nico Tank over Puka and Cooper? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because I think I think as good as Cup has been, he I, I I could see him falling off and not getting back to where he was. You go in Nico Tank over DJ Moore, Keenan Allen. Yeah, Ooh, okay. I, I, I'm not expect. I think Keenan I, Allen's starting I, I to fall off. I think I would too. I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, look, hey, Tank Dell, go Cougs. I mean, he was on pace for what double digit touchdowns or over thousand yards before he got hurt as a as playing as a fullback. So, are you willing to give him top five in your duos? Because now you're ahead no. of either Cincy, no. Minnesota, Miami, no. Philly, and then who do we say our fifth was? San no, Francisco. No, I would put them no. firmly at yeah. six. So yeah. you, it sounds like you are probably have them top seven, but not top, top five. Top seven. Yeah. I think yeah. I have them. I think I have the duo out just outside the top seven. But I have the trio number one. It's a and fair I have the argument. Number one but by I, far. As you name those teams off, I think I would put them at six. Uh, someone mentioned the Rams. Uh, Nine five zero six. Rock and roll. Six ten. Has an I, got, I don't like Godwin. Right Godwin now, and, and Evans. I mean, Mike Evans is is a very good one still. But I, are we I, talking I, duos or trios duos, here? Because they're trios. Du- awful. No, yeah, duos. Duos would be in my top ten ish. I probably I don't put it ahead of the Texans. No, CD and then who in Dallas? You can put Nobody. Brandon Cooks. Oh, that's right. Brandon Cooks should be your second receiver. Yeah, because no. Gallup's gone. Yeah, I, mean, I think Brandon Cooks is better than Gallup, though. But Gallup was Even coming was off a, uh, a surgery. I think I, I this don't year. Think, yeah, but I don't think Gallup has ever been as good as Brandon Cooks. Ooh, I don't think ever? so. Ever? No, no. Ever. No. He had, he has a moment, but now his moments weren't as good two as years, Brandon Before Cooks. he got hurt, was it two years he ago? Was that he never was never as good as but, Brandon Cooks. I mean, Cooks, Cooks had four. I mean, thousand yard seasons with four different teams. And he now. was traded for a first rounder twice and a second rounder once. Like, he's yeah. had incredible value around the NFL. That's true. Rams and – Somebody said Seattle. Uh, Seattle. Oh, Seattle's my problem, top ten trio. The problem, the problem is, though, I mean, obviously DK is established as a one. Lockett's on the downside, and we haven't the seen the kids J- from Ohio State. J- yeah. yeah, JSN. He, he had a he had a decent rookie season, but he hasn't fully broken out. I still so think they're top ten trio. I, I do too, uh, but I would have a t- uh, what, like specifically if we narrow it down to duos, though, I would have hard time like saying who's the second guy because yeah, because Lockett's kind of on the way down, and 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 Jackson Smith uh, and Jigba is. Not really fully broken out. Their like duo Vegas is probably in the top ten. Devontae, but Vegas yeah. doesn't have anything else. Mm, they have uh, the guy they signed, the uh, Parker, Devontae Parker. He's oh. okay. They spent they spent more money on Parker than he's worth, mm-hmm. but but it's a pretty significant drop off. I would probably have the Raiders outside of my top ten. And if you were to include them in their trios, who's your third option? Michael Mayer. Yeah. Who, yeah, he didn't do much yeah. as a rookie. Uh, but most tight ends don't. Other than I think Cleveland, Sam even if especially if you put in Joku with the year that. That uh, that Cooper had last year, those two guys, 
I still don't have them in my top ten, whether it's duo no, or trio. I wouldn't. They're, they're, they're solid. They're upper half, but I wouldn't put them nine, top three, ten. Nine, three, nine, twos. Falcons should have been there, but they had a stupid coach. I, I, I don't think that uh, – I don't disagree. But they're probably more top ten than top five, Atlanta. Drake London, London B.J. Robinson. They would be better well, not, if – Not Bijan. Right. Oh, that's right, not running back. They would so, rank London, please. Pitts – and who's their third? It'd be uh, Mooney right now. Oh. Yeah, which yeah. that's a significant drop off at third. Their duo, their duo would be ranked higher than their trio. Yeah, for sure. There's not a better quartet. You can argue me with trio with the Texans. I get it. I still have the Texans number one trio, rock and roll. You can't argue with me with a quartet though. Like there is not a better quartet in the NFL, and I would no. stand on that nope. table. I will listen to an argument for trio. I am not listening to an ar- argument for a quartet. Not no, even I close. Agree. All right, seven one three. Somebody said the Titans. Uh, Titans are not awful, but they're bottom half of the NFL. You have DeAndre. You brought in Calvin Ridley. Ridley. DeAndre's older. Ridley's who's the three though? You don't have a very good three. Yeah, you don't have a very good three. Duo's oh, with better the kid than from Arkansas trio. that's been a oh, complete tra- disappointment. Traylon Burks. Yeah, no, Burks. He's, yeah, he's, he's not. A, a, he's not a good three. He's been a yeah. Somebody said Pollard. We're only going pass catchers. Pollard's not the running back. Uh, but their duo is not awful. Their duo might be hot top half. Of the league, yeah, but their I mean, their trio's the, bottom half. Hopkins was sneaky, still over a thousand yards last season, so he he's not washed yet. In uh, Indy, we'll, we'll, I like uh, Pittman I like a lot. Pittman's but that's good, it. yeah. But I was Josh just, Downs is. I mean, I guess Josh Downs would be their number he's two. He's got to step up, but yeah, I don't think he's not a he's not a top level two yet. And tight that's, end, that's Mo Ali yeah, Cox. Ali I mean, Cox. Who, who who else is there? Lions for top duo or trio ranking? I have Detroit as my number three trio. Uh, Amon Ra and Laporta actually have an argument to be top ten as a duo. I think they have an argument to top five. Yeah, yeah, they're in mm. that Detroit sneaky good man. They're good. I don't know if they put them top five. Yeah, they're they're right on that cusp. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN HRMP listener line seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Two worries that you can put to rest for the Texans. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, let me take a moment for X-Golf in Katy. Go to X-Golf Katy on the internet and find out how awesome a place this is. It's the best combination of a, of a great sports bar and the best golf simulators you're ever going to find. If you're a golfer and you want a place where you can hit balls at night, you can do a range, you can play 50 courses worldwide, and they're the most unbelievable simulators I've ever been on. The putting is accurate, that you can track every shot, the distance, the direction, the height every bit of it you can practice your golf whenever you feel like it and because there's sports all the time there's sports on tvs all over the place great food and beverage it's a phenomenal place masters is coming up masters sunday is a special day they have eight golf simulators i think four of them already sold out they got four more to go you can pay one low price i think it's 400 bucks but you get the simulator all day from three o'clock until 8 p.m you can have there's a scramble going on where you can have a foursome compete for prizes like a new driver or a new wedge custom fit but on top of that they bring in all the same food as you get at the masters you watch the masters while you're competing and having fun on the simulators what a great time they also got leagues starting up uh, in the next two weeks so you can contact them and find out when you can get any, either an individual league or a team scramble league of twosomes it's phenomenal but i'm telling you the best part about it is these are the best simulators that they only uh, x golf simulators in the area check them out today go to x golf katie
Live from Constellation Field for a Veritex Community Bank Roadshow, this is The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. He's Blank. I'm Branham. We're broadcasting live from Constellation Field in Sugar Land, home of the Space Cowboys. You can catch all Space Cowboy games on ESPN 92.5. All right, I think Brian put this in the uh, the rundown today. Two worries that you can put to rest and stop stressing over when it comes to the Houston Texans. BMAC? Yeah, so I, I we've obviously had some of these conversations uh, throughout the offseason, and it's not limited to us. I, I think you hear that with people that call into the radio station, people you see talking on Twitter or just friends that you have. Worrying about you know the schedule and a possible second half dr- or second season sophomore slump from C.J. Stroud, but I think you're beyond that with the moves that the Texans have made. Like you, you to me, you can't look at what the Texans have done with their roster, transforming their defense by adding Danico Autry and Daniel Hunter, uh, Aziz Alshier, and then obviously with the offense with uh, Stephon Diggs and Joe Mixon. Uh, you can't look at that and then still worry to me about the schedule because worrying about the to me is a problem for a team that feels lesser than it's a problem if you feel like your team can't compete with the quote of the other first place teams with the Texans I think have put themselves with their roster with their moves in a place where you're now I mean you're not you're not the Chiefs but you're now in a group in a tier with other first place teams where to me you're beyond that fear it's not I don't want to put the Texans in the Chiefs category but like just putting them through that mindset like the Chiefs fans would obviously never worry about oh my god we have a first place schedule they don't worry about it because they have a team good enough to compete with those other first place teams and I think now with what we saw last year uh, from Stroud in year one and just the unbelievable year he had and the additions they made to this roster you're beyond to me having to worry about the schedule it's it's may, it's not like a nothing factor but it's not nearly the factor I think it's being made out to, yeah, to be. I think it, it, you can say that, yeah, no team should scare you anymore, but it's obviously a factor when you think about the fact that you had a cakewalk schedule last year compared to what you have this year. And so, you know, it's not from a standpoint that it should be intimidating to you, but it can factor in. It can be, you know, playing as many good teams week in, week out, especially when your last playoff spot or you're, you know, you're fighting for playoff positioning and, and home field or whatever – and you're fighting against teams that have a lesser than schedule, that's where the schedule still matters. That's where the first place schedule you have to take note of. But, yeah, in terms of what they've done that and the way they've added you know, added talent to be a Super Bowl-type contending team, no team on that schedule should fear them. They should look for it as a great barometer to play Kansas City whenever they play them in the season when the schedule comes out and say, say, say to themselves, hey, look, this is a great measuring test to figure out where we stand up to the best team in the NFL. Yeah, the um – I kind of related the Texans going into next season, kind of how Houston basketball went into the Big 12. Well, they got such a tough schedule. Their schedule's going to be so much more difficult. Their conference is just way better. Won the league. Like, good teams are good teams. Um, Sure, your opponents are better. Yeah, the Houston Cougars' opponents in the Big 12 are better than their opponents in the American. The Texans' opponents in 2024 are going to be better than their opponents in 2023. But the Texans are pretty good. The Texans are really good as well. So I- I'm with Brian on this. I don't have the worry of the the more difficult schedule. Plus, no one's asking to go 15 and two. Like no one's telling you you need to go win 15 of your 17 games against a first place schedule. You, you go 10 and seven, you're winning the AFC South. You, you go 11 and six, you're going to be in the conversation for a first round bye. Probably not 11 wins. You're probably going to get 13. You, yeah, you there. probably get. But you win you win 10 of you win 10 of 17 games. It's not that's not crazy that the Texans with a first place schedule can win 10 of 17. I expect expect them to win 10 of 17 games and win the AFC South. So I, I'll put that one to rest as well. Yeah, I, like I said, I don't think it's a fear, but I think it's a factor. I, I think that you have to factor in the fact when you are looking against other teams and other divisions and, and that are coming from a different spot where they didn't have the success of a year ago, that it could come down to the fact that you're playing a gauntlet and somebody else isn't when it comes down to playoff positioning. Well, I, do you think I, the Texans are going to win the division? I think they should, yes. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it's too much of a concern no, for you. No, that's what I'm saying. It's a factor. It's not I, a fear. I also do think, and, and there's no way to, to really know this until they actually play out the schedule. This might be just more anecdotal than anything else. But I also feel like the Texans at times last year played better when they felt pushed. Like when, when they had games against the Falcons Cincinnati. and the Panthers. Oh, yeah, yeah they, they didn't play as well. And those, those were teams they obviously should have handled. 
but with the, I, I don't know if I want to use the term playing down to their competition, but I do think that it seemed to be a team that, other than the Ravens games, responded better to being challenged by better teams. Well, there's a case to be made when you say, yeah, they took teams for granted and then they crapped the bed, and when they played Joe Burrow in Cincinnati right. – or they had to win the last game of the regular Against season. Against the Colts, Browns, they, and the on playoffs. On the road, yeah. yeah they, st- they, they stood up to the challenge and and uh, and, and whooped it. Ocho says, BMAC, I disagree because regardless of the roster upgrades, they still have to play a higher level consistently compared to last season uh, when you could win with your B or C game. But you lost with your B or C but, game. Uh, again, Usually I, against I, lesser competition. But yeah. I, I think it has to be restated. And well, actually, I don't think we stated in this segment, but so stating for the first time, the difference between the first-place schedule and the last-place schedule three games like the majority of your schedule is not based upon your record from the season prior it's your division and then the rotations with the a, the other, other AFC and NFC division so I get those three games that are, that are different between last year and this year are much harder yeah but the Texans are better and again it's three out of seven well there's two I mean the divisions could be better it, the, it can the, be. The divisions I, you're playing could be better. Uh, true, that, but that's not part of a quote-unquote first-place schedule. No, that's not part of the first-place yeah. schedule. It's just uh, more of the randomness of a schedule right. being more difficult or not. What was the other worry that you could put to rest? Oh, the, the, it was the the sophomore slump. Now, this hasn't been as, as, as prevalent of fear as that I've heard from Texans fans and people who cover the team, but I don't see how you can look at adding – Stefan Diggs now and keeping Slowick and, and see any chance for a drop off from from uh, CJ Stroud. I don't. I mean, you, you feel you feel great. You, you, you definitely think I, I think you have two number one wide receivers. Tank is a great number two. You have Dalton Schultz. You have a solid running game. You kept your your uh, your play caller. You kept a not that it was ever in doubt, but you kept your you kept your head coach that put this thing all together. I don't see any way that we see a sophomore slump from CJ Stroud. Look, it's hard to fathom it. You know, it's happened like, in the past where you say that like, there is a percentage of it, happen? but you, you always say that there could be a chance because you know, Vince Young won Rookie of the Year and then completely crapped the yeah, bed. Yeah, Vince Young was never that good, though. No, but what I'm saying is, is yeah, to finish that thought, is the fact that, you know, when you look at it, C.J. Stroud, to put the rookie year together that he did, and to your point, you know, they want guys that get into their r- routes quickly. They want guys that, you know, get the ball out of his hands quickly. Well, now, instead of worrying about guys that, you know, maybe are past their prime like Woods or trying to show that they, you know, are, are uh, sustainable for a season in Brown, you got those three guys to throw the football to. You got a tight end to, that you love to throw the football to. You got a running back you can, again, throw the football to. It's, he, it's, it's set up for him to have an easier time putting together another season like that. Yeah, I would agree with you, Brian. Um he the, carried far less last year than he's going to have to carry this yeah, year. Yeah, he carried – he made – we said he makes right. guys better. He made some guys that weren't – what we thought were very good, serviceable and better. Right. Like, his numbers might not be what they were, and, like, injuries are always a factor. But, like, if he played 15 games and he had less touchdowns next year, well, what if the Texans' offense is better? Like, the numbers to me aren't really relevant. Like, is he playing at a top first or second tier level at the quarterback position? I think he did in his rookie year, and I don't think he will not – do that in a second year I, I don't see any slippage statistically maybe but who cares like play at that level yeah. win football games that's fine even like with interceptions interceptions you, you're going to get some fluky ones that either one year they go your way last year they you know even some of the ones that maybe should have been caught weren't but interceptions don't matter if you're putting up points and you know you're building leads to where you know you can do some things and maybe he's not the statistics don't matter because maybe you're sitting down or you know you have the ability to kind of just feed the running game because you're up two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. Are those worries? Are they still worrisome? Are you putting those to rest? Also, what's your nomination for our car wreck of the day? Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. What are you nominating for the car wreck of the day? It's Killer Bees on ESPN ninety seven five and ESPN ninety two five. Hey, before we go to the break, a word from my good friend Doc Linville. Doc Linville, best in the business at the Neograph procedure. Look, make it simple for you. Are you losing your hair? Are you having pattern baldness, thinning? You don't have any more hair on. On your hairline or up on top and back and you think there's nothing you can do about it you're not interested in all the gimmicky sprays and creams and foams let me tell you about the neograph procedure it's taking your own hair where genetically you're never going to lose it and as doc linville explained to me you never lose the hair on the sides and the back of your head no matter how bald you go in other areas he takes some of that hair he repurposes it where you need it and in no time at all you see the results of having more hair having better coverage and having more self-confidence because of it check it out today go to 975 hair 
Com. As a listener to us that goes there to get the information, you have the ability to get a consultation with Doc and his staff for free. It's normally 150 bucks For you, for listening to us, you get it for free. You get to go in, ask questions, get answers, and you never once have to sign on the dotted line or cough up any money or make any commitment. You just figure out if you might be the next in line to reap the benefits of the Neograph procedure and the best in the business, Doc Linville. Check him out today. Go to 975hair.com. Tell him Joel Blank sent you by. He's blank on Branham. Thanks for uh, Constellation Field for having us out. Sugarland Space Cowboys, good to talk to Joey Loperfito. Uh, Space Cowboys play today at 6.30 against Las Vegas. Uh, Spencer Arigetti on the mound. If you're looking for something to do, you got a little bit of time to get here. Spencer Arigetti has been dominant in his first two starts, and then potentially – Justin Verlander starting on Sunday. I, I did learn one thing that I think you want to come out for next week. April 19th is a J.P. France bobblehead day. Oh. I, our guy Garrett, who does the play-by-play for the Space Cowboys, uh, cue, uh, clued me in on something. The mustache for the bobblehead is not just plastic. It's real hair. What? This From goes what? back to the days of the Moochie I, Norris. I guess. Yeah, was it that's, real hair? Oh, that, Moochie Norris that's bobblehead. What he, that's what he told when me. When he had the wild fro. Hair. The bobblehead used to have the hair? wild fur. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where'd so, they get the hair from? I, I a doll. I don't. I didn't a ask. Horse? For, I didn't ask further questions. But our guy Garrett said the the mustache for the JP France bobblehead uh, here at Constellation Field, April nineteenth. Real hair for the mustache. Are they getting JP France's mustache hair from a horse? <laughs> MTV JP. All right. What are you nominating for car record of the day? Uh, Major League Baseball and the A's for this situation for where the hell they're going to play over the next several years. Sacramento. You co- yeah, you Ugh. commit to Vegas overall, but they don't have a stadium, and, and the one that they do is a minor league stadium doesn't fit enough. So you're going to play in Sacramento while you're finishing up in Oakland before you go to Vegas. What are we doing? I have no problem with it. This it's, is this is a step that was necessary for them to go to Vegas, and I want them to be in Vegas, so I'm cool with that. You got a lot of fans too that are pushed back. Oh, there's still a chance for Oakland. I think that what ship fans? Has sailed. That's the other thing. Like the ballpark's too small. They get 45 fans at a game. Like you, you can host yeah. that anywhere. Opener? Didn't are they, they play at they a minor do league a, ballpark? 
Yeah, didn't the opener? They did an, instead of a, a sit-in. They did it in the parking lot. So a whole, like I forget how many thousands of fans came and they sat in the parking lot. Yeah, what was weird though is they're not going to go by the Sacramento A's while they're there. They're dropping the city. Like the Facebook dropped the Facebook and just went with Facebook dropped the the or like the Commanders that were Washington when they dropped their racist name and they didn't have a nickname they just went by Washington. The A's are going to go by the Athletics or the A's and not mention their city. Huh. For the next two That's years. That's the wow. car wreck. I have no problem with them going to Sacramento, but the fact that you're not even acknowledging that you're Sacramento is weird to me. You know, the other thing, too, is if you're just thinking about it purely from a financial standpoint, marketing, for those years you're in Sacramento, you could sell Sac- uh, yeah. Sacramento A's gear and make a boatload of money. Yeah, it doesn't, it's, it's odd to me they're not recognizing Sacramento. Uh, the studio that made Happy Gilmore uh, is my car wreck of the day. Yeah. They wanted to name Happy Gilmore Hole in Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Happy Gilmore, they wanted the name of the movie. Adam Sandler said this. You hear they're Dan making Patrick another show. one. Yeah, they're making another one. Which could you imagine? So you're Hole saying the original? Two, that the was original a- Happy Gilmore. Oh. The studio wanted Yikes. the name to be Hole in Fun, not Happy Gilmore. Well, they Gilmore. made the right call oh, not to go yeah. with that. Yeah, they yeah. wanted it to yeah. be Hole in Fun. That's about as Hopefully bad as you can get. Hopefully, that studio exec got fired. Yeah. There's so much that could be said about that title if it had been used. What can you say? Um, <laughs> there are Luckily other spin-off. for Joel, we only have a yeah, couple There are other left. spin-offs that could be used for that title. <laughs> we got about 90 seconds, so Joel's saved. Brian, you got a car wreck of the uh, day? Yeah, I'll name Paul Pierce for have, obviously having no clue who Caitlin Clark was before like two days ago. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was not good. Yeah, he needs to be a little bit uh, familiar with her game. Uh, 3338, car wreck of the day was Blanker's naming. Fun.